Chapter 2.1.8 Solemn League and Covenant Such dim masses, and specks of even deepest black, work in that white-hot glow of the French mind, now wholly in fusion and confusion. Old women here swearing their ten children on the new evangel of Jean Jacques, old women there looking up for Favre's heads in the celestial luminary, these are preternatural signs, prefiguring somewhat. In fact, to the patriot children of hope themselves, it is undeniable that difficulties exist, emigrating seigneurs, parliaments in sneaking but most malicious mutiny, though the rope is round their neck. Above all, the most decided deficiency of grains. Sorrowful, but, to a nation that hopes, not irremediable. To a nation which is in fusion and ardent communion of thought. Which, for example, on signal of one fugleman, will lift its right hand like a drilled regiment, and swear and illuminate, till every village from Ardennes to the Pyrenees has rolled its village drum, and sent up its little oath. And glimmer of tallow illumination some fathoms into the reign of night. If grains are defective, the fault is not of nature or national assembly, but of art and anti-national intriguers. Such malign individuals, of the scoundrel species, have power to vex us, while the constitution is a-making. Endure it, ye heroic patriots, nay rather, why not cure it? Grains do grow, they lie extant there in sheaf or sack, only that regraders and royalist plotters, to provoke the people into illegality, obstruct the transport of grains. Quick, ye organized patriot authorities, armed national guards, meet together, unite your goodwill, in union is tenfold strength, let the concentered flash of your patriotism strike stealthy scoundrelism blind, paralytic, as with a coup de soleil. Under which hat or nightcap of the twenty-five millions, this pregnant idea first rose, for in some one head it did rise, no man can now say. A most small idea, near at hand for the whole world, but a living one, fit. And which waxed, whether into greatness or not, into immeasurable size. When a nation is in this state that the fugleman can operate on it, what will the word in season, the act in season, not do? It will grow verily, like the boy's bean in the fairy tale, heaven high, with habitations and adventures on it, in one night. It is nevertheless unfortunately still a bean, for your long-lived oak grows not so. And, the next night, it may lie felled, horizontal, trodden into common mud dot, but remark, at least, how natural to any agitated nation, which has faith, this business of covenanting is. The Scotch, believing in a righteous heaven above them, and also in a gospel, far other than the Jean-Jacques I, swore, in their extreme need, a solemn league and covenant, as brothers on the forlorn hope and imminence of battle. Who embrace looking Godward? And got the whole isle to swear it, and even, in their tough old Saxon Hebrew Presbyterian way, to keep it more or less, for the thing, as such things are, was heard in heaven, and partially ratified there. Neither is it yet dead, if thou wilt look, nor like to die. The French too, with their Gallic ethnic excitability in effervescence, have, as we have seen, real faith, of a sort. They are hard bestead, though in the middle of hope, a national solemn league and covenant there may be in France too, under how different conditions, with how different development and issue. Note, accordingly, the small commencement. First spark of a mighty firework, for if the particular hat cannot be fixed upon, the particular district can. On the twenty-ninth day of last November, were national guards by the thousand seen filing, from far and near, with military music, with municipal officers in tricolor sashes, towards and along the Rhone stream, to the little town of Etoile. There with ceremonial evolution and maneuver, with fanfarinating, musketry salvos, and what else the patriot genius could devise, they made oath and obtestation to stand faithfully by one another, under law and king. In particular, to have all manner of grains, while grains there were, freely circulated, in spite both of robber and regrader. This was the meeting of Etoile, in the mild end of November 1789. But now, if a mere empty review, followed by review dinner, ball, and such gesticulation and flirtation as there may be, interests the happy county town, and makes it the envy of surrounding county towns, how much more might this? In a fortnight, larger Montelemart, half ashamed of itself, 
will do as good, and better. On the plain of Montelemart, or what is equally sonorous, under the walls of Montelemart, the 13th of December sees new gathering in obtestation. Six thousand strong, and now indeed, with these three remarkable improvements, as unanimously resolved on there. First that the men of Montelemart do federate with the already federated men of Itoil. Second, that, implying not expressing the circulation of grain, they swear in the face of God and their country, with much more emphasis and comprehensiveness, to obey all decrees of the National Assembly, and see them obeyed, till death. Jusque la mort. Third, and most important, that official record of all this be solemnly delivered into the National Assembly, to M. de Lafayette, and to the restorer of French liberty, who shall all take what comfort from it they can. Thus does larger Montelemart vindicate its patriot importance, and maintain its rank in the municipal scale. And so, with the new year, the signal is hoisted. For is not a national assembly, and solemn deliverance there, at lowest a national telegraph? Not only grain shall circulate, while there is grain, on highways or the Rhone waters, over all that southeastern region, where also if Monsignor d'Artois saw good to break in from Turin, hot welcome might wait him. But whatsoever province of France is straitened for grain, or vexed with a mutinous parliament, unconstitutional plotters, monarchic clubs, or any other patriot ailment, can go and do likewise, or even do better. And now, especially, when the February swearing has set them all agog. From Brittany to Burgundy, on most plains of France, under most city walls, it is a blaring of trumpets, waving of banners, a constitutional maneuvering, under the vernal skies, while nature too is putting forth her green hopes. Under bright sunshine defaced by the stormful east. Like patriotism victorious, though with difficulty, over aristocracy and defect of grain. Their march and constitutionally wheel, to the CAIRNG mood of fife and drum, under their tricolor municipals, are clear gleaming phalanxes. Or halt, with uplifted right hand, and artillery salvos that imitate Jove's thunder, and all the country, and metaphorically all, the universe, is looking on. Holy, in their best apparel, brave men, and beautifully dies and women, most of whom have lovers there, swearing, by the eternal heavens and this green-growing all-nutritive earth, that France is free. Sweetest days, when, astonishing to say, mortals have actually met together in communion and fellowship, and man, were it only once through long despicable centuries, is for moments verily the brother of man. And then the deputations to the National Assembly, with high-flown descriptive harangue, to M. de Lafayette, and the Restorer, very frequently moreover to the mother of patriotism sitting on her stout benches in that hall of the Jacobins. The general year is filled with federation. New names of patriots emerge, which shall one day become familiar, Boyer von Fried eloquent denunciator of a rebellious Bordeaux parliament, Max Isnard eloquent reporter of the Federation of Dragignan. Eloquent pair, separated by the whole breadth of France, who are nevertheless to meet. Ever wider burns the flame of federation, ever wider and also brighter. Thus the Brittany and Anjou brethren mention a fraternity of all true Frenchmen. And go the length of invoking, perdition and death, on any renegade, moreover, if in their national assembly harangue, they glance plaintively at the Marc d'Argent which makes so many citizens passive, they, over in the mother society, ask. Being henceforth themselves, neither Bretons nor Angevins but French, why all France has not one federation, and universal oath of brotherhood, once for all. A most pertinent suggestion, dating from the end of March. Which pertinent suggestion the whole patriot world cannot but catch, and reverberate and agitate till it become loud. Which, in that case, the town hall municipals had better take up, and meditate. Some universal federation seems inevitable, the where is given, clearly Paris, only the when, the how. These also productive time will give, is already giving. For always as the federative work goes on, it perfects itself, and patriot genius adds contribution after contribution. Thus, at Lyons, in the end of the May month, we behold as many as fifty, or some say sixty thousand, met to federate. And a multitude looking on, which it would be difficult to number. From dawn to dusk. 
For our lion's guardsmen took rank, at five in the bright dewy morning. Came pouring in, bright gleaming, to the Quai de Rhone, to march thence to the Federation field, amid wavings of hats and lady handkerchiefs, glad shoutings of some two hundred thousand patriot voices and hearts, the beautiful and brave. Among whom, courting no notice, and yet the notablest of all, what queen-like figure is this, with her escort of house friends and champagniacs the patriot editor, come abroad with the earliest. Radiant with enthusiasm are those dark eyes, is that strong Minerva face, looking dignity and earnest joy, joyfulest she where all are joyful. It is Roland de la Plotrière's wife. Strict elderly Roland, king's inspector of manufactures here. And now likewise, by popular choice, the strictest of our new lion's municipals, a man who has gained much, if worth and faculty be gain, but above all things, has gained to wife Flippon the Paris engraver's daughter. Reader, mark that queen-like burger woman, beautiful, Amazonian graceful to the eye, more so to the mind. Unconscious of her worth, as all worth is, of her greatness, of her crystal clearness. Genuine, the creature of sincerity in nature, in an age of artificiality, pollution and cant, there, in her still completeness, in her still invincibility, she, if thou knew it, is the noblest of all living French women, and will be seen, one day. O oh, blessed rather while unseen, even of herself. For the present she gazes, nothing doubting, into this grand theatricality, and thinks her young dreams are to be fulfilled. From dawn to dusk, as we said, it lasts, and truly a sight like few. Flourishes of drums and trumpets are something, but think of an artificial rock fifty feet high, all cut into crag steps, not without the similitude of shrubs. The interior cavity, for in sooth it is made of deal, stands solemn, a temple of concord on the outer summit rises, a statue of liberty, colossal, seen for miles, with her pike and Phrygian cap, and civic column. At her feet a country's altar, autel de la Patterie, on all which neither deal timber nor lath and plaster, with paint of various colors, have been spared. But fancy then the banners all placed on the steps of the rock, high mass chaunted. And the civic oath of fifty thousand, with what volcanic outburst of sound from iron and other throats, enough to frighten back the very sown and roan, and how the brightest fireworks, and balls, and even repasts closed in that night of the gods. And so the Lion's Federation vanishes too, swallowed of darkness, and yet not wholly, for our brave fair Roland was there, also she, though in the deepest privacy, writes her narrative of it in Champagniac's Courier de Lions. A piece which circulates to the extent of sixty thousand, which one would like now to read. But on the whole, Paris, we may see, will have little to devise, will only have to borrow and apply. And then as to the day, what day of all the calendar is fit, if the Bastille anniversary be not? The particular spot too, it is easy to see, must be the Champ de Mars. Where many a Julian the apostate has been lifted on bucklers, to France's or the world's sovereignty, and iron franks, loud clanging, have responded to the voice of a Charlemagne, and from of old mere sublimities have been familiar. Chapter 2.1 9. Symbolic how natural, in all decisive circumstances, is symbolic representation to all kinds of men. Nay, what is man's whole terrestrial life but a symbolic representation, and making visible, of the celestial invisible force that is in him. By act and word he strives to do it, with sincerity, if possible. Failing that, with theatricality, which latter also may have its meaning. An Almax masquerade is not nothing. In more genial ages, your Christmas guisings, feasts of the ass, abbots of unreason, were a considerable something, since sport they were, as Almax may still be sincere wish for sport. But what, on the other hand, must not sincere earnest have been, say, a Hebrew feast of tabernacles have been? A whole nation gathered, in the name of the highest, under the eye of the highest, imagination herself flagging under the reality. An all noblest ceremony as yet not grown ceremonial, but solemn, significant to the outmost fringe. Neither, in modern private life, 
are theatrical scenes, of tearful women wedding whole elves of Cambric in concert, of impassioned bushy-whiskered youth threatening suicide, and such like. To be so entirely detested, drop thou a tear over them thyself rather. At any rate, one can remark that no nation will throw by its work, and deliberately go out to make a scene, without meaning something thereby. For indeed no scenic individual, with knavish hypocritical views, will take the trouble to soliloquize the scene, and now consider, is not a scenic nation placed precisely in that predicament of soliloquizing, for its own behoof alone. To solace its own sensibilities, maudlin or other, yet in this respect, of readiness for scenes, the difference of nations, as of men, is very great. If our Saxon Puritanic friends, for example, swore and signed their national covenant, without discharge of gunpowder, or the beating of any drum, in a dingy covenant close of the Edinburgh High Street, in a mean room. Where men now drink mean liquor, it was consistent with their ways so to swear it. Our Gallic encyclopedic friends, again, must have a champ to Mars, scene of all the world, or universe. And such a scenic exhibition, to which the Colosseum Amphitheatre was but a stroller's barn, as this old globe of ours had never or hardly ever beheld. Which method also we reckon natural, then and there. Nor perhaps was the respective keeping of these two oaths far out of due proportion to such respective display in taking them, inverse proportion, namely. For the theatricality of a people goes in a compound ratio, ratio indeed of their trustfulness, sociability, fervency, but then also of their excitability, of their porosity, not continent. Or say, of their explosiveness, hot flashing, but which does not last. How true also, once more, is it that no man or nation of men, conscious of doing a great thing, was ever, in that thing, doing other than a small one. O Champtomar's Federation, with three hundred drummers, twelve hundred wind musicians, and artillery planted on height after height to boom the tidings of it all over France, in few minutes. Could no atheist nation contrive to discern, eighteen centuries off, those thirteen most poor mean-dressed men, at frugal supper, in a mean Jewish dwelling, with no symbol but hearts God initiated into the divine depth of sorrow. And they do this in remembrance of me. And so cease that small difficult crowing of his, if he were not doomed to it. Chapter 2.1.x Mankind Pardonable are human theatricalities, nay perhaps touching, like the passionate utterance of a tongue which with sincerity stammers. Of a head which with insincerity babbles, having gone distracted. Yet, in comparison with unpremeditated outbursts of nature, such as an insurrection of women, how foisonless, unedifying, undelightful. Like small ale palled, like an effervescence that has effervesced. Such scenes, coming of forethought, were they world great, and never so cunningly devised, are at bottom mainly pasteboard and paint. But the others are original. Emitted from the great ever-living heart of nature herself, what figure they will assume is unspeakably significant. To us, therefore, let the French National Solemn League, and Federation, be the highest recorded triumph of the thespian art. Triumphant surely, since the whole pit, which was of twenty-five millions, not only claps hands, but does itself spring on the boards and passionately set to playing there. And being such, be it treated as such, with sincere cursory admiration. With wonder from afar. A whole nation gone mumming deserves so much, but deserves not that loving minuteness a monadic insurrection did. Much more let prior, and as it were, rehearsal scenes of federation come and go, henceforward, as they list. And, on plains and under city walls, innumerable regimental bands blare off into the inane, without note from us. One scene, however, the hastiest reader will momentarily pause on, that of Anacharsis Klutz and the collective sinful posterity of Adam. For a patriot municipality has now, on the 4th of June, got its plan concocted, and got it sanctioned by National Assembly, a patriot king assenting. To whom, were he even free to dissent, federative harangues, overflowing with loyalty, have doubtless a transient sweetness. There shall come deputed National Guards, so many in the hundred, from each of the eighty-three departments of France. 
Likewise from all naval and military king's forces, shall deputed quotas come, such federation of national with royal soldier has, taking place spontaneously, been already seen and sanctioned. For the rest, it is hoped, as many as forty thousand may arrive, expenses to be borne by the deputing district, of all which let district and department take thought, and elect fit men, whom the Paris brethren will fly to meet and welcome. Now, therefore, judge if our patriot artists are busy, taking deep counsel how to make the scene worthy of a look from the universe. As many as fifteen thousand men, spade men, barrow men, stone builders, rammers, with their engineers, are at work on the Champ de Mars, hollowing it out into a natural amphitheater, fit for such solemnity. For one may hope it will be annual and perennial, a feast of pikes, fate to peaks, notablest among the high tides of the year, in any case ought not a scenic free nation to have some permanent national amphitheater. The Champ de Mars is getting hollowed out, and the daily talk and the nightly dream in most Parisian heads is of federation, and that only. Federate deputies are already under way. National Assembly, what with its natural work, what with hearing and answering harangues of federates, of this federation, will have enough to do. Harangue of, American Committee, among whom is that faint figure of Paul Jones, as with the stars dim twinkling through it, come to congratulate us on the prospect of such auspicious day. Harangue of Bastille conquerors, come to, renounce any special recompense, any peculiar place at the solemnity, since the center grenadiers rather grumble. Harangue of, tennis court club, who enter with far gleaming brassplate, aloft on a pole, and the tennis court oath engraved thereon. Which far gleaming brassplate they purpose to affix solemnly in the Versailles original locality, on the twentieth of this month, which is the anniversary, as a deathless memorial, for some years, they will then dine, as they come back. In the Bois de Boulogne. Cannot, however, do it without apprising the world. To such things does the August National Assembly ever and anon cheerfully listen, suspending its regenerative labors, and with some touch of impromptu eloquence, make friendly reply. As indeed the wont has long been, for it is a gesticulating, sympathetic people, and has a heart, and wears it on its sleeve. In which circumstances, it occurred to the mind of Anacharsis Klutz that while so much was embodying itself into club or committee, and perorating applauded, there yet remained a greater and greatest. Of which, if it also took body and perorated, what might not the effect be, humankind namely, le genre humine itself? In what rapt creative moment the thought rose in Anacharsis's soul? All his throes, while he went about giving shape and birth to it, how he was sneered at by cold worldlings, but did sneer again, being a man of polished sarcasm. And moved to and fro persuasive in coffeehouse and soiree, and dived down assiduous obscure in the great deep of Paris, making his thought a fact, of all this the spiritual biographies of that period say nothing. Enough that on the nineteenth evening of June 1790, the sun's slant rays lighted a spectacle such as our foolish little planet has not often had to show, Anacharsis Klutz entering the august Salle de Manege, with the human species at his heels. Swedes, Spaniards, Polacks, Turks, Chaldeans, Greeks, dwellers in Mesopotamia, behold them all, they have come to claim place in the Grand Federation, having an undoubted interest in it. Our ambassador titles, said the fervid Klutz, are not written on parchment, but on the living hearts of all men. These whiskered Polacks, long-flowing turbaned Ishmaelites, astrological Chaldeans, who stand so mute here, let them plead with you, August Senators, more eloquently than eloquence could. They are the mute representatives of their tongue-tied, befettered, heavy-laden nations. Who from out of that dark bewilderment gaze wistful, amazed, with half-incredulous hope, towards you, and this your bright light of a French federation, bright particular day star, the herald of universal day. We claim to stand there, as mute monuments, pathetically adumbrative of much dot, from bench and gallery comes, repeated applause, for what august senator but is flattered even by the very shadow of human species depending on him. From President Size, who presides this remarkable fortnight, in spite of his small voice, there comes eloquent though shrill reply. Anacharsis and the Foreigners Committee shall have place at the Federation. On condition of telling their respective peoples what they see there. 
In the meantime, we invite them to the honors of the sitting, honneur de la séance. A long flowing Turk, for rejoinder, bows with Eastern solemnity, and utters articulate sounds, but owing to his imperfect knowledge of the French dialect, his words are like spilt water, the thought he had in him remains conjectural to this day. Anacarsis and mankind accept the honors of the sitting, and have forthwith, as the old newspapers still testify, the satisfaction to see several things. First and chief, on the motion of Lameth, Lafayette, Saint Fargeau, and other patriot nobles, let the others repugn as they will, all titles of nobility, from duke to esquire, or lower, are henceforth abolished. Then, in like manner, livery servants, or rather the livery of servants. Neither, for the future, shall any man or woman, self styled noble, be incensed, foolishly fumigated with incense, in church, as the wont has been. In a word, feudalism being dead these ten months, why should her empty trappings and scutcheons survive? The very coats of arms will require to be obliterated. And yet Cassandra Marat on this and the other coach panel notices that they are but painted over, and threaten to peer through again. So that henceforth de Lafayette is but the Sieur Motier, and Saint Fargeau is plain Michel Le Pelletier. And Mirabeau soon after has to say huffingly, with your Ricchetti you have set Europe at cross purposes for three days. For his counthood is not indifferent to this man, which indeed the admiring people treat him with to the last. But let extreme patriotism rejoice, and chiefly anacarsis and mankind, for now it seems to be taken for granted that one Adam is father of us all. Such was, in historical accuracy, the famed feat of anacarsis. Thus did the most extensive of public bodies find a sort of spokesman. Whereby at least we may judge of one thing, what a humor the once sniffing mocking city of Paris and Baron Klutz had got into. When such exhibition could appear a propriety, next door to a sublimity. It is true, envy did in after times, pervert this success of Anacarsis. Making him, from incidental, speaker of the Foreign Nations Committee, claim to be official permanent, speaker, orator, of the human species, which he only deserved to be. And alleging, calumniously, that his astrological Chaldeans, and the rest, were a mere French tag rag and bobtail disguised for the nonce, and, in short, sneering and fleering at him in her cold barren way. All which, however, he, the man he was, could receive on thick enough panoply, or even rebound therefrom, and also go his way most extensive of public bodies, we may call it. And also the most unexpected, for who could have thought to see all nations in the Tillery's riding hall? But so it is, and truly as strange things may happen when a whole people goes mumming and miming. Hast not thou thyself perchance seen diademed Cleopatra, daughter of the Ptolemies, pleading, almost with bended knee, in unheroic tea parlor, or dimlit retail shop, to inflexible gross Berghal dignitary, for leave to reign and die. Being dressed for it, and moneyless, with small children, while suddenly constables have shut the thespian barn, and her Antony pleaded in vain. Such visual spectra flit across this earth, if the thespian stage be rudely interfered with, but much more, when, as was said, Pitt jumps on stage, then is it verily, as in her teak's drama, a verkert welt, of world topsy-turvied. Having seen the human species itself, to have seen the dean of the human species, ceased now to be a miracle. Such, doyen du genre Hamine, eldest of men, had shown himself there, in these weeks, Jean-Claude Jacob, a born serf, deputed from his native Jura Mountains to thank the National Assembly for enfranchising them. On his bleached worn face are ploughed the furrowings of one hundred and twenty years. He has heard dim Papua talk, of immortal grand monarch victories, of a burnt palatinate, as he toiled and moiled to make a little speck of this earth greener. Of Savennes dragoonings, of Marlborough going to the war. For generations have bloomed out, and loved and hated, and rustled off, he was forty-six when Louis XIV died. The assembly, as one man, spontaneously rose, and did reverence to the eldest of the world, old Jean is to take seance among them, honorably, with covered head. He gazes feebly there, with his old eyes, on that new wonder scene. Dreamlike to him, and uncertain, wavering amid fragments of old memories and dreams. 
For time is all growing unsubstantial, dreamlike, Jean's eyes and mind are weary, and about to close, and open on a far other wonder scene, which shall be real. Patriot subscription, royal pension was got for him, and he returned home glad, but in two months more he left it all, and went on his unknown way. Chapter 2.1.11 As in the Age of Gold Meanwhile to Paris, ever going and returning, day after day, and all day long, towards that field of Mars, it becomes painfully apparent that the spadework there cannot be got done in time. There is such an area of it. 300,000 square feet, for from the Ecole Militaire, which will need to be done up in wood with balconies and galleries, westward to the gate by the river, where also shall be wood, in triumphal arches. We count same thousand yards of length. And for breadth, from this umbrageous avenue of eight rows, on the south side, to that corresponding one on the north, some thousand feet, more or less. All this to be scooped out, and wheeled up in slope along the sides, high enough. For it must be rammed down there, and shaped stairwise into as many as thirty ranges of convenient seats, firm trimmed with turf, covered with enduring timber. And then our huge pyramidal fatherland's altar, Autel de la Patterie, in the center, also to be raised and stair-stepped. Force work with a vengeance, it is a world's amphitheater. There are but fifteen days good. And at this languid rate, it might take half as many weeks. What is singular too, the spade men seem to work lazily, they will not work double tides, even for offer of more wages, though their tide is but seven hours. They declare angrily that the human tabernacle requires occasional rest. Is it aristocrats secretly bribing? Aristocrats were capable of that. Only six months since, did not evidence get afloat that subterranean Paris, for we stand over quarries and catacombs, dangerously, as it were midway between heaven and the abyss, and our hollow underground, was charged with gunpowder. Which should make us, leap. Till a cordelier's deputation actually went to examine, and found it, carried off again. An accursed, incurable brood, all asking for, passports, in these sacred days. Trouble, of rioting, chateau burning, is in the Limousin and elsewhere. For they are busy. Between the best of peoples and the best of restorer kings, they would sow grudges, with what a fiend's grin would they see this federation, looked for by the universe, fail. Fail for want of spade work, however, it shall not. He that has four limbs, and a French heart, can do spade work, and will. On the first July Monday, scarcely has the signal cannon boomed. Scarcely have the languescent mercenary fifteen thousand laid down their tools, and the eyes of onlookers turn sorrowfully of the still high sun. When this and the other patriot, fire in his eye, snatches barrow and mattock, and himself begins indignantly wheeling. Whom scores and then hundreds follow, and soon a volunteer fifteen thousand are shoveling and trundling. With the heart of giants, and all in right order, with that extemporaneous adroitness of theirs, whereby such a lift has been given, worth three mercenary ones. Which may end when the late twilight thickens, in triumph shouts, heard or heard of beyond Montmartre. A sympathetic population will wait, next day, with eagerness, till the tools are free. Or why wait? Spades elsewhere exist. And so now bursts forth that effulgence of Parisian enthusiasm, good-heartedness and brotherly love, such, if chroniclers are trustworthy, as was not witnessed since the age of gold. Paris, male and female, precipitates itself towards its southwest extremity, spade on shoulder. Streams of men, without order, or in order, as ranked fellow craftsmen, as natural or accidental reunions, march towards the field of Mars. Three deep these march, to the sound of string music, preceded by young girls with green boughs, and tricolor streamers, they have shouldered, soldier-wise, their shovels and picks, and with one throat are singing C-A-I-R-A. -A. Yes, pardieu C-A-I-R-A, -A, cry the passengers on the streets. All corporate guilds, and public and private bodies of citizens, from the highest to the lowest, march, the very hawkers, one finds, have ceased bawling for one day. The neighboring villages turn out, their able men come marching, to village fiddle or tambourine and triangle, 
under their mayor, or mayor and curate, who also walk bespaded, and in tricolor sash. As many as 150,000 workers, nay at certain seasons, as some count, 250,000, for, in the afternoon especially, what mortal but, finishing his hasty day's work, would run. A stirring city, from the time you reach the place Louis Quinn's, southward over the river, by all avenues, it is one living throng. So many workers. And no mercenary mock workers, but real ones that lie freely to it, each patriot stretches himself against the stubborn glebe, hues and wheels with the whole weight that is in him. Amiable infants, amables and fans. They do the police de l'atelier, too, the guidance and governance, themselves, with that ready will of theirs, with that extemporaneous adroitness. It is a true brethren's work, all distinctions confounded, abolished. As it was in the beginning, when Adam himself delved. Long-frocked tonsured monks, with short-skirted water carriers, with swallow-tailed well-frizzled incroyables of a patriot turn, dark charcoal men, meal-white peruke makers. Or peruke wearers, for advocate and judge are there, and all heads of districts, sober nuns sister-like with flaunting nymphs of the opera, and females in common circumstances named unfortunate, the patriot ragpicker. And perfumed dweller in palaces. For patriotism like new birth, and also like death, levels all. The printers have come marching, Prudhomme's all in paper caps with revolutions to Paris printed on them, as Camille notes. Wishing that in these great days there should be a pacte de écrivains too, or federation of able editors. Beautiful to see. The snowy linen and delicate pantaloon alternates with the soiled check shirt and bushel breeches. For both have cast their coats, and under both are four limbs and a set of patriot muscles. There do they pick and shovel, or bend forward, yoked in long strings to box barrel or overloaded tumbrel, joyous, with one mind. Abbe size is seen pulling, wiry, vehement, if too light for draught, by the side of Beauharnais, who shall get kings though he be none. Abbe Mori did not pull, but the charcoal men brought a mummer guise like him, so he had to pull in effigy. Let no August senator disdain the work, Mayor Bailey, Generalissimo Lafayette are there, and, alas, shall be there again another day. The king himself comes to see, sky-rending vive Leroy. And suddenly with shouldered spades they form a guard of honor round him. Whosoever can come comes, to work, or to look, and bless the work. Whole families have come. One whole family we see clearly, of three generations, the father picking, the mother shoveling, the young ones wheeling assiduous, old grandfather, hoary with ninety-three years, holds in his arms the youngest of all, frisky, not helpful this one. Who nevertheless may tell it to his grandchildren, and how the future and the past alike looked on, and with failing or with half-formed voice, faltered their CAIRA. A vintner has wheeled in, on patriot truck, beverage of wine, drink not, my brothers, if ye are not dry, that your cask may last the longer, neither did any drink, but men, evidently exhausted. A dapper abbe looks on, sneering. To the barrow. Cry several, whom he, lest a worse thing befall him, obeys, nevertheless one wiser patriot barrowman, arriving now, interposes his, heretes, setting down his own barrow, he snatches the abbe's, trundles it fast, like an infected thing. Fourth of the Champdemar's circuit, and discharges it there. Thus to a certain person, of some quality, or private capital, to appearance, entering hastily, flings down his coat, waistcoat and two watches, and is rushing to the thick of the work, but your watches, cries the general voice. Does one distrust his brothers, answers he, nor were the watches stolen. How beautiful is noble sentiment, like gossamer gauze, beautiful and cheap, which will stand no tear and wear. Beautiful cheap gossamer gauze, thou film shadow of a raw material of virtue, which art not woven, nor likely to be, into duty, thou art better than nothing, and also worse. Young boarding school boys, college students, shout vive la nation, and regret that they have yet, only their sweat to give. What say we of boys? Beautifulest hebes. The loveliest of Paris, in their light air robes, with ribbon girdle of tricolor, are there, 
shoveling and wheeling with the rest. Their hebe eyes brighter with enthusiasm, and long hair in beautiful dishevelment, hard pressed are their small fingers. But they make the patriot barrow go, and even force it to the summit of the slope, with a little tracing, which what man's arm were not too happy to lend. Then bound down with it again, and go for more. With their long locks and tricolors blown back, graceful as the rosy hours. Oh, as that evening sun fell over the Champtomars, and tinted with fire the thick umbrageous boscage that shelters it on this hand and on that, and struck direct on those domes and two and forty windows of the Ecole Militaire. And made them all of burnished gold, saw he on his wide zodiac road other such sight. A living garden spotted and dotted with such flowerage, all colors of the prism, the beautifulest blent friendly with the usefulest, all growing and working brotherlike there, under one warm feeling, were it but for days, once and no second time. But night is sinking, these nights too, into eternity. The hastiest traveller Versailles ward has drawn bridle on the heights of Chalet, and looked for moments over the river, reporting at Versailles what he saw, not without tears. Meanwhile, from all points of the compass, federates are arriving, fervid children of the South, who glory in their Mirabeau, considerate north-blooded mountaineers of Jura, sharp Bretons, with their Gaelic suddenness. Normans not to be overreached in bargain, all now animated with one noblest fire of patriotism. Whom the Paris brethren march forth to receive, with military solemnities, with fraternal embracing, and a hospitality worthy of the heroic ages. They assist at the assembly's debates, these federates, the galleries are reserved for them. They assist in the toils of the Champtomars, each new troop will put its hand to the spade, lift a hod of earth on the altar of the fatherland. But the flourishes of rhetoric, for it is a gesticulating people, the moral sublime of those addresses to an august assembly, to a patriot restorer. Our Breton captain of federates kneels even, in a fit of enthusiasm, and gives up his sword. He wet eyed to a king wet eyed. Poor Louis. These, as he said afterwards, were among the bright days of his life. Reviews also there must be. Royal Federate reviews, with king, queen, and tricolor court looking on, at lowest, if, as is too common, it rains, our Federate volunteers will file through the inner gateways, royalty standing dry. Nay, there, should some stop occur, the beautifulest fingers in France may take you softly by the lapel, and, in mild flute voice, ask, Monsieur, of what province are you? Happy he who can reply, chivalrously lowering his sword's point, Madam, from the province your ancestors reigned over. He that happy, provincial advocate, now provincial federate, shall be rewarded by a sun smile, and such melodious glad words addressed to a king, Sire, these are your faithful Lorrainers. Cheerier verily, in these holidays, is this, sky-blue faced with red, of a national guardsman, than the dull black and grey of a provincial advocate, which in workdays one was used to. For the same thrice-blessed Lorena shall, this evening, stand sentry at a queen's door, and feel that he could die a thousand deaths for her, then again, at the outer gate, and even a third time, she shall see him, nay he will make her do it. Presenting arms with emphasis, making his musket jingle again, and in her salute there shall again be a sun smile, and that little blonde locked too hasty dauphin shall be admonished, salute then, monsieur, don't be unpolite. And therewith she, like a bright sky wanderer or planet with her little moon, issues forth peculiar. But at night, when patriot spade work is over, figure the sacred rites of hospitality. Le Pelletier Saint Fargeau, a mere private senator, but with great possessions, has daily his hundred dinner guests, the table of Generalissimo Lafayette may double that number. In lowly parlor, as in lofty saloon, the wine cup passes round. Crowned by the smiles of beauty, be it of lightly tripping grisette, or of high sailing dame, for both equally have beauty, and smiles precious to the brave. Chapter 2.1.12 Sound and Smoke and so now, in spite of plotting aristocrats, lazy hired spade men, and almost of destiny itself, for there has been much rain, the champ de Mars, on the thirteenth of the month is fairly ready, trimmed, rammed, buttressed with firm masonry. And patriotism can stroll over it admiring, and as it were rehearsing, 
for in every head is some unutterable image of the morrow. Pray heaven there be not clouds. Nay what far worse cloud is this, of a misguided municipality that talks of admitting patriotism, to the solemnity, by tickets. Was it by tickets we were admitted to the work, and to what brought the work? Did we take the Bastille by tickets? A misguided municipality sees the error, at late midnight, rolling drums announce to patriotism starting half out of its bedclothes, that it is to be ticketless. Pull down thy nightcap therefore. And, with demi-articulate grumble, significant of several things, go pacified to sleep again. Tomorrow is Wednesday morning, unforgettable among the fast eye of the world. The morning comes, cold for a July one. But such a festivity would make Greenland smile. Through every inlet of that national amphitheatre, for it is a league in circuit, cut with openings at due intervals, floods in the living throng, covers without tumult space after space. The Ecole Militaire has galleries and overvaulting canopies, where carpentry and painting have vied, for the upper authorities, triumphal arches, at the gate by the river, bear inscriptions, if weak, yet well meant, and orthodox. Far aloft, over the altar of the fatherland, on their tall crane standards of iron, swing pensile are antique castellets or pans of incense, dispensing sweet incense fumes, unless for the heathen mythology, one sees not for whom. Two hundred thousand patriotic men, and, twice as good, one hundred thousand patriotic women, all decked and glorified as one can fancy, sit waiting in this Champ de Mars. What a picture, that circle of bright-eyed life, spread up there, on its thirty-seated slope, leaning, one would say, on the thick umbrage of those avenue trees, for the stems of them are hidden by the height. And all beyond it mere greenness of summer earth, with the gleams of waters, or white sparklings of stone edifices, little circular enamel picture in the center of such a vase, of emerald. A vase not empty, the invalid's cupolas want not their population, nor the distant windmills of Montmartre, on remotest steeple and invisible village belfry, stand men with spyglasses. On the heights of Chalet are many colored undulating groups. Round and far on, over all the circling heights that embosom Paris, it is as one more or less peopled amphitheater, which the eye grows dim with measuring. Nay heights, as was before hinted, have cannon. And a floating battery of cannon is on the Seine. When I fails, ear shall serve, and all France properly is but one amphitheater, for in paved town and unpaved hamlet, men walk listening. Till the muffled thunder sound audible on their horizon, that they too may begin swearing and firing. But now, to streams of music, come federates enough, for they have assembled on the boulevard Saint Antoine or thereby, and come marching through the city, with their eighty-three department banners, and blessings not loud but deep. Comes National Assembly, and take seat under its canopy, comes royalty, and take seat on a throne beside it. And Lafayette, on white charger, is here, and all the civic functionaries. And the federates form dances, till their strictly military evolutions and maneuvers can begin. Evolutions and maneuvers. Task not the pen of mortal to describe them, truant imagination droops, declares that it is not worth while. There is wheeling and sweeping, to slow, to quick, and double quick time, Sieur Motier, or Generalissimo Lafayette, for they are one and the same, and he is General of France, in the King's stead, for four and twenty hours. Sieur Motier must step forth, with that sublime chivalrous gait of his, solemnly ascend the steps of the Fatherland's altar, in sight of heaven and of the scarcely breathing earth. And, under the creak of those swinging castellets, pressing his sword's point firmly there, pronounce the oath, to king, to law, and nation, not to mention, grains, with their circulating, in his own name and that of armed France. Whereat there is waving of banners and a claim sufficient. The National Assembly must swear, standing in its place, the king himself audibly. The king swears, and now be the welkin split with vivats. Let citizens enfranchised embrace, each smiting heartily his palm into his fellows, and armed federates clang their arms, above all, that floating battery speak. It has spoken, to the four corners of France. From eminence to eminence, bursts the thunder, faint heard, loud repeated. What a stone, cast into what a lake, 
in circles that do not grow fainter. From Arras to Avignon, from Metz to Bayonne. Over Orleans and Blois it rolls, in canon recitative. Puy bellows of it amid his granite mountains, how where is the shell cradle of great Henri? At far Marseilles, one can think, the ruddy evening witnesses it. Over the deep blue Mediterranean waters, the castle of if ruddy tinted darts forth, from every cannon's mouth, its tongue of fire, and all the people shout, Yes, France is free. O oh, glorious France that has burst out so! Into universal sound and smoke, and attained, the Phrygian cap of liberty. In all towns, trees of liberty also may be planted, with or without advantage. Said we not, it is the highest stretch attained by the thespian art on this planet, or perhaps attainable. The thespian art, unfortunately, one must still call it. For behold there, on this field of Mars, the national banners, before there could be any swearing, were to be all blessed. A most proper operation. Since surely without heaven's blessing bestowed, say even, audibly or inaudibly sought, no earthly banner or contrivance can prove victorious, but now the means of doing it. By what thrice divine Franklin Thunderrod shall miraculous fire be drawn out of heaven, and descend gently, life-giving, with health to the souls of men? Alas, by the simplest, by two hundred shaven-crowned individuals, in snow-white albs, with tricolor girdles, arranged on the steps of Fatherland's altar, and, at their head for spokesman, souls overseer Talleyrand Perigord. These shall act as miraculous thunder-rod, to such length as they can. O ye deep azure heavens, and thou green all-nursing earth, ye streams ever-flowing, deciduous forests that die and are born again, continually, like the sons of men. Stone mountains that die daily with every rain-shower, yet are not dead and leveled for ages of ages, nor born again, it seems, but with new world explosions, and such tumultuous seething and tumbling, steam halfway to the moon. O thou unfathomable mystic all, garment and dwelling place of the unnamed! O spirit, lastly, of man, who moldest and modellest that unfathomable unnameable even as we see, is not there a miracle, that some French mortal should, we say not have believed? but pretended to imagine that he believed that Talleyrand and two hundred pieces of white calico could do it. Here, however, we are to remark with the sorrowing historians of that day, that suddenly, while Episcopus Talleyrand, long stoled, with mitre and tricolor belt, was yet but hitching up the altar steps, to do his miracle. The material heaven grew black. A north wind, moaning cold moisture, began to sing, and there descended a very deluge of rain. Sad to see. The thirty stared seats, all round our amphitheatre, get instantaneously slated with mere umbrellas, fallacious when so thick set, our antique castellets become waterpots, their incense smoke gone hissing, in a whiff of muddy vapour. Alas, instead of vivats, there is nothing now but the furious peppering and rattling. From three to four hundred thousand human individuals feel that they have a skin, happily impervious. The general's sash runs water, how all military banners droop, and will not wave, but lazily flap, as if metamorphosed into painted tin banners. Worse, far worse, these hundred thousand, such is the historian's testimony, of the fairest of France. Their snowy muslins all splashed and draggled, the ostrich feather shrunk shamefully to the backbone of a feather, all caps are ruined. Innermost pasteboard molten into its original pap, Beauty no longer swims decorated in her garniture, like love goddess hidden revealed in her Paphian clouds, but struggles in disastrous imprisonment in it, for, the shape was noticeable. And now only sympathetic interjections, titterings, teehings, and resolute good humor will avail. A deluge, an incessant sheet or fluid column of rain, such that our overseer's very mitre must be filled. Not a mitre, but a filled and leaky fire bucket on his reverend head, Regardless of which, overseer Talleyrand performs his miracle, the blessing of Talleyrand, another than that of Jacob, is on all the eighty-three departmental flags of France. Which wave or flap, with such thankfulness as needs. Towards three o'clock, the sun beams out again, the remaining evolutions can be transacted under bright heavens, though with decorations much damaged. On Wednesday our federation is consummated, 
but the festivities last out the week, and over into the next. Festivities such as no Baghdad Caliph, or Aladdin with the lamp, could have equaled. There is a jousting on the river. With its water somersets, splashing in Hahayanji, ji, Abe Fawchet, Te Deum Fawchet, preaches, for his part, in, the Rotunda of the Corn Market, a harangue on Franklin, for whom the National Assembly has lately gone three days in black. The motier and lapelladier tables still groan with viands, roofs ringing with patriotic toasts. On the fifth evening, which is the Christian Sabbath, there is a universal ball. Paris, out of doors and in, man, woman and child, is jigging it, to the sound of harp and four-stringed fiddle. The hoariest-headed man will tread one other measure, under this nether moon. Speechless nurslings, infants as we call them, new pi iota alpha tau kappa nu alpha, crow in arms, and sprawl out num plump little limbs, impatient for muscularity, they know not why. The stiffest bulk bends more or less, all joists creak. Or out, on the earth's breast itself, behold the ruins of the Bastille. All lamplit, allegorically decorated, a tree of liberty sixty feet high, and Phrygian cap on it, of size enormous, under which King Arthur and his round table might have dined. In the depths of the background, is a single lugubrious lamp, rendering dim visible one of your iron cages, half buried, and some prison stones, tyranny vanishing downwards, all gone but the skirt the rest holy lamp festoons. Trees real or of pasteboard. In the similitude of a fairy grove, with this inscription, readable to runner, I see Elon dance, dancing here. As indeed had been obscurely foreshadowed by Cagliostro prophetic quack of quacks, when he, four years ago, quitted the grim durance. To fall into a grimmer, of the Roman Inquisition, and not quit it. But, after all, what is this Bastille business to that of the Champs Elysees? Thither, to these fields well named Elysian, all feet tend. It is radiant as day with festooned lamps. Little oil cups, like variegated fireflies, daintily illumine the highest leaves, trees there are all sheeted with variegated fire, shedding far a glimmer into the dubious wood. There, under the free sky, do tight limbed federates, with fairest newfound sweethearts, elastic as Diana, and not of that coyness and tart humor of Diana, thread their jocund mazes, all through the ambrosial night. And hearts were touched and fired, and seldom surely had our old planet, in that huge conic shadow of hers, which goes beyond the moon, and is named night, curtained such a ballroom. Oh, if, according to Seneca, the very gods look down on a good man struggling with adversity, and smile, what must they think of five and twenty million indifferent ones victorious over it, for eight days and more? In this way, and in such ways, however, has the Feast of Pikes danced itself off, gallant federates wending homewards, towards every point of the compass, with feverish nerves, heart and head much heated. Some of them, indeed, as Damp Martin's elderly respectable friend, from Strasbourg, quite burnt out with liquors, and flickering towards extinction. The Feast of Pikes has danced itself off, and become defunct, and the ghost of a feast. Nothing of it now remaining but this vision in men's memory, and the place that knew it, for the slope of that champ to Mars is crumbled to half the original height, now knowing it no more. Undoubtedly one of the memorablest national heights. Never or hardly ever, as we said, was oath sworn with such hard effusion, emphasis and expenditure of joyance and then it was broken irremediably within year and day. Ah, why? When the swearing of it was so heavenly joyful, bosom clasped to bosom, and five and twenty million hearts all burning together, O oh ye inexorable destinies, why, partly because it was sworn with such overjoyance. But chiefly, indeed, for an older reason, that sin had come into the world and misery by sin. These five and twenty millions, if we will consider it, have now henceforth, with that Phrygian cap of theirs, no force over them, to bind and guide. Neither in them, more than heretofore, is guiding force, or rule of just living, how then, while they all go rushing at such a pace, on unknown ways, with no bridle, towards no aim, can hurly-burly unutterable fail. For verily not Federation Rosepink is the color of this earth and her work, not by outbursts of noble sentiment, but with far other ammunition, shall a man front the world. But how wise, 
in all cases, to husband your fire. To keep it deep down, rather, as genial radical heat. Explosions, the forcibilest, and never so well directed, are questionable. Far oftenest futile, always frightfully wasteful, but think of a man, of a nation of men, spending its whole stock of fire in one artificial firework. So have we seen fond weddings, for individuals, like nations, have their high teeds, celebrated with an outburst of triumph and deray, at which the elderly shook their heads. Better had a serious cheerfulness been, for the enterprise was great. Fond pair. The more triumphant ye feel, and victorious over terrestrial evil, which seems all abolished, the wider-eyed will your disappointment be to find terrestrial evil still extant. And why extant? Will each of you cry, because my false mate has played the traitor, evil was abolished, I meant faithfully, and did, or would have done. Whereby the oversweet moon of honey changes itself into long years of vinegar. Perhaps devulsive vinegar, like Hannibal's. Shall we say then, the French nation has led royalty, or wooed and teased poor royalty to lead her, to the hymeneal fatherland's altar, in such oversweet manner and has, most thoughtlessly, to celebrate the nuptials with due shine and demonstration, burnt her bed? Book 2.2 Nancy Chapter 2.2.I Bull Dimly visible, at Metz on the northeastern frontier, a certain brave bull, last refuge of royalty in all straits and meditations of flight, has for many months hovered occasionally in our eye. Some name or shadow of a brave bull, let us now, for a little, look fixedly at him, till he become a substance and person for us. The man himself is worth a glance, his position and procedure there, in these days, will throw light on many things. For it is with Bull as with all French commanding officers, only in a more emphatic degree. The Grand National Federation, we already guess, was but empty sound, or worse, a last loudest universal hep hep hurrah, with full bumpers, in that national lapathy feast of constitution-making, as in loud denial of the palpably existing. As if, with hurrahings, you would shut out notice of the inevitable already knocking at the gates. Which new national bumper, one may say, can but deepen the drunkenness. And so, the louder it swears brotherhood, will the sooner and the more surely lead to cannibalism. Ah, under that fraternal shine and clangor, what a deep world of irreconcilable discords lie momentarily assuaged, damped down for one moment. Respectable military federates have barely got home to their quarters, and the inflammablest, dying, burnt up with liquors, and kindness, has not yet got extinct. The shine is hardly out of men's eyes, and still blazes filling all men's memories, when your discords burst forth again very considerably darker than ever. Let us look at Bull, and see how. Bull for the present commands in the garrison of Metz, and far and wide over the east and north, being indeed, by a late act of government with sanction of National Assembly, appointed one of our four supreme generals. Rochambeau and Maly, men and marshals of note in these days, though to us of small moment, are two of his colleagues, tough old babbling Luckner, also of small moment for us, will probably be the third. Marquis de Bull is a determined loyalist. Not indeed disinclined to moderate reform, but resolute against immoderate. A man long suspect to patriotism, who has more than once given the August Assembly trouble. Who would not, for example, take the national oath, as he was bound to do, but always put it off on this or the other pretext, till an autograph of majesty requested him to do it as a favor. There, in this post if not of honor, yet of eminence and danger, he waits, in a silent concentred manner, very dubious of the future. Alone, as he says, or almost alone, of all the old military notabilities, he has not emigrated. But thinks always, in atrabiliar moments, that there will be nothing for him too but to cross the marches. He might cross, say, to Treves or Koblenz where exiled princes will be one day ranking. Or say, over into Luxembourg where old Broy loiters and languishes. Or is there not the great dim deep of European diplomacy, where your calones, your braturals are beginning to hover, dimly discernible. With immeasurable confused outlooks and purposes, 
with no clear purpose but this of still trying to do his majesty a service, Bull waits, struggling what he can to keep his district loyal, his troops faithful, his garrisons furnished. He maintains, as yet, with his cousin Lafayette, some thin diplomatic correspondence, by letter and messenger, chivalrous constitutional professions on the one side, military gravity and brevity on the other. Which thin correspondence one can see growing ever the thinner and hollower, towards the verge of entire vacuity. A quick, choleric, sharply discerning, stubbornly endeavoring man. With suppressed explosive resolution, with valor, nay headlong audacity, a man who was more in his place, lion-like defending those windward isles, or, as with military tiger spring, clutching Nevis and Montserrat from the English. Then here in this suppressed condition, muzzled and fettered by diplomatic pack threads. Looking out for a civil war, which may never arrive. Few years ago Bull was to have led a French East Indian expedition, and reconquered or conquered Pondicherry and the Kingdoms of the Sun, but the whole world is suddenly changed, and he with it, destiny willed it not in that way but in this. Chapter 2.2.2 Arrears and Aristocrats Indeed, as to the general outlook of things, Bull himself augurs not well of it. The French army, ever since those old Bastille days, and earlier, has been universally in the questionable state, and growing daily worse. Discipline, which is at all times a kind of miracle, and works by faith, broke down then. One sees not with that near prospect of recovering itself. The guards Francaises played a deadly game, but how they won it, and where the prizes of it, all men know. In that general overturn, we saw the hired fighters refuse to fight. The very Swiss of Chateauvieux, which indeed is a kind of French Swiss, from Geneva and the Pays de Vaud, are understood to have declined. Deserters glided over, Royal Allemand itself looked disconsolate, though stanch of purpose. In a word, we there saw military rule, in the shape of poor Bissenville with that convulsive unmanageable camp of his, past two martyr days on the Champ de Mars. And then, veiling itself, so to speak, under the cloud of night, depart, down the left bank of the Seine, to seek refuge elsewhere, this ground having clearly become too hot for it. But what new ground to seek, what remedy to try? Quarters that were, uninfected, this doubtless, with judicious strictness of drilling, were the plan. Alas, in all quarters and places, from Paris onward to the remotest hamlet, is infection, is seditious contagion, inhaled, propagated by contact and converse, till the dullest soldier catch it. There is speech of men in uniform with men not in uniform, men in uniform read journals, and even write in them. There are public petitions or remonstrances, private emissaries and associations. There is discontent, jealousy, uncertainty, sullen suspicious humor. The whole French army, fermenting in dark heat, glooms ominous, boding good to no one. So that, in the general social dissolution and revolt, we are to have this deepest and dismalest kind of it, a revolting soldiery. Barren, desolate to look upon is this same business of revolt under all its aspects. But how infinitely more so, when it takes the aspect of military mutiny. The very implement of rule and restraint, whereby all the rest was managed and held in order, has become precisely the frightfulest immeasurable implement of misrule. Like the element of fire, our indispensable all-ministering servant, when it gets the mastery, and becomes conflagration. Discipline we call the kind of miracle, in fact, is it not miraculous how one man moves hundreds of thousands? Each unit of whom it may be loves him not, and singly fears him not, yet has to obey him, to go hither or go thither, to march and halt, to give death, and even to receive it, as if a fate had spoken. And the word of command becomes, almost in the literal sense, a magic word. Which magic word, again, if it be once forgotten, the spell of it once broken. The legions of assiduous ministering spirits rise on you now as menacing fiends. Your free orderly arena becomes a tumult place of the nether pit, and the hapless magician is rent limb from limb. Military mobs are mobs with muskets in their hands and also with death hanging over their heads, for death is the penalty of disobedience and they have disobeyed. 
And now if all mobs are properly frenzies, and work frenetically with mad fits of hot and of cold, fierce rage alternating so incoherently with panic terror, consider what your military mob will be, with such a conflict of duties and penalties. World between remorse and fury, and, for the hot fit, loaded firearms in its hand. To the soldier himself, revolt is frightful, and oftenest perhaps pitiable, and yet so dangerous, it can only be hated, cannot be pitied. An anomalous class of mortals these poor hired killers. With a frankness, which to the moralist in these times seems surprising, they have sworn to become machines, and nevertheless they are still partly men. Let no prudent person in authority remind them of this latter fact. But always let force, let injustice above all, stop short clearly on this side of the rebounding point. Soldiers, as we often say, do revolt, were it not so, several things which are transient in this world might be perennial. Over and above the general quarrel which all sons of Adam maintain with their lot here below, the grievances of the French soldiery reduce themselves to two, first that their officers are aristocrats, secondly that they cheat them of their pay. Two grievances, or rather we might say one, capable of becoming a hundred, for in that single first proposition, that the officers are aristocrats, what a multitude of corollaries lie ready. It is a bottomless ever-flowing fountain of grievances this, what you may call a general raw material of grievance, wherefrom individual grievance after grievance will daily body itself forth. Nay there will even be a kind of comfort in getting it, from time to time, so embodied. Peculation of one's pay. It is embodied, made tangible, made denounceable, exhalable, if only in angry words. For unluckily that grand fountain of grievances does exist, aristocrats almost all our officers necessarily are, they have it in the blood and bone. By the law of the case, no man can pretend to be the pitifulest lieutenant of militia, till he have first verified, to the satisfaction of the Lion King, a nobility of four generations. Not nobility only, but four generations of it, this latter is the improvement hit upon, in comparatively late years, by a certain war minister much pressed for commissions. An improvement which did relieve the overpressed war minister, but which split France still further into yawning contrasts of commonalty and nobility, nay of new nobility and old. As if already with your new and old, and then with your old, older and oldest, there were not contrasts and discrepancies enough. The general clash whereof men now see and hear, and in the singular whirlpool, all contrasts gone together to the bottom. Gone to the bottom or going, with uproar, without return, going everywhere save in the military section of things. And there, it may be asked, can they hope to continue always at the top? Apparently, not. It is true, in a time of external peace, when there is no fighting but only drilling, this question, how you rise from the ranks, may seem theoretical rather. But in reference to the rights of man it is continually practical. The soldier has sworn to be faithful not to the king only, but to the law and the nation. Do our commanders love the revolution? Ask all soldiers. Unhappily no, they hate it, and love the counter-revolution. Young epaulet men, with quality blood in them, poisoned with quality pride, do sniff openly, with indignation struggling to become contempt, at our rights of man, as at some newfangled cobweb, which shall be brushed down again. Old officers, more cautious, keep silent, with closed uncurled lips, but one guesses what is passing within. Nay who knows, how, under the plausiblest word of command, might like counter-revolution itself, sail to exiled princes and the Austrian Kaiser, treacherous aristocrats hoodwinking the small insight of U.S. common men. In such manner works that general raw material of grievance, disastrous, instead of trust and reverence, breeding hate, endless suspicion, the impossibility of commanding and obeying. And now when this second more tangible grievance has articulated itself universally in the mind of the common man, peculation of his pay. Peculation of the despicablest sort does exist, and has long existed. But, unless the new declared rights of man, and all rights whatsoever, be a cobweb, it shall no longer exist. The French military system seems dying a sorrowful suicidal death. Nay more, citizen, as is natural, ranks himself against citizen in this cause. 
the soldier finds audience, of numbers and sympathy unlimited, among the patriot lower classes. Nor are the higher wanting to the officer. The officer still dresses and perfumes himself for such sad and emigrated soiree as there may still be, and speaks his woes, which woes, are they not majesties and natures? Speaks, at the same time, his gay defiance, his firm set resolution. Citizens, still more citizenesses, see the right and the wrong, not the military system alone will die by suicide, but much along with it. As was said, there is yet possible a deepest overturn than any yet witnessed, that deepest upturn of the black burning sulfurous stratum whereon all rests and grows. But how these things may act on the rude soldier mind, with its military pedantries, its inexperience of all that lies off the parade ground, inexperience as of a child, yet fierceness of a man and vehemence of a Frenchman. It is long that secret communings in mess room and guard room, sour looks, thousandfold petty vexations between commander and commanded, measure everywhere the weary military day. Ask Captain Dad Martin. An authentic, ingenious literary officer of horse, who loves the reign of liberty, after a sort, yet has had his heart grieved to the quick many times, in the hot southwestern region and elsewhere. And has seen riot, civil battle by daylight and by torchlight and anarchy hatefuler than death. How insubordinate troopers, with drink in their heads, meet Captain Dab Martin and another on the ramparts, where there is no escape or side path. And make military salute punctually, for we look calm on them. Yet make it in a snappish, almost insulting manner, how one morning they leave all their chamois shirts and superfluous buffs, which they are tired of, laid in piles at the captain's doors. Whereat, we laugh, as the ass does, eating thistles, nay how they, not two forage cords together, with universal noisy cursing, with evident intent to hang the quartermaster, all this the worthy captain. Looking on it through the ruddy and sable of fond regretful memory, has flowingly ridden down. Men growl in vague discontent, officers fling up their commissions, and emigrate in disgust. Or let us ask another literary officer, not yet captain, sub-lieutenant only, in the artillery regiment La Fere, a young man of twenty-one. Not unentitled to speak, the name of him is Napoleon Bonaparte. To such height of sub-lieutenancy has he now got promoted, from Brienne School, five years ago, being found qualified in mathematics by Laplace. He is lying at Oxon, in the west, in these months, not sumptuously lodged, in the house of a barber, to whose wife he did not pay the customary degree of respect, or even over at the pavilion, in a chamber with bare walls. The only furniture an indifferent, bed without curtains, two chairs, and in the recess of a window a table covered with books and papers, his brother Louis sleeps on a coarse mattress in an adjoining room. However, he is doing something great, writing his first book or pamphlet, eloquent vehement letter to M. Matteo Buttafoco, our Corsican deputy, who is not a patriot but an aristocrat, unworthy of deputyship. Jolie of Dole is publisher. The literary sub-lieutenant corrects the proofs. Sets out on foot from Oxon, every morning at four o'clock, for Dole, after looking over the proofs, he partakes of an extremely frugal breakfast with Jolie, and immediately prepares for returning to his garrison. Where he arrives before noon, having thus walked above twenty miles in the course of the morning. This sub lieutenant can remark that, in drawing rooms, on streets, on highways, at inns, everywhere men's minds are ready to kindle into a flame. That a patriot, if he appear in the drawing room, or amid a group of officers, is liable enough to be discouraged, so great is the majority against him, but no sooner does he get into the street, or among the soldiers. Then he feels again as if the whole nation were with him. That after the famous oath, to the king, to the nation and law, there was a great change, that before this, if ordered to fire on the people, he for one would have done it in the king's name. But that after this, in the nation's name, he would not have done it. Likewise that the patriot officers, more numerous too in the artillery and engineers than elsewhere, were few in number. Yet that having the soldiers on their side, they ruled the regiment, and did often deliver the aristocrat brother officer out of peril and strait. One day, for example, a member of our own mess roused the mob, by singing, from the windows of our dining room, O Richard, O my king, 
and I had to snatch him from their fury. All which let the reader multiply by ten thousand. And spread it with slight variations over all the camps and garrisons of France. The French army seems on the verge of universal mutiny. Universal mutiny. There is in that what may well make patriot constitutionalism and an august assembly shudder. Something behoves to be done, yet what to do no man can tell. Mirabeau proposes even that the soldiery, having come to such a pass, be forthwith disbanded, the whole two hundred and eighty thousands of them, and organized anew. Impossible this, in so sudden a manner. Cry all men. And yet literally, answer we, it is inevitable, in one manner or another. Such an army, with its four-generation nobles, its peculated pay, and men nodding forage cords to hang their quartermaster, cannot subsist beside such a revolution. Your alternative is a slow-pining chronic dissolution and new organization. Or a swift decisive one, the agony spread over years or concentrated into an hour. With a Mirabeau for minister or governor the latter had been the choice, with no Mirabeau for governor it will naturally be the former. Chapter 2.2.3 Bull at Metz To Bull, in his northeastern circle, none of these things are altogether hid. Many times flight over the marches gleams out on him as a last guidance in such bewilderment, nevertheless he continues here, struggling always to hope the best, not from new organization but from happy counter-revolution and return to the old. For the rest it is clear to him that this same national federation, and universal swearing and fraternizing of people and soldiers, has done, incalculable mischief. So much that fermented secretly has hereby got vent and become open, national guards and soldiers of the line, solemnly embracing one another on all parade fields, drinking, swearing patriotic oaths, fall into disorderly street processions. Constitutional unmilitary exclamations and harangues. On which account the regiment Picardy, for one, has to be drawn out in the square of the barracks, here at Metz, and sharply harangued by the general himself, but expresses penitence. Far and near, as accounts testify, insubordination has begun grumbling louder and louder. Officers have been seen shut up in their mess rooms, assaulted with clamorous demands, not without menaces. The insubordinate ringleader is dismissed with yellow furlough, yellow infamous thing they call cartouche John, but ten new ringleaders rise in his stead, and the yellow cartouche ceases to be thought disgraceful. Within a fortnight, or at furthest a month, of that sublime feast of pikes, the whole French army, demanding arrears, forming reading clubs, frequenting popular societies, is in a state which Bull can call by no name but that of mutiny. Bull knows it as few do, and speaks by dire experience. Take one instance instead of many. It is still an early day of August, the precise date now undiscoverable, when Bull, about to set out for the waters of aix la chapelle is once more suddenly summoned to the barracks of Metz. The soldiers stand ranked in fighting order, muskets loaded, the officers all there on compulsion, and require, with many-voiced emphasis, to have their arrears paid. Picardy was penitent. But we see it has relapsed, the wide space bristles and lures with mere mutinous armed men. Brave Bull advances to the nearest regiment, opens his commanding lips to harangue. Obtains nothing but querulous indignant discordance, and the sound of so many thousand livres legally due. The moment is trying, there are some ten thousand soldiers now in Metz, and one spirit seems to have spread among them. Bull is firm as the adamant, but what shall he do? A German regiment, named of Somme, is thought to be of better temper, nevertheless Somme too may have heard of the precept, Thou shalt not steal, Somme too may know that money is money. Bull walks trustfully towards the regiment de Somme, speaks trustful words, but here again is answered by the cry of forty-four thousand livres odd sous. A cry waxing more and more vociferous, as Somme's humor mounts. Which cry, as it will produce no cash or promise of cash, ends in the wide simultaneous whir of shouldered muskets, and a determined quick-time march on the part of Somme, towards its colonel's house, in the next street there to seize the colors and military chest. Thus does Psalm, for its part, strong in the faith that Miam is not Tuum, that fair speeches are not forty-four thousand livres odd sous. Unrestrainable. 
Song tramps to military time, quick consuming the way. Bull and the officers, drawing sword, have to dash into double quick pot charge or unmilitary running, to get the start, to station themselves on the outer staircase, and stand there with what of death defiance and sharp steel they have. Song truculently coiling itself up, rank after rank, opposite them, in such humor as we can fancy, which happily has not yet mounted to the murder pitch. There will bull stand, certain at least of one man's purpose. In grim calmness, awaiting the issue. What the intrepidest of men and generals can do is done. Bull, though there is a barricading picket at each end of the street, and death under his eyes, contrives to send for a dragoon regiment with orders to charge, the dragoon officers mount, the dragoon men will not, hope is none there for him. The street, as we say, barricaded, the earth all shut out, only the indifferent heavenly vault overhead, perhaps here or there a timorous householder peering out of window, with prayer for bull. Copious rascality, on the pavement, with prayer for psalm, there do the two parties stand, like chariots locked in a narrow thoroughfare, like locked wrestlers at a dead grip. For two hours they stand. Bull's sword glittering in his hand, adamantine resolution clouding his brows, for two hours by the clocks of Metz. Moody silence stands psalm, with occasional clangor, but does not fire. Rascality from time to time urges some grenadier to level his musket at the general, who looks on it as a bronze general would, and always some corporal or other strikes it up. In such remarkable attitude, standing on that staircase for two hours, does brave bull, long a shadow, dawn on us visibly out of the dimness, and become a person. For the rest, since Sam has not shot him at the first instant, and since in himself there is no variableness, the danger will diminish. The mayor, a man infinitely respectable, with his municipals and tricolor sashes, finally gains entrance. Remonstrates, perorates, promises, gets some persuaded home to its barracks. Next day, our respectable mayor lending the money, the officers pay down the half of the demand in ready cash. With which liquidation some pacifies itself, and for the present all is hushed up, as much as may be. Such scenes as this of Metz, or preparations and demonstrations toward such, are universal over France, Damp Martin, with his knotted forage cords and piled chamois jackets, is at Strasbourg in the southeast. In these same days or rather nights, royal champagne is, shouting vive la nation, o diable les aristocrates, with some thirty lit candles, at Hesden, on the far northwest. The garrison of Beach, Deputy Robel is sorry to state, went out of the town, with drums beating, deposed its officers, and then returned into the town, sabre in hand. Ought not a national assembly to occupy itself with these objects? Military France is everywhere full of sour inflammatory humor, which exhales itself fuliginously, this way, or that, a whole continent of smoking flax. Which, blown on here or there by any angry wind, might so easily start into a blaze, into a continent of fire. Constitutional patriotism is in deep natural alarm at these things. The August Assembly sits diligently deliberating. Dare nowise resolve, with Mirabeau, on an instantaneous disbandment and extinction, finds that a course of palliatives is easier. But at least and lowest, this grievance of the arrears shall be rectified. A plan, much noised of in those days, under the name, Decree of the 6th of August, has been devised for that. Inspectors shall visit all armies. And, with certain elected corporals and soldiers able to write, verify what arrears and peculations do lie do, and make them good. Well, if in this way the smoky heat be cooled down. If it be not, as we say, ventilated over much, or, by sparks and collision somewhere, sent up. Chapter 2.2.4 Arrears at Nancy. We are to remark, however, that of all districts, this of Bulles seems the inflammablest. It was always to Bull and Metz that royalty would fly, Austria lies near. Here more than elsewhere must the disunited people look over the borders, into a dim sea of foreign politics and diplomacies, with hope or apprehension, with mutual exasperation. It was but in these days that certain Austrian troops, marching peaceably across an angle of this region, seemed an invasion realized. 
And there rushed towards Stenai, with musket on shoulder, from all the winds, some thirty thousand national guards, to inquire what the matter was. A matter of mere diplomacy it proved. The Austrian Kaiser, in haste to get to Belgium, had bargained for this shortcut. The infinite dim movement of European politics waved a skirt over these spaces, passing on its way, like the passing shadow of a condor. And such a winged flight of thirty thousand, with mixed cackling and crowing, rose in consequence. For, in addition to all, this people, as we said, is much divided, aristocrats abound, patriotism has both aristocrats and Austrians to watch. It is Lorraine, this region, not so illuminated as old France, it remembers ancient feudalisms, nay, within man's memory, it had a court and king of its own, or indeed the splendor of a court and king, without the burden. Then, contrarywise, the mother society, which sits in the Jacobins' church at Paris, has daughters in the towns here. Shrill-tongued, driven acrid, consider how the memory of good King Stanislaus, and ages of imperial feudalism, may comport with this new acrid evangel, and what a virulence of discord there may be. In all which, the soldiery, officers on one side, private men on the other, takes part, and now indeed principal part, a soldiery, moreover, all the hotter here as it lies the denser, the frontier province requiring more of it. So stands Lorraine, but the capital city, more especially so. The pleasant city of Nancy, which faded feudalism loves, where King Stanislaus personally dwelt and shone, has an aristocrat municipality, and then also a daughter society, it has some forty thousand divided souls of population. And three large regiments, one of which is Swiss Chateauvieux, dear to patriotism ever since it refused fighting, or was thought to refuse, in the Bastille days. Here unhappily all evil influences seem to meet concentered. Here, of all places, may jealousy and heat evolve itself. These many months, accordingly, man has been set against man, washed against unwashed, patriot soldier against aristocrat captain, ever the more bitterly. And a long score of grudges has been running up. Nameable grudges, and likewise unnameable, for there is a punctual nature in wrath. And daily, were there but glances of the eye, tones of the voice, and minutest commissions or omissions, it will jot down somewhat, to account, under the head of sundries, which always swells the sum total. For example, in April last, in those times of preliminary federation, when national guards and soldiers were everywhere swearing brotherhood, and all France was locally federating, preparing for the grand national feast of pikes. It was observed that these Nancy officers threw cold water on the whole brotherly business. That they first hung back from appearing at the Nancy Federation, then did appear, but in mere redingote and undress, with scarcely a clean shirt on. Nay that one of them, as the national colors flaunted by in that solemn moment, did, without visible necessity, take occasion to spit. Small, sundries as per journal, but then incessant ones. The aristocrat municipality, pretending to be constitutional, keeps mostly quiet. Not so the daughter society, the five thousand adult male patriots of the place, still less the five thousand female, not so the young, whiskered or whiskerless, four-generation noblesse in epaulets. The grim patriot Swiss of Chateauvieux, effervescent infantry of Regiment du Roy, hot troopers of Mestre de Camp. Walled Nancy, which stands so bright and trim, with its straight streets, spacious squares, and Stanislaus architecture, on the fruitful alluvium of the mirth. So bright, amid the yellow cornfields in these reaper months, is inwardly but a den of discord, anxiety, inflammability, not far from exploding. Let Bull look to it. If that universal military heat, which we liken to a vast continent of smoking flax, do anywhere take fire, his beard, here in Lorraine and Nancy, may the most readily of all get singed by it. Bull, for his part, is busy enough, but only with the general superintendents, getting his pacified psalm, and all other still tolerable regiments, marched out of Metz, to southward towns and villages. To rural cantonments as at Vic, Marcel and thereabout, by the still waters, where is plenty of horse forage, sequestered parade ground, and the soldier's speculative faculty can be stilled by drilling. Some, as we said, received only half payment of arrears, 
naturally not without grumbling. Nevertheless that scene of the drawn sword may, after all, have raised bull in the mind of some. For men and soldiers love intrepidity in swift and flexible decision, even when they suffer by it. As indeed is not this fundamentally the quality of qualities for a man? A quality which by itself is next to nothing, since inferior animals, asses, dogs, even mules have it, yet, in due combination, it is the indispensable basis of all. Of Nancy in its heats, Bull, commander of the whole, knows nothing special. Understands generally that the troops in that city are perhaps the worst. The officers there have it all, as they have long had it, to themselves, and unhappily seem to manage it ill. Fifty yellow furloughs, given out in one batch, do surely betoken difficulties. But what was patriotism to think of certain light-fencing fusiliers set on, or supposed to be set on, to insult the grenadier club, considerate speculative grenadiers, and that reading room of theirs? With shoutings, with hootings. Till the speculative grenadier drew his sidearms too, and there ensued battery and duels. Nay more, are not swashbucklers of the same stamp sent out, visibly, or sent out presumably, now in the dress of soldiers to pick quarrels with the citizens. Now, disguised as citizens, to pick quarrels with the soldiers. For a certain Roussier, expert in fence, was taken in the very fact, for officers, presumably of tender years, hounding him on, who thereupon fled precipitately. Fence master Roussier, hailed to the guardhouse, had sentence of three months imprisonment, but his comrades demanded, yellow furlough, for him of all persons, nay, thereafter they produced him on parade. Capped him in paper helmet inscribed, Iscariot, marched him to the gate of city, and there sternly commanded him to vanish for evermore. On all which suspicions, accusations and noisy procedure, and on enough of the like continually accumulating, the officer could not but look with disdainful indignation. Perhaps disdainfully expressed the same in words, and soon after fly over to the Austrians. So that when it here as elsewhere comes to the question of arrears, the humor and procedure is of the bitterest, regiment mestrata camp getting, amid loud clamor, some three gold Louis A man, which have, as usual, to be borrowed from the municipality. Swiss Chateauview applying for the like, but getting instead instantaneous courroie, or cat o' nine tails, with subsequent unsufferable hisses from the women and children. Regiment du Roy, sick of hope deferred, at length seizing its military chest, and marching it to quarters, but next day marching it back again, through streets all struck silent, unordered paradings and clamors, not without strong liquor. Objurgation, insubordination, your military ranked arrangement going all, as the typographers say of set types, in a similar case, rapidly to pie. Such is Nancy in these early days of August, the sublime feast of pikes not yet a month old. Constitutional patriotism, at Paris and elsewhere, may well quake at the news. War Minister Latour Dupin runs breathless to the National Assembly, with a written message that, all is burning, tout brule, tout presa. The National Assembly, on spur of the instant, renders such decret, and order to submit and repent, as he requires, if it will avail anything. On the other hand, journalism, through all its throats, gives hoarse outcry, condemnatory, elegiac applausive. The forty-eight sections, lift up voices, sonorous brewer, or call him now Colonel Santerre, is not silent, in the Faubourg Saint Antoine. For, meanwhile, the Nancy soldiers have sent a deputation of ten, furnished with documents and proofs, who will tell another story than the all is burning one. Which deputed ten, before ever they reach the assembly hall, assiduous Latour du Pin picks up, and on warrant of Mayor Bailey, claps in prison. Most unconstitutionally, for they had officers furloughs. Whereupon Saint Antoine, in indignant uncertainty of the future, closes its shops. Is Bull a traitor then, sold to Austria? In that case, these poor private sentinels have revolted mainly out of patriotism. New deputation, deputation of National Guardsmen now, sets forth from Nancy to enlighten the assembly. It meets the old deputed ten returning, quite unexpectedly unhanged, and proceeds thereupon with better prospects, but affects nothing. Deputations, 
government messengers, orderlies at hand gallops, alarms, thousand-voiced rumors, go vibrating continually, backwards and forwards, scattering distraction. Not till the last week of August does M. De Malsenia, selected as inspector, get down to the scene of mutiny, with authority, with cash, and, decree of the 6th of August. He now shall see these arrears liquidated, justice done, or at least tumult quashed. Chapter 2.2.V Inspector Malsenia Of Inspector Malsenia we discern, by direct light, that he is, of Herculean stature, and infer, with probability, that he is of truculent mustachoed aspect, for royalist officers now leave the upper lip unshaven. That he is of indomitable bullheart, and also, unfortunately, of thick bullhead. On Tuesday the 24th of August, 1790, he opens session as inspecting commissioner, meets those, elected corporals, and soldiers that can write. He finds the accounts of Chateauvieux to be complex, to require delay and reference, he takes to haranguing, to reprimanding, ends amid audible grumbling. Next morning, he resumes session, not at the town hall as prudent municipals counseled, but once more at the barracks. Unfortunately Chateauvieux, grumbling all night, will now hear of no delay or reference. From reprimanding on his part, it goes to bullying, answered with continual cries of, Juges tout de sweet, judge it at once, whereupon him, de Malsenia will off in a huff. But lo, Chateauvieux, swarming all about the baroque court, has sentries at every gate, M. de Malsenia, demanding egress, cannot get it, though Commandant de Nou backs him, can get only, Juges tout de sweet. Here is a notice. Bullhearted M. De Malsenia draws his sword, and will force egress. Confused splutter. M. De Malsenia's sword breaks, he snatches Commandant de Nou's, the sentry is wounded. M. De Malsenia, whom one is loath to kill, does force egress, followed by Chateauvieux all in disarray, a spectacle to Nancy. M. de Malsenia walks at a sharp pace, yet never runs, wheeling from time to time, with menaces and movements of fence. And so reaches Deneu's house, unhurt, which house Chateauvieux, in an agitated manner, invests, hindered as yet from entering, by a crowd of officers formed on the staircase. M. De Malsenia retreats by back ways to the town hall, flustered though undaunted, amid an escort of national guards. From the town hall he, on the morrow, emits fresh orders, fresh plans of settlement with Chateauvieux. To none of which will Chateauvieux listen, whereupon finally he, amid noise enough, emits order that Chateauvieux shall march on the morrow morning, and quarter at Sar Louis. Chateauvieux flatly refuses marching, M. De Malsenia, takes act, do notarial protest, of such refusal, if happily that may avail him. This is end of Thursday, and, indeed, of M. de Malsenia's inspectorship, which has lasted some fifty hours. To such length, in fifty hours, has he unfortunately brought it. Mestreda camp and regiment do Roy hang, as it were, fluttering, Chateauvieux is clean gone, in what way we see. Overnight, an aide de camp of Lafayette's, stationed here for such emergency, sends swift emissaries far and wide, to summon National Guards. The slumber of the country is broken by clattering hoofs, by loud fraternal knockings. Everywhere the constitutional patriot must clutch his fighting gear, and take the road for Nancy. And thus the Herculean inspector has sat all Thursday, among terror-struck municipals, a center of confused noise, all Thursday, Friday, and till Saturday towards noon. Chateauvieux, in spite of the notarial protest, will not march a step. As many as four thousand National Guards are dropping or pouring in, uncertain what is expected of them, still more uncertain what will be obtained of them. For all is uncertainty, commotion, and suspicion, there goes a word that Bull, beginning to bestir himself in the rural cantonments eastward, is but a royalist traitor, that Chateauvieux and patriotism are sold to Austria, of which latter am. De Malsenia is probably some agent. Mestreda Camp and Roy flutter still more questionably, Chateauvieux, far from marching, waves red flags out of two carriages, in a passionate manner, along the streets. And next morning answers its officers, pay us, then, 
and we will march with you to the world's end. Under which circumstances, towards noon on Saturday, M. de Malsenia thinks it were good perhaps to inspect the ramparts, on horseback. He mounts, accordingly, with escort of three troopers. At the gate of the city, he bids two of them wait for his return, and with the third, a trooper to be depended upon, he, gallops off for Lunaville. Where lies a certain carabiner regiment not yet in a mutinous state. The two left troopers soon get uneasy, discover how it is, and give the alarm. Mestreda camp, to the number of a hundred, saddles in frantic haste, as if sold to Austria. Gallops out pell-mell in chase of its inspector. And so they spur, and the inspector spurs, careering, with noise and jingle, up the valley of the river Mirth, towards Lunaville and the midday sun, through an astonished country. Indeed almost their own astonishment. What a hunt, Actian-like, which Actian de Malsenia happily gains. To arms, ye carabiners of Lunaville, to chastise mutinous men, insulting your general officer, insulting your own quarters. Above all things, fire soon, lest there be parleying ye refuse to fire. The carabiners fire soon, exploding upon the first stragglers of Mestreda camp. Who shrink at the very flash, and fall back hastily on Nancy, in a state not far from distraction. Panic and fury, sold to Austria without an if, so much per regiment, the very sums can be specified, and traitorous Malsania is fled. Help, O oh heaven! Help, thou earth, ye unwashed patriots, ye too are sold like us. Effervescent regiment du Roy primes its firelocks, Mestreda camp saddles holy, Commandant de Nul is seized, is flung in prison with a canvas shirt, Sereau de Toile, about him. Chateauvieux bursts up the magazines, distributes three thousand fusils to a patriot people, Austria shall have a hot bargain. Alas, the unhappy hunting dogs, as we said, have hunted away their huntsmen. And do now run howling and baying, on what trail they know not, nigh rabid. And so there is tumultuous march of men, through the night, with halt on the heights of Flinville, whence Lunaville can be seen all illuminated. Then there is parley, at four in the morning, and reparley, finally there is agreement, the carabiners give in, Malsania is surrendered, with apologies on all sides. After weary confused hours, he is even got under way. The Lundvillers all turning out, in the idle Sunday, to see such departure, home-going of mutinous Mestreda camp with its inspector captive. Mestreda camp accordingly marches, the Lundvillers look. C. At the corner of the first street, our inspector bounds off again, bullhearted as he is, amid the slash of sabres, the crackle of musketry, and escapes, full gallop, with only a ball lodged in his buff jerkin. The Herculean man. And yet it is an escape to no purpose. For the carabiners, to whom after the hardest Sunday's ride on record, he has come circling back, stand deliberating by their nocturnal watchfires. Deliberating of Austria, of traitors, and the rage of Mestreda camp. So that, on the whole, the next sight we have is that of M. de Malsenia, on the Monday afternoon, faring bullhearted through the streets of Nancy. In open carriage, a soldier standing over him with drawn sword, amid the furies of the women, hedges of national guards, and confusion of Babel, to the prison beside Commandant de Nil. That finally is the lodging of Inspector Malsenia. Surely it is time Bull were drawing near. The country all round, alarmed with watchfires, illuminated towns, and marching en route, has been sleepless these several nights. Nancy, with its uncertain national guards, with its distributed fusils, mutinous soldiers, black panic and red-hot ire, is not a city but a bedlam. Chapter 2.2.VI Bull at Nancy Haste with help, thou brave bull, if swift help come not, all is now verily burning, and may burn, to what lengths and breadths. Much, in these hours, depends on bull. As it shall now fare with him, the whole future may be this way or be that. If, for example, he were to loiter dubitating, and not come, if he were to come, and fail, the whole soldiery of France to blaze into mutiny, national guards going some this way, some that. And royalism to draw its rapier, 
and Sansculottism to snatch its pike. And the spirit if Jacobinism, as yet young, girt with sunrays, to grow instantaneously mature, girt with hellfire, as mortals, in one night of deadly crisis, have had their heads turned grey. Brave Bull is advancing fast, with the old inflexibility, gathering himself, unhappily, in small affluences, from east, from west and north. And now on Tuesday morning, the last day of the month, he stands all concentred, unhappily still in small force, at the village of Fruard, within some few miles. Son of Adam with a more dubious task before him is not in the world this Tuesday morning. A weltering inflammable sea of doubt and peril, and bull sure of simply one thing, his own determination. Which one thing, indeed, may be worth many. He puts a most firm face on the matter, submission, or unsparing battle and destruction, twenty-four hours to make your choice, this was the tenor of his proclamation. Thirty copies of which he sent yesterday to Nancy, all which, we find, were intercepted and not posted. Nevertheless, at half-past eleven, this morning, seemingly by way of answer, there does wait on him at Fruard, some deputation from the mutinous regiments, from the Nancy municipals, to see what can be done. Bull receives this deputation, in a large open court adjoining his lodging, pacified psalm, and the rest, attend also, being invited to do it, all happily still in the right humor. The mutineers pronounce themselves with a decisiveness, which to Bull seems insolence, and happily to psalm also. Psalm, forgetful of the Met staircase and sabre, demands that the scoundrels be hanged there and then. Bull represses the hanging, but answers that mutinous soldiers have one course, and not more than one, to liberate, with heartfelt contrition, Messrs. de Nou and de Malsaigne, to get ready forthwith for marching off, whither he shall order. And, submit and repent, as the National Assembly has decreed, as he yesterday did in thirty printed placards proclaim. These are his terms, unalterable as the decrees of destiny. Which terms as they, the mutineer deputies, seemingly do not accept, it were good for them to vanish from this spot, and even promptly, with him too, in few instants, the word will be, forward. The mutineer deputies banish, not unpromptly. The municipal ones, anxious beyond right for their own individualities, prefer abiding with Bull. Brave Bull, though he puts a most firm face on the matter, knows his position full well, how at Nancy, what with rebellious soldiers, with uncertain national guards, and so many distributed fusils. There rage and roar some ten thousand fighting men. While with himself is scarcely the third part of that number, in national guards also uncertain, in mere pacified regiments, for the present full of rage, and clamor to march, but whose rage and clamor may next moment take such a fatal new figure. On the top of one uncertain billow, therewith to calm billows. Bull must abandon himself to fortune, who is said sometimes to favor the brave. At half past twelve, the mutineer deputies having vanished, our drums beat, we march, for Nancy. Let Nancy bethink itself, then, for Bull has thought and determined. And yet how shall Nancy think, not a city but a bedlam? Grim Chateauview is for defense to the death. Forces the municipality to order, by tap of drum, all citizens acquainted with artillery to turn out, and assist in managing the cannon. On the other hand, effervescent regiment du Roy, is drawn up in its barracks. Quite disconsolate, hearing the humor psalm is in, and ejaculates dolefully from its thousand throats, La loy, la loy, la, la. Mestreda camp blusters, with profane swearing, in mixed terror and furor. National guards look this way and that, not knowing what to do. What a bedlam city, as many plans as heads, all ordering, none obeying, quiet none, except the dead, who sleep underground, having done their fighting. And, behold, Bull proves as good as his word, at half past two, scouts report that he is within half a league of the gates, rattling along, with cannon, and array, breathing nothing but destruction. A new deputation, municipals, mutineers, officers, goes out to meet him, with passionate entreaty for yet one other hour. Bull grants an hour. Then, at the end thereof, no Denou or Malsania appearing as promised, he rolls his drums, 
and again takes the road. Towards four o'clock, the terror-struck townsmen may see him face to face. His cannons rattle there, in their carriages. His vanguard is within thirty paces of the gate Stanislaus. Onward like a planet, by appointed times, by law of nature. What next? Lo, flag of truce and chamad, conjuration to halt, Malsenia and Danil are on the street, coming hither. The soldiers all repentant, ready to submit and march. Adamantin Boles look alters not, yet the word halt is given, gladder moment he never saw. Joy of joys. Malsenia and Danu do verily issue, escorted by national guards. From streets all frantic, with sail to Austria and so forth, they salute Bull, unscathed. Bull steps aside to speak with them, and with other heads of the town there. Having already ordered by what gates and routes the mutineer regiments shall file out. Such colloquy with these two general officers and other principal townsmen, was natural enough. Nevertheless one wishes Bull had postponed it, and not stepped aside. Such tumultuous inflammable masses, tumbling along, making way for each other. This of keen nitrous oxide, that of sulfurous fire damp, were it not well to stand between them, keeping them well separate, till the space be cleared. Numerous stragglers of Chateauvieux and the rest have not marched with their main columns, which are filing out by the appointed gates, taking station in the open meadows. National guards are in a state of nearly distracted uncertainty. The populace, armed and unharmed, roll openly delirious, betrayed, sold to the Austrians, sold to the aristocrats. There are loaded cannon with lit matches among them, and Bolles' vanguard is halted within thirty paces of the gate. Command dwells not in that mad inflammable mass, which smolders and tumbles there, in blind smoky rage, which will not open the gate when summoned, says it will open the cannon's throat sooner, cannonade not, O oh friends, or be it through my body. Cries heroic young de Sills, young captain of Roy, clasping the murderous engine in his arms, and holding it. Chateauvieux Swiss, by main force, with oaths and menaces, wrench off the heroic youth. Who undaunted, amid still louder oaths seats himself on the touch hole. Amid still louder oaths, with ever louder clangor, and, alas, with the loud crackle of first one, and then three other muskets, which explode into his body. Which roll it in the dust, and do also, in the loud madness of such moment, bring lit cannon match to ready priming, and so, with one thunderous belch of grape shot, blast some fifty of Bolas' vanguard into air. Fatal. That sputter of the first musket shot has kindled such a cannon shot, such a death blaze, and all is now red hot madness, conflagration as of Tophet. With demoniac rage, the bull vanguard storms through that gate Stanislaus. With fiery sweep, sweeps mutiny clear away, to death, or into shelters and cellars, from which latter, again, mutiny continues firing. The ranked regiments hear it in their meadow they rush back again through the nearest gates. Bull gallops in, distracted, inaudible, and now has begun, in Nancy, as in that doomed hall of the Niblungen, a murder grim and great. Miserable, such scene of dismal aimless madness as the anger of heaven but rarely permits among men. From cellar or from garret, from open street in front, from successive corners of cross streets on each hand, Chateauvieux and patriotism keep up the murderous rolling fire, on murderous not unpatriotic fires. Your blue national captain, riddled with balls, one hardly knows on whose side fighting, requests to be laid on the colors to die, the patriotic woman, name not given, deed surviving, screams to Chateauvieux that it must not fire the other cannon. And even flings a pail of water on it, since screaming avails not. Thou shalt fight, thou shalt not fight, and with whom shalt thou fight? Could tumult awaken the old dead, Burgundian Charles the Bold might stir from under that rotunda of his, never since he, raging, sank in the ditches, and lost life and diamond, was such a noise heard here. Three thousand, as some count, lie mangled, gory, the half of Chateauvieux has been shot, without need of court-martial. Cavalry, of Mestre de Camp or their foes, can do little. Regiment du Roy was persuaded to its barracks. Stands there palpitating. 
Bull, armed with the terrors of the law, and favored of fortune, finally triumphs. In two murderous hours he has penetrated to the grand squares, dauntless, though with loss of forty officers and five hundred men, the shattered remnants of Chateauvieux are seeking covert. Regiment du Roy, not effervescent now, alas no, but having effervesced, will offer to ground its arms, will march in a quarter of an hour. Nay these poor effervesced require escort to march with and get it. Though they are thousand strong, and have thirty ball cartridges a man. The sun is not yet down, when peace, which might have come bloodless, has come bloody, the mutinous regiments are on march, doleful, on their three routes. And from Nancy rises wail of women and men, the voice of weeping and desolation, the city weeping for its slain who awaken not. These streets are empty but for victorious patrols. Thus has fortune, favoring the brave, dragged bull, as himself says, out of such a frightful peril, by the hair of the head. An intrepid adamantine man this bull, had he stood in old Broy's place, in those Bastille days, it might have been all different. He has extinguished mutiny, an immeasurable civil war. Not for nothing, as we see. Yet at a rate which he and constitutional patriotism considers cheap. Nay, as for Bull, he, urged by subsequent contradiction which arose, declares coldly, it was rather against his own private mind, and more by public military rule of duty, that he did extinguish it. Immeasurable civil war being now the only chance. Urged, we say, by subsequent contradiction. Civil war, indeed, is chaos. And in all vital chaos, there is new order shaping itself free, but what a faith this, that of all new orders out of chaos and possibility of man and his universe. Louis XVI and two-chamber monarchy were precisely the one that would shape itself. It is like undertaking to throw Ducey's, say only five hundred successive times, and any other throw to be fatal, for bull. Rather thank fortune, and heaven, always, thou intrepid bull, and let contradiction of its way. Civil war, conflagrating universally over France at this moment, might have led to one thing or to another thing, meanwhile, to quench conflagration, wheresoever one finds it, wheresoever one can. This, in all times, is the rule for man and general officer. But at Paris, so agitated and divided, fancy how it went, when the continually vibrating orderlies vibrated thither at hand gallop, with such questionable news. High is the gratulation. And also deep the indignation. An august assembly, by overwhelming majorities, passionately thanks Bull, a king's autograph, the voices of all loyal, all constitutional men run to the same tenor. A solemn national funeral service, for the law defenders slain at Nancy, is said and sung in the Champ de Mars, Bailey, Lafayette and National Guards, all except the few that protested, assist. With pomp and circumstance, with episcopal calicoes in tricolor girdles, altar of fatherland smoking with cassolettes or incense kettles. The vast Champ de Mars wholly hung round with black mort cloth, which mort cloth and expenditure Marat thinks had better have been laid out in bread, in these dear days, and given to the hungry living patriot. On the other hand, living patriotism, and Saint Antoine, which we have seen noisily closing its shops and such like, assembles now, to the number of forty thousand. And, with loud cries, under the very windows of the thanking National Assembly, demands revenge for murdered brothers, judgment on bull, and instant dismissal of War Minister Latour du Pin. At sound and sight of which things, if not War Minister Latour, yet, adored Minister, Necker, sees good on the 3D of September 1790, to withdraw softly, almost privily, with an eye to the recovery of his health. Home to native Switzerland. Not as he last came, lucky to reach it alive. Fifteen months ago, we saw him coming, with escort of horse, with sound of clarion and trumpet, and now at Arsis sur Aube, while he departs unescorted soundless, the populace and municipals stop him as a fugitive. Are not unlike massacring him as a traitor. The National Assembly, consulted on the matter, gives him free egress as a nullity. Such an unstable, drift mold of accident, is the substance of this lower world, for them that dwell in houses of clay. 
So, especially in hot regions and times, do the proudest palaces we build of it take wings, and become Sahara sand palaces, spinning many pillared in the whirlwind, and bury us under their sand. In spite of the 40,000, the National Assembly persists in its thanks, and Royalist Latour du Pin continues minister. The 40,000 assemble next day, as loud as ever, roll towards Latour's hotel. Find cannon on the porch steps with flambeau lit, and have to retire elsewhere, and digest their spleen, or reabsorb it into the blood. Over in Lorraine, meanwhile, they of the distributed fusils, ringleaders of Mestreda Camp, of Roy, have got marked out for judgment, yet shall never get judged. Briefer is the doom of Chateauvieux. Chateauvieux is, by Swiss law, given up for instant trial in court-martial of its own officers. Which court-martial, with all brevity, in not many hours, has hanged some twenty-three, on conspicuous gibbets. Marched some threescore in chains to the galleys, and so, to appearance, finished the matter off. Hanged men do cease forever from this earth, but out of chains and the galleys there may be resuscitation in triumph. Resuscitation for the chained hero, and even for the chained scoundrel, or semi-scoundrel. Scottish John Knox, such world hero, as we know, sat once nevertheless pulling grim taciturn at the oar of French galley, in the water of lore. And even flung their Virgin Mary over, instead of kissing her, as, a pentade bread, or timber virgin, who could naturally swim. So, ye of Chateauvieux, tug patiently, not without hope. But indeed, at Nancy generally, aristocracy rides triumphant, rough. Bull is gone again, the second day, an aristocrat municipality, with free course, is as cruel as it had before been cowardly. The daughter society, as the mother of the whole mischief, lies ignominiously suppressed, the prisons can hold no more, bereaved downbeaten patriotism murmurs, not loud but deep. Here and in the neighboring towns, flattened balls, picked from the streets of Nancy are worn at buttonholes, balls flattened in carrying death to patriotism, men wear them there, in perpetual memento of revenge. Mutineer deserters roam the woods. Have to demand charity at the musket's end. All is dissolution, mutual rancor, gloom and despair, till National Assembly commissioners arrive, with a steady gentle flame of constitutionalism in their hearts who gently lift up the downtrodden, gently pull down the two uplifted, reinstate the daughter society, recall the mutineer deserter, gradually leveling, strive in all wise ways to smooth and soothe. With such gradual mild leveling on the one side, as with solemn funeral service, castellets, courts martial, national thanks, all that officiality can do is done. The buttonhole will drop its flat ball. The black ashes, so far as may be, get green again. This is the affair of Nancy, by some called the massacre of Nancy. Properly speaking, the unsightly wrong side of that thrice glorious feast of pikes, the right side of which formed a spectacle for the very gods. Right side and wrong lie always so near, the one was in July, in August the other. Theatres, the theatres over in London, are bright with their pasteboard simulacrum of that federation of the French people, brought out as drama this of Nancy, we may say, though not played in any pasteboard theatre, did for many months enact itself, and even walk spectrally, in all French heads. For the news of it fly peeling through all France, awakening, in town and village, in clubroom, messroom, to the utmost borders, some mimic reflex or imaginative repetition of the business, always with the angry questionable assertion, it was right. It was wrong. Whereby come controversies, duels, embitterment, vain jargon, the hastening forward, the augmenting and intensifying of whatever new explosions lie in store for us. Meanwhile, at this cost or at that, the mutiny, as we say, is stilled. The French army has neither burst up in universal simultaneous delirium, nor been at once disbanded, put an end to, and made new again. It must die in the chronic manner, through years, by inches. With partial revolts, as of breast sailors or the like, which dare not spread, with men unhappy, insubordinate. Officers unhappier, in royalist mustachios, taking horse, singly or in bodies, across the Rhine, sick dissatisfaction, sick disgust on both sides. 
The army moribund, fit for no duty, till it do, in that unexpected manner, phoenix-like, with long throes, get both dead and newborn, then start forth strong, nay stronger and even strongest. Thus much was the brave bull hitherto fated to do. Wherewith let him again fade into dimness, and at Metz or the rural cantonments, assiduously drilling, mysteriously diplomatizing, in scheme within scheme, hover as formerly a faint shadow, the hope of royalty. Book 2.3 The Tilleries Chapter 2.3.I Epimenides How true that there is nothing dead in this universe, that what we call dead is only changed, its forces working in inverse order. The leaf that lies rotting in moist winds, says one, has still force, else how could it rot? Our whole universe is but an infinite complex of forces, thousandfold, from gravitation up to thought and will. Man's freedom environed with necessity of nature, in all which nothing at any moment slumbers, but all is for ever awake and busy. The thing that lies isolated and active thou shalt nowhere discover. Seek everywhere from the granite mountain, slow mouldering since creation, to the passing cloud vapor, to the living man, to the action, to the spoken word of man. The word that is spoken, as we know, flies irrevocable, not less, but more, the action that is done. The gods themselves, sings Pindar, cannot annihilate the action that is done. No, this, once done, is done always, cast forth into endless time. And, long conspicuous or soon hidden, must verily work and grow forever there, an indestructible new element in the infinite of things. Or, indeed, what is this infinite of things itself, which men name universe, but an action, a sum total of actions and activities? The living ready-made sum total of these three, which calculation cannot add, cannot bring on its tablets. Yet the sum, we say, is written visible, all that has been done, all that is doing, all that will be done. Understand it well, the thing thou beholdest, that thing is an action, the product and expression of exerted force, the all of things is an infinite conjugation of the verb to do. Shoreless found notion of force, of power to do. Wherein force rolls and circles, billowing, many streamed, harmonious, wide as immensity, deep as eternity, beautiful and terrible, not to be comprehended, this is what man names existence and universe. This thousand-tinted flame image, at once veil and revelation, reflex such as he, in his poor brain and heart, can paint, of one unnameable dwelling in inaccessible light. From beyond the star galaxies, from before the beginning of days, it billows and rolls, round thee, nay thyself art of it, in this point of space where thou now standest, in this moment which thy clock measures. Or apart from all transcendentalism, is it not a plain truth of sense, which the duller mind can even consider as a truism, that human things wholly are in continual movement, and action and reaction. Working continually forward, faces after faces, by unalterable laws, towards prescribed issues. How often must we say, and yet not rightly lay to heart, the seed that is sown, it will spring. Given the summer's blossoming, then there is also given the autumnal withering, so is it ordered not with seed fields only, but with transactions, arrangements, philosophies, societies, French revolutions. Whatsoever man works within this lower world. The beginning holds in at the end, and all that leads thereto, as the acorn does the oak and its fortunes. Solemn enough, did we think of it, which unhappily and also happily we do not very much. Thou there canst begin. The beginning is for thee, and there, but where, and of what sort, and for whom will the end be? All grows, and seeks, and endures its destinies, consider likewise how much grows, as the trees do, whether we think of it or not. So that when your Epimenides, your somnolent Peter Klaus, since named Rip Van Winkle, awakens again, he finds it a changed world. In that seven years sleep of his, so much has changed. All that is without us will change while we think not of it. Much even that is within us. The truth that was yesterday a restless problem, has today grown a belief burning to be uttered, on the morrow, contradiction has exasperated it into mad fanaticism, obstruction has dulled it into sick inertness. 
it is sinking towards silence, of satisfaction, or of resignation. Today is not yesterday, for man, or for thing. Yesterday there was the oath of love, today has come the curse of hate. Not willingly, ah, no, but it could not help coming. The golden radiance of youth, would it willingly have tarnished itself into the dimness of old age, fearful, how we stand enveloped, deep sunk, in that mystery of time, and are sons of time, fashioned and woven out of time. And on us, and on all that we have, or see, or do, is written, Rest not, continue not, forward to thy doom. But in seasons of revolution, which indeed distinguish themselves from common seasons by their velocity mainly, your miraculous seven sleeper might, with miracle enough, wake sooner, not by the century, or seven years, need he sleep. Often not by the seven months. Fancy, for example, some new Peter Klaus, sated with the jubilee of that Federation Day, had lain down, say directly after the blessing of Talleyrand. And, reckoning it all safe now, had fallen composedly asleep under the timberwork of the Fatherland's altar, to sleep there, not twenty-one years, but as it were year and day. The cannonading of Nancy, so far off, does not disturb him. Nor does the black mort cloth, close at hand, nor the requiems chanted, and minute guns, incense pans and concourse right over his head, none of these, but Peter sleeps through them all. Through one circling year, as we say. From July 14th of 1790, till July the 17th of 1791, but on that latter day, no Klaus, nor most leaden Epimenides, only the dead could continue sleeping, and so our miraculous Peter Klaus awakens. With what eyes, O Peter! Earth and sky have still their joyous July look, and the chant Mars is multitudinous with men, but the jubilee huzzahing has become bedlam shrieking, of terror and revenge. Not blessing of Talleyrand, or any blessing, but cursing, imprecation and shrill wail, our cannon salvos are turned to sharp shot. For swinging of incense pans and eighty-three departmental banners, we have waving of the one sanguinous drapeau rouge dot, thou foolish Klaus. The one lay in the other, the one was the other minus time. Even as Hannibal's rock-rending vinegar lay in the sweet new wine. That sweet federation was of last year, this sour devulsion is the self-same substance, only older by the appointed days. No miraculous Klaus or Epimenides sleeps in these times, and yet, may not many a man, if of due opacity and levity, act the same miracle in a natural way, we mean, with his eyes open. Eyes has he, but he sees not, except what is under his nose. With a sparkling briskness of glance, as if he not only saw but saw through, such a one goes whisking, assiduous, in his circle of officialities. Not dreaming but that it is the whole world, as, indeed, where your vision terminates, does not inanity begin there, and the world's end clearly declares itself, to you? Whereby our brisk sparkling assiduous official person, call him, for instance, Lafayette, suddenly startled, after year and day, by huge grape-shot tumult, stares not less astonished at it than Peter Klaus would have done. Such natural miracle Lafayette can perform, and indeed not he only but most other officials, non-officials, and generally the whole French people can perform it, and do bounce up, ever and anon, like amazed seven sleepers awakening. Awakening amazed at the noise they themselves make. So strangely is freedom, as we say, environed in necessity, such a singular somnambulism, of conscious and unconscious, of voluntary and involuntary, is this life of man. If anywhere in the world there was astonishment that the Federation oath went into grape shot, surely of all persons the French, first swearers and then shooters, felt astonished the most. Alas, offenses must come. The sublime feast of pikes, with its effulgence of brotherly love, unknown since the age of gold, has changed nothing. That prurient heat in twenty-five millions of hearts is not cooled thereby, but is still hot, nay hotter. Lift off the pressure of command from so many millions, all pressure or binding rule, except such melodramatic federation oath as they have bound themselves with. For thou shalt was from of old the condition of man's being, and his weal and blessedness was in obeying that. Woe for him when, were it on hest of the clearest necessity, rebellion, disloyal isolation, 
and mere I will, becomes his rule. But the gospel of Jean-Jacques has come, and the first sacrament of it has been celebrated, all things, as we say, are got into hot and hotter prurience, and must go on pruriently fermenting, in continual change noted or unnoted. Worn out with disgusts, captain after captain, in royalist mustachios, mounts his warhorse, or his Rosinante wargaron, and rides minatory across the Rhine, till all have ridden. Neither does civic emigration cease, seigneur after seigneur must, in like manner, ride or roll, impelled to it, and even compelled. For the very peasants despise him in that he dare not join his order and fight. Can he bear to have a distaff, a canoeil sent to him, say in copperplate shadow, by post, or fixed up in wooden reality over his gate lintel, as if he were no Hercules but an omphily? Such scutcheon they forward to him diligently from behind the Rhine, till he too bestir himself and march, and in sour humor, another lord of land is gone, not taking the land with him. Nay, what of captains and emigrating seigneurs? There is not an angry word on any of those twenty-five million French tongues, and indeed not an angry thought in their hearts, but is some fraction of the great battle. Add many successions of angry words together, you have the manual brawl. Add brawls together, with the festering sorrows they leave, and they rise to riots and revolts. One reverend thing after another ceases to meet reverence, invisible material combustion, chateau after chateau mounts up. In spiritual invisible combustion, one authority after another. With noise and glare, or noisily and unnoted, a whole old system of things is vanishing piecemeal, on the morrow thou shalt look and it is not. Chapter 2.3.2 .2. The Wakeful Sleep who will, cradled in hope and short vision, like Lafayette, who always in the danger done sees the last danger that will threaten him, time is not sleeping, nor time seed field. That sacred herald's college of a new dynasty. We mean the sixty and odd bill stickers with their leaden badges, are not sleeping. Daily they, with paste pot and cross staff, new clothed the walls of Paris in colors of the rainbow, authoritative heraldic, as we say, or indeed almost magical thaumaturgic. For no placard journal that they paste but will convince some soul or souls of man. The Hawker's Ball. And the Ballad Zingers, great journalism blows and blusters, through all its throats, forth from Paris towards all corners of France, like an eolus cave, keeping alive all manner of fires. Throats or journals there are, as men count, to the number of some hundred and thirty-three. Of various caliber, from your Cheniers, Gorsaises, Camilles, down to your Marat, down now to your incipient Hébert of the Père Duchesne. These blow, with fierce weight of argument or quick light banter, for the rights of man, Durasois, Royus, Peltiers, Sullos, equally with mixed tactics, inclusive, singular to say, of much profane parody, are blowing for altar and throne. As for Marat the people's friend, his voice is as that of the bullfrog, or bittern by the solitary pools, he, unseen of men, croaks harsh thunder, and that alone continually, of indignation, suspicion, incurable sorrow. The people are sinking towards ruin, near starvation itself, my dear friends, cries he, your indigence is not the fruit of vices nor of idleness, you have a right to life, as good as Louis XVI, or the happiest of the century. What man can say he has a right to dine, when you have no bread? The people sinking on the one hand, on the other hand, nothing but wretched sur motiers, treasonous riquetti mirabos. Traitors, or else shadows, and simulacra of quacks, to be seen in high places, look where you will. Men that go mincing, grimacing, with plausible speech and brushed raiment, hollow within, quacks political, quacks scientific, academical. All with a fellow feeling for each other, and kind of quack public spirit. Not great Lavoisier himself, or any of the forty can escape this rough tongue, which wants not fanatic sincerity, nor, strangest of all, a certain rough caustic sense. And then the, three thousand gaming houses, that are in Paris, cesspools for the scoundrelism of the world, sinks of iniquity and debauchery, whereas without good morals liberty is impossible. There, in these dens of Satan, which one knows, and perseveringly denounces, do Sieur Motier's Mutchard's consort and colleague, battening vampire-like on a people next door to starvation. 
O couple, cries he oft times, with heartrending accent. Treason, delusion, vampirism, scoundrelism, from Dan to Beersheba. The soul of Marat is sick with the sight, but what remedy? To erect eight hundred gibbets, in convenient rows, and proceed to hoisting, Riketi on the first of them. Such is the brief recipe of Marat, friend of the people. So blow and bluster the hundred and thirty-three, nor, as would seem, are these sufficient, for there are benighted nooks in France, to which newspapers do not reach. And everywhere is such an appetite for news as was never seen in any country. Let an expeditious Damp Martin, on furlough, set out to return home from Paris, he cannot get along four peasants stopping him on the highway. Overwhelming him with questions, the maitre de poste will not send out the horses till you have well nigh quarrelled with him, but asks always, what news? At Auten, in spite of the rigorous frost, for it is now January, 1791, nothing will serve but you must gather your wayworn limbs, and thoughts, and, speak to the multitudes from a window opening into the marketplace. It is the shortest method, this, good Christian people, is verily what an august assembly seemed to me to be doing, this and no other is the news. Now my weary lips I close. Leave me, leave me to repose. The good damp Martin. But, on the whole, are not nations astonishingly true to their national character, which indeed runs in the blood? Nineteen hundred years ago, Julius Caesar, with his quick sure eye, took note how the Gauls waylaid men. It is a habit of theirs, says he, to stop travellers, were it even by constraint, and inquire whatsoever each of them may have heard or known about any sort of matter, in their towns, the common people beset the passing trader. Demanding to hear from what regions he came, what things he got acquainted with there. Excited by which rumours and hearsays they will decide about the weightiest matters. And necessarily repent next moment that they did it, on such guidance of uncertain reports, and many a traveller answering with mere fictions to please them, and get off. Nineteen hundred years. And good damp Martin, wayworn, in winter frost, probably with scant light of stars and fish oil, still pirates from the inn window. This people is no longer called Gaulish. And it has wholly become Bricatus, has got breeches, and suffered change enough, certain fierce German Franken came storming over, and, so to speak, vaulted on the back of it, and always after, in their grim tenacious way, have ridden it bridled. For German is, by his very name, German, or man that wars and gars. And so the people, as we say, is now called French or Frankish, nevertheless, does not the old Gaulish and Gaelic Celthood, with its vehemence, effervescent promptitude, and what good and ill it had, still vindicate itself little adulterated? For the rest, that in such prurient confusion, clubism thrives and spreads, need not be said. Already the mother of patriotism, sitting in the Jacobins, shines supreme over all. And has paled the poor lunar light of that monarchic club near to final extinction. She, we say, Shine supreme, girt with sunlight, not yet with infernal lightning, reverenced, not without fear, by municipal authorities. Counting her barnaves, lammaths, pessions, of a national assembly, most gladly of all, her Robespierre. Cordeliers, again, your Hébert, Vincent, Bibliopolist Mamoro, grown audibly that a tyrannous mayor and sieur mote your harrow them with the sharp tribula of law, intent apparently to suppress them by tribulation. How the Jacobin Mother Society, as hinted formerly, sheds forth cordeliers on this hand, and then fulans on that, the cordeliers on this hand, and then fulans on that, the cordeliers, an elixir or double distillation of Jacobin patriotism. The other a widespread weak delusion thereof, how she will reabsorb the former into her mother bosom, and stormfully dissipate the latter into nonentity, how she breeds and brings forth three hundred daughter societies. Her rearing of them, her correspondence, her endeavourings and continual travail, how, under an old figure, Jacobinism shoots forth organic filaments to the utmost corners of confused dissolved France. Organising it anew, this properly is the grand fact of the time. To passionate constitutionalism, still more to royalism, which see all their own clubs fail and die, clubism will naturally grow to seem the root of all evil. Nevertheless clubism is not death, 
but rather new organization, and life out of death, destructive, indeed, of the remnants of the old, but to the new important, indispensable. That man can cooperate and hold communion with man, herein lies his miraculous strength. In hut or hamlet, patriotism mourns not now like voice in the desert, it can walk to the nearest town. And there, in the daughter society, make its ejaculation into an articulate oration, into an action, guided forward by the mother of patriotism herself. All clubs of constitutionalists, and such like, fail, one after another, as shallow fountains, Jacobinism alone has gone down to the deep subterranean lake of waters, and may, unless filled in, flow there, copious, continual, like an artesian well. Till the great deep have drained itself up, and all be flooded and submerged, and Noah's deluge out deluged. On the other hand, Claude Fawcett, preparing mankind for a golden age now apparently just at hand, has opened his circle social, with clerks, corresponding boards, and so forth, in the precincts of the Palais Royal. It is Te Deum Fawcett. The same who preached on Franklin's death, in that huge Medicean rotunda of the Halley Aux Bleds. He here, this winter, by printing press and melodious colloquy, spreads brute of himself to the utmost city barriers. Ten thousand persons, of respectability attend there, and listen to this, Procure General de la Verite, Attorney General of Truth, so has he dubbed himself, to his sage Condorcet, or other eloquent coadjutor. Eloquent Attorney General. He blows out from him, better or worse, what crude or ripe thing he holds, not without result to himself, for it leads to a bishopric, though only a constitutional one. Fawcett approves himself a glib-tongued, strong-lunged, whole-hearted human individual, much flowing matter there is, and really of the better sort, about right, nature, benevolence, progress. Which flowing matter, whether, it is pantheistic, or is pot-theistic, only the greener mind, in these days, need read. Busy Brissett was long ago of purpose to establish precisely some such regenerative social circle, nay he had tried it, in Newman Street Oxford Street, of the Fog Babylon, and failed, as some say, surreptitiously pocketing the cash. Fawcett, not Brissett, was fated to be the happy man, whereat, however, generous Brissett will with sincere heart sing a timber-toned nunc domini. But, ten thousand persons of respectability what a bulk have many things in proportion to their magnitude. This circle social, for which Brissett chants in sincere timber-tones such nunc domini, what is it? Unfortunately wind and shadow. The main reality one finds in it now, is perhaps this, that an Attorney General of Truth did once take shape of a body, as son of Adam, on our earth, though but for months or moments. And ten thousand persons of respectability attended, ere yet chaos and Knox had reabsorbed him. 133 Paris Journals, Regenerative Social Circle. Oratory, in mother and daughter societies, from the balconies of inns, by chimney nook, at dinner table, polemical, ending many times in duel. Add ever, like a constant growling accompaniment of base discord, scarcity of work, scarcity of food. The winter is hard and cold, ragged baker's cues, like a black tattered flag of distress, wave out ever and anon. It is the third of our hunger years this new year of a glorious revolution. The rich man when invited to dinner, in such distress seasons, feels bound in politeness to carry his own bread in his pocket, how the poor dine. And your glorious revolution has done it, cries one. And our glorious revolution is satiety, by black traders worthy of the lamp iron, perverted to do it, cries another. Who will paint the huge whirlpool wherein France, all shivered into wild incoherence, whirls? The jarring that went on under every French roof, in every French heart, the diseased things that were spoken, done, the sum total whereof is the French Revolution, tongue of man cannot tell. Nor the laws of action that work unseen in the depths of that huge blind incoherence. With amazement, not with measurement, men look on the immeasurable, not knowing its laws. Seeing, with all different degrees of knowledge, what new phases, and results of event, its laws bring forth. France is as a monstrous galvanic mass, wherein all sorts of far stranger than chemical galvanic or electric forces and substances are at work, electrifying one another, 
positive and negative. Filling with electricity your Leiden jars, 25 millions in number. As the jars get full, there will, from time to time, be, on slight hint, an explosion. Chapter 2.3.3 Sword in Hand On such wonderful basis, however, has law, royalty, authority, and whatever yet exists of visible order, to maintain itself, while it can. Here, as in that commixture of the four elements did the anarch old, has an august assembly spread its pavilion, curtained by the dark infinite of discords, founded on the wavering bottomless of the abyss, and keeps continual hubbub. Time is around it, and eternity, and the inane, and it does what it can, what is given it to do. Glancing reluctantly in, once more, we discern little that is edifying, a constitutional theory of defective verbs struggling forward, with perseverance, amid endless interruptions, Mirabeau, from his tribune, with the weight of his name and genius. Awing down much Jacobin violence. Which in return vents itself the louder over in its Jacobin's hall, and even reads him sharp lectures there. This man's path is mysterious, questionable, difficult, and he walks without companion in it. Pure patriotism does not now count him among her chosen, pure royalism abhors him, yet his weight with the world is overwhelming. Let him travel on, companionless, unwavering, whither he is bound, while it is yet day with him, and the night has not come. But the chosen band of pure patriot brothers is small. Counting only some thirty, seated now on the extreme tip of the left, separate from the world. A virtuous passion, an incorruptible Robespierre, most consistent, incorruptible of thin acrid men. Triumvirs Barnave, Duport, Lameth, great in speech, thought, action, each according to his kind, a lean old Goupil de Prefelm, on these and what will follow them has pure patriotism to depend. There too, conspicuous among the thirty, if seldom audible, Philippe d'Orleans may be seen sitting, in dim fuliginous bewilderment, having, one might say, arrived at chaos. Gleams there are, at once of a lieutenancy and regency. Debates in the assembly itself, of succession to the throne, in case the present branch should fail, and Philippe, they say, walked anxiously, in silence, through the corridors, till such high argument were done, but it came all to nothing. Mirabeau, glaring into the man, and through him, had to ejaculate in strong untranslatable language, Su J. F. Anivot pa la pain kuan se don pour Louis. It came all to nothing, and in the meanwhile Philippe's money, they say, is gone. Could he refuse a little cash to the gifted patriot, in want only of that, he himself in want of all but that? Not a pamphlet can be printed without cash, or indeed written, without food purchasable by cash. Without cash your hopefulest projector cannot stir from the spot, individual patriotic or other projects require cash, how much more do widespread intrigues, which live and exist by cash, lying widespread, with dragon appetite for cash. Fit to swallow princedoms. And so Prince Philippe, amid his silleries, lack loses, and confused sons of night, has rolled along, the center of the strangest cloudy coil. Out of which has visibly come, as we often say, an epic preternatural machinery of suspicion. And within which there has dwelt and worked, what specialties of treason, stratagem, aimed or aimless endeavor towards mischief, no party living, if it be not the presiding genius of it, prince of the power of the air, has now any chance to know. Camille's conjecture is the likeliest, that poor Philippe did mount up, a little way, in treasonable speculation, as he mounted formerly in one of the earliest balloons. But, frightened at the new position he was getting into, had soon turned the cock again, and come down. More fool than he rose. To create preternatural suspicion, this was his function in the revolutionary epos. But now if he have lost his cornucopia of ready money, what else had he to lose? In thick darkness, inward and outward, he must welter and flounder on, in that piteous death element, the hapless man. Once, or even twice, we shall still behold him emerged, struggling out of the thick death element, in vain. For one moment, it is the last moment, he starts aloft, or is flung aloft, even into clearness and a kind of memorability, to sink then forevermore. The Cote Droit persists no less. 
nay with more animation than ever, though hope has now well nigh fled. Tough Abe Mori, when the obscure country royalist grasps his hand with transport of thanks, answers, rolling his indomitable brazen head, Hellas, monsieur, all that I do here is as good as simply nothing. Gallant Fossigny, visible this one time in history, advances frantic, into the middle of the hall, exclaiming, there is but one way of dealing with it, and that is to fall sword in hand on those gentry there, saber a la main sur ces galets la. Frantically indicating our chosen thirty on the extreme tip of the left. Whereupon is clangor and clamor, debate, repentance, evaporation. Things ripen towards downright incompatibility, and what is called scission, that fierce theoretic onslaught of Fossignes was in August, 1790. Next August will not have come, till a famed 292, the chosen of royalism, make solemn final scission from an assembly given up to faction, and depart, shaking the dust off their feet. Connected with this matter of sword in hand, there is yet another thing to be noted. Of duels we have sometimes spoken, how, in all parts of France, innumerable duels were fought. And argumentative men and messmates, flinging down the wine cup and weapons of reason and repartee, met in the measured field, to part bleeding. Or perhaps not to part, but to fall mutually skewered through with iron, their wrath and life alike ending, and die as fools die. Long has this lasted, and still lasts. But now it would seem as if in an august assembly itself, traitorous royalism, in its despair, had taken to a new course, that of cutting off patriotism by systematic duel. Bully swordsmen, spadassins, of that party, go swaggering. Or indeed they can be had for a trifle of money. Twelve spadassins were seen, by the yellow eye of journalism, arriving recently out of Switzerland. Also, a considerable number of assassins, known by considerable de-assassins, exercising in fencing schools and at pistol targets. Any patriot deputy of Mark can be called out. Let him escape one time, or ten times, a time there necessarily is when he must fall, and France mourn. How many cartels has Mirabeau had, especially while he was the people's champion? Cartels by the hundred, which he, since the constitution must be made first, and his time is precious, answers now always with a kind of stereotype formula, Monsieur, you are put upon my list. But I warn you that it is long, and I grant no preferences. Then, in autumn, had we not the duel of Cazals and Barnave, the two chief masters of tongue shot meeting now to exchange pistol shot? For Cazals, chief of the royalists, whom we call blacks or noirs, said, in a moment of passion, the patriots were sheer brigands, nay, in so speaking, he darted or seemed to dart a fire glance specially at Barnave. Who thereupon could not but reply by fire glances, by adjournment to the Bois de Boulogne. Barnave's second shot took effect, on Cazalza's hat. The front nook of a triangular felt, such as mortals then wore, deadened the ball. And saved that fine brow from more than temporary injury. But how easily might the lot have fallen the other way, and Barnave's hat not been so good. Patriotism raises its loud denunciation of dueling in general. Petitions an august assembly to stop such feudal barbarism by law. Barbarism and solecism, for will it convince or convict any man to blow half an ounce of lead through the head of him? Surely not. Barnave was received at the Jacobins with embraces, yet with rebukes. Mindful of which, and also that his repetition in America was that of headlong foolhardiness rather, and want of brain not of heart, Charles Lameth does, on the eleventh day of November, with little emotion. Decline attending some hot young gentleman from Artois, come expressly to challenge him, nay indeed he first coldly engages to attend. Then coldly permits two friends to attend instead of him, and shame the young gentleman out of it, which they successfully do. A cold procedure, satisfactory to the two friends, to Lameth and the hot young gentleman. Whereby, one might have fancied, the whole matter was cooled down. Not so, however, Lameth, proceeding to his senatorial duties, in the decline of the day, is met in those assembly corridors by nothing but royalist brocards. Sniffs, huffs, and open insults. Human patience has its limits, monsieur, said Lameth, 
breaking silence to one Lautrec, a man with hunchback, or natural deformity, but sharp of tongue, and a black of the deepest tint, monsieur, if you were a man to be fought with. I am one, cries the young Duc de Castries. Fast as fire flash Lameth replies, tout a lure, on the instant, then. And so, as the shades of dusk thicken in that bois de Boulogne, we behold two men with lion look, with alert attitude, side foremost, right foot advanced, flourishing and thrusting, staccato and passato, in tierce and quart. Intent to skewer one another. See, with most skewering purpose, headlong Lameth, with his whole weight, makes a furious lunge. But deft Castries whisks aside, Lameth skewers only the air, and slits deep and far, on Castries' sword's point, his own extended left arm. Whereupon with bleeding, pallor, surgeon's lint, and formalities, the duel is considered satisfactorily done. But will there be no end, then? Beloved Lameth lies deep slit, not out of danger. Black traitorous aristocrats kill the people's defenders, cut up not with arguments, but with rapier slits. And the twelve spadassins out of Switzerland, and the considerable number of assassins exercising at the pistol target? So meditates and ejaculates hurt patriotism, with ever-deepening ever-widening fervor, for the space of six and thirty hours. The thirty-six hours passed, on Saturday the thirteenth, one beholds a new spectacle, the Rue de Varennes, and neighboring Boulevard de Invalides, covered with a mixed flowing multitude, the Castries Hotel gone distracted, devil-ridden. Belching from every window, beds with clothes and curtains, plate of silver and gold with filigree, mirrors, pictures, images, commodes, chiffoniers, and endless crockery in jingle, amid steady popular cheers, absolutely without theft. For there goes a cry, he shall be hanged that steals a nail. It is a plebiscitum, or informal iconoclastic decree of the common people, in the course of being executed, the municipality sit tremulous. Deliberating whether they will hang out the drapeau rouge and martial law, national assembly, part in loud wail. Part in hardly suppressed applause, Abe Mori unable to decide whether the iconoclastic plebs amount to 40,000 or to 200,000. Deputations, swift messengers, for it is at a distance over the river, come and go. Lafayette and National Guards, though without drapeau rouge, get underway, apparently in no hot haste. Nay, arrived on the scene, Lafayette salutes with doffed hat, before ordering to fix bayonets. What avails it? The plebeian, court of cassation, as Camille might punningly name it, has done its work. Steps forth, with unbuttoned vest, with pockets turned inside out, sack, and just ravage, not plunder. With inexhaustible patience, the hero of two worlds remonstrates. Persuasively, with a kind of sweet constraint, though also with fixed bayonets, dissipates, hushes down, on the morrow it is once more all as usual. Considering which things, however, Duke Castries may justly, write to the President, justly transport himself across the marches, to raise a corps, or do what else is in him. Royalism totally abandons that Bobadillian method of contest, and the twelve spadassins return to Switzerland, or even to Dreamland through the Horn Gate, which soever their home is. Nay Editor Prudhomme is authorized to publish a curious thing, we are authorized to publish, says he, dull blustering publisher, that M. Boyer, champion of good patriots, is at the head of fifty spadassinicides or bully killers. His address is, Passage du Bois de Boulange, Faubourg Saint Denis. One of the strangest institutes, this of Champion Boyer and the Bully Killers. Whose services, however, are not wanted. Royalism having abandoned the rapier method as plainly impracticable. Chapter 2.3.4 To fly or not to fly. The truth is Royalism sees itself verging toward sad extremities, nearer and nearer daily. From over the Rhine it comes asserted that the king in his tilleries is not free, this the poor king may contradict, with the official mouth, but in his heart feels often to be undeniable. Civil Constitution of the Clergy Decree of ejectment against dissidents from it, not even to this latter, though almost his conscience rebels, can he say, nay, but, after two months hesitating, signs this also. It was on January 21, of this 1790, 
that he signed it. To the sorrow of his poor slash heart yet, on another 21st of January. Whereby come dissident ejected priests, unconquerable martyrs according to some, incurable chicaning traitors according to others. And so there has arrived what we once foreshadowed, with religion, or with the cant and echo of religion, all France is rent asunder in a new rupture of continuity, complicating, embittering all the older. To be cured only, by stern surgery, in Lavade. Unhappy royalty, unhappy majesty, hereditary, representative, representant hereditaire, or however they can name him, of whom much is expected, to whom little is given. Blue National Guards encircle that Tilleries, a Lafayette, thin constitutional pedant, clear, thin, inflexible, as water, turned to thin ice, whom no queen's heart can love. National Assembly, its pavilion spread where we know, sits nearby, keeping continual hubbub. From without nothing but Nancy revolts, sack of Castries hotels, riots and seditions. Riots, north and south, at Aix, at Douai, at Beffert, Uses, Perpignan, at Nimes, and that incurable Avignon of the Popes, a continual crackling and sputtering of riots from the whole face of France, testifying how electric it grows. Add only the hard winter, the famished strikes of operatives, that continual running base of scarcity, ground tone and basis of all other discords. The plan of royalty, so far as it can be said to have any fixed plan, is still, as ever, that of flying towards the frontiers. In very truth, the only plan of the smallest promise for it. Fly to bull. Bristle yourself round with cannon, served by your 40,000 undebauched Germans summon the National Assembly to follow you, summon what of it is royalist, constitutional, gainable by money, dissolve the rest, by grapeshot if need be. Let Jacobinism and revolt, with one wild wail, fly into infinite space, driven by grapeshot. Thunder over France with the cannon's mouth, commanding, not entreating, that this riot cease. And then to rule afterwards with utmost possible constitutionality, doing justice, loving mercy, being shepherd of this indigent people, not shearer merely, and shepherd similitude. All this, if ye dare. If ye dare not, then in heaven's name go to sleep, other handsome alternative seems none. Nay, it were perhaps possible, with a man to do it. For if such inexpressible whirlpool of Babylonish confusions, which our era is, cannot be stilled by man, but only by time and men, a man may moderate its paroxysms, may balance and sway, and keep himself unswallowed on the top of it. As several men and kings in these days do. Much is possible for a man, men will obey a man that kens and cans, and name him reverently their kenning or king. Did not Charlemagne rule? Consider too whether he had smooth times of it. Hanging, thirty thousand Saxons over the Weezer Bridge, at one dread swoop. So likewise, who knows but, in this same distracted fanatic France, the right man may verily exist. An olive-complexion taciturn man. For the present, lieutenant in the artillery service, who once sat studying mathematics at Brienne. The same who walked in the morning to correct proof sheets at Dole, and enjoyed a frugal breakfast with M. Jolie. Such a one is gone, whither also famed General Pauli his friend is gone, in these very days, to see old scenes in native Corsica, and what democratic good can be done there. Royalty never executes the evasion plan, yet never abandons it. Living in variable hope, undecisive, till fortune shall decide. In utmost secrecy, a brisk correspondence goes on with Bull. There is also a plot, which emerges more than once, for carrying the king to Rouen, plot after plot, emerging and submerging, like Igni's fatuary in foul weather, which lead no whither. About ten o'clock at night, the hereditary representative, in party quarry, with the queen, with brother monsieur, and madam, sits playing, whisk, or whist. Usher Campan enters mysteriously, with a message he only half comprehends, how a certain Comte d'Anistel waits anxious in the outer antechamber, national colonel, captain of the watch for this night, is gained over, post horses ready all the way. Party of noblesse sitting armed, determined, will His Majesty, before midnight, consent to go. Profound silence, 
Campan waiting with upturned ear. Did your majesty hear what Campan said, asks the queen. Yes, I heard, answers majesty, and plays on. Twas a pretty couplet, that of Campan's, hints monsieur, who at times showed a pleasant wit, majesty, still unresponsive, plays whisk. After all, one must say something to Campan, remarks the queen. Tell him, Dionisto, said the king, and the queen puts an emphasis on it, that the king cannot consent to be forced away. I see, said Dionisto, whisking round, piquing himself into flame of irritancy, we have the risk. We are to have all the blame if it fail, and vanishes, he and his plot, as will-o'-wisps do. The queen sat till far in the night, packing jewels, but it came to nothing, in that peaked frame of irritancy the will-o'-wisp had gone out. Little hope there is in all this. Alas, with whom to fly? Our loyal guards do cor, ever since the insurrection of women, are disbanded, gone to their homes. Gone, many of them, across the Rhine towards Koblenz and exiled princes, brave Myomandra and brave Tardivet, these faithful too, have received, in nocturnal interview with both majesties, their viaticum of gold Louis. Of heartfelt thanks from a queen's lips, though unluckily, his majesty stood, back to fire, not speaking. And do now dine through the provinces, recounting hair's breadth escapes, insurrectionary horrors. Great horrors, to be swallowed yet of greater. But on the whole what a falling off from the old splendor of Versailles. Here in this poor Tilleries, a national brewer colonel, Sonora Santerre, parades officially behind Her Majesty's chair. Our high dignitaries, all fled over the Rhine, nothing now to be gained at court. But hopes, for which life itself must be risked. Obscure busy men frequent the back stairs, with hearsays, wind projects, unfruitful fanfaronades. Young royalists at the Theatre de Vaudeville, sing couplets, if that could do anything. Royalists enough, captains on furlough, burnt-out seigneurs, may likewise be met with, in the Café de Valois, and at me at the restaurateurs. There they fan one another into high loyal glow. Drink, in such wine as can be procured, confusion to sansculottism, shoe purchased dirks, of an improved structure, made to order, and, greatly daring, dine. It is in these places, in these months, that the epithet sansculotte first gets applied to indigent patriotism, in the last age we had Gilbert sansculotte, the indigent poet. Destitute of breeches, a mournful destitution. Which however, if twenty millions share it, may become more effective than most possessions. Meanwhile, amid this vague dim whirl of fanfaronades, wind projects, poniards made to order, there does disclose itself one punctum salience of life and feasibility, the finger of Mirabeau. Mirabeau and the Queen of France have met. Have parted with mutual trust. It is strange, secret as the mysteries, but it is indubitable. Mirabeau took horse, one evening, and rode westward, unattended, to see friend Clavier in that country house of his. Before getting to Clavier's, the much-musing horseman struck aside to a back gate of the Garden of St. Cloud, some Duke d'Eremberg, or the like, was there to introduce him. The Queen was not far, on a, round knoll, Ron Point, the highest of the Garden of St. Cloud, he beheld the Queen's face, spake with her, alone, under the void canopy of night. What an interview! fateful secret for us, after all searching. Like the colloquies of the gods. She called him, a Mirabeau elsewhere we read that she, was charmed with him, the wild submitted titan. As indeed it is among the honorable tokens of this high ill-fated heart that no mind of any endowment, no Mirabeau, nay no Barnave, no de Maurier, ever came face to face with her but, in spite of all prepossessions, she was forced to recognize it. To draw nigh to it, with trust. High imperial heart, with the instinctive attraction towards all that had any height. You know not the queen, said Mirabeau once in confidence, her force of mind is prodigious, she is a man for courage. And so, under the void night, on the crown of that knoll, she has spoken with a Mirabeau, he has kissed loyally the queenly hand, and said with enthusiasm, Madam, the monarchy is saved. Possible. The foreign powers, mysteriously sounded, gave favorable guarded response, 
Bull is at Metz, and could find 40,000 sure Germans. With a Mirabeau for head, and a bull for hand, something verily is possible, if fate intervene not. But figure under what thousandfold rapages and cloaks of darkness, royalty, meditating these things, must involve itself. There are men with, tickets of entrance, there are chivalrous consultings, mysterious plottings. Consider also whether, involve as it like, plotting royalty can escape the glance of patriotism, link's eyes, by the ten thousand fixed on it, which see in the dark. Patriotism knows much, know the dirks made to order, and can specify the shops. Knows Sir Motier's legions of mutchards, the tickets of Autre, and men in black, and how plan of evasion succeeds plan, or may be supposed to succeed it. Then conceive the couplets chanted at the Theatre de Vaudeville. Or worse, the whispers, significant nods of traitors in mustaches. Conceive, on the other hand, the loud cry of alarm that came through the hundred and thirty journals, the Dionysius ear of each of the forty-eight sections, wakeful night and day. Patriotism is patient of much, not patient of all. The Café de Procope has sent, visibly along the streets, a deputation of patriots, to expostulate with bad editors, by trustful word of mouth, singular to see and hear. The bad editors promise to amend, but do not. Deputations for change of ministry were many, Mayor Bailey joining even with Cordelier Danton in such, and they have prevailed. With what profit? Of quacks, willing or constrained to be quacks, the race is everlasting, ministers du Portail and du Turter will have to manage much as ministers Latour du Pin and Seiss did. So welters the confused world. But now, beaten on for ever by such inextricable contradictory influences and evidences, what is the indigent French patriot, in these unhappy days, to believe, and walk by? Uncertainty all, except that he is wretched, indigent. That a glorious revolution, the wonder of the universe, has hitherto brought neither bread or peace, being marred by traitors, difficult to discover. Traitors that dwell in the dark, invisible there. Or seen for moments, in pallid dubious twilight, stealthily vanishing thither. Preternatural suspicion once more rules the minds of men. Nobody here, writes Cara of the Annals Patriotiques, so early as the 1st of February, can entertain a doubt of the constant obstinate project these people have on foot to get the king away. Or of the perpetual succession of maneuvers they employ for that. Nobody, the watchful mother of patriotism deputed two members to her daughter at Versailles, to examine how the matter looked there. Well, and there. Patriotic Kara continues, the report of these two deputies we all heard with our own ears last Saturday. They went with others of Versailles, to inspect the king's stables, also the stables of the Wylam Guards du Corps. They found there from seven to eight hundred horses standing always saddled and bridled, ready for the road at a moment's notice. The same deputies, moreover, saw with their own two eyes several royal carriages, which men were even then busy loading with large well-stuffed luggage bags, leather cows, as we call them, batches de queer. The royal arms on the panels almost entirely effaced. Momentous enough. Also, on the same day the whole Marichaussi, or cavalry police, did assemble with arms, horses, and baggage, and disperse again. They want the king over the marches, that so Emperor Leopold and the German princes, whose troops are ready, may have a pretext for beginning, this, adds Kara. Is the word of the riddle, this is the reason why our fugitive aristocrats are now making levies of men on the frontiers. Expecting that, one of these mornings, the executive chief magistrate will be brought over to them, and the civil war commence. If indeed the executive chief magistrate, bagged, say in one of these leather cows, were once brought safe over to them. But the strangest thing of all is that patriotism, whether barking at a venture, or guided by some instinct of preternatural sagacity, is actually barking aright this time, at something, not at nothing. Bulla's secret correspondence, since made public, testifies as much. Nay, it is undeniable, visible to all, that Maidam the king's aunts are taking steps for departure, asking passports of the ministry, safe conducts of the municipality. Which Marat warns all men to beware of. They will carry gold with them, 
these old beguines, nay they will carry the little dauphin, having nursed a changeling, for some time, to leave in his stead. Besides, they are as some light substance flung up, to shew how the wind sits, a kind of proof kite you fly off to ascertain whether the grand paper kite, evasion of the king, may mount. In these alarming circumstances, patriotism is not wanting to itself. Municipality deputes to the king, sections depute to the municipality, a national assembly will soon stir. Meanwhile, behold, on the 19th of February, 1791, Madame, quitting Bellevue and Versailles with all privacy, are off. Towards Rome, seemingly, or one knows not whither. They are not without king's passports, countersigned. And what is more to the purpose, a serviceable escort. The patriotic mayor or mayorlet of the village of Moret tried to detain them, but brisk Louis de Narbonne, of the escort, dashed off at hand gallop. Returned soon with thirty dragoons, and victoriously cut them out. And so the poor ancient women go their way, to the terror of France and Paris, whose nervous excitability is become extreme. Who else would hinder poor Locke and Grail, now grown so old, and fallen into such unexpected circumstances, when gossip itself turning only on terrors and horrors is no longer pleasant to the mind? And you cannot get so much as an orthodox confessor in peace, from going what way soever the hope of any solacement might lead them? They go, poor ancient dames, whom the heart were hard that does not pity, they go, with palpitations, with unmelodious suppressed screechings. All France, screeching and cackling, in loud unsuppressed terror, behind and on both hands of them, such mutual suspicion is among men. At arne le duc above halfway to the frontiers, a patriotic municipality and populace again takes courage to stop them, Louis Narbonne must now back to Paris, must consult the National Assembly. National Assembly answers, not without an effort, that may dom may go. Whereupon Paris rises worse than ever, screeching half distracted. Tilleries and precincts are filled with women and men, while the National Assembly debates this question of questions, Lafayette is needed at night for dispersing them, and the streets are to be illuminated. Commandant Berthier, a Berthier before whom are great things unknown, lies for the present under blockade at Bellevue in Versailles. By no tactics could he get Madame luggage stirred from the courts there. Frantic Versailles women came screaming about him, his very troops cut the wagon traces, he retired to the interior, waiting better times. Nay, in these same hours, while Madame hardly cut out from Moret by the saber's edge, are driving rapidly, to foreign parts, and not yet stopped at Arnay, their august nephew poor Monsieur. At Paris has dived deep into his cellars of the Luxembourg for shelter. And according to Montgaillard can hardly be persuaded up again. Screeching multitudes environ that Luxembourg of his, drawn thither by report of his departure, but, at sight and sound of Monsieur, they become crowing multitudes. And escort Madame and him to the Tilleries with vivats. It is a state of nervous excitability such as few nations know. Chapter 2.3.V The Day of Poniards. Or, again, what means this visible reparation of the castle of Vincennes? Other jails being all crowded with prisoners, new space is wanted here, that is the municipal account. For in such changing of judicatures, parliaments being abolished, and new courts but just set up, prisoners have accumulated. Not to say that in these times of discord and club law, offenses and committals are, at any rate, more numerous. Which municipal account, does it not sufficiently explain the phenomenon? Surely, to repair the castle of Vincennes was of all enterprises that an enlightened municipality could undertake, the most innocent. Not so however does neighboring Saint Antoine look on it, Saint Antoine to whom these peak turrets and grim dungeons, all too near her own dark dwelling, are of themselves an offense. Was not Vincennes a kind of minor Bastille? Great Diderot and Philosophes have lain in durance here, great Mirabeau, in disastrous eclipse, for forty-two months. And now when the old Bastille has become a dancing ground, had any one the mirth to dance, and its stones are getting built into the Pont Louisis, does this minor, comparative insignificance of a Bastille flank itself with fresh hewn mullions. Spread out tyrannous wings. 
Menacing Patriotism New Space for Prisoners, and What Prisoners A D. Orleans, with the chief patriots on the tip of the left. It is said, there runs, a subterranean passage, all the way from the Tilleries hither. Who knows? Paris, mined with quarries and catacombs, does hang wondrous over the abyss, Paris was once to be blown up, though the powder, when we went to look, had got withdrawn. Artilleries, sold to Austria and Koblenz, should have no subterranean passage. Out of which might not Koblenz or Austria issue, some morning, and, with cannon of long range, Foudroyer, Beth under a patriotic Saint Antoine into smolder and ruin. So meditates the benighted soul of Saint Antoine, as it sees the aproned workmen, in early spring, busy on these towers. An official speaking municipality, a Sieur Motier with his legions of Mutchards, deserve no trust at all. Were Patriot Santerre, indeed, commander. But the sonorous brewer commands only our own battalion, of such secrets he can explain nothing, knows nothing, perhaps suspects much. And so the work goes on. An afflicted benighted Saint Antoine hears rattle of hammers, sees stones suspended in air. Saint Antoine prostrated the first great Bastille, will it falter over this comparative insignificance of a Bastille? Friends, what if we took pikes, firelocks, sledgehammers, and helped ourselves, speedier is no remedy, nor so certain. On the twenty-eighth day of February, Saint Antoine turns out, as it has now often done. And, apparently with little superfluous tumult, moves eastward to that Isaro of Vincennes. With grave voice of authority, no need of bullying and shouting, Saint Antoine signifies to parties concerned there that its purpose is, to have this suspicious stronghold raised level with the general soil of the country. Remonstrance may be proffered, with zeal, but it avails not. The outer gate goes up, drawbridges tumble. Iron window stanchions, smitten out with sledgehammers, become iron crowbars, it rains furniture, stone masses, slates, with chaotic clatter and rattle, demolition clatters down. And now hasty expresses rush through the agitated streets, to warn Lafayette, and the municipal and departmental authorities, rumor warns a national assembly, a royal tilleries, and all men who care to hear it, that Saint Antoine is up. That Vincennes, and probably the last remaining institution of the country, is coming down. Quick, then. Let Lafayette roll his drums and fly eastward, for to all constitutional patriots this is again bad news. And you, ye friends of royalty, snatch your poniards of improved structure, made to order, your sword canes, secret arms, and tickets of entry, quick, by backstairs passages, rally round the son of sixty kings. An effervescence probably got up by Deorlands and company, for the overthrow of throne and altar, it is said Her Majesty shall be put in prison, put out of the way, what then will His Majesty be? Clay for the Sansculotic potter. Or were it impossible to fly this day, a brave noblesse suddenly all rallying. Peril threatens, hope invites, dukes de villaquier, the duras, gentlemen of the chamber give tickets and admittance, a brave noblesse is suddenly all rallying. Now were the time to fall sword in hand on those gentry there, could it be done with effect. The hero of two worlds is on his white charger. Blue nationals, horse and foot, hurrying eastward, Santerre, with the Saint Antoine battalion, is already there, apparently indisposed to act. Heavy laden hero of two worlds, what tasks are these? The jeerings, provocative gamblings of that patriot suburb, which is all out on the streets now, are hard to endure, unwashed patriots jeering in sulky sport, one unwashed patriot seizing the general by the boot to unhorse him. Santerre, ordered to fire, makes answer obliquely, these are the men that took the Bastille, and not a trigger stirs. Neither dare the Vincennes magistracy give warrant of arrestment, or the smallest countenance, wherefore the general will take it on himself to arrest. By promptitude, by cheerful adroitness, patience and brisk valor without limits, the riot may be again bloodlessly appeased. Meanwhile, the rest of Paris, with more or less unconcern, may mind the rest of its business for what is this but an effervescence, of which there are now so many? The National Assembly, in one of its stormiest moods, is debating a law against emigration, 
Mirabeau declaring aloud, I swear beforehand that I will not obey it. Mirabeau is often at the tribune this day, with endless impediments from without. With the old unabated energy from within. What can murmurs and clamors, from left or from right, do to this man, like Tenerife or Atlas unremoved? With clear thought. With strong bass voice, though at first low, uncertain, he claims audience, sways the storm of men, anon the sound of him waxes, softens, he rises into far-sounding melody of strength, triumphant, which subdues all hearts. His rude-seamed face, desolate fire-scathed, becomes fire-lit, and radiates, once again men feel, in these beggarly ages, what is the potency and omnipotency of man's word on the souls of men. I will triumph or be torn in fragments, he was once heard to say. Silence, he cries now, in strong word of command, in imperial consciousness of strength, silence, the thirty voices, silence aux trente voix. And Robespierre and the thirty voices die into mutterings, and the law is once more as Mirabeau would have it. How different, at the same instant, is General Lafayette's street eloquence. Wrangling with sonorous brewers, with an ungrammatical Saint Antoine. Most different, again, from both is the Café de Valois eloquence, and suppressed fanfaronade, of this multitude of men with tickets of entry. Who are now inundating the corridors of the Tilleries. Such things can go on simultaneously in one city. How much more in one country? In one planet with its discrepancies, every day a mere crackling infinitude of discrepancies, which nevertheless do yield some coherent net product, though an infinitesimally small one. Be this as it may. Lafayette has saved Vincennes. And is marching homewards with some dozen of arrested demolitionists. Royalty is not yet saved, nor indeed specially endangered. But to the king's constitutional guard, to these old guards Francaises, or centre grenadiers, as it chanced to be, this affluence of men with tickets of entry is becoming more and more unintelligible. Is his majesty verily for Metz, then? To be carried off by these men, on the spur of the instant? That revolt of Saint Antoine got up by traitor royalists for a stalking horse. Keep a sharp outlook, ye centre grenadiers on duty here, good never came from the men in black. Nay they have cloaks, redingotes, some of them leather breeches, boots, as if for instant riding. Or what is this that sticks visible from the lapel of Chevalier de Court? Too like the handle of some cutting or stabbing instrument. He glides and goes, and still the dudgeon sticks from his left lapel. Hold, monsieur. A centre grenadier clutches him, clutches the protrusive dudgeon, whisks it out in the face of the world, by heaven, a very dagger. Hunting knife, or whatsoever you call it, fit to drink the life of patriotism. So fared it with Chevalier de Court, early in the day, not without noise, not without commentaries. And now this continually increasing multitude at nightfall. Have they daggers too? Alas, with them too, after angry parleyings, there has begun a groping and a rummaging, all men in black, spite of their tickets of entry, are clutched by the collar, and groped. Scandalous to think of. For always, as the dirk, sword cane, pistol, or were it but Taylor's bodkin, is found on him, and with loud scorn drawn forth from him, he, the hapless man in black, is flung all too rapidly downstairs. Flung. And ignominiously descends, head foremost, accelerated by ignominious shovings from sentry after sentry, nay, as is written, by smitings, twitchings, spurnings, a posteriori, not to be named. In this accelerated way, emerges, uncertain which end uppermost, man after man in black, through all issues, into the Tillery's garden. Emerges, alas, into the arms of an indignant multitude, now gathered and gathering there, in the hour of dusk, to see what is toward, and whether the hereditary representative is carried off or not. Hapless men in black. At last convicted of poniards made to order, convicted, chevaliers of the poniard. Within is as the burning ship, without is as the deep sea. Within is no help. His Majesty, looking forth, one moment, from his interior sanctuaries, coldly bids all visitors, give up their weapons, 
and shuts the door again. The weapons given up form a heap, the convicted chevaliers of the poniard keep descending pell-mell, with impetuous velocity, and at the bottom of all staircases, the mixed multitude receives them, hustles, buffets, chases and disperses them. Such sight meets Lafayette, in the dusk of the evening, as he returns, successful with difficulty at Vincennes, sans culotte Scylla hardly weathered, here is aristocrat Charybdis gurgling under his lee. The patient hero of two worlds almost loses temper. He accelerates, does not retard, the flying chevaliers, delivers, indeed, this or the other hunted loyalist of quality, but rates him in bitter words, such as the hour suggested. Such as no saloon could pardon. Hero ill-bested, hanging, so to speak, in mid-air, hateful to rich divinities above, hateful to indigent mortals below. Duke de Villequier, gentleman of the chamber, gets such contumelious rating, in presence of all people there, that he may see good first to exculpate himself in the newspapers. Then, that not prospering, to retire over the frontiers, and begin plotting at Brussels. His apartment will stand vacant, usefuler, as we may find, than when it stood occupied. So fly the chevaliers of the poniard. Hunted of patriotic men, shamefully in the thickening dusk. A dim miserable business, born of darkness, dying away there in the thickening dusk and dimness. In the midst of which, however, let the reader discern clearly one figure running for its life, Crispin Catiline Diaspreminal, for the last time, or the last but one. It is not yet three years since these same center grenadiers, guards Franceses then, marched him towards the Calypso Isles, in the grey of the May morning, and he and they have got thus far. Buffeted, beaten down, delivered by popular passion, he might well answer bitterly, and I too, monsieur, have been carried on the people's shoulders. A fact which popular passion, if he like, can meditate. But happily, one way and another, the speedy night covers up this ignominious day of poniards, and the chevaliers escape, though maltreated, with torn coat skirts and heavy hearts, to their respective dwelling houses. Riot twofold is quelled. And little blood shed, if it be not insignificant blood from the nose, Vincennes stands undemolished, reparable, and the hereditary representative has not been stolen, nor the queen smuggled into prison. A day long remembered, commented on with loud ha-has and deep grumblings, with bitter scornfulness of triumph, bitter rancor of defeat. Royalism, as usual, imputes it to Diorleans and the anarchists' intent on insulting majesty, patriotism, as usual, to royalists, and even constitutionalists, intent on stealing majesty to Metz, we, also as usual, to preternatural suspicion. And Phoebus Apollo having made himself like the knight. Thus, however, has the reader seen, in an unexpected arena, on this last day of February 1791, the three long contending elements of French society, dashed forth into singular comico-tragical collision, acting and reacting openly to the eye. Constitutionalism, at once quelling sans culottic riot at Vincennes, and royalist treachery from the Tilleries, is great, this day, and prevails. As for poor royalism, tossed to and fro in that manner, its daggers all left in a heap, what can one think of it? Every dog, the adage says, has its day, has it, has had it, or will have it. For the present, the day is Lafayette's and the Constitution's. Nevertheless hunger and Jacobinism, fast-growing fanatical, still work, their day, were they once fanatical, will come. Hitherto, in all tempests, Lafayette, like some divine sea ruler, raises his serene head, the upper Aeolus's blasts fly back to their caves, like foolish unbidden winds, the undersea billows they had vexed into froth allay themselves. But if, as we often write, the submarine titanic fire powers came into play, the ocean bed from beneath being burst. If they hurled Poseidon Lafayette and his constitution out of space, and, in the titanic melee, sea were mixed with sky. Chapter 2.3.VI Mirabeau The spirit of France waxes ever more acrid, fever-sick, towards the final outburst of dissolution and delirium. Suspicion rules all minds, contending parties cannot now commingle. Stand separated sheer asunder, eyeing one another, in most aguish mood, of cold terror or hot rage. Counter-revolution, 
Days of Poniards, Castries Duels, Flight of Mesdames, of Monsieur and Royalty. Journalism shrills ever louder its cry of alarm. The sleepless Dionysius's ear of the forty-eight sections, how feverishly quick has it grown, convulsing with strange pangs the whole sick body, as in such sleeplessness and sickness, the ear will do. Since royalists get poniards made to order, and a sieur motier is no better than he should be, shall not patriotism too, even of the indigent sort, have pikes, second-hand firelocks, in readiness for the worst. The anvils ring, during this March month, with hammering of pikes. A constitutional municipality promulgated its placard, that no citizen except the active or cash citizen was entitled to have arms. But there rose, instantly responsive, such a tempest of astonishment from club and section, that the constitutional placard, almost next morning, had to cover itself up, and die away into inanity, in a second improved edition. So the hammering continues, as all that it betokens does. Mark, again, how the extreme tip of the left is mounting in favor, if not in its own national hall, yet with the nation, especially with Paris. For in such universal panic of doubt, the opinion that is sure of itself, as the meagerest opinion may the soonest be, is the one to which all men will rally. Great is belief, were it never so meager, and leads captive the doubting heart. Incorruptible Robespierre has been elected public accuser in our new courts of judicature, virtuous passion, it is thought, may rise to be mayor. Cordelier Danton, called also by triumphant majorities, sits at the departmental council table. Colleague there of Mirabeau. Of incorruptible Robespierre it was long ago predicted that he might go far, mean meagre mortal though he was, for doubt dwelt not in him. Under which circumstances ought not royalty likewise to cease doubting, and begin deciding and acting? Royalty has always that sure trump card in its hand, flight out of Paris. Which sure trump card, royalty, as we see, keeps ever and anon clutching at, grasping, and swashes it forth tentatively, yet never tables it, still puts it back again. Play it, O oh royalty. If there be a chance left, this seems it, and verily the last chance, and now every hour is rendering this a doubtfuler. Alas, one would so fain both fly and not fly, play one's card and have it to play. Royalty, in all human likelihood, will not play its trump card till the honours, one after one, be mainly lost, and such trumping of it prove to be the sudden finish of the game. Here accordingly a question always arises, of the prophetic sort. Which cannot now be answered. Suppose Mirabeau, with whom royalty takes deep counsel, as with a prime minister that cannot yet legally avow himself as such, had got his arrangements completed? Arrangements he has. Far-stretching plans that dawn fitfully on us, by fragments, in the confused darkness. Thirty departments ready to sign loyal addresses, of prescribed tenor, king carried out of Paris, but only to Compiègne and Rouen, hardly to Metz, since, once for all, no emigrant rabble shall take the lead in it, National Assembly consenting. By dint of loyal addresses, by management, by force of bull, to hear reason, and follow thither. Was it so, on these terms, that Jacobinism and Mirabeau were then to grapple, in their Hercules Antiphon duel, death inevitable for the one or the other? The duel itself is determined on, and sure, but on what terms? Much more, with what issue, we in vain guess. It is vague darkness all, unknown what is to be, unknown even what has already been. The giant Mirabeau walks in darkness, as we said. Companionless, on wild ways, what his thoughts during these months were, no record of biographer, not vague Phil's adoptive, will now ever disclose. To us, endeavouring to cast his horoscope, it of course remains doubly vague. There is one Herculean man, in internecine in duel with him, there is monster after monster. Emigrant noblesse return, sword on thigh, vaunting of their loyalty never sullied. Descending from the air, like harpy swarms with ferocity, with obscene greed. Earthward there is the typhon of anarchy, political, religious, sprawling hundred-headed, say with twenty-five million heads, wide as the area of France, fierce as frenzy. Strong in very hunger. With these shall the serpent queller do battle continually, and expect no rest. 
As for the king, he as usual will go wavering chameleon-like, changing color and purpose with the color of his environment. Good for no kingly use. On one royal person, on the queen only, can Mirabeau perhaps place dependence. It is possible, the greatness of this man, not unskilled too in blandishments, courtiership, and graceful adroitness, might, with most legitimate sorcery, fascinate the volatile queen, and fix her to him. She has courage for all noble daring. An eye and a heart, the soul of Teresa's daughter. Fo I L Donk, is it fated then, she passionately writes to her brother, that I with the blood I am come of, with the sentiments I have, must live and die among such mortals. Alas, poor princess, yes. She is the only man, as Mirabeau observes, whom his majesty has about him. Of one other man Mirabeau is still sure, of himself. There lies his resources, sufficient or insufficient. Dim and great to the eye of prophecy looks the future. A perpetual life and death battle, confusion from above and from below, mere confused darkness for us, with here and there some streak of faint lurid light. We see king perhaps laid aside. Not tonsured, tonsuring is out of fashion now, but say, sent away any whither, with handsome annual allowance, and stock of smith tools. We see a queen and dauphin, regent and minor. A queen, mounted on horseback, in the din of battles, with Mariamer pro reg nostro. Such a day, Mirabeau writes, may come. Din of battles, wars more than civil, confusion from above and from below, in such environment the eye of prophecy sees Comte de Mirabeau, like some cardinal de Retz, stormfully maintain himself. With head all devising, heart all daring, if not victorious, yet unvanquished, while life is left him. The specialties and issues of it, no eye of prophecy can guess at, it is clouds, we repeat, and tempestuous night. And in the middle of it, now visible, far darting, now laboring in eclipse, is Mirabeau indomitably struggling to be cloud compeller, one can say that, had Mirabeau lived, the history of France and of the world had been different. Further, that the man would have needed, as few men ever did, the whole compass of that same, art of daring, art de oser, which he so prized, and likewise that he, above all men then living, would have practiced and manifested it. Finally, that some substantiality, and no empty simulacrum of a formula, would have been the result realized by him, a result you could have loved, a result you could have hated. By no likelihood, a result you could only have rejected with closed lips, and swept into quick forgetfulness forever. Had Mirabeau lived one other year. Chapter 2.3.7 Death of Mirabeau But Mirabeau could not live another year, any more than he could live another thousand years. Men's years are numbered, and the tale of Mirabeau's was now complete. Important, or unimportant. To be mentioned in world history for some centuries, or not to be mentioned there beyond a day or two, it matters not to peremptory fate. From amid the press of ruddy busy life, the pale messenger beckons silently, widespreading interests, projects, salvation of French monarchies, what things whoever man has on hand, he must suddenly quit it all, and go. Wert thou saving French monarchies, wert thou blacking shoes on the Pont Neuf? The most important of men cannot stay, did the world's history depend on an hour, that hour is not to be given. Whereby, indeed, it comes that these same would have beans are mostly a vanity, and the world's history could never in the least be what it would, or might, or should, by any manner of potentiality, but simply and altogether what it is. The fierce wear and tear of such an existence has wasted out the giant oaken strength of Mirabeau. A fret and fever that keeps heart and brain on fire, excess of effort, of excitement. Excess of all kinds, labor incessant, almost beyond credibility. If I had not lived with him, says Dumont, I should never have known what a man can make of one day, what things may be placed within the interval of twelve hours. A day for this man was more than a week or a month is for others, the mass of things he guided on together was prodigious, from the scheming to the executing not a moment lost. Monsieur Le Comte said his secretary to him once, what you require is impossible. Impossible, answered he starting from his chair, the me dites je me si e bet de 
never name to me that blockhead of a word. And then the social repasts. The dinner which he gives as commandant of national guards, which costs five hundred pounds, alas, and the sirens of the opera, and all the ginger that is hot in the mouth, down what a course is this man hurled. Cannot Mirabeau stop? Cannot he fly, and save himself alive? No. There is a Nessus shirt on this Hercules, he must storm and burn there, without rest, till he be consumed. Human strength, never so Herculean, has its measure. Herald shadows flit pale across the fire brain of Mirabeau, heralds of the pale repose. While he tosses and storms, straining every nerve, in that sea of ambition and confusion, there comes, somber and still, a monition that for him the issue of it will be swift death. In January last, you might see him as president of the assembly. His neck wrapped in linen cloths, at the evening session there was sick heat of the blood, alternate darkening and flashing in the eyesight, he had to apply leeches, after the morning labor, and preside bandaged. At parting he embraced me, says Dumont, with an emotion I had never seen in him, I am dying, my friend, dying as by slow fire, we shall perhaps not meet again. When I am gone, they will know what the value of me was. The miseries I have held back will burst from all sides on France. Sickness gives louder warning, but cannot be listened to. On the twenty-seventh day of March, proceeding towards the assembly, he had to seek rest and help in friend de la Marque's, by the road, and lay there, for an hour, half fainted, stretched on a sofa. To the assembly nevertheless he went, as if in spite of destiny itself, spoke, loud and eager, five several times, then quitted the tribune forever. He steps out, utterly exhausted, into the Tillery's gardens. Many people press round him, as usual, with applications, memorials, he says to the friend who was with him, take me out of this. And so, on the last day of March 1791, endless anxious multitudes beset the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. Incessantly inquiring, within doors there, in that house numbered in our time, forty-two, the over-wearied giant has fallen down, to die. Crowds, of all parties and kinds, of all ranks from the king to the meanest man. The king sends publicly twice a day to inquire, privately besides, from the world at large there is no end of inquiring. A written bulletin is handed out every three hours, is copied and circulated, in the end, it is printed. The people spontaneously keep silence, no carriage shall enter with its noise, there is crowding pressure, but the sister of Mirabeau is reverently recognized, and has free way made for her. The people stand mute, heart-stricken. To all it seems as if a great calamity were nigh, as if the last man of France, who could have swayed these coming troubles, lay there at hand grips with the unearthly power. The silence of a whole people, the wakeful toil of Cabanis, friend and physician, skills not, on Saturday, the second day of April, Mirabeau feels that the last of the days has risen for him, that, on this day, he has to depart and be no more. His death is titanic, as his life has been. Lit up, for the last time, in the glare of coming dissolution, the mind of the man is all glowing and burning, utters itself in sayings, such as men long remember. He longs to live, yet acquiesces in death, argues not with the inexorable. His speech is wild and wondrous, unearthly phantasms dancing now their torch dance round his soul. The soul itself looking out, fire radiant, motionless, girt together for that great hour. At times comes a beam of light from him on the world he is quitting. I carry in my heart the death dirge of the French monarchy. The dead remains of it will now be the spoil of the factious. Or again, when he heard the cannon fire, what is characteristic too, have we the Achilles' funeral already? So likewise, while some friend is supporting him, yes, support that head. Would I could bequeath it thee. For the man dies as he has lived, self-conscious, conscious of a world looking on. He gazes forth on the young spring, which for him will never be summer. The sun has risen. He says, Si si e ne pas l'adieu, c'est du moins son cousin Germain. Death has mastered the outworks, power of speech is gone, the citadel of the heart still holding out, the moribund giant, passionately, 
by sign, demands paper and pen. Writes his passionate demand for opium, to end these agonies. The sorrowful doctor shakes his head, Dormir, to sleep, writes the other, passionately pointing at it. So dies a gigantic heathen and titan. Stumbling blindly, undismayed, down to his rest. At half past eight in the morning, Dr. Petit, standing at the foot of the bed, says, I L N E suffer plus. His suffering and his working are now ended. Even so, ye silent patriot multitudes, all ye men of France, this man is rapt away from you. He has fallen suddenly, without bending till he broke, as a tower falls, smitten by sudden lightning. His word ye shall hear no more, his guidance follow no more. Dot, the multitudes depart, heartstruck, spread the sad tidings. How touching is the loyalty of men to their sovereign man! All theatres, public amusements close. No joyful meeting can be held in these nights, joy is not for them, the people break in upon private dancing parties, and sullenly command that they cease. Of such dancing parties apparently but two came to light, and these also have gone out. The gloom is universal, never in this city was such sorrow for one death, never since that old night when Louis XII. Departed, and the criers de corps went sounding their bells, and crying along the streets, Le bon Roy Louis, Père du Pupil, Est Mort, the good King Louis, father of the people, is dead. King Mirabeau is now the lost king. And one may say with little exaggeration, all the people mourns for him. For three days there is low wide moan, weeping in the National Assembly itself. The streets are all mournful. Orators mounted on the borns, with large silent audience, preaching the funeral sermon of the dead. Let no coachman whip fast, distractively with his rolling wheels, or almost at all, through these groups. His traces may be cut. Himself and his fair, as incurable aristocrats, hurled sulkily into the kennels. The born stone orators speak as it is given them. The sansculotic people, with its rude soul, listens eager, as men will to any sermon, or sermo, when it is a spoken word meaning a thing, and not a babblement meaning no thing. In the restaurateurs of the Palais Royal, the waiter remarks, Fine weather, monsieur, yes, my friend, answers the ancient man of letters, very fine, but Mirabeau is dead. Horse rhythmic threnodies comes also from the throats of ballad singers, are sold on grey white paper at a so each. But of portraits, engraved, painted, hewn, and written. Of eulogies, reminiscences, biographies, nay vaudevilles, dramas and melodramas, in all provinces of France, there will, through these coming months, be the due immeasurable crop, thick as the leaves of spring. Nor, that a tincture of burlesque might be in it, is Goebel's episcopal mandament wanting, Goose Goebel, who has just been made constitutional bishop of Paris. A mandament wherein CAIRA alternates very strangely with nominee domini, and you are, with a grave countenance, invited to rejoice at possessing in the midst of you a body of prelates created by Mirabeau, zealous followers of his doctrine. Faithful imitators of his virtues. So speaks, and cackles manifold, the sorrow of France, wailing articulately, inarticulately, as it can, that a sovereign man is snatched away. In the National Assembly, when difficult questions are astir, all eyes will turn mechanically to the place where Mirabeau sat, and Mirabeau is absent now. On the third evening of the Lamentation, the 4th of April, there is solemn public funeral, such as deceased mortals seldom had. Procession of a league in length, of mourners reckoned loosely at a hundred thousand. All roofs are thronged with onlookers, all windows, lamp-irons, branches of trees. Sadness is painted on every countenance, many persons weep. There is double hedge of national guards, there is national assembly in a body. Jacobin society, and societies, king's ministers, municipals, and all notabilities, patriot or aristocrat. Bull is noticeable there, with his hat on, say, hat drawn over his brow, hiding many thoughts. Slow wending, in religious silence, the procession of a league in length, under the level sun rays, for it is five o'clock, moves and marches, with its sable plumes, itself in a religious silence. 
but, by fits, with the muffled roll of drums, by fits with some long-drawn wail of music, and strange new clangor of trombones, and metallic dirge voice, amid the infinite hum of men. In the church of St. Eustache, there is funeral oration by Cherudi, and discharge of firearms, which, brings down pieces of the plaster. Thence, forward again to the church of St. Genevieve. Which has been consecrated, by supreme decree, on the spur of this time, into a pantheon for the great men of the fatherland, Aux Grands Homs La Patery Reconnaissant. Hardly at midnight is the business done. And Mirabeau left in his dark dwelling, first tenant of that fatherland's pantheon. Tenant, alas, who inhabits but at will, and shall be cast out. For, in these days of convulsion and disjection, not even the dust of the dead is permitted to rest. Voltaire's bones are, by and by, to be carried from their stolen grave in the Abbaye of Celliers, to an eager stealing grave, in Paris his birth city, all mortals processioning in pirorating there. Cars drawn by eight white horses, goadsters in classical costume, with fillets and wheat ears enough, though the weather is of the wettest. Evangelist Jean Jacques, too, as is most proper, must be dug up from Ermenonville, and processioned, with pomp, with sensibility, to the pantheon of the fatherland. He and others, while again Mirabeau, we say, is cast forth from it, happily incapable of being replaced. And rests now, irrecognizable, reburied hastily at dead of night, in the central, part of the churchyard St. Catherine, in the suburb St. Marceau, to be disturbed no further. So blazes out, far seen, a man's life, and becomes ashes in a caput mortuum, in this world pyre, which we name French Revolution, not the first that consumed itself there, nor, by thousands and many millions, the last. A man who, had swallowed all formulas, who, in these strange times and circumstances, felt called to live titanically, and also to die so. As he, for his part had swallowed all formulas, what formula is there, never so comprehensive, that will express truly the plus and the minus, give us the accurate net result of him. There is hitherto none such. Moralities not a few must shriek condemnatory over this Mirabeau. The morality by which he could be judged has not yet got uttered in the speech of men. We shall say this of him, again, that he is a reality, and no simulacrum, a living son of nature our general mother, not a hollow artifice, and mechanism of conventionalities, son of nothing, brother to nothing. In which little word, let the earnest man, walking sorrowful in a world mostly of stuffed cloth suits, that chatter and grin meaningless on him, quite ghastly to the earnest soul, think what significance there is. Of men who, in such sense, are alive, and see with eyes, the number is now not great, it may be well, if in this huge French Revolution itself, with its all-developing fury, we find some three. Mortals driven rabid we find. Sputtering the acridest logic, bearing their breast to the battle hail, their neck to the guillotine, of whom it is so painful to say that they too are still, in good part, manufactured formalities, not facts but hearsays. Honor to the strong man, in these ages, who has shaken himself loose of shams, and is something. For in the way of being worthy, the first condition surely is that one be. Let can't cease, at all risks and at all costs, till can't cease, nothing else can begin. Of human criminals, in these centuries, writes the moralist, I find but one unforgivable, the quack. Hateful to God, as divine Dante sings, and to the enemies of God. A Dio spiacentieta, nemesis sway. But whoever will, with sympathy, which is the first essential towards insight, look at this questionable Mirabeau, may find that there lay verily in him, as the basis of all, a sincerity, a great free earnestness. Nay call it honesty, for the man did before all things see, with that clear flashing vision, into what was, into what existed as fact, and did, with his wild heart, follow that and no other. Whereby on what ways soever he travels and struggles, often enough falling, he is still a brother man. Hate him not, thou canst not hate him. Shining through such soil and tarnish, and now victorious effulgent, and often as struggling eclipsed, the light of genius itself is in this man, which was never yet base and hateful, but at worst was lamentable, lovable with pity. They say that he was ambitious, 
that he wanted to be minister. It is most true, and was he not simply the one man in France who could have done any good as minister? Not vanity alone, not pride alone, far from that. Wild burstings of affection were in this great heart, of fierce lightning, and soft dew of pity. So sunk, bemired in wretchedest defacements, it may be said of him, like the Magdalene of old, that he loved much, his father the harshest of old crabbed men he loved with warmth, with veneration. Be it that his falls and follies are manifold, as himself often lamented even with tears. Alas, is not the life of every such man already a poetic tragedy, made up, of fate and of one's own deservings, of shiksal und eigen should. Full of the elements of pity and fear. This brother man, if not epic for us, is tragic, if not great, is large, large in his qualities, world-large in his destinies. Whom other men, recognizing him as such, may, through long times, remember, and draw nigh to examine and consider, these, in their several dialects, will say of him and sing of him, till the right thing be said. And so the formula that can judge him be no longer an undiscovered one. Here then the wild Gabriel Honoré drops from the tissue of our history, not without a tragic farewell. He is gone, the flower of the wild Ricchetti or Arrighetti kindred. Which seems as if in him, with one last effort, it had done its best, and then expired, or sunk down to the undistinguished level. Crabbed old Marquis Mirabeau, the friend of men, sleeps sound. The Bailey Mirabeau, worthy uncle, will soon die forlorn, alone. Beryl Mirabeau, already gone across the Rhine, his regiment of emigrants will drive nigh desperate. Beryl Mirabeau, says a biographer of his, went indignantly across the Rhine, and drilled emigrant regiments. But as he sat one morning in his tent, sour of stomach doubtless and of heart, meditating in Tartarian humor on the turn things took, a certain captain or subaltern demanded admittance on business. Such captain is refused. He again demands, with refusal. And then again, till Colonel Viscount Barrow Mirabeau, blazing up into a mere burning brandy barrel, clutches his sword, and tumbles out on this canal of an intruder, alas, on the canal of an intruder's sword's point. Who had drawn with swift dexterity. And dies, and the newspapers name it apoplexy and alarming accident. So die the Mirabeaus. New Mirabeaus one hears not of, the wild kindred, as we said, is gone out with this its greatest. As families and kindreds sometimes do. Producing, after long ages of unnoted notability, some living quintessence of all the qualities they had, to flame forth as a man world noted, after whom they rest as if exhausted, the scepter passing to others. The chosen last of the Mirabeaus is gone, the chosen man of France is gone. It was he who shook old France from its basis, and, as if with his single hand, has held it toppling there, still unfallen. What things depended on that one man? He is as a ship suddenly shivered on sunk rocks, much swims on the waste waters, far from help. Book 2.4 Varennes Chapter 2.4. I Easter at St. Cloud The French monarchy may now therefore be considered as, in all human probability, lost, as struggling henceforth in blindness as well as weakness, the last light of reasonable guidance having gone out. What remains of resources their poor majesties will waste still further, in uncertain loitering and wavering. Mirabeau himself had to complain that they only gave him half confidence, and always had some plan within his plan. Had they fled frankly with him, to Rouen or any whither, long ago. They may fly now with chance immeasurably lessened, which will go on lessening towards absolute zero. Decide, O oh Queen. Poor Louis can decide nothing, execute this flight project, or at least abandon it. Correspondence with Bull there has been enough, what profits consulting, and hypothesis, while all around is in fierce activity of practice. The rustic sits waiting till the river run dry, alas with you it is not a common river, but a Nile inundation, snow melting in the unseen mountains, till all, and you where you sit, be submerged. Many things invite to flight. The voice journals invites, royalist journals proudly hinting it as a threat, patriot journals rapidly denouncing it as a terror. Mother society, waxing more and more emphatic, 
invites. So emphatic that, as was prophesied, Lafayette and your limited patriots have ere long to branch off from her, and form themselves into fulans, with infinite public controversy. The victory in which, doubtful though it look, will remain with the unlimited mother. Moreover, ever since the day of Poniards, we have seen unlimited patriotism openly equipping itself with arms. Citizens denied, activity, which is facetiously made to signify a certain weight of purse, cannot buy blue uniforms, and be guardsmen, but man is greater than blue cloth. Man can fight, if need be, in multiform cloth, or even almost without cloth, as sans culotte. So pikes continued to be hammered, whether those dirks of improved structure with barbs be meant for the West India market, or not meant. Men beat, the wrong way, their plowshares into swords. Is there not what we may call an Austrian committee, Comite Otrichine, sitting daily and nightly in the tilleries? Patriotism, by vision and suspicion, knows it too well. If the king fly, will there not be aristocrat Austrian invasion, butchery, replacement of feudalism, wars more than civil? The hearts of men are saddened and maddened. Dissident priests likewise give trouble enough. Expelled from their parish churches, where constitutional priests, elected by the public, have replaced them, these unhappy persons resort to convents of nuns, or other such receptacles. And there, on Sabbath, collecting assemblages of anti-constitutional individuals, who have grown devout all on a sudden, they worship or pretend to worship in their straight-laced contumacious manner, to the scandal of patriotism. Dissident priests, passing along with their sacred wafer for the dying, seem wishful to be massacred in the streets, wherein patriotism will not gratify them. Slighter palm of martyrdom, however, shall not be denied, martyrdom not of massacre, yet of fustigation. At the refractory places of worship, patriot men appear, patriot women with strong hazel wands, which they apply. Shut thy eyes, O reader. See not this misery, peculiar to these later times, of martyrdom without sincerity, with only cant and contumacy. A dead Catholic Church is not allowed to lie dead, no, it is galvanized into the detestablest death life. Whereat humanity, we say, shuts its eyes. For the patriot women take their hazel wands, and fustigate, amid laughter of bystanders, with alacrity, broad bottom of priests, alas, nuns too reversed, and codlins retresses. The National Guard does what it can, municipality, invokes the principles of toleration, grants dissident worshippers the Church of the Theodans, promising protection. But it is to no purpose, at the door of that Theodans. Church, appears a placard, and suspended atop, like plebeian consular fasces, a bundle of rods. The principles of toleration must do the best they may, but no dissident man shall worship contumaciously, there is a plebiscitum to that effect. Which, though unspoken, is like the laws of the Medes and Persians. Dissident contumacious priests ought not to be harbored, even in private, by any man, the club of the courtiers openly denounces majesty himself as doing it. Many things invite to flight, but probably this thing above all others, that it has become impossible. On the 15th of April, notice is given that His Majesty, who has suffered much from Qatar lately, will enjoy the spring weather, for a few days, at St. Cloud. Out at St. Cloud. Wishing to celebrate his Easter, his Pax, or Pasch, there. With refractory anti-constitutional dissidents, wishing rather to make off for Compiègne, and thence to the frontiers. As were, in good sooth, perhaps feasible, or would once have been, nothing but some two chasseurs attending you. Chasseurs easily corrupted. It is a pleasant possibility, executed or not. Men say there are thirty thousand chevaliers of the poniard lurking in the woods there, lurking in the woods, and thirty thousand, for the human imagination is not fettered. But now, how easily might these, dashing out on Lafayette, snatch off the hereditary representative, and roll away with him, after the manner of a world blast, whither they listed, enough, it were well the king did not go. Lafayette is forewarned and forearmed, but, indeed, is the risk his only, or his and all France's. Monday the 18th of April is come, the Easter journey to St. Cloud shall take effect. National Guard has got its orders. 
A first division, as advanced guard, has even marched, and probably arrived. His Majesty's Maison Bouche, they say, is all busy stewing and frying at St. Cloud, the king's dinner not far from ready there. About one o'clock, the royal carriage, with its eight royal blacks, shoots stately into the place du Carousel, draws up to receive its royal burden. But hark! From the neighboring church of St. Rock, the tocsin begins ding-donging. Is the king stolen then, he is going, Don. Multitudes of persons crowd the carousel, the royal carriage still stands there, and, by heaven's strength, shall stand. Lafayette comes up, with aide de cause and oratory. Pervading the groups, Taises vous, answer the groups, the king shall not go. Monsieur appears, at an upper window, ten thousand voices bray and shriek, nous en volans pas que le roi part. Their majesties have mounted. Crack go the whips. But twenty patriot arms have seized each of the eight bridles, there is rearing, rocking, vociferation, not the smallest headway. In vain does Lafayette fret, indignant. And pirorate and strive, patriots in the passion of terror, bellow round the royal carriage, it is one bellowing sea of patriot terror run frantic. Will royalty fly off towards Austria, like a lit rocket, towards endless conflagration of civil war? Stop it, ye patriots, in the name of heaven. Rude voices passionately apostrophize royalty itself. Usher Campan, and other the like official persons, pressing forward with help or advice, are clutched by the sashes, and hurled and whirled, in a confused perilous manner, so that Her Majesty has to plead passionately from the carriage window. Order cannot be heard, cannot be followed, National Guards know not how to act. Center Grenadiers, of the Observatoire Battalion, are there, not on duty, alas, in quasi-mutiny, speaking rude disobedient words. Threatening the mounted guards with sharp shot if they hurt the people. Lafayette mounts and dismounts, runs haranguing, panting, on the verge of despair. For an hour and three quarters, seven quarters of an hour, by the Tillery's clock. Desperate Lafayette will open a passage, were it by the cannon's mouth, if His Majesty will order. Their Majesties, counseled to it by royalist friends, by patriot foes, dismount, and retire in, with heavy indignant heart, giving up the enterprise. Maison Bouche may eat that cooked dinner themselves, His Majesty shall not see St. Cloud this day, or any day. The pathetic fable of imprisonment in one's own palace has become a sad fact, then. Majesty complains to assembly. Municipality deliberates, proposes to petition or address, sections respond with sullen brevity of negation. Lafayette flings down his commission, appears in civic pepper and salt frock, and cannot be flattered back again. Not in less than three days, and by unheard of entreaty, National Guards kneeling to him, and declaring that it is not sycophancy, that they are free men kneeling here to the Statue of Liberty. For the rest, those center grenadiers of the Observatoire are disbanded, yet indeed are rain listed, all but fourteen, under a new name, and with new quarters. The king must keep his Easter in Paris, meditating much on this singular posture of things, but as good as determined now to fly from it, desire being wedded by difficulty. Chapter 2.4.2 Easter at Paris. For above a year, ever since March 1790, it would seem, there has hovered a project of flight before the royal mind, and ever and anon has been condensing itself into something like a purpose. But this or the other difficulty always vaporized it again. It seems so full of risks, perhaps of civil war itself, above all, it cannot be done without effort. Somnolent laziness will not serve, to fly, if not in a leather vash, one must verily stir himself. Better to adopt that constitution of theirs, execute it so as to shew all men that it is inexecutable. Better or not so good, surely it is easier. To all difficulties you need only say, there is a lion in the path, behold your constitution will not act. For a somnolent person it requires no effort to counterfeit death, as Dame de Stahl and friends of liberty can see the king's government long doing, Faisant le mort. Nay now, when desire wedded by difficulty has brought the matter to a head, and the royal mind no longer halts between two, what can come of it? 
Grant that poor Lewis were safe with Bull, what on the whole could he look for there? Exasperated tickets of entry answer, much, all. But cold reason answers, little almost nothing. Is not loyalty a law of nature? Ask the tickets of entry. Is not love of your king, and even death for him, the glory of all Frenchmen, except these few Democrats? Let Democrat constitution builders see what they will do without their keystone. And France rend its hair, having lost the hereditary representative. Thus will King Louis fly, one sees not reasonably towards what? As a maltreated boy, shall we say, who, having a stepmother, rushes sulky into the wide world. And will wring the paternal heart, poor Louis escapes from known unsupportable evils, to an unknown mixture of good and evil, colored by hope. He goes, as Rabelais did when dying, to seek a great maybe, J. E. Vase Churcher on Grand Putetry. As not only the sulky boy but the wise grown man is obliged to do, so often, in emergencies. For the rest, there is still no lack of stimulants, and stepdame maltreatments, to keep one's resolution at the due pitch. Factious disturbance ceases not, as indeed how can they, unless authoritatively conjured, in a revolt which is by nature bottomless. If the ceasing of faction be the price of the king's somnolence, he may awake when he will, and take wing. Remark, in any case, what somersets and contortions a dead Catholicism is making, skillfully galvanized, hideous, and even piteous, to behold. Jurant and dissident, with their shaved crowns, argue frothing everywhere. Or are ceasing to argue, and stripping for battle. In Paris was scourging while need continued, contrariwise, in the Morbian of Brittany, without scourging, armed peasants are up, roused by pulpit drum, they know not why. General de Mourier, who has got mission thitherward, finds all in sour heat of darkness, finds also that explanation and conciliation will still do much. But again, consider this, that His Holiness, Pius VI, has seen good to excommunicate Bishop Talleyrand. Surely, we will say then, considering it, there is no living or dead church in the earth that has not the indubitablest right to excommunicate Talleyrand. Pope Pius has right and might, in his way. But truly so likewise has Father Adam, C.I. Devant Marquis St. Eurage, in his way. Behold, therefore, on the 4th of May, in the Palais Royal, a mixed loud-sounding multitude. In the middle of whom, Father Adam, bull-voiced St. Eurage, in white hat, towers visible and audible. With him, it is said, walks journalist Gorses, walk many others of the washed sort, for no authority will interfere. Pius VI, with his plush and tiara, and power of the keys, they bear aloft, of natural size, made of lath and combustible gum. Royu, the king's friend, is born too in effigy. With a pile of newspaper king's friends, condemned numbers of the Ami du Roy, fit fuel of the sacrifice. Speeches are spoken, a judgment is held, a doom proclaimed, audible in bull voice, towards the four winds. And thus, amid great shouting, the holocaust is consummated, under the summer sky, and our lath and gum holiness, with the attendant victims, mounts up in flame, and sinks down in ashes. A decomposed pope, and right or might, among all the parties, has better or worse accomplished itself, as it could. But, on the whole, reckoning from Martin Luther in the marketplace of Wittenberg to Marquis St. Eurich in this Palais Royal of Paris, what a journey have we gone, into what strange territories has it carried us. No authority can now interfere. Nay religion herself, mourning for such things, may after all ask, what have I to do with them? In such extraordinary manner does dead Catholicism somerset and caper, skillfully galvanized. For, does the reader inquire into the subject matter of controversy in this case, what the difference between orthodoxy or mydoxy and heterodoxy or thydoxy might here be? Mydoxy is that an august national assembly can equalize the extent of bishoprics, that an equalized bishop, his creed and formularies being left quite as they were, can swear fidelity to king, law and nation, and so become a constitutional bishop. Thydoxy, if thou be dissident, is that he cannot. But that he must become an accursed thing. Human ill-nature needs but some homoousian iota, 
or even the pretense of one. And will flow copiously through the eye of a needle, thus always must mortals go jargoning and fuming. And, like the ancient Stoics in their porches, with fierce dispute maintain their churches. This auto de fe of St. Hurich was on the 4th of May, 1791. Royalty sees it, but says nothing. Chapter 2.4.3 Count Fersen Royalty, in fact, should, by this time, be far on with its preparations. Unhappily much preparation is needful, could a hereditary representative be carried in leather vash, how easy were it. But it is not so. New clothes are needed, as usual, in all epic transactions, were it in the grimmest Iron Ages. Consider, Queen Krimhild, with her sixty semstresses, in that Iron Nibelungen song. No queen can stir without new clothes. Therefore, now, Dame Campan whisks assiduous to this mantua maker and to that, and there is clipping of frocks and gowns, upper clothes, and under, great and small, such a clipping and sewing, as might have been dispensed with. Moreover, Her Majesty cannot go a step any whither without her necessaire, dear necessaire, of inlaid ivory and rosewood, cunningly devised, which holds perfumes, toilet implements, infinite small queen-like furnitures, necessary to terrestrial life. Not without a cost of some five hundred louis, of much precious time, and difficult hoodwinking which does not blind, can this same necessary of life be forwarded by the Flanders carriers, never to get to hand. All which, you would say, augurs ill for the prospering of the enterprise. But the whims of women and queens must be humoured. Bull, on his side, is making a fortified camp at Montmedy. Gathering royal Alamand, and all manner of other German and true French troops thither, to watch the Austrians. His Majesty will not cross the frontiers, unless on compulsion. Neither shall the emigrants be much employed, hateful as they are to all people. Nor shall old war god Broy have any hand in the business, but solely our brave bull. To whom, on the day of meeting, a marshal's baton shall be delivered, by a rescued king, amid the shouting of all the troops. In the meanwhile, Paris being so suspicious, were it not perhaps good to write your foreign ambassadors an ostensible constitutional letter. Desiring all kings and men to take heed that King Louis loves the constitution, that he has voluntarily sworn, and does again swear, to maintain the same, and will reckon those his enemies who affect to say otherwise? Such a constitutional circular is dispatched by couriers, is communicated confidentially to the assembly, and printed in all newspapers, with the finest effect. Simulation and dissimulation mingle extensively in human affairs. We observe, however, that Count Fersen is often using his ticket of entry, which surely he has clear right to do. A gallant soldier and Swede, devoted to this fair queen, as indeed the highest Swede now is. Has not King Gustav, famed fiery chevalier du Nord, sworn himself, by the old laws of chivalry, her knight? He will descend on fire wings, of Swedish musketry, and deliver her from these foul dragons, if, alas, the assassin's pistol intervene not. But, in fact, Count Fersen does seem a likely young soldier, of alert decisive ways, he circulates widely, seen, unseen, and has business on hand. Also Colonel the Duc de Choiseul, nephew of Choiseul the Great, of Choiseul the now deceased. He and Engineer Gogolat are passing and repassing between Metz and the Tilleries, and letters go in cipher, one of them, a most important one, hard to decipher, Fersen having ciphered it in haste. As for Duc de Villequier, he is gone ever since the day of Poniards, but his apartment is useful for Her Majesty. On the other side, poor Commandment Guvian, watching at the Tilleries, second in national command, sees several things hard to interpret. It is the same Guvian who sat, long months ago, at the town hall, gazing helpless into that insurrection of women, motionless, as the brave stabled steed when conflagration rises, till Usher Maillard snatched his drum. Sincerer patriot there is not. But many a shiftier. He, if Dame Campan gossip credibly, is paying some similitude of love court to a certain false chambermaid of the palace, who betrays much to him, the necessaire, the clothes, the packing of the jewels, could he understand it when betrayed. 
helpless Guvian gazes with sincere glassy eyes into it, stirs up his sentries to vigilance, walks restless to and fro, and hopes the best. But, on the whole, one finds that, in the second week of June, Colonel de Choiseau is privately in Paris. Having come, to see his children. Also that Fersen has got a stupendous new coach built, of the kind named Berlin, done by the first artists, according to a model, they bring it home to him, in Choiseau's presence. The two friends take a proof drive in it, along the streets, in meditative mood, then send it up to Madame Sullivan's, in the Rue de Clichy, far north, to wait there till wanted. Apparently a certain Russian Baroness de Korf, with waiting woman, valet, and two children, will travel homewards with some state, in whom these young military gentlemen take interest. A passport has been procured for her. And much assistance shown, with coach builders, and such like, so helpful polite are young military men. Fersen has likewise purchased a chase fit for two, at least for two waiting maids. Further, certain necessary horses, one would say, he is himself quitting France, not without outlay. We observe finally that their majesties, heaven willing, will assist at Corpus Christi Day, this blessed summer solstice, in Assumption Church, here at Paris, to the joy of all the world. For which same day, moreover, brave bull, at Metz, as we find, has invited a party of friends to dinner, but indeed is gone from home, in the interim, over to Montmedy. These are of the phenomena, or visual appearances, of this wide-working terrestrial world, which truly is all phenomenal, what they call spectral, and never rests at any moment, one never at any moment can know why. On Monday night, the 20th of June 1791, about eleven o'clock, there is many a hackney coach, and glass coach, carrosse de remise, still rumbling, or at rest, on the streets of Paris. But of all glass coaches, we recommend this to thee, O reader, which stands drawn up, in the Rue de l'Echelle, hard by the carousel and outgate of the Tilleries, in the Rue de l'Echelle that then was. Opposite ronce in the saddler's door, as if waiting for a fare there. Not long does it wait, a hooded dame, with two hooded children has issued from Villequier's door, where no sentry walks, into the Tilleries' court of princes, into the carousel. Into the Rue de l'Echelle, where the glass coachman readily admits them, and again waits. Not long, another dame, likewise hooded or shrouded, leaning on a servant, issues in the same manner, by the glass coachman, cheerfully admitted. Whither go, so many dames? Tis his majesty's couchy, majesty just gone to bed, and all the palace world is retiring home. But the glass coachman still waits, his fare seemingly incomplete. By and by, we note a thick-set individual, in round hat and peruke, arm and arm with some servant, seemingly of the runner or courier sort, he also issues through Villequier's door. Starts a shoe buckle as he passes one of the sentries, stoops down to clasp it again, is however, by the glass coachman, still more cheerfully admitted. And now, is his fare complete? Not yet, the glass coachman still waits. Dot, alas. And the false chambermaid has warned Guvian that she thinks the royal family will fly this very night, and Guvian distrusting his own glazed eyes, has sent express for Lafayette. And Lafayette's carriage, flaring with lights, rolls this moment through the inner arch of the carousel, where a lady shaded in broad gypsy hat, and leaning on the arm of a servant, also of the runner or courier sort, stands aside to let it pass. And has even the whim to touch a spoke of it with her badine, light little magic rod which she calls badine, such as the beautiful then wore. The flare of Lafayette's carriage, rolls past, all is found quiet in the court of princes, sentries at their post, majesty's apartments closed in smooth rest. Your false chambermaid must have been mistaken. Watch thou, Guvian, with Argus vigilance, for, of a truth, treachery is within these walls. But where is the lady that stood aside in gypsy hat, and touched the wheel spoke with her badine? O oh reader, that lady that touched the wheel spoke was the Queen of France. She has issued safe through that inner arch, into the carousel itself, but not into the Rue de l'Echelle. Flurried by the rattle and rencounter, she took the right hand not the left, neither she nor her courier knows Paris, he indeed is no courier, but a loyal stupid C.I. Devant bodyguard disguised as one. 
They are off, quite wrong, over the Pont Royal and River, roaming disconsolate in the Rue du Bac, far from the glass coachman, who still waits. Waits, with flutter of heart, with thoughts, which he must button close up, under his jarby surtout. Midnight clangs from all the city steeples, one precious hour has been spent so, most mortals are asleep. The glass coachman waits, and what mood? A brother Jarvie drives up, enters into conversation. Is answered cheerfully in Jarvie dialect, the brothers of the whip exchange a pinch of snuff, decline drinking together, and part with good night. Be the heavens blessed. Here at length is the queen lady, in gypsy hat, safe after perils. Who has had to inquire her way? She too is admitted, her courier jumps aloft, as the other, who is also a disguised bodyguard, has done, and now, O glass coachman of a thousand, Count Furson, for the reader sees it is thou, drive. Dust shall not stick to the hoofs of Furson, crack. Crack. The glass coach rattles, and every soul breathes lighter. But is Furson on the right road? Northeastward, to the barrier of St. Martin and Metz Highway, thither were we bound, and lo, he drives right northward. The royal individual, in round hat and peruke, sits astonished, but right or wrong, there is no remedy. Crack, crack, we go incessant, through the slumbering city. Seldom, since Paris rose out of mud, or the long-haired kings went in bullock carts, was there such a drive. Mortals on each hand of you, close by, stretched out horizontal, dormant. And we alive and quaking. Crack, crack, through the Rue de Grimont, across the boulevard, up the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin, these windows, all silent, of number 42, were Mirabeau's. Towards the barrier not of St. Martin, but of Clichy on the utmost north. Patience, ye royal individuals, Furson understands what he is about. Passing up the Rue de Clichy, he alights for one moment at Madame Sullivan's, did Count Furson's coachman get the Baroness de Corf's new Berlin? Gone with it an hour and half ago, grumbles responsive the drowsy porter. Say bien. Yes, it is well, though had not such hour and half been lost, it were still better. Forth therefore, O Furson, fast, by the barrier de Clichy, then eastward along the outward boulevard, what horses and whipcord can do. Thus Furson drives, through the ambrosial night. Sleeping Paris is now all on the right hand of him, silent except for some snoring hum, and now he is eastward as far as the barrier de Saint Martin, looking earnestly for Baroness de Corf's Berlin. This heaven's Berlin he at length does descry, drawn up with its six horses, his own German coachman waiting on the box. Right, thou good German, now haste, whither thou knowest, and as for us of the glass coach, haste too, O haste. Much time is already lost. The August glass coach fair, six insides, hastily packs itself into the new Berlin, two bodyguard couriers behind. The glass coach itself is turned adrift, its head towards the city. To wander whither it lists, and be found next morning tumbled in a ditch. But Furson is on the new box, with its brave new hammer cloths, flourishing his whip, he bolts forward towards Bondi. There a third and final bodyguard courier of ours ought surely to be, with post horses ready ordered. There likewise ought that purchased chase, with the two waiting maids and their bandboxes to be, whom also Her Majesty could not travel without. Swift, thou deft person, and may the heavens turn it well. Once more, by heaven's blessing, it is all well. Here is the sleeping hamlet of Bondi, chase with waiting women. Horses all ready, and postilions with their churn boots, impatient in the dewy dawn. Brief harnessing done, the postilions with their churn boots vault into the saddles, brandish circularly their little noisy whips. Furson, under his jarvy surtout, bends in lowly silent reverence of adieu, royal hands wave speechless in expressible response, Baroness de Corf's Berlin, with the royalty of France, bounds off, forever, as it proved. Deft Furson dashes obliquely northward, through the country, towards Bougre, gains Bougre, finds his German coachman and chariot waiting there, cracks off, and drives undiscovered into unknown space. A deft active man, we say. 
what he undertook to do is nimbly and successfully done. And so the royalty of France is actually fled. This precious night, the shortest of the year, it flies and drives. Baroness de Corf is, at bottom, Dame de Turzel, governess of the royal children, she who came hooded with the two hooded little ones, little Dauphin, little Madame Royale, known long afterwards as Duchess d'Angouleme. Baroness de Corf's waiting maid is the queen in gypsy hat. The royal individual in round hat and peruke, he is valet, for the time being. That other hooded dame, styled traveling companion, is kind sister Elizabeth. She had sworn, long since, when the insurrection of women was, that only death should part her in them. And so they rush there, not too impetuously, through the wood of Bondy, over a Rubicon in their own and France's history. Great. Though the future is all vague. If we reach Bull. If we do not reach him. O oh Louis. And this all round thee is the great slumbering earth, and overhead, the great watchful heaven. The slumbering wood of Bondy, where long-haired Childeric do nothing was struck through with iron, not unreasonably. These peaked stone towers are Rainsy, towers of wicked Diorlans. All slumbers save the multiplex rustle of our new Berlin. Loose-skirted scarecrow of an herb merchant, with his ass and early greens, toilsomely plodding, seems the only creature we meet. But right ahead the great northeast sends up evermore his grey brindled dawn, from dewy branch, birds here and there, with short deep warble, salute the coming sun stars fade out, and galaxies, street lamps of the city of God. The universe, O oh my brothers, is flinging wide its portals for the levy of the great high king. Thou, poor King Louis, fairest nevertheless, as mortals do, towards orient lands of hope. And the Tilleries with its levies, and France and the earth itself, is but a larger kind of dog hutch, occasionally going rabid. Chapter 2.4.4 Attitude But in Paris, at six in the morning. When some patriot deputy, warned by a billet, awoke Lafayette, and they went to the Tilleries, imagination may paint, but words cannot, the surprise of Lafayette. Or with what bewilderment helpless Gouvian rolled glassy Argus's eyes, discerning now that his false chambermaid told true. However, it is to be recorded that Paris, thanks to an August National Assembly, did, on this seeming doomsday, surpass itself. Never, according to historian eyewitnesses, was there seen such an imposing attitude. Sections all in permanence. Our town hall, too, having first, about ten o'clock, fired three solemn alarm cannons, above all, our National Assembly. National Assembly, likewise permanent, decides what is needful. With unanimous consent, for the Cote Droit sits dumb, afraid of the lantern. Decides with a calm promptitude, which rises towards the sublime. One must needs vote, for the thing is self-evident, that His Majesty has been abducted, or spirited away, in lev, by some person or persons unknown, in which case, what will the Constitution have us do? Let us return to first principles, as we always say, revenons aux principes. By first or by second principles, much is promptly decided, ministers are sent for, instructed how to continue their functions, Lafayette is examined. And Gouvian, who gives a most helpless account, the best he can. Letters are found written, one letter, of immense magnitude all in His Majesty's hand, and evidently of His Majesty's own composition, addressed to the National Assembly. It details, with earnestness, with a childlike simplicity, what woes His Majesty has suffered. Woes great and small, a necker seen applauded, a majesty not, then insurrection, want of due cash in civil list. General want of cash, furniture and order, anarchy everywhere, deficit never yet, in the smallest, choked or cumble, wherefore in brief His Majesty has retired towards a place of liberty. And, leaving sanctions, federation, and what oaths there may be, to shift for themselves, does now refer, to what, thinks an August Assembly. To that, declaration of the 23rd of June, with its Sol Ael Farah, he alone will make his people happy. As if that were not buried, deep enough, under two irrevocable twelve months, and the wreck and rubbish of a whole feudal world. 
This strange autograph letter the National Assembly decides on printing, on transmitting to the 83 departments, with exegetic commentary, short but pithy. Commissioners also shall go forth on all sides, the people be exhorted. The armies be increased, care taken that the commonweal suffer no damage. And now, with a sublime air of calmness, nay of indifference, we pass to the order of the day. By such sublime calmness, the terror of the people is calmed. These gleaming pike forests, which bristled fateful in the early sun, disappear again, the far sounding street orders cease or spout milder. We are to have a civil war, let us have it then. The king is gone. But National Assembly, but France, and we remain. The people also takes a great attitude, the people also is calm, motionless as a couchant lion. With but a few brolings, some waggings of the tail, to shew what it will do. Cazals, for instance, was beset by street groups and cries of lantern, but national patrols easily delivered him. Likewise all kings' effigies and statues, at least stucco ones, get abolished. Even kings' names. The word Roy fades suddenly out of all shop signs, the Royal Bengal Tiger itself, on the boulevards, becomes the National Bengal 1, Tigre National. How great is a calm couch in people! On the morrow, men will say to one another, We have no king, yet we slept sound enough. On the morrow, fervent Achille de Chatelet, and Thomas Paine the rebellious needleman, shall have the walls of Paris profusely plastered with their placard. Announcing that there must be a republic, need we add that Lafayette too, though at first menaced by pikes, has taken a great attitude, or indeed the greatest of all. Scouts and aides de camp fly forth, vague, in quest and pursuit. Young Romuff towards Valenciennes, though with small hope. Thus Paris, sublimely calmed, in its bereavement. But from the messageries royales, in all mailbags, radiates forth far darting the electric news, our hereditary representative is flown. Laugh, black royalists, yet be it in your sleeve only. Lest patriotism notice, and waxing frantic, lower the lantern. In Paris alone is a sublime national assembly with its calmness. Truly, other places must take it as they can, with open mouth and eyes, with panic cackling, with wrath, with conjecture. How each one of those dull leathern diligences, with its leathern bag and, the king is fled, furrows up smooth France as it goes, through town and hamlet, ruffles the smooth public mind into quivering agitation of death terror. Then lumbers on, as if nothing had happened. Along all highways, towards the utmost borders, till all France is ruffled, roughened up, metaphorically speaking, into one enormous, desperate-minded, red-guggling turkey cock. For example, it is under cloud of night that the leather monster reaches Nantes, deep sunk in sleep. The word spoken rouses all patriot men, General de Mourier, enveloped in rocolores, has to descend from his bedroom. Finds the street covered with four or five thousand citizens in their shirts. Here and there a faint farthing rushlight, hastily kindled, and so many swart featured haggard faces, with nightcaps pushed back and the more or less flowing drapery of nightshirt, open-mouthed till the general say his word. And overhead, as always, the great bear is turning so quiet round Bootes, steady, indifferent as the leathern diligence itself. Take comfort, ye men of Nantes, Bootes and the steady bear are turning, ancient Atlantic still sends his brine, loud billowing, up your war stream, brandy shall be hot in the stomach, this is not the last of the days, but one before the last. The fools! If they knew what was doing, in these very instants, also by candlelight, in the far northeast. Perhaps we may say the most terrified man in Paris or France is, who thinks the reader, see green Robespierre. Double paleness, with the shadow of gibbets and halters, overcasts the sea green features, it is too clear to him that there is to be a Saint Bartholomew of patriots, that in four and twenty hours he will not be in life. These horrid anticipations of the soul he is heard uttering at Pessions, by a notable witness. By Madame Roland, namely, her whom we saw, last year, radiant at the Lions Federation. These four months, the Rolands have been in Paris. 
arranging with assembly committees the municipal affairs of Lyons, affairs all sunk in debt, communing, the while, as was most natural, with the best patriots to be found here, with our Brissets, Pessians, Busets, Robespierres. Who were wont to come to us, says the fair hostess, for evenings in the week. They, running about, busier than ever this day, would fain have comforted the sea-green man, spake of Achille du Chatelet's placard. Of a journal to be called the Republican, of preparing men's minds for a republic. A republic, said the sea-green, with one of his dry husky unsportful laughs, what is that? O sea-green incorruptible, thou shalt see. Chapter 2.4.V. The New Berlin. But scouts all this while in Abdikas, have flown forth faster than the leathern diligences. Young Romuff, as we said, was off early towards Valenciennes, distracted villagers seize him, as a traitor with a finger of his own in the plot, drag him back to the town hall, to the National Assembly, which speedily grants a new passport. Nay now, that same scarecrow of an herb merchant with his ass has bethought him of the grand new Berlin scene in the wood of Bondi. And delivered evidence of it, Romuff, furnished with new passport, is sent forth with double speed on a hopefuler track, by Bondi, Clay, and Chalens, towards Metz, to track the New Berlin, and gallops off Frank Etrier. Miserable New Berlin! Why could not royalty go in some old Berlin similar to that of other men? Flying for life, one does not stickle about his vehicle. Monsieur, in a commonplace travelling carriage is off northwards. Madame, his princess, in another, with variation of route, they cross one another while changing horses, without look of recognition, and reach Flanders, no man questioning them. Precisely in the same manner, beautiful Princess de Lambault set off, about the same hour, and will reach England safe, would she had continued there. The beautiful, the good, but the unfortunate, reserved for a frightful end. All runs along, unmolested, speedy, except only the new Berlin. Huge leathern vehicle, huge argosy, let us say, or Acapulco ship, with its heavy stern boat of chase and pair. With its three yellow pilot boats of mounted bodyguard couriers, rocking aimless round it and ahead of it, to bewilder, not to guide. It lumbers along, lurchingly with stress, at a snail's pace, noted of all the world. The bodyguard couriers, in their yellow liveries, go prancing and clattering, loyal but stupid, unacquainted with all things. Stoppages occur, and breakages to be repaired at etoges. King Louis too will dismount, will walk up hills, and enjoy the blessed sunshine, with eleven horses and double drink money, and all furtherances of nature and art, it will be found that royalty, flying for life, accomplishes sixty-nine miles in twenty-two incessant hours. Slow royalty. And yet not a minute of these hours but is precious, on minutes hang the destinies of royalty now. Readers, therefore, can judge in what humor Duc de Choiseul might stand waiting, in the village of pont de Somavel, some leagues beyond Chalens, hour after hour, now when the day bends visibly westward. Choiseul drove out of Paris, in all privity, ten hours before their majesty's fixed time, his hussars, led by engineer Gogolat, are here duly, come, to escort a treasure that is expected but, hour after hour, is no baroness de Corfs Berlin. Indeed, over all that northeast region, on the skirts of Champagne and of Lorraine, where the great road runs, the agitation is considerable. For all along, from this Pont de Somavel northeastward as far as Montmedy, at post villages and towns, escorts of hussars and dragoons do lounge waiting, a train or chain of military escorts. At the Montmedy end of it are Brave Bull, an electric thunder chain, which the invisible bull, like a father Jove, holds in his hand, for wise purposes. Brave Bull has done what man could. Has spread out his electric thunder chain of military escorts, onwards to the threshold of Chalens, it waits but for the new Corf Berlin, to receive it, escort it, and, if need be, bear it off in whirlwind of military fire. They lie and lounge there, we say, these fierce troopers, from Montmedy and Steny, through Clermont, St. Menahel to utmost Pont de Somavel, in all post villages. For the route shall avoid Verdun and great towns, they loiter impatient, till the treasure arrive. 
Judge what a day this is for brave bull, perhaps the first day of a new glorious life, surely the last day of the old. Also, and indeed still more, what a day, beautiful and terrible, for your young full-blooded captains, your Dandoins, Comte de Damas, Duc de Choiseul, Engineer Gogolat, and the like, entrusted with the secret. Alas, the day bends ever more westward, and no Korf Berlin comes to sight. It is four hours beyond the time, and still no Berlin. In all village streets, royalist captains go lounging, looking off in Paris ward. With face of unconcern, with heart full of black care, rigorous quartermasters can hardly keep the private dragoons from cafés and dram shops. Dawn on our bewilderment, thou new Berlin. Dawn on us, thou sun chariot of a new Berlin, with the destinies of France. It was of His Majesty's ordering, this military array of escorts, a thing solacing the royal imagination with a look of security and rescue. Yet, in reality, creating only alarm, and where there was otherwise no danger, danger without end. For each patriot, in these post villages, asks naturally, this clatter of cavalry, and marching and lounging of troops, what means it? To escort a treasure. Why escort, when no patriot will steal from the nation, or where is your treasure? There has been such marching and countermarching, for it is another fatality, that certain of these military escorts came out so early as yesterday. The nineteenth not the twentieth of the month being the day first appointed, which Her Majesty, for some necessity or other, saw good to alter. And now consider the suspicious nature of patriotism, suspicious, above all, of Bull the aristocrat. And how the sour doubting humor has had leave to accumulate and exacerbate for four and twenty hours. At Ponte Samavel, these forty foreign hussars of Gogolat and Duc Choiseul are becoming an unspeakable mystery to all men. They lounged long enough, already, at St. Menehauld, lounged and loitered till our national volunteers there, all risen into hot wrath of doubt, demanded three hundred fusils of their town hall, and got them. At which same moment too, as it chanced, our Captain Dandoins was just coming in, from Clermont with his troop, at the other end of the village. A fresh troop, alarming enough, though happily they are only dragoons and French. So that Gogolat with his hussars had to ride, and even to do it fast, till here at Pont de Samavel, where Choiseul lay waiting, he found resting place. Resting place, as on burning Merley. For the rumor of him flies abroad. And men run to and fro in fright and anger, Chalin sends forth exploratory pickets, coming from St. Menehauld, on that. What is it, ye whiskered hussars, men of foreign guttural speech, in the name of heaven, what is it that brings you? A treasure, exploratory pickets shake their heads. The hungry peasants, however, know too well what treasure it is, military seizure for rents, feudalities, which no bailiff could make us pay. This they know. And set to jingling their parish bell by way of toxin, with rapid effect. Choiseul and Gogolat, if the whole country is not to take fire, must needs, be there Berlin, be there no Berlin, saddle and ride. They mount. And this parish toxin happily ceases. They ride slowly eastward, toward St. Menehauld, still hoping the sun chariot of a Berlin may overtake them. Ah me! no Berlin. And near now is that St. Menehauld, which expelled us in the morning, with its three hundred national fusils, which looks, belike, not too lovingly on Captain Dandoins and his fresh dragoons, though only French. Which, in a word, one dare not enter the second time, under pain of explosion. With rather heavy heart, our hussar party strikes off to the left. Through byways, through pathless hills and woods, they, avoiding St. Menehauld and all places which have seen them heretofore, will make direct for the distant village of Varennes. It is probable they will have a rough evening ride. This first military post, therefore, in the long thunder chain, has gone off with no effect, or with worse, and your chain threatens to entangle itself. The great road, however, is got hushed again into a kind of quietude, though one of the wakefulest. Indolent dragoons cannot, by any quartermaster, be kept altogether from the dram shop. Where patriots drink, and will even treat, eager enough for news. 
Captains, in a state near distraction, beat the dusky highway, with a face of indifference, and no sun chariot appears. Why lingers it? Incredible, that with eleven horses and such yellow couriers and furtherances, its rate should be under the weightiest dray rate, some three miles an hour. Alas, one knows not whether it ever even got out of Paris. And yet also one knows not whether, this very moment, it is not at the village end. One's heart flutters on the verge of unutterabilities. Chapter 2.4.VI Old Dragoon Druet In this manner, however, has the day bent downwards. Wearied mortals are creeping home from their field labor, the village artisan eats with relish his supper of herbs, or has strolled forth to the village street for a sweet mouthful of air and human news. Still summer eventide everywhere. The great sun hangs flaming on the utmost northwest, for it is his longest day this year. The hilltops rejoicing will ere long be at their ruddiest, and blush good night. The thrush, in green dells, on long shadowed leafy spray, pours gushing his glad serenade, to the babble of brooks grown audibler, silence is stealing over the earth. Your dusty mill of Valmy, as all other mills and drudgeries, may furl its canvas, and cease swashing and circling. The swanked grinders in this treadmill of an earth have ground out another day, and lounge there, as we say, in village groups. Movable, or ranked on social stone seats, their children, mischievous imps, sporting about their feet. Unnotable hum of sweet human gossip rises from this village of St. Menehauld, as from all other villages. Gossip mostly sweet, unnotable. For the very dragoons are French and gallant, nor as yet has the Paris Amber done diligence, with its leathern bag, rumbled in, to terrify the minds of men. One figure nevertheless we do note at the last door of the village, that figure in loose flowing nightgown, of Jean Baptiste Druet, master of the post here. An acrid choleric man, rather dangerous looking. Still in the prime of life, though he has served, in his time as a Conde dragoon. This day from an early hour, Druet got his collar stirred, and has been kept fretting. Hussar Gogolat in the morning saw good, by way of thrift, to bargain with his own innkeeper, not with Druet regular maitre de post, about some gig horse for the sending back of his gig. Which thing Druet perceiving came over in red ire, menacing the innkeeper, and would not be appeased. Holy and unsatisfactory day. For Druet is an acrid patriot too, was at the Paris Feast of Pikes, and what do these bull soldiers mean? Hussars, with their gig, and a vengeance to it, have hardly been thrust out, when Dandoins and his fresh dragoons arrive from Clermont, and stroll. For what purpose? Choleric Druet steps out and steps in, with long flowing nightgown. Looking abroad, with that sharpness of faculty which stirred collar gives to man. On the other hand, marked Captain Dandoins on the street of that same village, sauntering with a face of indifference, a heart eaten of black care. For no Corf Berlin makes its appearance. The great sun flames broader toward setting, one's heart flutters on the verge of dread unutterabilities. By heaven! Here is the yellow bodyguard courier, spurring fast, in the ruddy evening light. Steady, O oh Dandoins, stand with inscrutable indifferent face, though the yellow blockhead spurs past the posthouse, inquires to find it, and stirs the village, all delighted with his fine livery. Lumbering along with its mountains of bandboxes, and chase behind, the Corf Berlin rolls in, huge Acapulco ship with its cockboat, having got thus far. The eyes of the villagers look enlightened, as such eyes do when a coach transit, which is an event, occurs for them. Strolling dragoons respectfully, so fine are the yellow liveries, bring hand to helmet. And a lady in gypsy hat responds with a grace peculiar to her. Dandoin stands with folded arms, and what look of indifference and disdainful garrison air a man can, while the heart is like leaping out of him. Curled disdainful mustachio. Careless glance, which however surveys the village groups, and does not like them. With his eye he bespeaks the yellow courier. Be quick, be quick. Thick-headed yellow cannot understand the eye. Comes up mumbling, to ask in words, scene of the village. Nor is postmaster Druitt unobservant, all this while, but steps out and steps in, with his long flowing nightgown, 
in the level sunlight, prying into several things. When a man's faculties, at the right time, are sharpened by collar, it may lead to much. That lady in slouched gypsy hat, though sitting back in the carriage, does she not resemble someone we have seen, some time? At the feast of pikes, or elsewhere. And this gross tet in round hat and peruke, which, looking rearward, pokes itself out from time to time, methinks there are features in it. Quick, Sieur Guillaume, clerk of the Directoire, bring me a new assignat. Druet scans the new assignat, compares the paper money picture with the gross head in round hat there, by day and night. You might say the one was an attempted engraving of the other. And this march of troops, this sauntering and whispering, I see it. Druet postmaster of this village, hot patriot, old dragoon of Condé, consider, therefore, what thou wilt do. And fast, for behold the new Berlin, expeditiously yoked, cracks whipcord, and rolls away, Druet dare not, on the spur of the instant, clutch the bridles in his own two hands, Dandoins, with broadsword, might hew you off. Our poor nationals, not one of them here, have three hundred fusils but then no powder, besides one is not sure, only morally certain. Druet, as an adroit old dragoon of Condé does what is advisablest, privily bespeaks Clerk Guillaume, old dragoon of Condé he too, privily, while Clerk Guillaume is saddling two of the fleetest horses, slips over to the town hall to whisper a word. Then mounts with Clerk Guillaume, and the two bound eastward in pursuit, to see what can be done. They bound eastward, in sharp trot, their moral certainty permeating the village, from the town hall outwards, in busy whispers. Alas! Captain Dandoins orders his dragoons to mount, but they, complaining of long fast, demand bread and cheese first, before which brief repast can be eaten, the whole village is permeated, not whispering now, but blustering and shrieking. National volunteers, in hurried muster, shriek for gunpowder. Dragoons halt between patriotism and rule of the service, between bread and cheese and fixed bayonets, Dandoin's hands secretly his pocketbook, with its secret dispatches, to the rigorous quartermaster, the very ostlers have stable forks and flails. The rigorous quartermaster, half-saddled, cuts out his way with the sword's edge, amid leveled bayonets, amid patriot vociferations, adjurations, flail strokes, and rides frantic, few or even none following him. The rest, so sweetly constrained consenting to stay there. And thus the new Berlin rolls, and Druet and Guillaume gallop after it, and Dandoins as troopers or trooper gallops after them. And St. Menehauld, with some leagues of the king's highway, is in explosion, and your military thunder chain has gone off in a self-destructive manner, one may fear with the frightfulest issues. Chapter 2.4.7 The Night of Spurs This comes of mysterious escorts, and a new Berlin with eleven horses, he that has a secret should not only hide it, but hide that he has it to hide. Your first military escort has exploded self-destructive. And all military escorts, and a suspicious country will now be up, explosive, comparable not to victorious thunder. Comparable, say rather, to the first stirring of an alpine avalanche. Which, once stirred, as here at St. Menehauld, will spread, all round, and on and on, as far as Steni, thundering with wild ruin, till patriot villagers, peasantry, military escorts, New Berlin and royalty are down, jumbling in the abyss. The thick shades of night are falling. Postilions crack the whip, the Royal Berlin is through Clermont, where Colonel Comte de Damas got a word whispered to it, is safe through, towards Varennes. Rushing at the rate of double drink money, an unknown and canoe on horseback shrieks earnestly some hoarse whisper, not audible, into the rushing carriage window, and vanishes, left in the night. August travellers palpitate. Nevertheless overwearied nature sinks every one of them into a kind of sleep. Alas, and Druet and Clerk Guillaume Spur. Taking side roads, for shortness, for safety, scattering abroad that moral certainty of theirs. Which flies, a bird of the air carrying it. And your rigorous quartermaster spurs, awakening hoarse trumpet tone, as here at Clermont, calling out dragoons gone to bed. Brave Colonel de Damas has them mounted, in part, these Clermont men. 
young cornet Remy dashes off with a few. But the Patriot Magistracy is out here at Claremont too, National Guard shrieking for ball cartridges, and the village illuminates itself, deft patriots springing out of bed. Alertly, in shirt or shift, striking a light, sticking up each his farthing candle, or penurious oil crews, till all glitters and glimmers, so deft are they. A camisado, or shirt tumult, everywhere, storm bells set a ringing. Village drum beating furious general, as here at Claremont, under illumination, distracted patriots pleading in menacing. Brave young Colonel de Damas, in that uproar of distracted patriotism, speaks some fire sentences to what troopers he has, comrades insulted at St. Menehault, king and country calling on the brave, then gives the fire word, draw swords. Whereupon, alas, the troopers only smite their sword handles, driving them further home. To me, whoever is for the king, cries Damas in despair, and gallops, he with some poor loyal too, of the subaltern sort, into the bosom of the night. Night unexampled in the Clermontais, shortest of the year, remarkablest of the century, night deserving to be named of spurs. Cornet Remy, and those few he dashed off with, has missed his road, is galloping for hours towards Verdun. Then, for hours, across hedged country, through roused hamlets, towards Varennes. Unlucky Cornet Remy, unluckier Colonel Damas, with whom there ride desperate only some loyal too. More ride not of that Claremont escort, of other escorts, in other villages, not even two may ride, but only all curvette and prance, impeded by storm bell and your village illuminating itself. And Druitt rides and Clerc Guillaume, and the country runs. Gogolat and Duke Choiseul are plunging through morasses, over cliffs, over stock and stone, in the shaggy woods of the Clermontais, by tracks, or trackless, with guides. Hussars tumbling into pitfalls, and lying, swooned three quarters of an hour, the rest refusing to march without them. What an evening ride from Pont de Somerville! What a thirty hours, since Choiseul quitted Paris, with Queen's valet Leonard in the chaise by him. Black care sits behind the rider. Thus go they plunging, rustle the owlet from his branchy nest. Chant the sweet-scented forest herb, queen of the meadows spilling her spikenard, and frighten the ear of night. But hark! Towards twelve o'clock, as one guesses, for the very stars are gone out, sound of the toxin from Varennes. Checking bridle, the hussar officer listens, some fire undoubtedly. Yet rides on, with double breathlessness, to verify. Yes, gallant friends that do your utmost, it is a certain sort of fire, difficult to quench. The Corf Berlin, fairly ahead of all this riding avalanche, reached the little paltry village of Varennes about eleven o'clock, hopeful, in spite of that hoarse whispering unknown. Do not all towns now lie behind us, Verdun avoided, on our right? Within wind of Bull himself, in a manner, and the darkest of midsummer nights favoring us. And so we halt on the hilltop at the south end of the village, expecting our relay. Which young bull, Bull's own son, with his escort of hussars, was to have ready, for in this village is no post. Distracting to think of, neither horse nor hussar is here. Ah, and stout horses, a proper relay belonging to Duke Choiseul, do stand at hay, but in the upper village over the bridge, and we know not of them. Hussars likewise do wait, but drinking in the taverns. For indeed it is six hours beyond the time. Young bull, silly stripling, thinking the matter over for this night, has retired to bed. And so our yellow couriers, inexperienced, must rove, groping, bungling, through a village mostly asleep, postilions will not, for any money, go on with the tired horses, not at least without refreshment. Not they, let the valet in round hat argue as he likes. Miserable. For five and thirty minutes, by the king's watch, the Berlin is at a dead stand, round hat arguing with churn boots, tired horses slobbering their meal and water. Yellow couriers groping, bungling, young bull asleep, all the while, in the upper village, and Choiseul's fine team standing there at hay. No help for it. Not with a king's ransom the horses deliberately slobber, round hat argues, bull sleeps. And mark now, in the thick night, 
do not two horsemen, with jaded trot, come clank clanking. And start with half paws, if one noticed them, at sight of this dim mass of a Berlin, and its dull slobbering and arguing, then prick off faster, into the village. It is Druet, he and Clerk Guillaume. Still ahead, they too, of the whole riding hurly-burly, unshot, though some brag of having chased them. Perilous is Druet's errand also, but he is an old dragoon, with his wits shaken thoroughly awake. The village of Varennes lies dark and slumberous, a most unlevel village, of inverse saddle shape, as men write. It sleeps, the rushing of the river air singing lullaby to it. Nevertheless from the Golden Arms, Bras Door Tavern, across that sloping marketplace, there still comes shine of social light, comes voice of rude drovers, or the like, who have not yet taken the stirrup cup. Boniface Leblanc, in white apron, serving them, cheerful to behold. To this Bras d'Or, Druid enters, alacrity looking through his eyes, he nudges Boniface, in all privacy, camarade, a tu bon patriot, art thou a good patriot? C.J.E. Sui. Answers Boniface. Dot, in that case, eagerly whispers Druet, what whisper is needful, heard of Boniface alone. And now see Boniface Leblanc bustling, as he never did for the jolliest toper. See Druet and Guillaume, dexterous old dragoons, instantly down blocking the bridge, with a furniture wagon they find there, with whatever wagons, tumbrils, barrels, barrows their hands can lay hold of, till no carriage can pass. Then swiftly, the bridge once blocked, see them take station hard by, under Varennes archway, joined by Leblanc, Leblanc's brother, and one or two alert patriots he has roused. Some half dozen in all, with national muskets, they stand close, waiting under the archway, till that same Korf Berlin rumble up. It rumbles up, Alti La. Lanterns flash out from under coat skirts, bridles chuck in strong fists, two national muskets level themselves fore and aft through the two coach doors, may dom, your passports. Alas! Alas! Sieur Sauce, procure of the township, Tallow Chandler also and grocer is there, with official grocer politeness. Drew it with fierce logic and ready wit, the respected traveling party, be it Baroness de Corfs, or persons of still higher consequence, will perhaps please to rest itself in M. Sauce till the dawn strike up. O oh Louis! O oh hapless Marie Antoinette, fated to pass thy life with such men! Phlegmatic Louis, art thou but lazy semi animate phlegm then, to the centre of thee? King, Captain General, Sovereign Frank! If thy heart ever formed, since it began beating under the name of heart, any resolution at all, be it now then, or never in this world, violent nocturnal individuals, and if it were persons of high consequence. And if it were the king himself? Has the king not the power, which all beggars have, of travelling unmolested on his own highway? Yes, it is the king, and tremble ye to know it. The king has said, in this one small matter. And in France, or under God's throne, is no power that shall gainsay. Not the king shall ye stop here under this your miserable archway, but his dead body only, and answer it to heaven and earth. To me, bodyguards, postillions, and avant. One fancies in that case the pale paralysis of these two Leblanc musketeers, the drooping of Druitt's underjaw, and how procure sauce had melted like tallow in furnace heat, Louis faring on. In some few steps awakening young bull, awakening relays and hussars, triumphant entry, with cavalcading high-brandishing escort, and escorts, into Montmédy, and the whole course of French history different. Alas, it was not in the poor phlegmatic man. Had it been in him, French history had never come under this Varennes archway to decide itself. He steps out, all step out. Procure sauce gives his grocer arms to the Queen and Sister Elizabeth. Majesty taking the two children by the hand. And thus they walk, coolly back, over the marketplace, to procure sauce, mount into his small upper story, where straightway his majesty demands refreshments. Demands refreshments, as is written. Gets bread and cheese with a bottle of burgundy, and remarks, that it is the best burgundy he ever drank. Meanwhile, the Varennes notables, and all men, official, and non-official, are hastily drawing on their breeches, getting their fighting gear. 
Mortals half-dressed tumble out barrels, lay felled trees, scouts dart off to all the four winds, the toxin begins clanging, the village illuminates itself. Very singular, how these little villages do manage, so adroit are they, when startled in midnight alarm of war. Like little adroit municipal rattlesnakes, suddenly awakened, for their storm bell rattles and rings. Their eyes glisten luminous, with tallow light, as in rattlesnake ire, and the village will sting. Old Dragoon Druid is our engineer and generalissimo, valiant as a Rui Diaz, now or never, ye patriots, for the soldiery is coming. Massacre by Austrians, by aristocrats, wars more than civil, it all depends on you and the hour. National guards rank themselves, half-buttoned, mortals, we say, still only in breeches, in under-petticoat, tumble out barrels and lumber, lay felled trees for barricades, the village will sting. Rabid democracy, it would seem, is not confined to Paris, then. Ah no, whatsoever courtiers might talk, too clearly no. This of dying for one's king is grown into a dying for oneself, against the king, if need be. And so our riding and running avalanche and hurly-burly has reached the abyss, Corf Berlin foremost, and may pour itself thither, and jumble, endless. For the next six hours, need we ask if there was a clattering far and wide? Clattering and toxining in hot tumult, over all the clermontise, spreading through the three bishoprics, dragoon and hussar troops galloping on roads and no roads, national guards arming and starting in the dead of night. Toxin after toxin transmitting the alarm. In some forty minutes, Gogolat and Choiseul, with their wearied hussars, reach Varennes. Ah, it is no fire then, or a fire difficult to quench. They leap the tree barricades, in spite of national sergeant, they enter the village, Choiseul instructing his troopers how the matter really is, who respond interjectionally, in their guttural dialect, Der Koenig, die Konigen, and seem stanch. These now, in their stanch humor, will, for one thing, beset Procure Sauce's house. Most beneficial, had not Druid stormfully ordered otherwise, and even bellowed, in his extremity, cannoneers to your guns. Two old honeycombed field pieces, empty of all but cobwebs, the rattle whereof, as the cannoneers with assured countenance trundled them up, did nevertheless abate the hussar ardor, and produce a respectfuler ranking further back. Jugs of wine, handed over the ranks, for the German throat too has sensibility, will complete the business. When engineer Gogolat, some hour or so afterwards, steps forth, the response to him is, a hiccuping vive la nation. What boots it? Gogolat, Choiseul, now also Count de Moss, and all the Varennes officiality are with the king, and the king can give no order, form no opinion but sits there, as he has ever done, like clay on potter's wheel. Perhaps the absurdest of all pitiable and pardonable clay figures that now circle under the moon. He will go on, next morning, and take the National Guard with him, sauce permitting. Hapless queen, with her two children laid there on the mean bed, old mother sauce kneeling to heaven, with tears and an audible prayer, to bless them. Imperial Marie Antoinette near kneeling to son sauce and wife sauce, amid candle boxes and treacle barrels, in vain. There are three thousand National Guards got in, before long they will count ten thousand. Toxins spreading like fire on dry heath, or far faster. Young bull, roused by this Varennes toxin, has taken horse, and, fled towards his father. Thitherward also rides, in an almost hysterically desperate manner, a certain Sieur Aubriot, Choiseul's orderly, swimming dark rivers, our bridge being blocked, spurring as if the hell-hunt were at his heels. Through the village of Dunn, he, galloping still on, scatters the alarm, at Dunn, brave Captain Deslins and his escort of a hundred, saddle and ride. Deslins too gets into Varennes, leaving his hundred outside, at the tree barricade. Offers to cut King Louis out, if he will order it, but unfortunately, the work will prove hot, whereupon King Louis has no orders to give. And so the toxin clangs, and dragoons gallop. And can do nothing, having galloped, National Guards stream in like the gathering of ravens, your exploding thunder chain, falling avalanche, or what else we liken it to, does play, with a vengeance, up now as far as Steenine Bull himself. 
Brave bull, son of the whirlwind, he saddles royal alamand, speaks fire words, kindling heart and eyes, distributes twenty-five gold lewis a company, ride, royal alamand, long famed, no tillery's charge in Necroorland's bus procession. A very king made captive, and world all to win, such is the knight deserving to be named of spurs. At six o'clock two things have happened. Lafayette's aide de ca, Romuff, riding a Frank Etrier, on that old herb merchant's route, quickened during the last stages, has got to Varennes. Where the ten thousand now furiously demand, with fury of panic terror, that royalty shall forthwith return Paris ward, that there be not infinite bloodshed. Also, on the other side, English Tom, Choiseul's Jokiai, flying with that Choiseul relay, has met Bull on the heights of Dun, the adamantine brow flushed with dark thunder, thunderous rattle of royal alamand at his heels. English Tom answers as he can the brief question, how it is at Varennes, then asks in turn what he, English Tom, with him, de Choiseul's horses, is to do, and whither to ride, to the bottomless pool. Answers a thunder voice. Then again speaking and spurring, orders Royal Alamand to the gallop, and vanishes, swearing, endurant. Tis the last of our brave bull. Within sight of Varennes, he having drawn bridle, calls a council of officers, finds that it is in vain. King Louis has departed, consenting, amid the clangor of universal storm bell, amid the tramp of ten thousand armed men, already arrived, and say, of sixty thousand flocking thither. Brave Deslins, even without orders, darted at the river air with his hundred. Swam one branch of it, could not the other, and stood there, dripping and panting, with inflated nostril. The ten thousand answering him with a shout of mockery, the new Berlin lumbering Paris ward its weary inevitable way. No help, then in earth, nor in an age, not of miracles, in heaven. That night, Marquis de Bull and twenty-one more of us rode over the frontiers, the Bernardine monks at Orville in Luxembourg gave us supper and lodging. With little of speech, Bull rides, with thoughts that do not brook speech. Northward, towards uncertainty, and the Cimmerian night, towards West Indian Isles, for with thin emigrant delirium the son of the whirlwind cannot act, towards England, towards premature stoical death, not towards France any more. Honour to the brave, who, be it in this quarrel or in that, is a substance and articulate speaking piece of human valor, not a fanfarinating hollow spectrum and squeaking and gibbering shadow. One of the few royalist chief actors this bull, of whom so much can be said. The brave bull too, then, vanishes from the tissue of our story. Story and tissue, faint ineffectual emblem of that grand miraculous tissue, and living tapestry named French Revolution, which did weave itself then in very fact, on the loud-sounding, loom of time. The old brave drop out from it, with their strivings, and new acrid druets, of new strivings and color, come in, as is the manner of that weaving. Chapter 2.4.8 The Return So then our grand royalist plot, of flight to Metz, has executed itself. Long hovering in the background, as a dread royal ultimatum, it has rushed forward in its terrors, verily to some purpose. How many royalist plots and projects, one after another, cunningly devised, that were to explode like powder mines and thunderclaps, not one solitary plot of which has issued otherwise. Powder mine of a seance royale on the 23rd of June 1789, which exploded as we then said, through the touchhole, which next, your war god Broy having reloaded it, brought a bastille about your ears. Then came fervent opera past, with flourishing of sabres, and O Richard, O my king, which, aided by hunger, produces insurrection of women, and palace Athene in the shape of Demoiselle Theroin. Valor profits not. Neither has fortune smiled on fanfarinade. The bull armament ends as the broy one had done. Man after man spends himself in this cause, only to work at quicker ruin, it seems a cause doomed, forsaken of earth and heaven. On the 6th of October dawn a year, King Louis, escorted by Demoiselle Theroin and some two hundred thousand, made a royal progress and entrance into Paris, such as man had never witnessed, we prophesied him two more such. And accordingly another of them, after this flight to Metz, is now coming to pass. 
Theroin will not escort here, neither does Mirabeau now, sit in one of the accompanying carriages. Mirabeau lies dead, in the pantheon of great men. Theroin lies living, in dark Austrian prison, having gone to Liège, professionally, and been seized there. Bemurmured now by the horse-flowing Danube, the light of her patriot supper parties gone quite out. So lies Theroin, she shall speak with the Kaiser face to face, and return. And France lies how. Fleeting time shears down the great and the little, and in two years alters many things. But at all events, here, we say, is a second ignominious royal procession, though much altered, to be witnessed also by its hundreds of thousands. Patience, ye Paris patriots, the Royal Berlin is returning. Not till Saturday, for the Royal Berlin travels by slow stages, amid such loud-voiced confluent sea of national guards, sixty thousand as they count, amid such tumult of all people. Three National Assembly commissioners, famed Barnave, famed Peschen, generally respectable Le Tourmaubourg, have gone to meet it, of whom the two former ride in the Berlin itself beside Majesty, day after day. Le Tour, as a mere respectability, and man of whom all men speak well, can ride in the rear, with Dame Tourzel and the Soubrettes. So on Saturday evening, about seven o'clock, Paris by hundreds of thousands is again drawn up, not now dancing the tricolor joy dance of hope, nor as yet dancing in fury dance of hate and revenge. But in silence, with vague look of conjecture and curiosity mostly scientific. A Saint Antoine placard has given notice this morning that whosoever insults Louis shall be caned, whosoever applauds him shall be hanged. Behold then, at last, that wonderful new Berlin. Encircled by blue national sea with fixed bayonets, which flows slowly, floating it on, through the silent assembled hundreds of thousands. Three yellow couriers sit atop bound with ropes. Peschen, Barnave, their majesties, with Sister Elizabeth, and the children of France, are within. Smile of embarrassment, or cloud of dull sourness, is on the broad phlegmatic face of His Majesty, who keeps declaring to the successive official persons, what is evident, eh bien, me voila, well, here you have me. And what is not evident, I do assure you I did not mean to pass the frontiers, and so forth, speech is natural for that poor royal man, which decency would veil. Silent is Her Majesty, with a look of grief and scorn, natural for that royal woman. Thus lumbers and creeps the ignominious royal procession, through many streets, amid a silent gazing people, comparable, Mercier thinks, to some procession de Roy de Bazocchi. Or say, procession of King Crispin, with his dukes of Sudermania and royal blazonry of Cordwainery. Except indeed that this is not comic, a uh, no, it is comico-tragic, with bound couriers, and a doom hanging over it. Most fantastic, yet most miserably real. Miserablest flebble ludibrium of a pickle-herring tragedy. It sweeps along there, in most ungorgeous pall, through many streets, in the dusty summer evening, gets itself at length wriggled out of sight. Vanishing in the Tillery's palace, towards its doom, of slow torture, pain forte et dur. Populous, it is true, seizes the three rope-bound yellow couriers, will at least massacre them. But our august assembly, which is sitting at this great moment, sends out deputation of rescue, and the whole is got huddled up. Barnave, all dusty, is already there, in the National Hall, making brief discreet address and report. As indeed, through the whole journey, this Barnave has been most discreet, sympathetic, and has gained the Queen's trust, whose noble instinct teaches her always who is to be trusted. Very different from heavy passion. Who, if Campan speak truth, ate his luncheon, comfortably filled his wine glass, in the Royal Berlin, flung out his chicken bones past the nose of royalty itself. And, on the king saying, France cannot be a republic, answered, no, it is not ripe yet. Barnave is henceforth a queen's adviser, if advice could profit, and Her Majesty astonishes Dame Campan by signifying almost a regard for Barnave, and that, in a day of retribution and royal triumph, Barnave shall not be executed. On Monday night royalty went, on Saturday evening it returns, so much, within one short week, has royalty accomplished for itself.
the pickle herring tragedy has vanished in the Tillery's palace, towards pain strong and hard. Watched, fettered, and humbled, as royalty never was. Watched even in its sleeping apartments and inmost recesses, for it has to sleep with doors set ajar, blue national Argus watching, his eye fixed on the queen's curtains. Nay, on one occasion, as the queen cannot sleep, he offers to sit by her pillow, and converse a little. Chapter 2.4.9 Sharp Shot In regard to all which, this most pressing question arises, what is to be done with it? Depose it. Resolutely answer Robespierre and the thoroughgoing few. For truly, with a king who runs away, and needs to be watched in his very bedroom that he may stay and govern you, what other reasonable thing can be done? Had Philippe d'Orleans not been a caput mortuum? But of him, known as one defunct, no man now dreams. Depose it not, say that it is inviolable, that it was spirited away, was in lev, at any cost of sophistry and solecism, re-establish it. So answer with loud vehemence all manner of constitutional royalists, as all your pure royalists do naturally likewise, with low vehemence, and rage compressed by fear, still more passionately answer. Nay Barnave and the two Lameths, and what will follow them, do likewise answer so. Answer, with their whole might, terror-struck at the unknown abysses on the verge of which, driven thither by themselves mainly, all now reels, ready to plunge. By mighty effort and combination this latter course, of re-establish it, is the course fixed on, and it shall by the strong arm, if not by the clearest logic, be made good. With the sacrifice of all their hard-earned popularity, this notable triumvirate, says Talangin, set the throne up again, which they had so toiled to overturn, as one might set up an overturned pyramid, on its vertex. To stand so long as it is held. Unhappy France, unhappy in king, queen, and constitution, one knows not in which unhappiest. Was the meaning of our so glorious French Revolution this, and no other, that when shams and delusions, long soul-killing, had become body-killing, and got the length of bankruptcy in inanition, a great people rose and, with one voice, said. In the name of the highest, shams shall be no more. So many sorrows and bloody horrors, endured, and to be yet endured through dismal coming centuries, were they not the heavy price paid and payable for this same, total destruction of shams from among men? And now, O Barnave Triumvirate! Is it in such double distilled delusion, and sham even of a sham, that an effort of this kind will rest acquiescent? Messers of the popular triumvirate, never. But, after all, what can poor popular triumvirates and fallible august senators do? They can, when the truth is all too horrible, stick their heads ostrich-like into what sheltering fallacy is nearest, and wait there, a posteriori. Readers who saw the Clementines and three bishoprics gallop, in the night of spurs. Diligences ruffling up all France into one terrific terrified cock of India, and the town of Nantes in its shirt, may fancy what an affair to settle this was. Robespierre, on the extreme left, with perhaps Pechon and lean old Goupil, for the very triumvirate has defalcated, are shrieking hoarse, drowned in constitutional clamor. But the debate and arguing of a whole nation. The bellowings through all journals, for and against, the reverberant voice of Danton, the Hyperion shafts of Camille, the porcupine quills of implacable Marat, conceive all this. Constitutionalists in a body, as we often predicted, do now recede from the mother society, and become fulans, threatening her with inanition, the rank and respectability being mostly gone. Petition after petition, forwarded by post, or born in deputation, comes praying for judgment and decheance, which is our name for deposition, praying, at lowest, for reference to the eighty-three departments of France. Hot Marseille's deputation comes declaring, among other things, our Phocian ancestors flung a bar of iron into the bay at their first landing, this bar will float again on the Mediterranean brine before we consent to be slaves. All this for four weeks or more, while the matter still hangs doubtful, emigration streaming with double violence over the frontiers. France seething in fierce agitation of this question and prize question, what is to be done with the fugitive hereditary representative? Finally, on Friday the 15th of July, 1791, the National Assembly decides, 
in what negatory manner we know. Whereupon the theatres all close, the born stones and portable chairs begin spouting, municipal placards flaming on the walls, and proclamations published by sound of trumpet, invite to repose, with small effect. And so, on Sunday the seventeenth, there shall be a thing seen, worthy of remembering. Scroll of a petition, drawn up by Brissets, Dantons, by Cordeliers, Jacobins. For the thing was infinitely shaken and manipulated, and many had a hand in it, such scroll lies now visible, on the wooden framework of the Fatherland's altar, for signature. Unworking Paris, male and female, is crowding thither, all day, to sign or to see. Our fair Roland herself the eye of history can discern there, in the morning, not without interest. In few weeks the fair patriot will quit Paris. Yet perhaps only to return. But, what with sorrow of balked patriotism, what with closed theatres, and proclamations still publishing themselves by sound of trumpet, the fervour of men's minds, this day, is great. Nay, over and above, there has fallen out an incident, of the nature of farce tragedy in riddle, enough to stimulate all creatures. Early in the day, a patriot, or some say, it was a patriotess, and indeed truth is undiscoverable, while standing on the firm deal board of Fatherland's altar, feels suddenly, with indescribable torpedo shock of amazement. His boot sole pricked through from below. He clutches up suddenly this electrified boot sole and foot, discerns next instant, the point of a gimlet or brad all playing up, through the firm deal board, and now hastily drawing itself back. Mystery, perhaps treason. The wooden framework is impetuously broken up, and behold, verily a mystery, never explicable fully to the end of the world. Two human individuals, of mean aspect, one of them with a wooden leg, lie ensconced there, gimlet in hand, they must have come in overnight, they have a supply of provisions, no barrel of gunpowder, that one can see, they affect to be asleep. Look blank enough, and give the lamest account of themselves. Mere curiosity, they were boring up to get an eye hole. To see, perhaps, with lubricity, whatsoever, from that new point of vision, could be seen, little that was edifying, one would think. But indeed what stupidest thing may not human dullness, pruriency, lubricity, chance and the devil, choosing two out of half a million idle human heads, tempt them to? Sure enough, the two human individuals with their gimlet are there. Ill-starred pair of individuals. For the result of it all is that patriotism, fretting itself, in this state of nervous excitability, with hypotheses, suspicions and reports, keeps questioning these two distracted human individuals, and again questioning them. Claps them into the nearest guardhouse, clutches them out again, one hypothetic group snatching them from another, till finally, in such extreme state of nervous excitability, patriotism hangs them as spies of Sieur Motier. And the life and secret is choked out of them forevermore. Forevermore, alas. Or is a day to be looked for when these two evidently mean individuals, who are human nevertheless, will become historical riddles. And, like him of the Iron Mask, also a human individual, and evidently nothing more, have their dissertations. To us this only is certain, that they had a gimlet, provisions and a wooden leg. And have died there on the lantern, as the unluckiest fools might die. And so the signature goes on, in a still more excited manner. And Chaumet, for antiquarians possessed the very paper to this hour, has signed himself, in a flowing saucy hand slightly leaned, and they bear, detestable Père Duchesne, as if, an ink spider had dropped on the paper. Usher Maillard also has signed, and many crosses, which cannot write. And Paris, through its thousand avenues, is welling to the Champ de Mars and from it, in the utmost excitability of humor. Central Fatherland's altar quite heaped with signing patriots and patriotesses, the thirty benches and whole internal space crowded with onlookers, with comers and goers, one regurgitating whirlpool of men and women in their Sunday clothes. All which a constitutional Sieur Motier sees, and Bailey, looking into it with his long visage made still longer. Auguring no good, perhaps to chance and deposition after all. Stop it, ye constitutional patriots. Fire itself is quenchable, yet only quenchable at first. Stop it, 
truly, but how stop it? Have not the first free people of the universe a right to petition? Happily, if also unhappily, here is one proof of riot, these two human individuals, hanged at the lantern. Proof, O oh treacherous Sieur Motier! Were they not two human individuals sent thither by thee to be hanged? To be a pretext for thy bloody drapeau rouge? This question shall many a patriot, one day, ask, and answer affirmatively, strong in preternatural suspicion. Enough, towards half past seven in the evening, the mere natural eye can behold this thing, Sieur Motier, with municipals in scarf, with blue national patrolitism, rank after rank, to the clang of drums, wending resolutely to the Champ de Mars. Mayor Bailey, with elongated visage, bearing, as in sad duty bound, the drapeau rouge. Howl of angry derision rises in treble and bass from a hundred thousand throats, at the sight of martial law. Which nevertheless waving its red sanguinary flag, advances there, from the Grocaillou entrance, advances, drumming and waving, towards altar of fatherland. Amid still wilder howls, with objurgation, obtestation. With flights of pebbles and mud, saxa et feces, with crackle of a pistol shot, finally with volley fire of patrolitism, leveled muskets, roll of volley on volley. Precisely after one year and three days, our sublime federation field is wedded, in this manner, with French blood. Some, twelve unfortunately shot, reports Bailey, counting by units, but patriotism counts by tens and even by hundreds. Not to be forgotten, nor forgiven. Patriotism flies, shrieking, execrating. Camille ceases journalizing, this day, great Danton with Camille and Frerin have taken wing, for their life, Marat burrows deep in the earth, and is silent. Once more patrolitism has triumphed, one other time, but it is the last. This was the royal flight to Varennes. Thus was the throne overturned thereby, but thus also was it victoriously set up again, on its vertex. And will stand while it can be held. Book 2.V. Parliament 1st. Chapter 2.5.I. Grande Acceptation. In the last nights of September, when the autumnal equinox is past, and grey September fades into brown October, why are the Champs Elysees illuminated, why is Paris dancing, and flinging fireworks? They are gala nights, these last of September. Paris may well dance, and the universe, the edifice of the Constitution is completed. Completed, nay revised, to see that there was nothing insufficient in it, solemnly proffered to His Majesty. Solemnly accepted by him, to the sound of cannon salvos, on the fourteenth of the month. And now by such illumination, jubilee, dancing and fireworking, do we joyously handsel the new social edifice, and first raise heat and reek there, in the name of hope. The revision, especially with a throne standing on its vertex, has been a work of difficulty, of delicacy. In the way of propping and buttressing, so indispensable now, something could be done, and yet, as is feared, not enough. A repentant Barnave triumvirate, our rabots, Duports, Thurettes, and indeed all constitutional deputies did strain every nerve, but the extreme left was so noisy. The people were so suspicious, clamorous to have the work ended, and then the loyal right side sat feeble petulant all the while, and as it were, pouting and petting, unable to help, had they even been willing. The 290 had solemnly made scission, before that, and departed, shaking the dust off their feet. To such transcendency of fret, and desperate hope that worsening of the bad might the sooner end it and bring back the good, had our unfortunate loyal right side now come. However, one finds that this and the other little prop has been added, where possibility allowed. Civil list and privy purse were from of old well cared for. King's Constitutional Guard, 1800 loyal men from the 83 departments, under a loyal Duke de Brissac, this, with trustworthy Swiss besides, is of itself something. The old loyal bodyguards are indeed dissolved, in name as well as in fact, and gone mostly towards Koblenz. But now also those sansculotic violent guards Francesas, or center grenadiers, shall have their mitimus, they do ere long, in the journals, not without a horse pathos, publish their farewell. 
wishing all aristocrats the graves in Paris which to us are denied. They depart, these first soldiers of the revolution, they hover very dimly in the distance for about another year. Till they can be remodeled, new named, and sent to fight the Austrians, and then history beholds them no more. A most notable corps of men, which has its place in world history, though to us, so is history written, they remain mere rubrics of men. Nameless, a shaggy grenadier mass, crossed with buff belts. And yet might we not ask, what Argonauts, what Leonidas Spartans had done such a work? Think of their destiny, since that May morning, some three years ago, when they, unparticipating, trundled off Diaspremenal to the Calypso Isles. Since that July evening, some two years ago, when they, participating in sacring with knit brows, poured a volley into Bissenville's Prince de Lambesque. History waves them her mute adieu. So that the sovereign power, these sansculotic watchdogs, more like wolves, being leashed and led away from his tilleries, breathes freer. The sovereign power is guarded henceforth by a loyal 1800, whom contrivance, under various pretexts, may gradually swell to 6,000, who will hinder no journey to St. Cloud. The sad Varennes business has been soldered up. Cemented, even in the blood of the Champ de Mars, these two months and more, and indeed ever since, as formerly, Majesty has had its privileges, its choice of residence, though, for good reasons, the royal mind prefers continuing in Paris. Poor royal mind, poor Paris, that have to go mumming, enveloped in speciosities, in falsehood which knows itself false, and to enact mutually your sorrowful farce tragedy, being bound to it, and on the whole, to hope always, in spite of hope. Nay, now that His Majesty has accepted the Constitution, to the sound of cannon salvos, who would not hope? Our good king was misguided but he meant well. Lafayette has moved for an amnesty, for universal forgiving and forgetting of revolutionary faults, and now surely the glorious revolution cleared of its rubbish, is complete. Strange enough, and touching in several ways, the old cry of Vive le Roy once more rises round King Louis the hereditary representative. Their majesties went to the opera. Gave money to the poor, the queen herself, now when the constitution is accepted, hears voice of cheering. Bygone shall be bygone, the new era shall begin. To and fro, amid those lamp galaxies of the Elysian fields, the royal carriage slowly wends and rolls, everywhere with vivats, from a multitude striving to be glad. Lewis looks out, mainly on the variegated lamps and gay human groups, with satisfaction enough for the hour. In Her Majesty's face, under that kind graceful smile a deep sadness is legible. Brilliancies, of valor and of wit, stroll here observant, a dame de Stahl, leaning most probably on the arm of her Narbonne. She meets deputies, who have built this constitution. Who saunter here with vague communings, not without thoughts whether it will stand. But as yet melodious fiddle-strings twang and warble everywhere, with the rhythm of light fantastic feet, long lamp galaxies fling their colored radiance. And brass lunged hawkers elbow and ball, grande acceptation, constitution monarchique it behoves the son of Adam to hope. Have not Lafayette, Barnave, and all constitutionalists set their shoulders handsomely to the inverted pyramid of a throne? Fulans, including almost the whole constitutional respectability of France, pirorate nightly from their tribune, correspond through all post offices, denouncing unquiet Jacobinism, trusting well that its time is nigh done. Much is uncertain, questionable, but if the hereditary representative be wise and lucky, may one not, with a sanguine Gaelic temper, hope that he will get in motion better or worse, that what is wanting to him will gradually be gained and added. For the rest, as we must repeat, in this building of the constitutional fabric, especially in this revision of it, nothing that one could think of to give it new strength, especially to steady it, to give it permanence, and even eternity, has been forgotten. Biennial Parliament, to be called Legislative, Assembly Legislative. With 745 members, chosen in a judicious manner by the active citizens alone, and even by electing of electors still more active, this, with privileges of Parliament shall meet, self-authorized if need be and self-dissolved, shall grant money supplies and talk, 
watch over the administration and authorities, discharge forever the functions of a constitutional great council, collective wisdom, and national palaver, as the heavens will enable. Our first biennial parliament, which indeed has been a choosing since early in August, is now as good as chosen. Nay it has mostly got to Paris, it arrived gradually. Not without pathetic greeting to its venerable parent, the now moribund constituent, and sat there in the galleries, reverently listening, ready to begin, the instant the ground were clear. Then as to changes in the constitution itself. This, impossible for any legislative, or common biennial parliament, and possible solely for some resuscitated constituent or national convention, is evidently one of the most ticklish points. The August moribund assembly debated it for four entire days. Some thought a change, or at least review and new approval, might be admissible in thirty years, some even went lower, down to twenty, nay to fifteen. The August assembly had once decided for thirty years, but it revoked that, on better thoughts, and did not fix any date of time, but merely some vague outline of a posture of circumstances, and on the whole left the matter hanging. Doubtless a national convention can be assembled even within the thirty years, yet one may hope, not. But that legislatives, biennial parliaments of the common kind, with their limited faculty, and perhaps quiet successive additions thereto, may suffice, for generations, or indeed while computed time runs. Furthermore, be it noted that no member of this constituent has been, or could be, elected to the new legislative. So noble-minded were these lawmakers. Cry some, and Solon-like would banish themselves. So splenetic. Cry more, each grudging the other, none daring to be outdone in self-denial by the other. So unwise in either case. Answer all practical men. But consider this other self-denying ordinance, that none of us can be king's minister, or accept the smallest court appointment, for the space of four, or at lowest, and on long debate and revision, for the space of two years. So moves the incorruptible sea-green Robespierre, with cheap magnanimity he, and none dare be outdone by him. It was such a law, not so superfluous then, that sent Mirabeau to the gardens of St. Cloud, under cloak of darkness, to that colloquy of the gods, and thwarted many things. Happily and unhappily there is no Mirabeau now to thwart. Welcomer meanwhile, welcome surely to all right hearts, is Lafayette's chivalrous amnesty. Welcome too is that hard-rung union of Avignon. Which has cost us, first and last, thirty sessions of debate, and so much else, may it at length prove lucky. Rousseau's statue is decreed, virtuous Jean-Jacques, evangelist of the Conrad social. Not Druid of Varennes. Nor worthy Latai, master of the old world-famous tennis court in Versailles, is forgotten, but each has his honorable mention, and due reward in money. Whereupon, things being all so neatly winded up, and the deputations, and messages, and royal and other ceremonials having rustled by. And the king having now affectionately perorated about peace and tranquilization, and members having answered, We. We. With effusion, even with tears, President Thouret, he of the law reforms, rises, and, with a strong voice, utters these memorable last words, the National Constituent Assembly declares that it has finished its mission. And that its sittings are all ended. Incorruptible Robespierre, virtuous Pechon are borne home on the shoulders of the people, with vivats heaven high. The rest glide quietly to their respective places of abode. It is the last afternoon of September, 1791, on the morrow morning the new legislative will begin. So, amid glitter of illuminated streets and champs Elysees, and crackle of fireworks and glad deray, has the first National Assembly vanished. Dissolving, as they well say, into blank time, and is no more. National Assembly is gone, its work remaining, as all bodies of men go, and as man himself goes, it had its beginning, and must likewise have its end. A phantasm reality born of time, as the rest of us are, flitting ever backwards now on the tide of time, to be long remembered of men. Very strange assemblages, sanhedrims, amphictyonics, trades unions, ecumenic councils, parliaments and congresses, have met together on this planet and dispersed again. 
but a stranger assemblage than this august constituent, or with a stranger mission, perhaps never met there. Seen from the distance, this also will be a miracle. Twelve hundred human individuals, with the gospel of Jean-Jacques Rousseau in their pocket, congregating in the name of twenty-five millions, with full assurance of faith, to make the constitution such sight. The acme and main product of the eighteenth century, our world can witness once only. For time is rich in wonders, in monstrosities most rich, and is observed never to repeat himself, or any of his gospels, surely least of all, this gospel according to Jean-Jacques. Once it was right and indispensable, since such had become the belief of men, but once also is enough. They have made the constitution, these twelve hundred Jean-Jacques evangelists, not without result. Near twenty-nine months they sat, with various fortune, in various capacity, always, we may say, in that capacity of carborn carocho, and miraculous standard of the revolt of men, as a thing high and lifted up. Whereon whosoever looked might hope healing. They have seen much, cannons leveled on them, then suddenly, by interposition of the powers, the cannons drawn back. And a war god broy vanishing, in thunder not his own, amid the dust and down rushing of a Bastille and old feudal France. They have suffered somewhat, royal session, with reign and oath of the tennis court, knights of Pentecost. Insurrections of women. Also have they not done somewhat? Made the constitution, and managed all things the while. Passed, in these twenty-nine months, twenty-five hundred decrees, which on the average is some three for each day, including Sundays. Brevity, one finds, is possible, at times, had not Moreau d'Est. Mary to give three thousand orders before rising from his seat, there was valor, or value, in these men, and a kind of faith, were it only faith in this, that cobwebs are not cloth, that a constitution could be made. Cobwebs and chimeras ought verily to disappear, for a reality there is. Let formulas, soul killing, and now grown body killing, insupportable, be gone, in the name of heaven and earth, time, as we say, brought forth these twelve hundred. Eternity was before them, eternity behind, they worked, as we all do, in the confluence of two eternities, what work was given them. Say not that it was nothing they did. Consciously they did somewhat, unconsciously how much. They had their giants and their dwarfs, they accomplished their good and their evil, they are gone, and return no more. Shall they not go with our blessing, in these circumstances, with our mild farewell? By post, by diligence, on saddle or soul. They are gone, towards the four winds. Not a few over the marches, to rank at Koblenz. Thither wended Mori, among others, but in the end towards Rome, to be clothed there in red cardinal plush, in falsehood as in a garment. Pet son, her last born, of the scarlet woman. Talleyrand Perigord, excommunicated constitutional bishop, will make his way to London, to be ambassador, spite of the self-denying law, brisk young Marquis Chauvelin acting as ambassador's cloak. In London too, one finds Pesson the virtuous, harangued and haranguing, pledging the wine cup with constitutional reform clubs, in solemn tavern dinner. Incorruptible Robespierre retires for a little to native heiress, seven short weeks of quiet. The last appointed him in this world. Public accuser in the Paris department, acknowledged high priest of the Jacobins. The glass of incorruptible thin patriotism, for his narrow emphasis is loved of all the narrow, this man seems to be rising, some with her. He sells his small heritage at Arras. Accompanied by a brother and a sister, he returns, scheming out with resolute timidity a small sure destiny for himself and them, to his old lodging, at the cabinet makers, in the Rue Esti. Honoré, O resolute tremulous incorruptible sea green man, towards what a destiny! Lafayette, for his part, will lay down the command. He retires Cincinnatus like to his hearth and farm, but soon leaves them again. Our National Guard, however, shall henceforth have no one commandant, but all colonels shall command in succession, month about. Other deputies we have met, or Dame de Stahl has met, sauntering in a thoughtful manner, perhaps uncertain what to do. Some, as Barnave, the Lammaths, and their Duport, will continue here in Paris, 
watching the new biennial legislative, Parliament the first, teaching it to walk, if so might be, and the court to lead it. Thus these, sauntering in a thoughtful manner. Travelling by post or diligence, whither fate beckons. Giant Mirabeau slumbers in the pantheon of great men, and France. And Europe. The brass-lunged hawkers sing, grand acceptation, monarchic constitution through these gay crowds, the morrow, grandson of yesterday, must be what it can, as today its father is. Our new biennial legislative begins to constitute itself on the 1st of October, 1791. Chapter 2.5.2 .2. The Book of the Law If the August Constituent Assembly itself, fixing the regards of the universe, could, at the present distance of time and place, gain comparatively small attention from us, how much less can this poor legislative? It has its right side and its left, the less patriotic and the more, for aristocrats exist not here or now, it spouts and speaks, listens to reports, reads bills and laws. Works in its vocation, for a season, but the history of France, one finds, is seldom or never there. Unhappy legislative, what can history do with it, if not drop a tear over it, almost in silence? First of the two-year parliaments of France, which, if paper constitution and oft-repeated national oath could avail aught, were to follow in softly strong indissoluble sequence while time ran, it had to vanish dolefully within one year. And there came no second like it. Alas! Your biennial parliaments in endless indissoluble sequence. They, and all that constitutional fabric, built with such explosive federation oaths, and its top stone brought out with dancing and variegated radiance, went to pieces, like frail crockery, in the crash of things. And already, in eleven short months, were in that limbo near the moon, with the ghosts of other chimeras. There, except for rare specific purposes, let them rest, in melancholy peace. On the whole, how unknown is a man to himself. Or a public body of men to itself. Aesop's fly sat on the chariot wheel, exclaiming, What a dust I do raise! Great governors, clad in purple with fasces and insignia, are governed by their valets, by the pouting of their women and children. Or, in constitutional countries, by the paragraphs of their able editors. Say not, I am this or that, I am doing this or that. For thou knowest it not, thou knowest only the name it as yet goes by. A purple Nebuchadnezzar rejoices to feel himself now verily emperor of this great Babylon which he has builded, and is a nondescript biped quadruped, on the eve of a seven years course of grazing. These 745 elected individuals doubt not but they are the first biennial parliament, come to govern France by parliamentary eloquence, and they are what? And they have come to do what? Things foolish and not wise. It is much lamented by many that this first biennial had no members of the old constituent in it, with their experience of parties and parliamentary tactics, that such was their foolish self-denying law. Most surely, old members of the constituent had been welcomed to us here. But, on the other hand, what old or what new members of any constituent under the sun could have effectually profited? There are first biennial parliaments so postured as to be, in a sense, beyond wisdom, where wisdom and folly differ only in degree, and wreckage and dissolution are the appointed issue for both. Old constituents, your Barnaves, Lammaths and the like, for whom a special gallery has been set apart, where they may sit in honour and listen, are in the habit of sneering at these new legislators, but let not us. The poor 745, sent together by the active citizens of France, are what they could be, do what is fated them. That they are of patriot temper we can well understand. Aristocrat noblesse had fled over the marches, or sat brooding silent in their unburnt chateaus, small prospect had they in primary electoral assemblies. What with flights to Varennes, what with days of poniards, with plot after plot, the people are left to themselves, the people must needs choose defenders of the people, such as can be had. Choosing, as they also will ever do, if not the ablest man, yet the man ablest to be chosen. Fervor of character, decided patriot constitutional feeling, these are qualities, but free utterance, mastership in tongue fence. This is the quality of qualities. 
Accordingly one finds, with little astonishment, in this first biennial, that as many as four hundred members are of the advocate or attorney species. Men who can speak, if there be aught to speak, may here are men also who can think, and even act. Candor will say of this ill-fated first French parliament that it wanted not its modicum of talent, its modicum of honesty. That it, neither in the one respect nor in the other, sank below the average of parliaments, but rose above the average. Let average parliaments, whom the world does not guillotine, and cast forth to long infamy, be thankful not to themselves but to their stars. France, as we say, has once more done what it could, fervid men have come together from wide separation. For strange issues. Fiery Max Isnard is come, from the utmost southeast, fiery Claude Fauchet, Te Deum Fauchet Bishop of Calvados, from the utmost northwest. No Mirabeau now sits here, who had swallowed formulas, our only Mirabeau now is Danton, working as yet out of doors, whom some call Mirabeau of the Sansculottes. Nevertheless we have our gifts, especially of speech and logic. An eloquent Vergniad we have, most mellifluous yet most impetuous of public speakers, from the region named Gironda, of the Garonne, a man unfortunately of indolent habits. Who will sit playing with your children, when he ought to be scheming and pirorating? Sharp bustling Guadet, considerate grave Sanson, kind sparkling mirthful young Ducas. The lays doomed to a sad end, all these likewise are of that Gironda, or Bordeaux region, men of fervid constitutional principles, of quick talent, irrefragable logic, clear respectability. Who will have the reign of liberty establish itself, but only by respectable methods? Round whom others of like temper will gather, known by and by as Girondins, to the sorrowing wonder of the world. Of which sort note Condorcet, Marquis and philosopher, who has worked at much, at Paris Municipal Constitution, Differential Calculus, Newspaper Chronique de Paris, Biography, Philosophy. And now sits here as two years senator, a notable Condorcet, with stoical Roman face, and fiery heart, volcano hid under snow, styled likewise, in irreverent language, mouton in rage, peaceablest of creatures bitten rabid. Or note, lastly, Jean-Pierre Brissett, whom destiny, long working noisily with him, has hurled hither, say, to have done with him. A biennial senator he too, nay, for the present, the king of such. Restless, scheming, scribbling Brissett. Who took to himself the style de Warville, heralds know not in the least why, unless it were that the father of him did, in an unexceptionable manner, perform cookery and vintnery in the village of Warville. A man of the windmill species, that grinds always, turning towards all winds, not in the steadiest manner. In all these men there is talent, faculty to work. And they will do it, working and shaping, not without effect, though alas not in marble, only in quicksand, but the highest faculty of them all remains yet to be mentioned. Or indeed has yet to unfold itself for mention, Captain Hippolyte Carnot, sent hither from the Pas de Calais, with his cold mathematical head, and silent stubbornness of will, Iron Carnot, far planning, imperturbable, unconquerable. Who, in the hour of need, shall not be found wanting? His hair is yet black, and it shall grow grey, under many kinds of fortune, bright and troublous, and with iron aspect this man shall face them all. Nor is Coty Droit, and band of king's friends, wanting, Vaublanc, Dumas, Jocourt the honoured chevalier, who love liberty, yet with monarchy over it, and speak fearlessly according to that faith, whom the thick coming hurricanes will sweep away. With them, let a new military Theodore Lameth be named, were it only for his two brothers' sake, who looked down on him, approvingly there, from the old constituents' gallery. Frothy professing pastorettes, honey-mouthed conciliatory lamourettes, and speechless nameless individuals sit plentiful, as moderates, in the middle. Still less is a coty gauche wanting, extreme left. Sitting on the topmost benches, as if aloft on its speculatory height or mountain, which will become a practical fulminatory height, and make the name of mountain famous infamous to all times and lands. Honor waits not on this mountain. Nor as yet even loud dishonor. Gifts it boasts not, nor graces, of speaking or of thinking, 
solely this one gift of assured faith, of audacity that will defy the earth and the heavens. Foremost here are the Cordelier Trio, Hot Merlin from Thionville, Hot Bazire, Attorneys Both, Chabot, Disfrocked Capuchin, Skillful in Agio. Lawyer Lacroix, who wore once as subaltern the single epaulette, has loud lungs and a hungry heart. There too is Cuthin, little dreaming what he is, whom a sad chance has paralyzed in the lower extremities. For, it seems, he sat once a whole night, not warm in his true love's bower, who indeed was by law another's, but sunken to the middle in a cold peat bog, being hunted out, quaking for his life, in the cold quaking morass. And goes now on crutches to the end. Camden likewise, in whom slumbers undeveloped such a finance talent for printing of assignats, father of paper money. Who, in the hour of menace, shall utter this stern sentence, war to the manor house, peace to the hut, guerre aux chateaux, pigs aux chaumiers. Le Cointer, the intrepid draper of Versailles, is welcome here. Known since the opera past and insurrection of women. Thuriot II. Elector Thuriot, who stood in the embrasures of the Bastille, and saw Saint Antoine rising in mass, who has many other things to see. Last and grimmest of all note old rule, with his brown dusky face and long white hair, of Alsatian Lutheran breed, a man whom age and book learning have not taught. Who, haranguing the old men of Reims, shall hold up the sacred Ampulla, heaven sent, wherefrom Clovis and all kings have been anointed, as a mere worthless oil bottle, and dash it to sherds on the pavement there. Who, alas, shall dash much to sherds, and finally his own wild head, by pistol shot, and so end it. Such lava welters red hot in the bowels of this mountain, unknown to the world and to itself. A mere commonplace mountain hitherto. Distinguished from the plain chiefly by its superior barrenness, its baldness of look, at the utmost it may, to the most observant, perceptibly smoke. For as yet all lies so solid, peaceable. And doubts not, as was said, that it will endure while time runs. Do not all love liberty and the constitution. All heartily, and yet with degrees. Some, as Chevalier Jawcourt in his right side, may love liberty less than royalty, were the trial made, others, as Brissett and his left side, may love it more than royalty. Nay again of these latter some may love liberty more than law itself. Others not more. Parties will unfold themselves, no mortal as yet knows how. Forces work within these men and without, dissidence grows opposition, ever widening. Waxing into incompatibility and internecine feud, till the strong is abolished by a stronger, himself in his turn by a strongest. Who can help it? Jaw court and his monarchists, Fulans, or moderates. Brissett and his Brissettins, Jacobins, or Girondins, these, with the Cordelier trio, and all men, must work what is appointed them, and in the way appointed them. And to think what fate these poor 745 are assembled, most unwittingly, to meet. Let no heart be so hard as not to pity them. Their soul's wish was to live and work as the first of the French parliaments, and make the constitution march. Did they not, at their very installment, go through the most affecting constitutional ceremony, almost with tears? The twelve eldest are sent solemnly to fetch the constitution itself, the printed book of the law. Archivist Camus, an old constituent appointed archivist, he and the ancient twelve, amid blare of military pomp and clangor, enter, bearing the divine book, and president and all legislative senators, laying their hand on the same. Successively take the oath, with cheers and heart effusion, universal three times three. In this manner they begin their session. Unhappy mortals. For, that same day, His Majesty having received their deputation of welcome, as seemed, rather drilly, the deputation cannot but feel slighted, cannot but lament such slight, and thereupon our cheering swearing first Parliament sees itself. On the morrow, obliged to explode into fierce retaliatory sputter, of anti-royal enactment as to how they, for their part, will receive majesty. And how majesty shall not be called sire any more, except they please, and then, on the following day, to recall this enactment of theirs, as too hasty, and a mere sputter though not unprovoked. 
an effervescent well-intentioned set of senators. Two combustible, where continual sparks are flying. Their history is a series of sputters and quarrels, true desire to do their function, fatal impossibility to do it. Denunciations, reprimandings of king's ministers, of traitors supposed and real. Hot rage and fulmination against fulminating emigrants, terror of Austrian Kaiser, of Austrian committee, in the Tilleries itself, rage and haunting terror, haste and dim desperate bewilderment, haste, we say. And yet the Constitution had provided against haste. No bill can be passed till it had been printed, till it had been thrice read, with intervals of eight days, unless the Assembly shall beforehand decree that there is urgency. Which, accordingly, the Assembly, scrupulous of the Constitution, never omits to do, considering this, and also considering that, and then that other, the Assembly decrees always, chuilya urgence. And thereupon, the Assembly, having decreed that there is urgence, is free to decree, what indispensable distracted thing seems best to it. Two thousand and odd decrees, as men reckon, within eleven months. The haste of the constituent seemed great. But this is treble quick. For the time itself is rushing treble quick, and they have to keep pace with that. Unhappy 745, true patriotic, but so combustible. Being fired, they must needs fling fire, senate of touchwood and rockets, in a world of smokestorm, with sparks wind-driven continually flying. Or think, on the other hand, looking forward some months, of that scene they call Bazer de Lamourette. The dangers of the country are now grown imminent, immeasurable, national assembly, hope of France, is divided against itself. In such extreme circumstances, honey-mouthed Abbé Lamourette, new bishop of Lyons, rises, whose name, Al Amourette, signifies the sweetheart, or Delilah Doxy, he rises, and, with pathetic honeyed eloquence, calls on all August senators to forget mutual griefs and grudges, to swear a new oath, and unite as brothers. Whereupon they all, with vivats, embrace and swear, left side confounding itself with right, barren mountain rushing down to fruitful plain, pastorette into the arms of Condorcet, injured to the breast of injure, with tears. And all swearing that whosoever wishes either fuelant two-chamber monarchy or extreme Jacobin republic, or anything but the constitution and that only, shall be anathema maranatha. Touching to behold. For, literally on the moral morning, they must again quarrel, driven by fate, and their sublime reconcilement is called derisively Bazer de Lamourette, or Delilah Kiss. Like fated Idiocles Polynices brothers, embracing, though in vain. Weeping that they must not love, that they must hate only, and die by each other's hands. Or say, like doomed familiar spirits, ordered, by art magic under penalties, to do a harder than twist ropes of sand, to make the constitution march. If the constitution would but march. Alas, the constitution will not stir. It falls on its face, they tremblingly lift it on end again, march, thou gold constitution. The constitution will not march. He shall march, bye. Said kind Uncle Toby, and even swore. The corporal answered mournfully, he will never march in this world. A constitution, as we often say, will march when it images, if not the old habits and beliefs of the constituted. Then accurately their rights, or better indeed, their mights, for these two, well understood, are they not one and the same. The old habits of France are gone, her new rights and mights are not yet ascertained, except in paper theorem. Nor can be, in any sort, till she have tried. Till she have measured herself, in fell death grip, and were it in utmost preternatural spasm of madness, with principalities and powers, with the upper and the under, internal and external. With the earth and Tophet and the very heaven. Then will she know dot, three things bode ill for the marching of this French constitution, the French people, the French king, thirdly the French noblesse and an assembled European world. Chapter 2.5 3. Avignon but quitting generalities, what strange fact is this, in the far southwest, towards which the eyes of all men do now, in the end of October, bend themselves. A tragical combustion, long smoking and smoldering unluminous, 
has now burst into flame there. Hot is that southern Pravasal blood, alas, collisions, as was once said, must occur in a career of freedom, different directions will produce such. Nay different velocities in the same direction will. To much that went on their history, busied elsewhere, would not specially give heed, to troubles of uses, troubles of nimes, Protestant and Catholic, Patriot and Aristocrat. To troubles of Marseilles, Montpellier, Alls, to aristocrat camp of jails, that wondrous real imaginary entity, now fading pale dim, then always again glowing forth deep-hued, in the imagination mainly. Ominous magical, an aristocrat picture of war done naturally. All this was a tragical deadly combustion, with plot and riot, tumult by night and by day, but a dark combustion, not luminous, not noticed. Which now, however, one cannot help noticing. Above all places, the unluminous combustion in Avignon and the Comtat V. Nason was fierce. Papal Avignon, with its castle rising sheer over the Rhone stream. Beautifulest town, with its purple vines and gold orange groves, why must foolish old rhyming René, the last sovereign of Provence, bequeath it to the Pope and gold tiara, not rather to Louis XI with the leaden virgin in his hatband? For good and for evil. Popes, Antipopes, with their pomp, have dwelt in that castle of Avignon rising sheer over the Rhone stream, their Lord de Sade went to hear Mass. Her Petrarch twanging and singing by the fountain of Vaucluse hard by, surely in a most melancholy manner. This was in the old days. And now in these new days, such issues do come from a squirt of the pen by some foolish rhyming René, after centuries, this is what we have, Jordan Couptet, leading to siege and warfare and army from three to fifteen thousand strong. Called the brigands of Avignon. Which title they themselves accept, with the addition of an epithet, the brave brigands of Avignon. It is even so. Jordan the headsman fled hither from that Chatelet inquest, from that insurrection of women, and began dealing in matter. But the scene was rife in other than dye stuffs, so Jordan shut his matter shop, and has risen, for he was the man to do it. The tile beard of Jordan is shaven off, his fat visage has got coppered and studded with black carbuncles. The Silenus trunk is swollen with drink and high living, he wears blue national uniform with epaulets, an enormous saber, two horse pistols crossed in his belt and other two smaller, sticking from his pockets. Styles himself general, and is the tyrant of men. Consider this one fact, O oh reader, and what sort of facts must have preceded it, must accompany it. Such things come of old René. And of the question which has risen, whether Avignon cannot now cease wholly to be papal and become French and free? For some twenty-five months the confusion has lasted. Say three months of arguing, then seven of raging. Then finally some fifteen months now of fighting, and even of hanging. For already in February 1790, the papal aristocrats had set up four gibbets, for a sign, but the people rose in June, in retributive frenzy. And, forcing the public hangman to act, hanged four aristocrats, on each papal gibbet a papal hangman. Then were Avignon emigrations, papal aristocrats emigrating over the Rhone River. Demission of papal consul, flight, victory, re-entrance of papal legate, truce, and new onslaught, and the various turns of war. Petitions there were to National Assembly, Congresses of Townships. Three score and odd townships voting for French reunion, and the blessings of liberty, while some twelve of the smaller, manipulated by aristocrats, gave vote the other way, with shrieks and discord. Township against township, town against town, Carpentras, long jealous of Avignon, is now turned out in open war with it, and Jordan Couptet, your first general being killed in mutiny, closes his die shop. And does there visibly, with siege artillery, above all with bluster and tumult, with the brave brigands of Avignon, beleaguer the rival town, for two months, in the face of the world. Feats were done, doubt it not, far famed in parish history. But to universal history unknown. Gibbets we see rise, on the one side and on the other, and wretched carcasses swinging there, a dozen in the row, wretched mayor of Vaison buried before dead. The fruitful seed field, lie unreaped, the vineyards trampled down, there is red cruelty, madness of universal collar and gall. 
Havoc and anarchy everywhere, a combustion most fierce, but unloosened, not to be noticed here. Finally, as we saw, on the 14th of September last, the National Constituent Assembly, having sent commissioners and heard them, having heard petitions, held debates, month after month ever since August 1789. And on the whole, spent thirty sittings, on this matter, did solemnly decree that Avignon and the Comtat were incorporated with France, and His Holiness the Pope should have what indemnity was reasonable. And so hereby all is amnestied and finished. Alas, when madness of choler has gone through the blood of men, and gibbets have swung on this side and on that, what will a parchment decree in Lafayette amnesty do? Oblivious Lethe flows not above ground. Papal aristocrats and patriot brigands are still an eye sorrow to each other, suspected, suspicious, in what they do and forbear. The August Constituent Assembly is gone but a fortnight, when, on Sunday the 16th morning of October 1791, the unquenched combustion suddenly becomes luminous. For anti-constitutional placards are up, and the statue of the Virgin is said to have shed tears, and grown red. Wherefore, on that morning, Patriot L. Escuier, one of our six leading patriots, having taken counsel with his brethren in General Jordan, determines on going to church, in company with a friend or two, not to hear Mass, which he values little. But to meet all the populists there in a body, nay to meet that same weeping virgin, for it is the Cordelier's church, and give them a word of admonition. Adventurous errand, which has the fatalist issue. What Lesquire's word of admonition might be no history records, but the answer to it was a shrieking howl from the aristocrat papal worshippers, many of them women. A thousand-voiced shriek and menace. Which as Lesquire did not fly, became a thousand-handed hustle and jostle, a thousand-footed kick, with tumblings and tramplings, with the pricking of sempstresses' stilettos, scissors, and female-pointed instruments. Horrible to behold. The ancient dead, and Petrarch and Laura, sleeping round it there, high altar and burning tapers looking down on it, the virgin quite tearless, and of the natural stone color. Lesquire's friend her two rush off, like Job's messengers, for Jordan and the national force. But heavy Jordan will seize the town gates first. Does not run treble fast, as he might, on arriving at the Cordelier's church, the church is silent, vacant, Lesquire, all alone, lies there, swimming in his blood, at the foot of the high altar, pricked with scissors, trodden, massacred. Gives one dumb sob, and gasps out his miserable life for evermore. Sight to stir the heart of any man, much more of many men, self-styled brigands of Avignon. The corpse of Lesquire, stretched on a bier, the ghastly head girt with laurel, is borne through the streets, with many-voiced unmelodious ninia, funeral wail still deeper than it is loud. The copper face of Jordan, of bereft patriotism, has grown black. Patriot municipality dispatches official narrative and tidings to Paris, orders numerous or innumerable arrestments for inquest and perquisition. Aristocrats male and female are hailed to the castle, lie crowded in subterranean dungeons there, bemoaned by the hoarse rushing of the Rhone, cut out from help. So lie they, waiting inquest and perquisition. Alas! With a Jordan headsman for Generalissimo, with his copper face grown black, and armed brigand patriots chanting their ninia, the inquest is likely to be brief. On the next day and the next, let municipality consent or not, a brigand court-martial establishes itself in the subterranean stories of the castle of Avignon, brigand executioners, with naked saber, waiting at the door, for a brigand verdict. Short judgment, no appeal. There is brigand wrath and vengeance, not unrefreshed by brandy. Close by is the dungeon of the glacier, or ice tower, there may be deeds done. For which language has no name. Darkness and the shadow of horrid cruelty envelopes these castle dungeons, that glacier tower, clear only that many have entered, that few have returned. Jordan and the brigands, supreme now over municipals, over all authorities patriot or papal, reign in Avignon, waited on by terror and silence. The result of all which is that, on the 15th of November, 1791, we behold friend Damp Martin, and subalterns beneath him, and General Choisy above him, with infantry and cavalry, and proper cannon carriages rattling in front, with spread banners. 
to the sound of fife and drum, wend, in a deliberate formidable manner, towards that sheer castle rock, towards those broad gates of Avignon. Three new National Assembly commissioners following at safe distance in the rear. Avignon, summoned in the name of Assembly in Law, flings its gates wide open. Choisy with the rest, Damp Martin and the Bones and Fans, good boys of Baphomont, so they name these brave constitutional dragoons, known to them of old, do enter, amid shouts and scattered flowers. To the joy of all honest persons. To the terror only of Jordan headsmen and the brigands. Nay next we behold carbuncled swollen Jordan himself shoe copper face, with saber and four pistols, affecting to talk high, engaging, meanwhile, to surrender the castle that instant. So the choisy grenadiers enter with him there. They start and stop, passing that glacier, snuffing its horrible breath, with wild yell, with cries of, cut the butcher down. And Jordan has to whisk himself through secret passages, and instantaneously vanish. Be the mystery of iniquity laid bare then. A hundred and thirty corpses, of men, nay of women and even children, for the trembling mother, hastily seized, could not leave her infant, lie heaped in that glacier, putrid, under putridities, the horror of the world. For three days there is mournful lifting out, and recognition. Amid the cries and movements of a passionate southern people, now kneeling in prayer, now storming in wild pity and rage, lastly there is solemn sepulture, with muffled drums, religious requiem, and all the people's wail and tears. Their massacred rest now in holy ground, buried in one grave. And Jordan Couptet. Him also we behold again, after a day or two, in flight, through the most romantic Petrarchan hill country, vehemently spurring his nag. Young Ligonet, a brisk youth of Avignon, with choisy dragoons, close in his rear. With such swollen mass of a rider no nag can run to advantage. The tired nag, spur-driven, does take the river sorg, but sticks in the middle of it. Firm on that chiaro fondo di sorga, and will proceed no further for spurring. Young Ligonet dashes up, the copper face menaces and bellows, draws pistol, perhaps even snaps it, is nevertheless seized by the collar. Is tied firm, ankles under horse's belly, and ridden back to Avignon, hardly to be saved from massacre on the streets there. Such is the combustion of Avignon in the southwest, when it becomes luminous. Long loud debate is in the August legislative, in the mother society as to what now shall be done with it. Amnesty, cry eloquent Vergniad and all patriots, let there be mutual pardon and repentance, restoration, pacification, and if so might anyhow be, an end. Which vote ultimately prevails? So the southwest smolders and welters again in an amnesty, or non-remembrance, which alas cannot but remember, no lethe flowing above ground. Jordan himself remains unchanged, gets loose again as one not yet gallows ripe. Nay, as we transiently discern from the distance, is, carried in triumph through the cities of the south. What things men carry! With which transient glimpse, of a copper-faced portent faring in this manner through the cities of the south, we must quit these regions, and let them smolder. They want not their aristocrats, proud old nobles, not yet emigrated. Alls has its chiffon, so, in symbolical cant, they name that aristocrat secret association, alls has its pavements piled up, by and by, into aristocrat barricades. Against which Rebecqui, the hot clear patriot, must lead Marseilles with cannon. The bar of iron has not yet risen to the top in the Bay of Marseilles, neither have these hot sons of the Phocians submitted to be slaves. By clear management and hot instance, Rebecqui dissipates that chiffon, without bloodshed, restores the pavement of alls. He sails in coast barks, this Rebecqui, scrutinizing suspicious martello towers, with the keen eye of patriotism. Marches overland with dispatch, singly, or in force, to city after city, dim scouring far and wide, argues, and if it must be, fights. For there is much to do, jails itself is looking suspicious. So that legislator Fauchet, after debate on it, has to propose commissioners in a camp on the plain of Beaucaire, with or without result. Of all which, and much else, let us note only this small consequence, that young Barbarous, advocate, 
town clerk of Marseilles, being charged to have these things remedied, arrived at Paris in the month of February 1792. The beautiful and brave, young Spartan, ripe in energy, not ripe in wisdom, over whose black doom there shall flit nevertheless a certain ruddy fervor, streaks of bright southern tint, not wholly swallowed of death. Note also that the Rolands of Lyons are again in Paris, for the second and final time. King's inspectorship is abrogated at Lyons, as elsewhere, Roland has his retiring pension to claim, if attainable, has patriot friends to commune with. At lowest, has a book to publish. That young Barbarous and the Rolands came together, that elderly Spartan Roland liked, or even loved the young Spartan, and was loved by him, one can fancy, and madam. Breathe not, thou poison breath, evil speech. That soul is taintless, clear, as the mirror sea. And yet if they two did look into each other's eyes, and each, in silence, in tragical renunciance, did find that the other was all too lovely. Honey soit. She calls him, beautiful as Antinous, he will speak elsewhere of that astonishing woman. A Madame Diudon, or some such name, for Dumont does not recollect quite clearly, gives copious breakfast to the Brissenden deputies and us friends of freedom, at her house in the place Vadome. With temporary celebrity, with graces and wreathed smiles, not without cost. There, amid wide babble and jingle, our plan of legislative debate is settled for the day, and much counselling held. Strict Roland is seen there, but does not go often. Chapter 2.5.4 No Sugar Such are our inward troubles, seen in the cities of the South, extant, seen or unseen, in all cities and districts, North as well as South. For in all our aristocrats, more or less malignant, watched by patriotism. Which again, being of various shades, from light Fayettist fuel and down to deep sombre Jacobin, has to watch itself. Directories of departments, what we call county magistracies, being chosen by citizens of a too active class, are found to pull one way, municipalities, town magistracies, to pull the other way. In all places too are dissident priests. Whom the legislative will have to deal with, contumacious individuals, working on that angriest of passions, plotting, enlisting for coblance, or suspected of plotting, fuel of a universal unconstitutional heat. What to do with them? They may be conscientious as well as contumacious, gently they should be dealt with, and yet it must be speedily. In unilluminated lavade the simple are like to be seduced by them. Many a simple peasant, a Catholino the wool dealer wayfaring meditative with his wool packs, in these hamlets, dubiously shakes his head. Two assembly commissioners went thither last autumn, considerate Jensan, not yet called to be a senator. Gao Lois, an editorial man. These two, consulting with General de Mourier, spake and worked, softly, with judgment, they have hushed down the irritation, and produced a soft report, for the time. The general himself doubts not in the least but he can keep peace there, being an able man. He passes these frosty months among the pleasant people of Nure, occupies tolerably handsome apartments in the castle of Nure, and tempers the minds of men. Why is there but one de Mourier? Elsewhere you find south or north, nothing but untempered obscure jarring, which breaks forth ever and anon into open clangor of riot. Southern Perpignan has its toxin, by torch light. With rushing and onslaught, northern can not less, by daylight, with aristocrats ranged in arms at places of worship, departmental compromise proving impossible, breaking into musketry and a plot discovered. Add hunger too, for bread, always dear, is getting dearer, not so much as sugar can be had, for good reasons. Poor Simino, mayor of Etamps, in this northern region, hanging out his red flag in some riot of grains, is trampled to death by a hungry exasperated people. What a trade this of mayor, in these times. Mayor of St. Denis hung at the lantern, by suspicion and dyspepsia, as we saw long since, mayor of Vaison, as we saw lately, buried before dead, and now this poor Simino, the tanner, of attempts, whom legal constitutionalism will not forget. With factions, suspicions, want of bread and sugar, it is verily what they call Descher, torn asunder this poor country, France and all that is French. 
4. Overseas 2 Come Bad News In Black St. Domingo, before that variegated glitter in the Champs Elysees was lit for an accepted constitution, there had risen, and was burning contemporary with it, quite another variegated glitter and nocturnal fulgor. Had we known it, of molasses and ardent spirits, of sugar boileries, plantations, furniture, cattle and men, sky high, the plain of Cap Francais, one huge whirl of smoke and flame. What a change here, in these two years. Since that first box of tricolor cockades got through the custom house, and atrabiliar creoles too rejoiced that there was a leveling of Bastilles. Leveling is comfortable, as we often say, leveling, yet only down to oneself. Your pale white creoles have their grievances, and your yellow quarterons, and your dark yellow mulattoes, and your slave soot black. Quarteron Oge, friend of our Parisian Brissadin friends of the blacks, felt, for his share too, that insurrection was the most sacred of duties. So the tricolor cockades had fluttered and swashed only some three months on the Creole hat, when Oge's signal conflagrations went aloft, with the voice of rage and terror. Repressed, doomed to die, he took black powder or seed grains in the hollow of his hand, this Oge, sprinkled a film of white ones on the top, and said to his judges, Behold they are white. Then shook his hand, and said, Where are the whites, O saint les blancs? So now, in the autumn of 1791, looking from the sky windows of Cap Francais, thick clouds of smoke girdle our horizon, smoke in the day, in the night fire. Preceded by fugitive shrieking white women, by terror and rumor. Black demonized squadrons are massacring and harrying, with nameless cruelty. They fight and fire, from behind thickets and coverts, for the black man loves the bush. They rush to the attack, thousand strong, with brandished cutlasses and fusils, with caperings, shoutings and vociferation, which, if the white volunteer company stands firm, dwindle into staggerings, into quick gabblement. Into panic flight at the first volley, perhaps before it. Poor Oge could be broken on the wheel, this fire whirlwind too can be abetted, driven up into the mountains, but Saint Domingo is shaken, as Oge's sea grains were, shaking, writhing in long horrid death throes, it is black without remedy. And remains, as African Haiti, a munition to the world. Oh my Parisian friends, is not this, as well as regraders and fuel and plotters, one cause of the astonishing dearth of sugar. The grocer, palpitant, with drooping lip, sees his sugar tax. Weighed out by female patriotism, in instant retail, at the inadequate rate of twenty-five sous, or thirteen pence a pound. Abstain from it, yes, ye patriot sections, all ye Jacobins, abstain. Louvet and call it de Herboys so advise. Resolute to make the sacrifice, though, how shall literary men do without coffee? Abstain, with an oath, that is the surest. Also, for like reason, must not Brest and the shipping interest languish? Poor Brest languishes, sorrowing, not without spleen, denounces an aristocrat Bertrand Molleville traitorous aristocrat marine minister. Do not her ships and king's ships lie rotting piecemeal in harbor? Naval officers mostly fled, and on furlough too, with pay. Little stirring there, if it be not the Brest galleys, whip-driven, with their galley slaves, alas, with some forty of our hapless Swiss soldiers of Chateauvieux, among others. These forty Swiss, too mindful of Nancy, do now, in their red wool caps, tug sorrowfully at the oar, looking into the Atlantic brine, which reflects only their own sorrowful shaggy faces, and seem forgotten of hope. But, on the whole, may we not say, in fugitive language, that the French constitution which shall march is very rheumatic, full of shooting internal pains, in joint and muscle, and will not march without difficulty. Chapter 2.5.V Kings and Emigrants Extremely rheumatic constitutions have been known to march, and keep on their feet, though in a staggering sprawling manner, for long periods, in virtue of one thing only, that the head were healthy. But this head of the French constitution. What King Louis is and cannot help being, readers already know. A king who cannot take the constitution, nor reject the constitution, nor do anything at all, but miserably ask, what shall I do? 
a king environed with endless confusions, in whose own mind is no germ of order. Haughty implacable remnants of noblesse struggling with humiliated repentant Barnave Lameths, struggling in that obscure element of fetchers and carriers, of half-pay braggarts from the Café Valois, of chambermaids, whisperers, and subaltern officious persons. Fierce patriotism looking on all the while, more and more suspicious, from without, what, in such struggle, can they do? At best, cancel one another, and produce zero. Poor king! Barnave and your senatorial jawcourts speak earnestly into this ear. Bertrand Molleville, and messengers from Koblenz, speak earnestly into that, the poor royal head turns to the one side and to the other side, can turn itself fixedly to no side. Let decency drop a veil over it, sorrier misery was seldom enacted in the world. This one small fact, does it not throw the saddest light on much? The Queen is lamenting to Madame Campan, what am I to do? When they, these Barnaves, get us advised to any step which the noblesse do not like, then I am pouted at, nobody comes to my card table, the king's couchy is solitary. In such a case of dubiety, what is one to do? Go inevitably to the ground. The king has accepted this constitution, knowing beforehand that it will not serve, he studies it, and executes it in the hope mainly that it will be found inexecutable. King's ships lie rotting in harbor, their officers gone. The armies disorganized, robbers scour the highways, which were down unrepaired, all public service lies slack and waste, the executive makes no effort, or an effort only to throw the blame on the constitution. Shamming death, Faisant le mort. What constitution, use it in this manner, can march? Grow to disgust the nation, it will truly, unless you first grow to disgust the nation. It is Bertrand de Molleville's plan, and His Majesty's, the best they can form. Or if, after all, this best plan proved too slow, proved a failure. Provident of that too, the Queen, shrouded in deepest mystery, writes all day, in cipher, day after day, to Koblenz. Engineer Gogolat, he of the Knight of Spurs, whom the Lafayette amnesty has delivered from prison, rides and runs. Now and then, on fit occasion, a royal familiar visit can be paid to that Sal de Manege, an affecting encouraging royal speech, sincere, doubt it not, for the moment, can be delivered there, and the senators all cheer and almost weep. At the same time Mallet du Pan has visibly ceased editing, and invisibly bears abroad a king's autograph, soliciting help from the foreign potentates. Unhappy Louis, do this thing or else that other, if thou couldst. The thing which the king's government did do was to stagger distractedly from contradiction to contradiction, and wetting fire to water, envelope itself in hissing, and ashy steam. Danton and needy corruptible patriots are sopped with presents of cash, they accept the sop, they rise refreshed by it, and travel their own way. Nay, the king's government did likewise hire hand clappers, or claqueurs, persons to applaud. Subterranean Riverall has fifteen hundred men in king's pay, at the rate of some ten thousand pounds sterling per month, what he calls, a staff of genius, paragraph writers, placard journalists. Two hundred and eighty applauders, at three shillings a day, one of the strangest staffs ever commanded by man. The musterolls and account books of which still exist. Bertrand Molleville himself, in a way he thinks very dexterous, contrives to pack the galleries of the legislative. Get sans-culottes hired to go thither, and applaud at a signal given, they fancying it was passion that bid them, a device which was not detected for almost a week. Dexterous enough. As if a man finding the day fast declined should determine on altering the clock hands, that is a thing possible for him. Here too let us note an unexpected apparition of Philippe d'Orleans at court, his last at the levy of any king. D'Orleans, sometime in the winter months seemingly, has been appointed to that old first coveted rank of admiral, though only over ships rotting in port. The wished for comes too late. However, he waits on Bertrand Molleville to give thanks, nay to state that he would willingly thank His Majesty in person, that, in spite of all the horrible things men have said and sung, he is far from being His Majesty's enemy, at bottom, how far. Bertrand delivers the message, brings about the royal interview, which does pass to the satisfaction of His Majesty, 
Diorlin seeming clearly repentant, determined to turn over a new leaf. And yet, next Sunday, what do we see? Next Sunday, says Bertrand, he came to the king's levy. But the courtiers ignorant of what had passed, the crowd of royalists who were accustomed to resort thither on that day specially to pay their court, gave him the most humiliating reception. They came pressing round him. Managing, as if by mistake, to tread on his toes, to elbow him towards the door, and not let him enter again. He went downstairs to Her Majesty's apartments, where cover was laid. So soon as he shewed face, sounds rose on all sides, messers, take care of the dishes, as if he had carried poison in his pockets. The insults which his presence everywhere excited forced him to retire without having seen the royal family, the crowd followed him to the queen's staircase. In descending, he received a spitting, cratchit, on the head, and some others, on his clothes. Rage and spite were seen visibly painted on his face as indeed how could they miss to be. He imputes it all to the king and queen, who know nothing of it, who are even much grieved at it, and so descends, to his chaos again. Bertrand was there at the chateau that day himself, and an eyewitness to these things. For the rest, nonjurant priests, and the repression of them, will distract the king's conscience, emigrant princes and noblesse will force him to double dealing, there must be veto on veto, amid the ever waxing indignation of men. For patriotism, as we said, looks on from without, more and more suspicious. Waxing tempest, blast after blast, of patriot indignation, from without, dim inorganic whirl of intrigues, fatuities, within. Inorganic, fatuous. From which the eye turns away. The stall intrigues for her so gallant Narbonne, to get him made war minister, and ceases not, having got him made. The king shall fly to Rouen. Shall there, with the gallant Narbonne, properly, modify the constitution. This is the same brisk Narbonne, who, last year, cut out from their entanglement, by force of dragoons, those poor fugitive royal ants, men say he is at bottom their brother, or even more, so scandalous is scandal. He drives now, with his de Stal, rapidly to the armies, to the frontier towns, produces rose-colored reports, not too credible, pirorates, gesticulates, wavers poising himself on the top, for a moment, scene of men. Then tumbles, dismissed, washed away by the time flood. Also the fair princess de Lambal intrigues, bosom friend of her majesty, to the angering of patriotism. Beautiful unfortunate, why did she ever return from England? Her small silver voice, what can it profit in that piping of the black world tornado? Which will whirl her, poor fragile bird of paradise, against grim rocks? Lambal and de Stahl intrigue visibly, apart or together, but who shall reckon how many others, and in what infinite ways, invisibly? Is there not what one may call an Austrian committee, sitting invisible in the Tilleries? Center of an invisible anti-national spiderweb, which, for we sleep among mysteries, stretches its threads to the ends of the earth. Journalist Cara has now the clearest certainty of it, to Brissetten patriotism, and France generally, it is growing more and more probable. O oh reader, hast thou no pity for this constitution? Rheumatic shooting pains in its members. Pressure of hydrocephale and hysteric vapors on its brain, a constitution divided against itself, which will never march, hardly even stagger. Why were not Druid and Procure sauce in their beds, that unblessed Varenus night? Why did they not, in the name of heaven, let the Corf Berlin go whither it listed? Nameless incoherency, incompatibility, perhaps prodigies at which the world still shudders, had been spared. But now comes the third thing that bodes ill for the marching of this French constitution, besides the French people, and the French king, there is thirdly, the assembled European world. It has become necessary now to look at that also. Fair France is so luminous, and round and round it, is troublous Sumerian night. Calones, Braturals hover dim, far-flown, overnetting Europe with intrigues. From Turin to Vienna, to Berlin, and utmost Petersburg in the frozen north. Great Burke has raised his great voice long ago, eloquently demonstrating that the end of an epoch is come, to all appearance the end of civilized time. Him many answer, Camille de Moulin, 
Klut Speaker of Mankind, Payne the Rebellious Needleman, and Honorable Gallic Vindicators in that country and in this, but the Great Burke remains unanswerable. The age of chivalry is gone, and could not but go, having now produced the still more indomitable age of hunger. Altars enough, of the Du Bois Rohan sort, changing to the Gobelin Talleyrand sort, are faring by rapid transmutation to, shall we say, the right proprietor of them? French game and French game preservers did alight on the cliffs of Dover, with cries of distress. Who will say that the end of much is not come? A set of mortals has risen, who believe that truth is not a printed speculation, but a practical fact. That freedom and brotherhood are possible in this earth, supposed always to be Belial's, which the supreme quack was to inherit. Who will say that church, state, throne, altar are not in danger? That the sacred strong box itself, last palladium of effete humanity, may not be blasphemously blown upon, and its padlocks undone? The poor constituent assembly might act with what delicacy and diplomacy it would. Declare that it abjured meddling with its neighbors, foreign conquest, and so forth, but from the first this thing was to be predicted, that old Europe and new France could not subsist together. A glorious revolution, oversetting state prisons and feudalism. Publishing, with outburst of federative canon, in face of all the earth, that appearance is not reality, how shall it subsist amid governments which, if appearance is not reality, are, one knows not what. In death feud, an internecine wrestle and battle, it shall subsist with them, not otherwise. Rights of man, printed on cotton handkerchiefs, in various dialects of human speech, pass over to the Frankfurt Fair. What say we, Frankfurt Fair? They have crossed Euphrates and the fabulous Hydaspes, wafted themselves beyond the Ural, Altai, Himalaya, struck off from wood stereotypes, in angular picture writing, they are jabbered and jingled of in China and Japan. Where will it stop? Qianlong smells mischief, not the remotest Dalai Lama shall now need his dough pills in peace. Hateful to us, as is the night. Bestir yourselves, ye defenders of order. They do bestir themselves, all kings and kinglets, with their spiritual temporal array, are astir, their brows clouded with menace. Diplomatic emissaries fly swift, conventions, privy conclaves assemble. And wise wigs wag, taking what counsel they can. Also, as we said, the pamphleteer draws pen, on this side and that, zealous fists beat the pulpit drum. Not without issue. Did not iron Birmingham, shouting, church and king, itself knew not why, burst out, last July, into rage, drunkenness, and fire, and your priestlies, and the like, dining there on that Bastille day, get the maddest singeing, scandalous to consider. In which same days, as we can remark, high potentates, Austrian and Prussian, with emigrants, were faring towards Pilnitz in Saxony. There, on the 27th of August, they, keeping to themselves what further, secret treaty, there might or might not be, did publish their hopes and their threatenings, their declaration that it was, the common cause of kings. Where a will to quarrel is, there is a way. Our readers remember that Pentecost night, 4th of August 1789, when feudalism fell in a few hours. The National Assembly, in abolishing feudalism, promised that, compensation, should be given. And did endeavor to give it. Nevertheless the Austrian Kaiser answers that his German princes, for their part, cannot be unfeudalized. That they have possessions in French Alsace, and feudal rights secured to them, for which no conceivable compensation will suffice. So this of the possession princes, princes' possessions, is bandied from court to court. Covers acres of diplomatic paper at this day, a weariness to the world. Kaunitz argues from Vienna, the lesser responds from Paris, though perhaps not sharply enough. The Kaiser and his possession princes will too evidently come and take compensation, so much as they can get. Nay might one not partition France, as we have done Poland, and are doing, and so pacify it with a vengeance. From south to north. For actually it is, the common cause of kings. Swedish Gustav, sworn knight of the Queen of France, will lead coalized armies, had not Ankarstrom treasonously shot him, for, indeed, there were griefs nearer home. 
Austria and Prussia speak at Pilnitz, all men intensely listening, imperial rescripts have gone out from Turin, there will be secret convention at Vienna. Catherine of Russia beckons approvingly, will help, were she ready. Spanish bourbon stirs amid his pillows, from him too, even from him, shall there come help. Lean Pitt, the minister of preparatives, looks out from his watchtower in St. James's, in a suspicious manner. Counselors plotting, Calon's dim hovering, alas, sergeants rub-a-dubbing openly through all manner of German market towns, collecting ragged valor. Look where you will, immeasurable obscurantism is girdling this fair France. Which, again, will not be girdled by it. Europe is in travail, pang after pang, what a shriek was that of Pilnitz. The birth will be, war. Nay the worst feature of the business is this last, still to be named. The emigrants at Koblenz, so many thousands ranking there, in bitter hate and menace, king's brothers, all princes of the blood except wicked Diorlans, your dueling de Castries, your eloquent Casals, bull-headed Malsains, a war god broy. Distaff seigneurs, insulted officers, all that have ridden across the Rhine stream, d'Artois welcoming Abbe Mori with a kiss, and clasping him publicly to his own royal heart. Emigration, flowing over the frontiers, now in drops, now in streams, in various humors of fear, of petulance, rage and hope, ever since those first Bastille days when d'Artois went, to shame the citizens of Paris. Has swollen to the size of a phenomenon of the world. Koblenz has become a small extranational Versailles, a Versailles in party bus, breeding, intriguing, favoritism, strumpetocracy itself, they say, goes on there, all the old activities, on a small scale, quickened by hungry revenge. Enthusiasm, of loyalty, of hatred and hope, has risen to a high pitch, as, in any Koblenz tavern, you may hear, in speech, and in singing. Mori assists in the interior council, much is decided on. For one thing, they keep lists of the dates of your emigrating, a month sooner, or a month later determines your greater or your less right to the coming division of the spoil. Casals himself, because he had occasionally spoken with a constitutional tone, was looked on coldly at first, so pure are our principles. And arms are a hammering at Liege. Three thousand horses, ambling hitherward from the fairs of Germany, cavalry enrolling, likewise foot soldiers, in blue coat, red waistcoat, and nankeen trousers. They have their secret domestic correspondences, as their open foreign, with disaffected crypto-aristocrats, with contumacious priests, with Austrian committee in the Tilleries. Deserters are spirited over by assiduous crimps. Royal Alamand is gone almost wholly. Their route of march, towards France and the division of the spoil, is marked out, were the Kaiser once ready. It is said, they mean to poison the sources. But, adds patriotism making report of it, they will not poison the source of liberty, whereat, on applauded, we cannot but applaud. Also they have manufactories of false assignats. And men that circulate in the interior distributing and dispersing the same, one of these we denounce now to legislative patriotism, a man Lebrun by name, about thirty years of age, with blonde hair and in quantity. Has, only for the time being surely, a black eye, oi poche, goes in a whiskey with a black horse, always keeping his gig. Unhappy emigrants, it was their lot, and the lot of France. They are ignorant of much that they should know, of themselves, of what is around them. A political party that knows not when it is beaten, may become one of the fatal list of things, to itself, and to all. Nothing will convince these men that they cannot scatter the French Revolution at the first blast of their war trumpet. That the French Revolution is other than a blustering effervescence, of brawlers and spooters, which, at the flash of chivalrous broadswords, at the rustle of gallows ropes, will burrow itself, in dens the deeper the welcomer. But, alas, what man does know and measure himself, and the things that are round him, elsewhere were the need of physical fighting at all? Never till they are cleft asunder, can these heads believe that a sansculotic arm has any vigor in it, cleft asunder, it will be too late to believe. One may say, without spleen against his poor erring brothers of any side, that above all other mischiefs, this of the emigrant nobles acted fatally on France. Could they have known, 
could they have understood? In the beginning of 1789, a splendor and a terror still surrounded them, the conflagration of their chateaus, kindled by months of obstinacy, went out after the 4th of August. And might have continued out, had they at all known what to defend, what to relinquish as indefensible. They were still a graduated hierarchy of authorities, or the accredited similitude of such, they sat there, uniting king with commonalty. Transmitting and translating gradually, from degree to degree, the command of the one into the obedience of the other, rendering command and obedience still possible. Had they understood their place, and what to do in it, this French Revolution, which went forth explosively in years and in months, might have spread itself over generations. And not a torture death but a quiet euthanasia have been provided for many things. But they were proud and high, these men, they were not wise to consider. They spurned all from them. In disdainful hate, they drew the sword and flung away the scabbard. France has not only no hierarchy of authorities, to translate command into obedience, its hierarchy of authorities has fled to the enemies of France. Calls loudly on the enemies of France to interfere armed who want but a pretext to do that. Jealous kings and kaisers might have looked on long, meditating interference, yet afraid and ashamed to interfere, but now do not the king's brothers, and all French nobles, dignitaries and authorities that are free to speak. Which the king himself is not, passionately invite us, in the name of right and of might? Ranked at Koblenz, from fifteen to twenty thousand stand now brandishing their weapons, with the cry, On, on. Yes, Messrs, you shall on, and divide the spoil according to your dates of emigrating. Of all which things a poor legislative assembly, and patriot France, is informed, by denunciant friend, by triumphant foe. Sullo's pamphlets, of the Riverall staff of genius, circulate, heralding supreme hope. Durasoy's placards tapestry the walls. Chant du coq crow's day, pecked at by Italians ami de citoyens. King's friend, Royu, ami du roi, can name, in exact arithmetical ciphers, the contingents of the various invading potentates. In all, 419,000 foreign fighting men, with 15,000 emigrants. Not to reckon these your daily and hourly desertions, which an editor must daily record, of whole companies, and even regiments, crying Vive le Roy, Vive la Reine, and marching over with banners spread, lies all, and wind. Yet to patriotism not wind, nor, alas, one day, to Royu. Patriotism, therefore, may brawl and babble yet a little while, but its hours are numbered, Europe is coming with 419,000 in the chivalry of France. The gallows, one may hope, will get its own. Chapter 2.5. VI. Brigands and jails. We shall have war, then, and on what terms? With an executive, pretending, really with less and less deceptiveness now, to be dead. Casting even a wishful eye towards the enemy, on such terms we shall have war. Public functionary in vigorous action there is none, if it be not Riverall with his staff of genius and 280 applauders. The public service lies waste, the very tax gatherer has forgotten his cunning, in this and the other provincial board of management, directoire de department, it is found advisable to retain what taxes you can gather. To pay your own inevitable expenditures. Our revenue is assignats, emission on emission of paper money. And the army, our three grand armies, of Rochambeau, of Luckner, of Lafayette, Lean, disconsolate hover these three grand armies, watching the frontiers there. Three flights of long-necked cranes in molting time, wretched, disobedient, disorganized, who never saw fire, the old generals and officers gone across the Rhine. War Minister Narbonne, he of the rose-colored reports, solicits recruitments, equipments, money, always money, threatens, since he can get none, to take his sword, which belongs to himself, and go serve his country with that. The question of questions is, what shall be done? Shall we, with a desperate defiance which fortune sometimes favors, draw the sword at once, in the face of this inrushing world of emigration and obscurantism? Or wait, and temporize and diplomatize, till, if possible, our resources mature themselves a little? And yet again are our resources growing towards maturity, or growing the other way? 
dubious, the ablest patriots are divided. Brissett and his Brissettans, or Girondins, in the legislative, cry aloud for the former defiant plan, Robespierre, in the Jacobins, pleads as loud for the latter dilatory one, with responses, even with mutual reprimands. Distracting the mother of patriotism. Consider also what agitated breakfasts there may be at Madame Dieudon's in the place Vaudome. The alarm of all men is great. Help, ye patriots, and oh at least agree, for the hour presses. Frost was not yet gone, when in that tolerably handsome apartment of the castle of Niort, there arrived a letter, General de Mourier must to Paris. It is War Minister Narbonne that writes, the general shall give counsel about many things. In the month of February 1792, Brissett and friends welcomed their de Mourier Palamides, comparable really to an antique Ulysses in modern costume, quick, elastic, shifty, insuppressible, many counseled man. Let the reader fancy this fair France with a whole Sumerian Europe girdling her, rolling in on her, black, to burst in red thunder of war. Fair France herself hand-shackled and foot-shackled in the weltering complexities of this social clothing, or constitution, which they have made for her, a France that, in such constitution, cannot march. And hunger too. And plotting aristocrats, and excommunicating dissident priests, the man Lebrun by name urging his black whiskey, visible to the eye, and, still more terrible in his invisibility, engineer Gogolat, with Queen's cipher, riding and running. The excommunicatory priests give new trouble in the main and lawyer, Lavade, nor Catalino the wool dealer, has not ceased grumbling and rumbling. Nay behold jails itself once more, how often does that real imaginary camp of the fiend require to be extinguished? For near two years now, it has waned faint and again waxed bright, in the bewildered soul of patriotism, actually, if patriotism knew it, one of the most surprising products of nature working with art. Royalist seigneurs, under this or the other pretext, assemble the simple people of these Savennes mountains, men not in use to revolt, and with heart for fighting, could their poor heads be got persuaded. The Royalist Seigneur harangues. Harping mainly on the religious string, true priests maltreated, false priests intruded, Protestants, once dragooned, now triumphing, things sacred given to the dogs, and so produces, from the pious mountaineer throat, rough growlings. Shall we not testify, then, ye brave hearts of the Savens, march to the rescue? Holy religion, duty to God and King. See fate, si fate, just so, just so, answer the brave hearts always, mais ilya de bien bon shows is dawn la revolution, but there are many good things in the revolution too. And so the matter, cajole as we may, will only turn on its axis, not stir from the spot, and remains theatrical merely. Nevertheless deepen your cajolery, harp quick and quicker, ye royalist seigneurs. With a deadlift effort you may bring it to that. In the month of June next, this camp of jails will step forth as a theatricality suddenly become real, two thousand strong, and with the boast that it is seventy thousand, most strange to see. With flags flying, bayonets fixed, with proclamation, and d'Artois commission of civil war. Let some Rebecqui, or other the like hot clear patriot. Let some, Lieutenant Colonel Aubrey, if Rebecqui is busy elsewhere, raise instantaneous national guards, and disperse and dissolve it, and blow the old castle asunder, that so, if possible, we hear of it no more. In the months of February and March, it is recorded, the terror, especially of rural France, had risen even to the transcendental pitch, not far from madness. In town and hamlet is rumor. Of war, massacre, that Austrians, aristocrats, above all, that the brigands are close by. Men quit their houses and huts, rush fugitive, shrieking, with wife and child, they know not whither. Such a terror, the eyewitnesses say, never fell on a nation, nor shall again fall, even in reigns of terror expressly so called. The countries of the lawyer, all the central and southeast regions, start up distracted, simultaneously as by an electric shock, for indeed grain too gets scarcer and scarcer. The people barricade the entrances of towns, pile stones in the upper stories, the women prepare boiling water, from moment to moment, expecting the attack. In the country, the alarm bell rings incessant, 
troops of peasants, gathered by it, scour the highways, seeking an imaginary enemy. They are armed mostly with scythes stuck in wood. And, arriving in wild troops at the barricaded towns, are themselves sometimes taken for brigands. So rushes old France, old France is rushing down. What the end will be is known to no mortal, that the end is near all mortals may know. Chapter 2.5.7 Constitution will not march. To all which are poor legislative, tied up by an unmarching constitution, can oppose nothing, by way of remedy, but mere bursts of parliamentary eloquence. They go on, debating, denouncing, objurgating, loud weltering chaos, which devours itself. But their two thousand and odd decrees. Reader, these happily concern not thee, nor me. Mere occasional decrees, foolish and not foolish. Sufficient for that day was its own evil. Of the whole two thousand there are not, now half a score, and these mostly blighted in the bud by royal veto, that will profit or disprofit us. On the 17th of January, the legislative, for one thing, got its high court, its haute cour, set up at Orleans. The theory had been given by the constituent, in May last, but this is the reality, a court for the trial of political offenses. A court which cannot want work. To this it was decreed that there needed no royal acceptance, therefore that there could be no veto. Also priests can now be married, ever since last October. A patriotic adventurous priest had made bold to marry himself then, and not thinking this enough, came to the bar with his new spouse, that the whole world might hold honeymoon with him, and a law be obtained. Less joyful are the laws against refractory priests, and yet no less needful. Decrees on priests and decrees on emigrants, these are the two brief series of decrees, worked out with endless debate, and then cancelled by veto, which mainly concern us here. For an August National Assembly must needs conquer these refractories, clerical or laic, and thumbscrew them into obedience. Yet, behold, always as you turn your legislative thumbscrew, and will press and even crush till refractories give way, King's veto steps in, with magical paralysis, and your thumbscrew, hardly squeezing, much less crushing, does not act. Truly a melancholy set of decrees, a pair of sets, paralyzed by veto. First, under date the 28th of October, 1791, we have legislative proclamation, issued by Harold and Bill Sticker. Inviting Monsieur, the King's brother to return within two months, under penalties. To which invitation Monsieur replies nothing. Or indeed replies by newspaper parody, inviting the August legislative, to return to common sense within two months, under penalties. Whereupon the legislative must take stronger measures. So, on the 9th of November, we declare all emigrants to be, suspect of conspiracy, and, in brief, to be, outlawed, if they have not returned at New Year's Day, will the king say veto? That, triple impost, shall be levied on these men's properties, or even their properties be, put in sequestration, one can understand. But further, on New Year's Day itself, not an individual having, returned, we declare, and with fresh emphasis some fortnight later again declare, that Monsieur is detu, forfeited of his eventual heirship to the crown. Nay more that Condé, Calonne, and a considerable list of others are accused of high treason, and shall be judged by our High Court of Orleans, veto. Then again as to nonjurant priests, it was decreed, in November last, that they should forfeit what pensions they had, be, put under inspection, under surveillance, and, if need were, be banished, veto. A still sharper turn is coming. But to this also the answer will be, veto. Veto after veto, your thumbscrew paralyzed. Gods and men may see that the legislative is in a false position. As, alas, who is in a true one? Voices already murmur for a national convention. This poor legislative, spurred and stung into action by a whole France and a whole Europe, cannot act, can only objurgate and perorate, with stormy motions, and motion in which is no way, with effervescence, with noise and fuliginous fury. What scenes in that national hall? President jingling his inaudible bell, or, as utmost signal of distress, clapping on his hat. The tumult subsiding in twenty minutes, 
and this or the other indiscreet member sent to the Abbey prison for three days. Suspected persons must be summoned and questioned, old M. The Sombruil of the Invalids has to give account of himself, and why he leaves his gates open. Unusual smoke rose from the Sevra pottery, indicating conspiracy. The potters explained that it was Nicholas Lamotte's memoirs, bought up by Her Majesty, which they were endeavouring to suppress by fire, which nevertheless he that runs may still read. Again, it would seem, Duke de Brissac and the King's Constitutional Guard are making cartridges secretly in the cellars, a set of royalists, pure and impure, black cutthroats many of them, picked out of gaming houses and sinks. In all six thousand instead of eighteen hundred, who evidently gloom on us every time we enter the chateau. Wherefore, with infinite debate, let Brissac and King's Guard be disbanded. Disbanded accordingly they are. After only two months of existence, for they did not get on foot till March of this same year. So ends briefly the King's new constitutional Maison Militaire, he must now be guarded by mere Swiss and Blue Nationals again. It seems the lot of constitutional things. New constitutional Maison Civil he would never even establish, much as Barnave urged it, old resident duchesses sniffed at it and held aloof. On the whole Her Majesty thought it not worth while, the noblesse would so soon be back triumphant. Or, looking still into this national hall and its scenes, behold Bishop Torna, a constitutional prelate, not of severe morals, demanding that religious costumes and such caricatures be abolished. Bishop Torna warms, catches fire. Finishes by untying, and indignantly flinging on the table, as if for gauge or bet, his own pontifical cross. Which cross, at any rate, is instantly covered by the cross of Te Deum Facet, then by other crosses, and insignia, till all are stripped. This clerical senator clutching off his skullcap, that other his frill collar, lest fanaticism return on us. Quick is the movement here. And then so confused, unsubstantial, you might call it almost spectral. Pallid, dim, inane, like the kingdoms of Dis. Unruly Leggett, shrunk to a kind of spectre for us, pleads here, some cause that he has, amid rumour and interruption, which excel human patience. He tears his papers, and withdraws, the irascible adust little man. Nay honourable members will tear their papers, being effervescent, Merlin of Thionville tears his papers, crying, so, the people cannot be saved by you. Nor are deputations wanting, deputations of sections, generally with complaint and denouncement, always with patriot fervour of sentiment, deputation of women, pleading that they also may be allowed to take pikes and exercise in the Champtomars. Why not, ye Amazons, if it be in you? Then occasionally, having done our message and got answer, we defile through the hall, singing C-A-I-R-A. -A. Or rather roll and whirl through it, dancing our Ron Patriotique the while, our new Carmignol, or Pyrrhic war dance and liberty dance. Patriot Huguenin, ex advocate, ex carabiner, ex clerk of the barriers, comes deputed, with Saint Antoine at his heels, denouncing anti patriotism, famine, forestallment, and man eaters. Asks an August legislative, Is there not a toxin in your hearts against these mangers de homes? But above all things, for this is a continual business, the legislative has to reprimand the king's ministers. Of His Majesty's ministers we have said hitherto, and say, next to nothing. Still more spectral these. Sorrowful. Of no permanency any of them, none at least since Montmorin vanished, the eldest of the King's Council, is occasionally not ten days old. Fuel and constitutional, as your respectable Cahier de Gerville, as your respectable unfortunate Delisarts. Or royalist constitutional, as Montmorin last friend of Necker, or aristocrat as Bertrand Molleville, they flit their phantom-like, in the huge simmering confusion, poor shadows, dashed in the racking winds, powerless, without meaning. Whom the human memory need not charge itself with. But how often, we say, are these poor majesties ministers summoned over, to be questioned, tutored, nay, threatened, almost bullied. They answer what, with adroitest simulation and casuistry, they can, of which a poor legislative knows not what to make. One thing only is clear, that Sumerian Europe is girdling us in, that France, 
not actually dead, surely, cannot march. Have a care, ye ministers. Sharp Guadet transfixes you with cross-questions, with sudden advocate conclusions, the sleeping tempest that is in Vergniad can be awakened. Restless Brissett brings up reports, accusations, endless thin logic. It is the man's high day even now. Condor Saradax, with his firm pen, our address of the Legislative Assembly to the French nation. Fiery Max Isnard, who, for the rest, will carry not fire and sword on those Sumerian enemies, but liberty, is for declaring that we hold ministers responsible, and that by responsibility we mean death, new sentendens la mort. For verily it grows serious, the time presses, and traitors there are. Bertrand Molleville has a smooth tongue, the known aristocrat, gall in his heart. How his answers and explanations flow ready, Jesuitic, plausible to the ear. But perhaps the notablest is this, which befell once when Bertrand had done answering and was withdrawn. Scarcely had the August Assembly begun considering what was to be done with him, when the hall fills with smoke. Thick sour smoke, no oratory, only wheezing and barking, irremediable, so that the August Assembly has to adjourn. A miracle? Typical miracle? One knows not, only this one seems to know, that, the keeper of the stoves was appointed by Bertrand, or by some underling of his. O fuliginous confused kingdom of Dis, with thy tantalusic scion toils, with thy angry fire floods, and streams named of lamentation, why hast thou not thy lethe too, that so one might finish? Chapter 2.5.8 The Jacobins Nevertheless let not patriotism despair. Have we not, in Paris at least, a virtuous passion, a holy patriotic municipality? Virtuous passion, ever since November, is mayor of Paris, in our municipality, the public, for the public is now admitted too, may behold an energetic Danton, further, an epigrammatic slow sure Manuel. A resolute unrepentant Billard Varennes, of Jesuit breeding, Tallinn able editor, and nothing but patriots, better or worse. So ran the November elections, to the joy of most citizens, nay the very court supported Pession rather than Lafayette. And so Bailey in his fewinance, long waning like the moon, had to withdraw then, making some sorrowful obeisance, into extinction. Or indeed into worse, into lurid half-light, grimmed by the shadow of that red flag of theirs, and bitter memory of the Champtomars. How swift is the progress of things and men! Not now does Lafayette, as on that Federation Day, when his noon was, press his sword firmly on the Fatherland's altar, and swear in sight of France, ah no! He, waning and setting ever since that hour, hangs now, disastrous, on the edge of the horizon, commanding one of those three molten crane flights of armies, in a most suspected, unfruitful, uncomfortable manner. But, at most, cannot patriotism, so many thousands strong in this metropolis of the universe, help itself? Has it not right hands, pikes? Hammering of pikes, which was not to be prohibited by Mayor Bailey, has been sanctioned by Mayor Pession. Sanctioned by Legislative Assembly. How not, when the king's so-called constitutional guard was making cartridges in secret? Changes are necessary for the National Guard itself, this whole fuel and aristocrat staff of the guard must be disbanded. Likewise, citizens without uniform may surely rank in the guard, the pike beside the musket, in such a time, the active citizen and the passive who can fight for us, are they not both welcome, O oh my patriot friends, indubitably yes. Nay the truth is, patriotism throughout, were it never so white-frilled, logical, respectable, must either lean itself heartily on sansculottism, the black, bottomless, or else vanish, in the frightfulest way, to limbo. Thus some, with upturned nose, will altogether sniff and disdain sansculottism, others will lean heartily on it, nay others again will lean what we call heartlessly on it, three sorts, each sort with a destiny corresponding. In such point of view, however, have we not for the present a volunteer ally, stronger than all the rest, namely, hunger? Hunger, and what rushing of panic terror this and the sum total of our other miseries may bring. For sansculottism grows by what all other things die of. Stupid Peter Bailey almost made an epigram, though unconsciously, 
and with the patriot world laughing not at it but at him, when he wrote, Tout va bien ici, le pain monk, all goes well here, vittles not to be had. Neither, if you knew it, is patriotism without her constitution that can march, her not impotent parliament, or call it, ecumenic council, and general assembly of the Jean-Jacques churches, the mother society, namely. Mother society with her three hundred full-grown daughters, with what we can call little granddaughters trying to walk, in every village of France, numerable, as Burke thinks, by the hundred thousand. This is the true constitution. Made not by twelve hundred August senators, but by nature herself, and has grown, unconsciously, out of the wants and the efforts of these twenty-five millions of men. They are, lords of the articles, are Jacobins. They originate debates for the legislative, discuss peace and war, settle beforehand what the legislative is to do. Greatly to the scandal of philosophical men, and of most historians, who do in that judge naturally, and yet not wisely. A governing power must exist, your other powers here are simulacra, this power is it. Great is the mother society, she has had the honor to be denounced by Austrian counts, and is all the dearer to patriotism. By fortune and valor, she has extinguished fuelantism itself, at least the fuelant club. This latter, high as it once carried its head, she, on the 18th of February, has the satisfaction to see shut, extinct. Patriots having gone thither, with tumult, to hiss it out of pain. The mother society has enlarged her locality, stretches now over the whole nave of the church. Let us glance in, with the worthy Talangin, our old ex-constituent friend, who happily has eyes to see, the nave of the Jacobin's church, says he, is changed into a vast circus. The seats of which mount up circularly like an amphitheater to the very groin of the domed roof. A high pyramid of black marble, built against one of the walls, which was formerly a funeral monument, has alone been left standing, it serves now as back to the office bearers' bureau. Here on an elevated platform sit president and secretaries, behind and above them the white busts of Mirabeau, of Franklin, and various others, nay finally of Marat. Facing this is the tribune, raised till it is midway between floor and groin of the dome, so that the speaker's voice may be in the center. From that point, thunder the voices which shake all Europe, down below, in silence, are forging the thunderbolts and the firebrands. Penetrating into this huge circuit, where all is out of measure, gigantic, the mind cannot repress some movement of terror and wonder, the imagination recalls those dread temples which poetry, of old, had consecrated to the avenging deities. Scenes too are in this Jacobin amphitheater, had history time for them. Flags of the three free peoples of the universe, trinal brotherly flags of England, America, France, have been waved here in concert. By London deputation, of Whigs or Wise and their club, on this hand, and by young French citizenesses on that. Beautiful sweet-tongued female citizens, who solemnly send over salutation and brotherhood, also tricolor stitched by their own needle, and finally ears of wheat, while the dome rebelos with vivant les trois pupils libres. From all throats, a most dramatic scene. Demoiselle Theroen recites, from that tribune in mid-air, her persecutions in Austria, comes leaning on the arm of Joseph Chenier, poet Chenier, to demand liberty for the hapless Swiss of Chateauvieux. Be of hope, ye forty Swiss, tugging there, in the breast waters, not forgotten. Deputy Brissett pirorates from that tribune, de Moulin, our wicked Camille, interjecting audibly from below, Cokin. Here, though oftener in the Cordeliers, reverberates the lion voice of Danton, grim Billa Varennes is here, call out de Herboys, pleading for the forty Swiss, tearing a passion to rags. Apophthegmatic Manuel winds up in this pithy way, a minister must perish. To which the amphitheater responds, two, two, all, all. But the chief priest and speaker of this place, as we said, is Robespierre, the long-winded incorruptible man. What spirit of patriotism dwelt in men in those times, this one fact, it seems to us, will evince, that fifteen hundred human creatures, not bound to it, sat quiet under the oratory of Robespierre, nay, listen nightly, hour after hour, applausive. And gaped as for the word of life. More insupportable individual, one would say, seldom opened his mouth in any tribune. 
acrid, implacable impotent, dull drawling, barren as the harmattan wind. He pleads, in endless earnest shallow speech, against immediate war, against woolen caps or bonnets rouges, against many things, and is the Trismegistus and Dalai Lama of patriot men. Whom nevertheless a shrill-voiced little man, yet with fine eyes, and a broad beautifully sloping brow, rises respectfully to controvert, he is, say the newspaper reporters, M. Louvet, author of the charming romance of Fabulous. Steady, ye patriots! Pull not yet two ways, with a France rushing panic-stricken in the rural districts, and a Sumerian Europe storming in on you. Chapter 2.5.9 Minister Roland About the vernal equinox, however, one unexpected gleam of hope does burst forth on patriotism, the appointment of a thoroughly patriot ministry. This also His Majesty, among his innumerable experiments of wetting fire to water, will try. Quat bonum sit. Madame Diudon's breakfasts have jingled with a new significance, not even Genevieve's Dumont but had a word in it. Finally, on the 15th and onwards to the 23d day of March, 1792, when all is negotiated, this is the blessed issue. This patriot ministry that we see. General de Maurier, with the foreign portfolio shall ply Kaunitz and the Kaiser, in another style than did poor Delisarts, whom indeed we have sent to our high court of Orleans for his sluggishness. War Minister Narbonne is washed away by the time flood, poor Chevalier de Grave, chosen by the court, is fast washing away, then shall austere servant, able engineer officer, mount suddenly to the war department. Genevieve's clavier sees an old omen realized, passing the finance hotel, long years ago, as a poor Genevieve's exile, it was borne wondrously on his mind that he was to be finance minister, and now he is it. And his poor wife, given up by the doctors, rises and walks, not the victim of nerves but their vanquisher. And above all, our minister of the interior. Roland de la Platriere, he of lions. So have the Brissetins, public or private opinion, and breakfasts in the place Vadome decided it. Strict Roland, compared to a Quaker Endemanche, or Sunday Quaker, goes to kiss hands at the Tilleries, in round hat and sleek hair, his shoes tied with mere ribbon or ferret. The supreme usher twitches de Mourier aside, quoi, monsieur. No buckles to his shoes. Ah, monsieur, answers de Mourier, glancing towards the ferret, all is lost, tout est perdu. And so our fair Roland removes from her upper floor in the Rue Saint-Jacques, to the sumptuous saloons once occupied by Madame Necker. Nay still earlier, it was Calonne that did all this gilding, it was he who ground these lustres, Venetian mirrors. Who polished this inlaying, this veneering in Ormolu, and made it, by rubbing of the proper lamp, an Aladdin's palace, and now behold, he wanders dim flitting over Europe, half drowned in the Rhine stream, scarcely saving his papers. Vos non vobis. Dot, the fair Roland, equal to either fortune, has her public dinner on Fridays, the ministers all there in a body, she withdraws to her desk, the cloth once removed, and seems busy writing. Nevertheless loses no word, if for example Deputy Brissett and Minister Clavier get too hot in argument, she, not without timidity, yet with a cunning gracefulness, will interpose. Deputy Brissett's head, they say, is getting giddy, in this sudden height, as feeble heads do. Envious men insinuate that the wife Roland is minister, and not the husband, it is happily the worst they have to charge her with. For the rest, let whose head soever be getting giddy, it is not this brave woman's. Serene and queenly here, as she was of old in her own hired garret of the Ursuline's convent. She who has quietly shelled French beans for her dinner. Being led to that, as a young maiden, by quiet insight and computation, and knowing what that was, and what she was, such a one will also look quietly on Ormolu and veneering, not ignorant of these either. Calonne did the veneering, he gave dinners here, old Bissenville diplomatically whispering to him, and was great, yet Calonne we saw at last, walk with long strides. Necker next, and where now is Necker? Us also a swift change has brought hither. A swift change will send us hence. Not a palace but a caravanzera. So wags and wavers this unrestful world, day after day, month after month. 
the streets of Paris, and all cities, roll daily their oscillatory flood of men. Which flood does, nightly, disappear, and lie hidden horizontal in beds and truckle beds, and awakes on the morrow to new perpendicularity and movement. Men go their roads, foolish or wise, engineer Gogolat to and fro, bearing Queen Cipher. A Madame de Stahl is busy, cannot clutch her Narbonne from the time flood, a Princess de Lamballe is busy, cannot help her queen. Barnave, seeing the Fuenants dispersed, and Koblenz so brisk, begs by way of final recompense to kiss Her Majesty's hand, augurs not well of her new course, and retires home to Grenoble, to wed an heiress there. The Café Valois and me at the restaurateurs hear daily gasconade, loud babble of half-pay royalists, with or without poniards, remnants of aristocrat saloons call the new ministry minister sans culotte. A louvé, of the romance fablas, is busy in the Jacobins. A kazat, of the romance diabol amuru, is busy elsewhere, better wert thou quiet, old kazat, it is a world, this, of magic become real. All men are busy. Doing they only half guess what, flinging seeds, of tares mostly, into the seed field of time, this, by and by, will declare holy what. But social explosions have in them something dread, and as it were mad and magical, which indeed life always secretly has, thus the dumb earth, says fable, if you pull her mandrake roots, will give a demonic mad-making moan. These explosions and revolts ripen, break forth like dumb dread forces of nature, and yet they are men's forces, and yet we are part of them, the demonic that is in man's life has burst out on us, will sweep us two away. One day here is like another, and yet it is not like but different. How much is growing, silently resistless, at all moments. Thoughts are growing, forms of speech are growing, and customs and even costumes. Still more visibly are actions and transactions growing, and that doomed strife, of France with herself and with the whole world. The word liberty is never named now except in conjunction with another, liberty and equality. In like manner, what, in a reign of liberty and equality, can these words, sir, obedient servant, honor to be, and such like, signify? Tatters and fibers of old feudality. Which, were it only in the grammatical province, ought to be rooted out. The mother society has long since had proposals to that effect, these she could not entertain, not at the moment. Note too how the Jacobin brethren are mounting new symbolical headgear, the woolen cap or nightcap, bonnet de laine, better known as bonnet rouge, the color being red. A thing one wears not only by way of Phrygian cap of liberty, but also for convenience, sake, and then also in compliment to the lower class patriots and bastille heroes, for the red nightcap combines all the three properties. Nay cockades themselves begin to be made of wool, of tricolor yarn, the ribbon cockade, as a symptom of fuel and upper class temper, is becoming suspicious. Signs of the Times Still more, note the travail throes of Europe, or, rather, note the birth she brings. For the successive throes and shrieks, of Austrian and Prussian alliance, of Kaunitz anti-Jacobin dispatch, of French ambassadors cast out, and so forth, were long to note. Du Maurier corresponds with Kaunitz, Metternich, or Cobensel, in another style that Delisarts did. Strict becomes stricter, categorical answer, as to this Koblenz work and much else, shall be given. Failing which? Failing which, on the 20th day of April 1792, King and ministers step over to the Salle de Manege, promulgate how the matter stands, and poor Louis, with tears in his eyes, proposes that the assembly do now decree war. After due eloquence, war is decreed that night. War, indeed. Paris came all crowding, full of expectancy, to the morning, and still more to the evening session. Dorleans with his two sons, is there, looks on, wide-eyed, from the opposite gallery. Thou canst look, O Philippe, it is a war big with issues, for thee and for all men. Cimmerian obscurantism and this thrice glorious revolution shall wrestle for it, then, some four and twenty years, in immeasurable briarious wrestle. Trampling and tearing, before they can come to any, not agreement, but compromise, and approximate ascertainment each of what is in the other. Let our three generals on the frontiers look to it, therefore. 
and poor Chevalier de Grave, the war minister, consider what he will do. What is in the three generals and armies we may guess. As for poor Chevalier de Grave, he, in this whirl of things all coming to oppress and pinch upon him, loses head, and merely whirls with them, in a totally distracted manner, signing himself at last, de Grave, mayor of Paris. Whereupon he demites, returns over the channel, to walk in Kensington Gardens, an austere servant, the able engineer officer, is elevated in his stead. To the post of honor? To that of difficulty, at least. Chapter 2.5.x Pesha National Peak And yet, how, on dark bottomless cataracts there plays the foolishest fantastic colored spray and shadow, hiding the abyss under vapory rainbows. Alongside of this discussion as to Austrian-Prussian war, there goes on no less but more vehemently a discussion, whether the forty or two and forty Swiss of Chateauvieux shall be liberated from the Brest galleys. And then, whether, being liberated, they shall have a public festival, or only private ones. Theroen, as we saw, spoke, and Collot took up the tale. Has not Bolles' final display of himself, in that final night of spurs, stamped your so-called, revolt of Nancy, into a, massacre of Nancy, for all patriot judgments. Hateful is that massacre. Hateful the Lafayette fuelant public thanks given for it. For indeed, Jacobin patriotism and dispersed fuelantism are now at death grips, and do fight with all weapons, even with scenic shows. The walls of Paris, accordingly, are covered with placard and counterplacard, on the subject of forty Swiss blockheads. Journal responds to journal, player call lot to poet Asta Roucher. Joseph Chenier the Jacobin, squire of Theroen, to his brother André the Fuelant, mayor Pechen to Dupont de Nemours, and for the space of two months, there is nowhere peace for the thought of man, till this thing be settled. Gloria in excelsis. The forty Swiss are at last got amnestied. Rejoice ye forty, doff your greasy wool bonnets, which shall become caps of liberty. The Breast Daughter Society welcomes you from on board, with kisses on each cheek, your iron handcuffs are disputed as relics of saints, the Breast Society indeed can have one portion, which it will beat into pikes, a sort of sacred pikes. But the other portion must belong to Paris, and be suspended from the dome there, along with the flags of the three free peoples. Such a goose is man, and cackles over plush velvet grand monarchs and woolen galley slaves. Over everything and over nothing, and will cackle with his whole soul merely if others cackle. On the ninth morning of April, these forty Swiss blockheads arrive. From Versailles, with vivats heaven high, with the affluence of men and women. To the town hall we conduct them, nay to the legislative itself, though not without difficulty. They are harangued, bedenard, begifted, the very court, not for conscience' sake, contributing something. And their public festival shall be next Sunday. Next Sunday accordingly it is. They are mounted into a triumphal car resembling a ship, are carted over Paris, with the clang of cymbals and drums, all mortals assisting applausive. Carted to the Champ de Mars and Fatherland's altar, and finally carted, for time always brings deliverance, into invisibility for evermore. Whereupon dispersed fuelantism, or that party which loves liberty yet not more than monarchy, will likewise have its festival, festival of Simoneau, unfortunate mayor of attempts, who died for the law. Most surely for the law, though Jacobinism disputes, being trampled down with his red flag in the riot about grains. At which festival the public again assists, unapplausive, not we. On the whole, festivals are not wanting. Beautiful rainbow spray when all is now rushing treble quick towards its Niagara fall. National repasts there are, countenanced by Mayor Pechen. Saint Antoine, and the strong ones of the Halleys defiling through Jacobin Club, their felicity, according to Santerre, not perfect otherwise, singing many voiced their CAIRA, dancing their Ronde Patriotique. Among whom one is glad to discern Saint Hurich, expressly, in white hat, the Saint Christopher of the Carmignol. Nay, a certain tambour or national drummer, having just been presented with a little daughter, determines to have the new French woman christened on Fatherland's altar then and there. Repassed once over, he accordingly has her christened. 
fought at the Te Deum Bishop acting in chief, Thuriot and honorable person standing gossips, by the name, Pesha National Peak. Does this remarkable sightiseness, now past the meridian of life, still walk the earth? Or did she die perhaps of teething? Universal history is not indifferent. Chapter 2.5.11 The Hereditary Representative And yet it is not by carmignol dances and singing of C.A.I.R.A. that the work can be done. Duke Brunswick is not dancing carmignols, but has his drill sergeants busy. On the frontiers, our armies, be it treason or not, behave in the worst way. Troops badly commanded, shall we say. Or troops intrinsically bad. Unappointed, undisciplined, mutinous, that, in a thirty years' peace, have never seen fire. In any case, Lafayette's and Rochambeau's little clutch, which they made at Austrian Flanders, has prospered as badly as clutch need do, soldiers starting at their own shadow. Suddenly shrieking, on news trahit, and flying off in wild panic, at or before the first shot. Managing only to hang some two or three prisoners they had picked up, and massacre their own commander, poor Theobald Dillon, driven into a granary by them in the town of Lille. And poor Guvian, he who sat shiftless in that insurrection of women. Guvian quitted the legislative hall and parliamentary duties, in disgust and despair, when those galley slaves of Chateauvieux were admitted there. He said, between the Austrians and the Jacobins there is nothing but a soldier's death for it. And so, in the dark stormy night, he has flung himself into the throat of the Austrian cannon, and perished in the skirmish at Maubeuge on the 9th of June. Whom legislative patriotism shall mourn, with black more cloths and melody in the Chantamars, many a patriot shiftier, truer none. Lafayette himself is looking altogether dubious. In place of beating the Austrians, is about writing to denounce the Jacobins. Rochambeau, all disconsolate, quits the service, there remains only Luckner, the babbling old Prussian grenadier. Without armies, without generals. And the Cimmerian knight has gathered itself, Brunswick preparing his proclamation, just about to march. Let a patriot ministry and legislative say, what in these circumstances it will do. Suppress internal enemies, for one thing, answers the patriot legislative, and proposes, on the 24th of May, its decree for the banishment of priests. Collect also some nucleus of determined internal friends, adds War Minister Servan. And proposes, on the 7th of June, his camp of 20,000. 20,000 national volunteers, five out of each canton, picked patriots, for Roland has charge of the interior, they shall assemble here in Paris. And be for a defense, cunningly devised, against foreign Austrians and domestic Austrian committee alike. So much can a patriot ministry and legislative do. Reasonable and cunningly devised as such camp may, to servant and patriotism, appear, it appears not so to fuelantism, to that fuelant aristocrat staff of the Paris Guard, a staff, one would say again, which will need to be dissolved. These men see, in this proposed camp of servants, an offense, and even, as they pretend to say, an insult. Petitions there come, in consequence, from blue fuenants in epaulets, ill received. Nay, in the end, there comes one petition, called, of the eight thousand national guards so many names are on it, including women and children. Which famed petition of the eight thousand is indeed received, and the petitioners, all under arms, are admitted to the honors of the sitting, if honors or even if sitting there be. For the instant their bayonets appear at the one door, the assembly adjourns, and begins to flow out at the other. Also, in these same days, it is lamentable to see how National Guards, escorting fate due or Corpus Christi ceremonial, do collar and smite down any patriot that does not uncover as the host I passes. They clap their bayonets to the breast of cattle butcher Legendre, a known patriot ever since the Bastille days, and threaten to butcher him. Though he sat quite respectfully, he says, in his gig, at a distance of fifty paces, waiting till the thing were by. Nay, orthodox females were shrieking to have down the lantern on him. To such height has fuelantism gone in this corps. For indeed, are not their officers creatures of the chief fuelant, Lafayette? 
The court too has, very naturally, been tampering with them, caressing them, ever since that dissolution of the so-called Constitutional Guard. Some battalions are altogether, Patrice, needed full, of fuelantism, mere aristocrats at bottom, for instance, the battalion of the Fia St. Thomas, made up of your bankers, stockbrokers, and other full purses of the Rue Vivian. Our worthy old friend Weber, Queen's foster brother Weber, carries a musket in that battalion, one may judge with what degree of patriotic intention. Heedless of all which, or rather heedful of all which, the legislative, backed by patriot France and the feeling of necessity, decrees this camp of twenty thousand. Decisive though conditional banishment of malign priests, it has already decreed. It will now be seen, therefore, whether the hereditary representative is for us or against us. Whether or not, to all our other woes, this intolerablest one is to be added. Which renders us not a menaced nation in extreme jeopardy and need, but a paralytic solecism of a nation, sitting wrapped as in dead sermons, of a constitutional vesture that were no other than a winding sheet. Our right hand glued to our left, to wait there, writhing and wriggling, unable to stir from the spot, till in Prussian rope we mount to the gallows. Let the hereditary representative consider it well, the decree of priests. The camp of twenty thousand, by heaven, he answers, Vito. Vito, strict Roland hands in his letter to the king, or rather it was Madame's letter, who wrote it all at a sitting, one of the plainest spoken letters ever handed in to any king. This plain-spoken letter King Lewis has the benefit of reading overnight. He reads, inwardly digests, and next morning, the whole Patriot ministry finds itself turned out. It is the 13th of June, 1792. Du Maurier the many counseled, he, with one Durant Han, called Minister of Justice, does indeed linger for a day or two, in rather suspicious circumstances, speaks with the Queen, almost weeps with her, but in the end, he too sets off for the army. Leaving what unpatriot or semi-patriot ministry and ministries can now accept the helm, to accept it. Name them not, new quick-changing phantasms, which shift like magic lantern figures, more spectral than ever. Unhappy Queen, unhappy Louis. The two vetoes were so natural, are not the priests martyrs, also friends? This camp of twenty thousand, could it be other than of stormfullest sansculottes? Natural, and yet, to France, unendurable. Priests that cooperate with Koblenz must go elsewhere with their martyrdom, stormful sansculottes, these and no other kind of creatures, will drive back the Austrians. If thou prefer the Austrians, then, for the love of heaven go join them. If not, join frankly with what will oppose them to the death. Middle course is none. Or alas, what extreme course was there left now, for a man like Lewis. Underhand royalists, ex-minister Bertrand Molleville, ex-constituent Malouette, and all manner of unhelpful individuals, advise and advise. With face of hope turned now on the legislative assembly, and now on Austria and Koblenz, and round generally on the chapter of chances, an ancient kingship is reeling and spinning, one knows not whitherward, on the flood of things. Chapter 2.5 12. Procession of the Black Bridges. But is there a thinking man in France who, in these circumstances, can persuade himself that the Constitution will march? Brunswick is stirring, he, in few days now, will march. Shall France sit still, wrapped in dead sermons and grave clothes, its right hand glued to its left, till the Brunswick St. Bartholomew arrive, till France be as Poland, and its rights of man become a Prussian gibbet? Verily, it is a moment frightful for all men. National death, or else some preternatural convulsive outburst of national life, that same, demonic outburst. Patriots whose audacity has limits had, in truth, better retire like Barnave. Court private felicity at Grenoble. Patriots, whose audacity has no limits must sink down into the obscure, and, daring and defying all things, seek salvation in stratagem, in plot of insurrection. Roland and young Barbarous have spread out the map of France before them, Barbarous says, with tears, they consider what rivers, what mountain ranges are in it, they will retire behind this Loire stream, defend these Auvergne stone labyrinths. Save some little sacred territory of the free, 
die at least in their last ditch. Lafayette Indites his emphatic letter to the legislative against Jacobinism, which emphatic letter will not heal the unhealable. Forward, ye patriots whose audacity has no limits, it is you now that must either do or die. The sections of Paris sit in deep council, send out deputation after deputation to the Salle de Manege, to petition and denounce. Great is their ire against Tyrannus Vito, Austrian committee, and the combined Sumerian kings. What boots it? Legislative listens to the toxin in our hearts, grants us honors of the sitting, sees us defile with jingle and fanfaronade. But the camp of twenty thousand, the priest decree, be vetoed by majesty, are become impossible for legislative. Fiery Isnard says, we will have equality, should we descend for it to the tomb. Verdniad utters, hypothetically, his stern Ezekiel visions of the fate of anti-national kings. But the question is, will hypothetic prophecies, will jingle and fanfaronade demolish the veto? Or will the veto, secure in its Tillery's chateau, remain undemolishable by these? Barbarous, dashing away his tears, writes to the Marseilles municipality, that they must send him, six hundred men who know how to die, Cassavant Moore. No wet-eyed message this, but a fire-eyed one, which will be obeyed. Meanwhile the 20th of June is nigh, anniversary of that world-famous oath of the tennis court, on which day, it is said, certain citizens have in view to plant a mai or tree of liberty, in the Tillery's terrace of the Fuenans. Perhaps also to petition the legislative and hereditary representative about these vetoes, with such demonstration, jingle and evolution, as may seem profitable and practicable. Sections have gone singly, and jingled and evolved, but if they all went, or great part of them, and there, planting their might in these alarming circumstances, sounded the toxin in their hearts. Among kings' friends there can be but one opinion as to such a step, among nations' friends there may be two. On the one hand, might it not by possibility scare away these unblessed vetoes? Private patriots and even legislative deputies may have each his own opinion, or own no opinion, but the hardest task falls evidently on Mayor Peschen and the municipals, at once patriots and guardians of the public tranquility. Hushing the matter down with the one hand, tickling it up with the other. Mayor Peschen and municipality may lean this way, department directory with procure syndic rotorer having a fuel and tendency, may lean that. On the whole, each man must act according to his one opinion or to his two opinions, and all manner of influences, official representations cross one another in the foolishest way. Perhaps after all, the project, desirable and yet not desirable, will dissipate itself, being run athwart by so many complexities, and coming to nothing? Not so, on the twentieth morning of June, a large tree of liberty, Lombardy poplar by kind, lies visibly tied on its car, in the suburb Antoine. Suburb St. Marceau too, in the uttermost southeast, and all that remote oriental region, pikemen and pikewomen, national guards, and the unarmed curious are gathering, with the peaceablest intentions in the world. A tricolor municipal arrives. Speaks. Tush, it is all peaceable, we tell thee, in the way of law, are not petitions allowable, and the patriotism of maize? The tricolor municipal returns without effect, your sansculotic rills continue flowing, combining into brooks, towards noontide, led by tall Santerre in blue uniform, by tall St. Eurage in white hat, it moves westward, a respectable river. Or complication of still swelling rivers. What processions have we not seen, Corpus Christi and Legendre waiting in gig, bones of Voltaire with bullet chariots, and goadsmen in Roman costume, feasts of Chateauvieux and Simoneau. Gouvian funerals, Rousseau sham funerals, and the baptism of Pesha National Pike. Nevertheless this procession has a character of its own. Tricolor ribbons streaming aloft from pike heads, iron-shod batons, and emblems not a few. Among which, see specially these two, of the tragic and the untragic sort, a bull's heart transfixed with iron, bearing this epigraph, cur de aristocrate, aristocrat's heart. And, more striking still, properly the standard of the host, a pair of old black breeches, silk, they say, extended on cross staff high overhead, with these memorable words, trembles tyrans, voila les sans 
tremble tyrants. Here are the sands indispensables. Also, the procession trails two cannons. Scarf tricolor municipals do now again meet it, in the Quai Saint Bernard, and plead earnestly, having called halt. Peaceable, ye virtuous tricolor municipals, peaceable are we as the sucking dove. Behold our tennis court my. Petition is legal, and as for arms, did not an August legislative receive the so-called eight thousand in arms, few eminence though they were? Our pikes, are they not of national iron? Law is our father and mother, whom we will not dishonor, but patriotism is our own soul. Peaceable, ye virtuous municipals, and on the whole, limited as to time. Stop we cannot, march ye with us. Dot, the black breeches agitate themselves, impatient. The cannon wheels grumble, the many footed host tramps on. How it reached the Salle de Manege, like an ever waxing river, got admittance, after debate, read its address. And defiled, dancing in CIRNG, led by tall Sonoris Santerre and tall Sonoris Saint Hurich, how it flowed, not now a waxing river but a shut Caspian lake, round all precincts of the Tilleries. The front patriot squeezed by the rearward, against barred iron grates, like to have the life squeezed out of him, and looking too into the dread throat of cannon, for national battalions stand ranked within, how tricolor municipals ran assiduous. And royalists with tickets of entry. And both majesties sat in the interior surrounded by men in black, all this the human mind shall fancy for itself, or read in old newspapers, and syndic rotorers chronicle of fifty days. Our my is planted. If not in the Fuenin's terrace, where there is no ingate, then in the garden of the Capuchins, as near as we could get. National Assembly has adjourned till the evening session, perhaps this shut lake, finding no ingate, will retire to its sources again, and disappear in peace. Alas, not yet, rearward still presses on. Rearward knows little what pressure is in the front. One would wish at all events, were it possible, to have a word with His Majesty first. The shadows fall longer, eastward, it is four o'clock, will His Majesty not come out? Hardly he. In that case, Commandant Santerre, Cattle Butcher Legendre, Patriot Huguenin with the toxin in his heart, they, and others of authority, will enter in. Petition and request to wearied uncertain National Guard, louder and louder petition. Backed by the rattle of our two cannons. The reluctant grate opens, endless sans culottic multitudes flood the stairs, knock at the wooden guardian of your privacy. Knocks, in such case, grow strokes, grow smashings, the wooden guardian flies in shivers. And now ensues a scene over which the world has long wailed, and not unjustly. For a sorrier spectacle, of incongruity fronting incongruity, and as it were recognizing themselves incongruous, and staring stupidly in each other's face, the world seldom saw. King Louis, his door being beaten on, opens it, stands with free bosom. Asking, what do you want? The sans culottic flood recoils awestruck, returns however, the rear pressing on the front, with cries of veto. Patriot ministers. Remove veto. Which things, Louis valiantly answers, this is not the time to do, nor this the way to ask him to do. Honor what virtue is in a man. Louis does not want courage. He has even the higher kind called moral courage, though only the passive half of that. His few national grenadiers shuffle back with him, into the embrasure of a window, there he stands, with unimpeachable passivity, amid the shouldering and the brain, a spectacle to men. They hand him a red cap of liberty. He sets it quietly on his head, forgets it there. He complains of thirst, half-drunk rascality offers him a bottle, he drinks of it. Sire, do not fear, says one of his grenadiers. Fear. Answers Louis, feel then, putting the man's hand on his heart. So stands Majesty in red woolen cap, black sansculottism weltering round him, far and wide, aimless, with inarticulate dissonance, with cries of veto. Patriot ministers. For the space of three hours or more. The National Assembly is adjourned, tricolor municipals avail almost nothing, Mayor Peschen absent, authority is none. 
the queen with her children and sister Elizabeth, in tears and terror not for themselves only, are sitting behind barricaded tables and grenadiers in an inner room. The men in black have all wisely disappeared. Blind lake of sansculottism welters stagnant through the king's chateau, for the space of three hours. Nevertheless all things do end. Verdniad arrives with legislative deputation, the evening session having now opened. Mayor Peshin has arrived. Is haranguing, lifted on the shoulders of two grenadiers. In this uneasy attitude and in others, at various places without and within, Mayor Peshin harangues, many men harangue, finally Commandant Santer defile. Passes out, with his sansculottism, by the opposite side of the chateau. Passing through the room where the queen, with an air of dignity and sorrowful resignation, sat among the tables and grenadiers, a woman offers her to a red cap. She holds it in her hand, even puts it on the little prince royal. Madam, said Santerre, this people loves you more than you think. About eight o'clock the royal family fall into each other's arms amid torrents of tears. Unhappy family! Who would not weep for it? were there not a whole world to be wept for. Thus has the age of chivalry gone, and that of hunger come. Thus does all needing sansculottism look in the face of its roy, regulator, king or ableman. And find that he has nothing to give it. Thus do the two parties, brought face to face after long centuries, stare stupidly at one another, this, verily, am I, but, good heaven, is that thou, and depart, not knowing what to make of it. And yet, incongruities having recognized themselves to be incongruous, something must be made of it. The fates know what. This is the world-famous 20th of June, more worthy to be called the procession of the black breeches. With which, what we had to say of this first French biennial parliament, and its products and activities, may perhaps fitly enough terminate. Book 2.VI The Marseillaise Chapter 2.6.I Executive that does not act. How could your paralytic national executive be put, in action, in any measure, by such a 20th of June as this? Quite contrarywise, a large sympathy for majesty so insulted arises everywhere. Expresses itself in addresses, petitions, petition of the 20,000 inhabitants of Paris, and such like, among all constitutional persons, a decided rallying round the throne of which rallying it was thought King Louis might have made something. However, he does make nothing of it, or attempt to make. For indeed his views are lifted beyond domestic sympathy and rallying, over to Koblenz mainly, neither in itself is the same sympathy worth much. It is sympathy of men who believe still that the constitution can march. Wherefore the old discord and ferment, of fuelant sympathy for royalty, and Jacobin sympathy for fatherland, acting against each other from within. With terror of Koblenz and Brunswick acting from without, this discord and ferment must hold on its course, till a catastrophe do ripen and come. One would think, especially as Brunswick is near marching, such catastrophe cannot now be distant. Busy, ye twenty-five French millions, ye foreign potentates, minatory emigrants, German drill sergeants, each do what his hand findeth. Thou, O reader, at such safe distance, wilt see what they make of it among them. Consider therefore this pitiable 20th of June as a futility, no catastrophe, rather a catastasis, or heightening. Do not its black breeches wave there, in the historical imagination, like a melancholy flag of distress. Soliciting help, which no mortal can give. Soliciting pity, which thou wert hard-hearted not to give freely, to one and all. Other such flags, or what are called occurrences, and black or bright symbolic phenomena, will flit through the historical imagination, these, one after one, let us note, with extreme brevity. The first phenomenon is that of Lafayette at the bar of the assembly, after a week and day. Promptly, on hearing of this scandalous 20th of June, Lafayette has quitted his command on the north frontier, in better or worse order, and got hither, on the 28th, to repress the Jacobins, not by letter now, but by oral petition and weight of character, face to face. The August Assembly finds the step questionable, invites him meanwhile to the honours of the sitting. 
Other honor, or advantage, there unhappily came almost none. The galleries all growling, fiery isner glooming, sharp guadet not wanting in sarcasms. And out of doors, when the sitting is over, Sieur Rezson, keeper of the Patriot Café in these regions, hears in the street a hurly-burly. Steps forth to look, he and his Patriot customers, it is Lafayette's carriage, with a tumultuous escort of blue grenadiers, cannoneers, even officers of the line, hurrahing and capering round it. They make a pause opposite Sieur Resson's door. Wag their plumes at him, nay shake their fists, bellowing a bas less Jacobins. But happily pass on without onslaught. They pass on, to plant a mic before the general's door, and bully considerably. All which the Sieur Resson cannot but report with sorrow, that night, in the mother society. But what no Sieur Resson nor mother society can do more than guess is this, that a council of rank fuinance, your unabolished staff of the guard and who else has status and weight, is in these very moments privily deliberating at the generals, can we not put down the Jacobins by force? Next day, a review shall be held, in the Tillery's garden, of such as will turn out, and try. Alas, says Talonjan, hardly a hundred turned out. Put it off till tomorrow, then, to give better warning. On the morrow, which is Saturday, there turn out, some thirty, and depart shrugging their shoulders. Lafayette promptly takes carriage again, returns musing on many things. The dust of Paris is hardly off his wheels, the summer Sunday is still young, when Cordeliers in deputation pluck up that my of his, before sunset, patriots have burnt him in effigy. Louder doubt and louder rises, in section, in national assembly, as to the legality of such unbidden anti-Jacobin visit on the part of a general, doubt swelling and spreading all over France. For six weeks or so, with endless talk about usurping soldiers, about English monk, nay about Cromwell, O thou poor Grandison Cromwell! What boots it? King Louis himself looked coldly on the enterprise, colossal hero of two worlds, having weighed himself in the balance, finds that he has become a gossamer colossus, only some thirty turning out. In a like sense, and with a like issue, works our department directory here at Paris. Who, on the 6th of July, take upon them to suspend Mayor Pechon and procure Manuel from all civic functions, for their conduct, replete, as is alleged, with omissions and commissions, on that delicate 20th of June. Virtuous Pechon sees himself a kind of martyr, or pseudo-martyr, threatened with several things, draws out due heroical lamentation, to which Patriot Paris and Patriot Legislative duly respond. King Louis and Mayor Pechon have already had an interview on that business of the 20th, an interview in dialogue, distinguished by frankness on both sides, ending on King Louis's side with the words, Taisez vous, hold your peace. For the rest, this of suspending our mayor does seem a mistimed measure. By ill chance, it came out precisely on the day of that famous Bazer de l'Amourette, or miraculous reconciliatory Delilachis, which we spoke of long ago. Which Delilachis was thereby quite hindered of effect. For now His Majesty has to write, almost that same night, asking a reconciled assembly for advice. The reconciled assembly will not advise, will not interfere. The king confirms the suspension, then perhaps, but not till then will the assembly interfere, the noise of patriot Paris getting loud. Whereby your Delilah kiss, such was the destiny of Parliament first, becomes a Philistine battle. Nay there goes a word that as many as thirty of our chief patriot senators are to be clapped in prison, by mit imus an indictment of fuel and justices, jugs to pakes, who here in Paris were well capable of such a thing. It was but in May last that Jugues de Pakes La Riviere, on complaint of Bertrand Molleville touching that Austrian committee, made bold to launch his mit imus against three heads of the mountain, deputies Bazire, Chabot, Merlin, the Cordelier trio. Summoning them to appear before him, and shew where that Austrian committee was, or else suffer the consequences. Which mit imus the trio, on their side, made bold to fling in the fire, and valiantly pleaded privilege of Parliament. So that, for his zeal without knowledge, poor Justice La Riviere now sits in the prison of Orleans, waiting trial from the haute cour there. Whose example, may it not deter other rash justices? 
and so this word of the thirty arrestments continue a word merely. But on the whole, though Lafayette weighed so light, and has had his might plucked up, official fuelantism falters not a whit. But carries its head high, strong in the letter of the law. Fuenants all of these men, a fuelant directory, founding on high character, and such like, with Duke de la Rochefoucauld for president, a thing which may prove dangerous for him. Dim now is the once bright Anglomania of these admired noblemen. Duke de Lioncourt offers, out of Normandy where he is Lord Lieutenant, not only to receive his majesty, thinking of flight thither, but to lend him money to enormous amounts. Sire, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution, and truly no rosewater one. Worthier noblemen were not in France nor in Europe than those two, but the time is crooked, quick-shifting, perverse, what straightest course will lead to any goal, in it? Another phasis which we note, in these early July days, is that of certain thin streaks of federate national volunteers wending from various points towards Paris, to hold a new federation festival, or Feast of Pikes, on the 14th there. So has the National Assembly wished it, so has the nation willed it. In this way, perhaps, may we still have our patriot camp in spite of veto. For cannot these faders, having celebrated their Feast of Pikes, march on to Soissons? And, they're being drilled and regimented, rush to the frontiers, or whither we like. Thus were the one veto cunningly eluded. As indeed the other veto, about priests, is also like to be eluded, and without much cunning. For provincial assemblies, in Calvados as one instance, are proceeding on their own strength to judge and banish anti-national priests. Or still worse without provincial assembly, a desperate people, as at Bordeaux, can hang two of them on the lantern, on the way towards judgment. Pity for the spoken veto, when it cannot become an acted one. It is true, some ghost of a war minister, or home minister, for the time being, ghost whom we do not name, does write to municipalities and king's commanders, that they shall, by all conceivable methods, obstruct this federation. And even turn back the faders by force of arms, a message which scatters mere doubt, paralysis and confusion. Irritates the poor legislature, reduces the faders as we see, to thin streaks. But being questioned, this ghost and the other ghosts, what it is then that they propose to do for saving the country, they answer, that they cannot tell. That indeed they for their part have, this morning, resigned in a body, and do now merely respectfully take leave of the helm altogether. With which words they rapidly walk out of the hall, sort and brusquement de la salle, the galleries cheering loudly, the poor legislature sitting, for a good while in silence. Thus do cabinet ministers themselves, in extreme cases, strike work. One of the strangest omens. Other complete cabinet ministry there will not be, only fragments, and these changeful, which never get completed, spectral apparitions that cannot so much as appear. King Lewis writes that he now views this federation feast with approval, and will himself have the pleasure to take part in the same. And so these thin streaks of faders when Paris ward through a paralytic France. Thin grim streaks. Not thick joyful ranks, as of old to the first feast of pikes. No, these poor federates march now towards Austria and Austrian committee, towards jeopardy and forlorn hope, men of hard fortune and temper, not rich in the world's goods. Municipalities, paralyzed by war ministers, are shy of affording cash, it may be, your poor federates cannot arm themselves, cannot march, till the daughter society of the place open her pocket, and subscribe. There will not have arrived, at the set day, three thousand of them in all. And yet, thin and feeble as these streaks of federates seem, they are the only thing one discerns moving with any clearness of aim, in this strange scene. Angry buzz and simmer, uneasy tossing and moaning of a huge France, all enchanted, spellbound by unmarching constitution, into frightful conscious and unconscious magnetic sleep. Which frightful magnetic sleep must now issue soon in one of two things, death or madness. The faders carry mostly in their pocket some earnest cry and petition, to have the national executive put in action. Or as a step towards that, to have the king's decheance, king's forfeiture, or at least his suspension, pronounced. They shall be welcome to the legislative, to the mother of patriotism, 
and Paris will provide for their lodging. Dechiens, indeed, and, what next? A France spell free, a revolution saved, and anything, and all things next. So answer grimly Danton and the unlimited patriots, down deep in their subterranean region of plot, whither they have now dived. Dechiens, answers Brissett with the limited, and if next the little prince royal were crowned, and some regency of Girondins and recalled patriot ministry set over him. Alas, poor Brissett. Looking, as indeed poor man does always, on the nearest morrow as his peaceable promised land, deciding what must reach to the world's end, yet with an insight that reaches not beyond his own nose. Wiser are the unlimited subterranean patriots, who with light for the hour itself, leave the rest to the gods. Or were it not, as we now stand, the probablest issue of all, that Brunswick, in Koblenz, just gathering his huge limbs towards him to rise, might arrive first, and stop both to Chiens, and theorizing on it. Brunswick is on the eve of marching. With eighty thousand, they say, fell Prussians, Hessians, feller emigrants, a general of the great Frederick, with such an army. And our armies? And our generals? As for Lafayette, on whose late visit a committee is sitting and all France is jarring and censuring, he seems readier to fight us than fight Brunswick. Luckner and Lafayette pretend to be interchanging corps, and are making movements. Which patriotism cannot understand. This only is very clear, that their corps go marching and shuttling, in the interior of the country, much nearer Paris than formerly. Luckner has ordered de Mourier down to him, down from Mald, and the fortified camp there. Which order the many counseled de Mourier, with the Austrians hanging close on him, he busy meanwhile training a few thousands to stand fire and be soldiers, declares that, come of it what will, he cannot obey. Will a poor legislative, therefore, sanction de Mourier, who applies to it, not knowing whether there is any war ministry? Or sanction Luckner and these Lafayette movements? The poor legislative knows not what to do. It decrees, however, that the staff of the Paris Guard, and indeed all such staffs, for they are fuinants mostly, shall be broken and replaced. It decrees earnestly in what manner one can declare that the country is in danger. And finally, on the 11th of July, the morrow of that day when the ministry struck work, it decrees that the country be, with all dispatch, declared in danger. Whereupon let the king sanction. Let the municipality take measures, if such declaration will do service, it need not fail. In danger, truly, if ever country was. Arise, O country, or be trodden down to ignominious ruin. Nay, are not the chances a hundred to one that no rising of the country will save it, Brunswick, the emigrants, and feudal Europe drawing nigh? Chapter 2.6.2 let us march. But to our minds the notablest of all these moving phenomena, is that of Barbarouza's six hundred Marseillese who know how to die. Prompt to the request of Barbarous, the Marseilles municipality has got these men together, on the fifth morning of July, the town hall says, Marche, Abates le tyrant, march, strike down the tyrant. And they, with grim appropriate marchands, are marching. Long journey, doubtful errand, and fans de la patterie, may a good genius guide you. Their own wild heart and what faith it has will guide them, and is not that the monition of some genius, better or worse. 517 able men, with captains of fifties and tens. Well armed all, musket on shoulder, sabre on thigh, nay they drive three pieces of cannon, for who knows what obstacles may occur. Municipalities there are, paralyzed by war minister, Commandants with orders to stop even Federation volunteers. Good, when sound arguments will not open a town gate, if you have a petard to shiver it. They have left their sunny Phocian city in Sea Haven, with its bustle and its bloom, the thronging course, with high frondent avenues, pitchy dockyards, almond and olive groves, orange trees on housetops. And white glittering bastides that crown the hills are all behind them. They wend on their wild way from the extremity of French land, through unknown cities, toward an unknown destiny, with a purpose that they know. Much wondering at this phenomenon, and how, in a peaceable trading city, 
so many householders or hearthholders do severally fling down their crafts and industrial tools. Gird themselves with weapons of war, and set out on a journey of six hundred miles to strike down the tyrant, you search in all historical books, pamphlets, and newspapers, for some light on it, unhappily without effect. Rumor and terror precede this march, which still echo on you, the march itself an unknown thing. Weber, in the back stairs of the Tilleries, has understood that they were four cats, galley slaves and mere scoundrels, these Marseillaise. That, as they marched through Lyons, the people shut their shops, also that the number of them was some four thousand. Equally vague is Blanc Gilly, who likewise murmurs about four cats and danger of plunder. Four cats they were not. Neither was there plunder, or danger of it. Men of regular life, or of the best filled purse, they could hardly be, the one thing needful in them was that they knew how to die. Friend Damp Martin saw them, with his own eyes, march, gradually, through his quarters at Villefranche in the Beaujolais, but saw in the vaguest manner, being indeed preoccupied, and himself minded for matching just then, across the Rhine. Deep was his astonishment to think of such a march, without appointment or arrangement, station or ration, for the rest it was, the same men he had seen formerly, in the troubles of the South, perfectly civil. Though his soldiers could not be kept from talking a little with them. So vague are all these, moniteur, histoire parlementaire are as good as silent, garrulous history, as is too usual, will say nothing where you most wish her to speak. If enlightened curiosity ever gets sight of the Marseilles council books, will it not perhaps explore this strangest of municipal procedures? And feel called to fish up what of the biographies, creditable or discreditable, of these 517, the stream of time has not yet irrevocably swallowed. As it is, these Marseillaise remain inarticulate, undistinguishable in feature, a black-browed mass, full of grim fire, who went there, in the hot sultry weather, very singular to contemplate. They wend, amid the infinitude of doubt and dim peril. They not doubtful, fate and feudal Europe, having decided, come girdling in from without, they, having also decided, do march within. Dusty of face, with frugal refreshment, they plod onwards, unweariable, not to be turned aside. Such march will become famous. The thought, which works voiceless in this black-browed mass, an inspired Turtian colonel, Rouget de Lille, whom the earth still holds, has translated into grim melody and rhythm. Into his hymn or march of the Marseillaise, luckiest musical composition ever promulgated. The sound of which will make the blood tingle in men's veins. And whole armies and assemblages will sing it, with eyes weeping and burning, with hearts defiant of death, despot and devil. One sees well, these Marseillaise will be too late for the Federation feast. In fact, it is not Champ de Mars' oaths that they have in view. They have quite another feat to do, a paralytic national executive to set in action. They must strike down whatsoever tyrant or martyr feignant there may be who paralyzes it. Strike and be struck, and on the whole prosper and know how to die. Chapter 2.6.3 some consolation to mankind. Of the Federation feast itself we shall say almost nothing. There are tents pitched in the Champ de Mars. Tent for National Assembly, tent for hereditary representative, who indeed is there too early, and has to wait long in it. There are eighty-three symbolical departmental trees of liberty. Trees and maize enough, beautifulest of all these is one huge my, hung round with effete scutcheons, emblazonries and genealogy books, nay better still, with lawyers' bags, sacks to procedure which shall be burnt. The thirty seat rows of that famed slope are again full, we have a bright sun, and all is marching, streamering and blaring, but what avails it? Virtuous Mayor Peschen, whom feulentism had suspended, was reinstated only last night, by decree of the Assembly. Men's humour is of the sourest. Men's hats have on them, written in chalk, vive Peschen. And even, Peschen or death, Peschen o you la mort. Poor Louis, who has waited till five o'clock before the assembly would arrive, swears the national oath this time, with a quilted cuirass under his waistcoat which will turn pistol bullets. Madame de Stahl, from that royal tent, 
stretches out the neck in a kind of agony, lest the waving multitudes which receive him may not render him back alive. No cry of vive le roi salutes the ear, cries only of vive passion, passion o you la mort. The national solemnity is as it were huddled by, each cowering off almost before the evolutions are gone through. The very my with its scutcheons and lawyers' bags is forgotten, stands unburnt. Till, certain patriot deputies, called by the people, set a torch to it, by way of voluntary afterpiece. Sadder feast of pikes no man ever saw. Mayor Peschen, named on hats, is at his zenith in this federation. Lafayette again is close upon his nadir. Why does the storm bell of St. Rock speak out, next Saturday, why do the citizens shut their shops? It is sections defiling, it is fear of effervescence. Legislative Committee, long deliberating on Lafayette and that anti-Jacobin visit of his, reports, this day, that there is, not ground for accusation. Peace, ye patriots, nevertheless. And let that toxin cease, the debate is not finished, nor the report accepted, but Brissett, Isnard, and the mountain will sift it, and re-sift it, perhaps for some three weeks longer. So many bells, storm bells and noises do ring, scarcely audible. One drowning the other. For example, in this same Lafayette toxin, of Saturday, was there not withal some faint Bob Minor, and deputation of legislative, ringing the Chevalier Paul Jones to his long rest, toxin or dirge now all one to him. Not ten days hence Patriot Brissett, beshouted this day by the Patriot galleries, shall find himself begrown by them, on account of his limited patriotism, nay pelted at while perorating, and hit with two prunes. It is a distracted empty-sounding world, of Bob Miners and Bob Majors, of triumph and terror, of rise and fall. The more touching is this other solemnity, which happens on the morrow of the Lafayette toxin, proclamation that the country is in danger. Not till the present Sunday could such solemnity be. The legislative decreed it almost a fortnight ago. But royalty and the ghost of a ministry held back as they could. Now however, on this Sunday, 22nd day of July 1792, it will hold back no longer, and the solemnity in very deed is. Touching to behold. Municipality and mayor have on their scarfs. Cannon salvo booms alarm from the Pont Neuf, and single gun at intervals all day. Guards are mounted, scarfed notabilities, halberdiers, and a cavalcade, with streamers, emblematic flags. Especially with one huge flag, flapping mournfully, citoyens, la patrie est en danger. They roll through the streets, with stern sounding music, and slow rattle of hoofs, pausing at set stations, and with doleful blast of trumpet, singing out through herald's throat, what the flag says to the eye, citizens, the country is in danger. Is there a man's heart that hears it without a thrill? The many-voiced responsive hum or bellow of these multitudes is not of triumph, and yet it is a sound deeper than triumph. But when the long cavalcade and proclamation ended, and our huge flag was fixed on the Pont Neuf, another like it on the Hotel de Ville, to wave there till better days. And each municipal sat in the center of his section, in a tent raised in some open square, tent surmounted with flags of pattery and danger, and topmost of all a pike and bonnet rouge. And, on two drums in front of him, there lay a plank table, and on this an open book, and a clerk sat, like recording angel, ready to write the lists, or as we say to enlist. Oh, then, it seems, the very gods might have looked down on it. Young patriotism, colotic and sansculotic, rushes forward emulous, that is my name, name, blood, and life, is all my country's, why have I nothing more? Youths of short stature weep that they are below size. Old men come forward, a son in each hand. Mothers themselves will grant the son of their travail, send him, though with tears. And the multitude bellows vive la patery, far reverberating. And fire flashes in the eyes of men. And at eventide, your municipal returns to the town hall, followed by his long train of volunteer valor, hands in his list, says proudly, looking round. This is my day's harvest. They will march, on the morrow, to Soissons. Small bundle holding all their chattels. 
So, with Vive la Patrie, Vive la Liberté, Stone Paris reverberates like ocean in his caves, day after day, municipals enlisting in tricolor tent. The flag flapping on Pont Neuf and Town Hall, Citoyens, La Patrie est en danger. Some 10,000 fighters, without discipline but full of heart, are on march in few days. The like is doing in every town of France. Consider therefore whether the country will want defenders, had we but a national executive? Let the sections and primary assemblies, at any rate, become permanent, and sit continually in Paris, and over France, by legislative decree dated Wednesday the 25th. Mark contrarywise how, in these very hours, dated the 25th, Brunswick shakes himself s Abranel, in Koblenz, and takes the road. Shakes himself indeed, one spoken word becomes such a shaking. Successive, simultaneous dirl of thirty thousand muskets shouldered, prance and jingle of ten thousand horsemen, fanfarinating emigrants in the van, drum, kettle drum, noise of weeping, swearing. And the immeasurable lumbering clank of baggage wagons and camp kettles that groan into motion, all this is Brunswick shaking himself, not without all this does the one man march, covering a space of forty miles. Still less without his manifesto, dated, as we say, the twenty fifth, a state paper worthy of attention. By this document, it would seem great things are in store for France. The universal French people shall now have permission to rally round Brunswick and his emigrant seigneurs, tyranny of a Jacobin faction shall oppress them no more, but they shall return, and find favour with their own good king. Who, by royal declaration, three years ago, of the 23rd of June, said that he would himself make them happy. As for National Assembly, and other bodies of men invested with some temporary shadow of authority, they are charged to maintain the king's cities and strong places intact, till Brunswick arrive to take delivery of them. Indeed, quick submission may extenuate many things, but to this end it must be quick. Any National Guard or other unmilitary person found resisting in arms shall be treated as a traitor, that is to say, hanged with promptitude. For the rest, if Paris, before Brunswick gets thither, offer any insult to the king, or, for example, suffer a faction to carry the king away elsewhither, in that case Paris shall be blasted asunder with cannon shot and military execution. Likewise all other cities, which may witness, and not resist to the uttermost, such forced march of his majesty, shall be blasted asunder. And Paris and every city of them, starting place, course and goal of said sacrilegious forced march, shall, as rubbish and smoking ruin, lie there for a sign. Such vengeance were indeed signal, an insignia vengeance, O Brunswick, what words thou writest and blusterest. In this Paris, as in old Nineveh, are so many score thousands that know not the right hand from the left, and also much cattle. Shall the very milk cows, hard living cadgers asses, and poor little canary birds die? Nor is royal and imperial Prussian Austrian declaration wanting, setting forth, in the amplest manner, their Sansusi Schönbrunn version of this whole French Revolution, since the first beginning of it. And with what grief these high heads have seen such things done under the sun, however, as some small consolation to mankind, they do now dispatch Brunswick, regardless of expense, as one might say, of sacrifices on their own part. For is it not the first duty to console men? Serene Highnesses, who sit there protocoling and manifestoing, and consoling mankind. How were it if, for once in a thousand years, your parchments, formularies, and reasons of state were blown to the four winds, and reality sans indispensables stared you, even you, in the face. And mankind said for itself what the thing was that would console it. Chapter 2.6.4 Subterranean But judge if there was comfort in this to the sections all sitting permanent, deliberating how a national executive could be put in action. High rises the response, not of cackling terror, but of crowing counter-defiance, and vive la nation, young valor streaming towards the frontiers, pattery and danger mutely beckoning on the Pont Neuf. Sections are busy, in their permanent deep. And down, lower still, works unlimited patriotism, seeking salvation in plot. Insurrection, you would say, becomes once more the sacredest of duties. Committee, 
self-chosen, is sitting at the sign of the Golden Sun, journalist Cara, Camille de Moulin, Alsatian Westerman friend of Danton, American Fournier of Martinique. A committee not unknown to Mayor Peschen, who, as an official person, must sleep with one eye open. Not unknown to procure Manuel, least of all to procure substitute Danton. He, wrapped in darkness, being also official, bears it on his giant shoulder, cloudy invisible atlas of the whole. Much is invisible, the very Jacobins have their reticences. Insurrection is to be, but when? This only we can discern, that such faders as are not yet gone to Soissons, as indeed are not inclined to go yet, for reasons, says the Jacobin president, which it may be interesting not to state, have got a central committee sitting close by. Under the roof of the mother society herself. Also, what in such ferment and danger of effervescence is surely proper, the forty-eight sections have got their central committee, intended for prompt communication. To which central committee the municipality, anxious to have it at hand, could not refuse an apartment in the Hotel de Ville. Singular city. For overhead of all this, there is the customary baking and brewing, labor hammers and grinds. Frilled promenaders saunter under the trees. White muslin promenaderess, in green parasol, leaning on your arm. Dogs dance, and shoe blacks polish, on that Pont Neuf itself, where fatherland is in danger. So much goes its course. And yet the course of all things is nigh altering and ending. Look at that Tillery's and Tillery's garden. Silent all as Sahara, none entering save by ticket. They shut their gates, after the day of the black breeches. A thing they had the liberty to do. However, the National Assembly grumbled something about Terrace of the Fuenans, how said Terrace lay contiguous to the back entrance to their sow, and was partly national property. And so now national justice has stretched a tricolor ribbon athwart, by way of boundary line, respected with splenetic strictness by all patriots. It hangs there that tricolor boundary line. Carries satirical inscriptions on cards, generally in verse, and all beyond this is called Koblenz, and remains vacant, silent, as a fateful Golgotha, sunshine and umbrage alternating on it in vain. Fateful circuit, what hope can dwell in it? Mysterious tickets of entry introduce themselves, speak of insurrection very imminent. Riverall's staff of genius had better purchase blunderbusses, grenadier bonnets, red Swiss uniforms may be useful. Insurrection will come. But likewise will it not be met. Staved off, one may hope, till Brunswick arrive. But consider with all if the born stones and portable chairs remain silent, if the Herald's College of Bill Stickers sleep. Louvet's sentinel warns gratis on all walls, Sullo is busy, people's friend Marat and king's friend Royu croak and counter croak. For the man Marat, though long hidden since that Champ de Mars massacre, is still alive. He has lain, who knows in what cellars, perhaps in Legendre's, fed by a stake of Legendre's killing, but, since April, the bullfrog voice of him sounds again, hoarsest of earthly cries. For the present, black terror haunts him, O oh brave Barbarous wilt thou not smuggle me to Marseilles, disguised as a jockey? In Polaroyal and all public places, as we read, there is sharp activity. Private individuals haranguing that valor may enlist, haranguing that the executive may be put in action. Royalist journals ought to be solemnly burnt, argument thereupon, debates which generally end in single stick, coups de can. Or think of this, the hour midnight, place salle de manege, August assembly just adjourning, citizens of both sexes enter in a rush exclaiming, vengeance, they are poisoning our brothers, baking braid glass among their bread at Soissons. Vergniaud has to speak soothing words, how commissioners are already sent to investigate this braid glass, and do what is needful therein, till the rush of citizens makes profound silence and goes home to its bed. Such is Paris. The heart of a France like to it. Preternatural suspicion, doubt, disquietude, nameless anticipation, from shore to shore, and those black-browed Marseillaise, marching, dusty, unwearied, through the midst of it, not doubtful they. Marching to the grim music of their hearts, they consume continually the long road, these three weeks and more, heralded by terror and rumor. 
The breastfaders arrive on the 26th, through hurrying streets. Determined men are these also, bearing or not bearing the sacred pikes of Chateauvieux, and on the whole decidedly disinclined for Soissons as yet. Surely the Marseillese brethren do draw nigher all days. Chapter 2.6.V At dinner. It was a bright day for Charenton, that 29th of the month, when the Marseillese brethren actually came in sight. Barbaros, Santerre and Patriots have gone out to meet the grim wayfarers. Patriot clasps dusty Patriot to his bosom. There is foot washing and refection, dinner of twelve hundred covers at the blue dial, cadran blue, and deep interior consultation, that one what's not of. Consultation indeed which comes to little. For Santerre, with an open purse, with a loud voice, has almost no head. Here however we repose this night, on the morrow is public entry into Paris. On which public entry the day historians, diurnalists, or journalists as they call themselves, have preserved record enough. How Saint Antoine male and female, and Paris generally, gave brotherly welcome, with bravo and hand clapping, in crowded streets, and all passed in the peaceablest manner. Except it might be our Marseillaise pointed out here and there a ribbon cockade, and beckoned that it should be snatched away, and exchanged for a wool one, which was done. How the mother society in a body has come as far as the Bastille ground, to embrace you. How you then wend onwards, triumphant, to the town hall, to be embraced by Mayor Pession. To put down your muskets in the barracks of Nouvelle France, not far off, then towards the appointed tavern in the Champs Elysees to enjoy a frugal patriot repast. Of all which the indignant Tilleries may, by its tickets of entry, have warning. Red Swiss look doubly sharp to their chateau grates, though surely there is no danger. Blue grenadiers of the Fia St. Thomas section are on duty there this day, men of Agio, as we have seen, with stuffed purses, ribbon cockades. Among whom serves Weber. A party of these latter, with captains, with sundry fuelant notabilities, Moreau de St. Mary of the Three Thousand Orders, and others, have been dining, much more respectably, in a tavern hard by. They have dined, and are now drinking loyal patriotic toasts, while the Marseillaise, national patriotic merely, are about sitting down to their frugal covers of Delph. How it happened remains to this day undemonstrable, but the external fact is, certain of these Fia St. Thomas grenadiers do issue from their tavern, perhaps touched, surely not yet muddled with any liquor they have had. Issue in the professed intention of testifying to the Marseillaise, or to the multitude of Paris patriots who stroll in these spaces, that they, the Fia St. Thomas men, if well seen into, are not a whit less patriotic than any other class of men whatever. It was a rash errand. For how can the strolling multitudes credit such a thing, or do other indeed than hoot at it, provoking, and provoked? Till grenadier sabres stir in the scabbard, and a sharp shriek rises, A nous Marseillaise, help Marseillaise. Quick as lightning, for the frugal repast is not yet served, that Marseillaise tavern flings itself open, by door, by window. Running, bounding, vault forth the 517 undeemed patriots, and, sabre flashing from thigh, are on the scene of controversy. Will ye parley, ye grenadier captains and official persons? With faces grown suddenly pale, the deponents say. Advisabler were instant moderately swift retreat. The Fia St. Thomas retreat, back foremost, then, alas, face foremost, at treble quick time. The Marseillaise, according to a deponent, clearing the fences and ditches after them like lions, messers, it was an imposing spectacle. Thus they retreat, the Marseillaise following. Swift and swifter, towards the Tilleries, where the drawbridge receives the bulk of the fugitives, and, then suddenly drawn up, saves them or else the green mud of the ditch does it. The bulk of them, not all, ah, no. Moreau de St. Mary for example, being too fat, could not fly fast, he got a stroke, flat stroke only, over the shoulder blades, and fell prone, and disappears there from the history of the revolution. Cuts also there were, pricks in the posterior fleshy parts, much rending of skirts, and other discrepant waste. But poor sub-lieutenant Duhamel, innocent change-broker, what a lot for him. He turned on his pursuer, 
or pursuers, with a pistol. He fired and missed, drew a second pistol, and again fired and missed, then ran, unhappily in vain. In the Rue Saint Florentine, they clutched him, thrust him through, in red rage, that was the end of the new era, and of all eras, to poor Duhamel. Pacific readers can fancy what sort of grace before meat this was to frugal patriotism. Also how the battalion of the Fia St. Thomas, drew out in arms, luckily without further result. How there was accusation at the bar of the assembly, and counter-accusation and defense, Marcellese challenging the sentence of free jury court, which never got to a decision. We ask rather, what the upshot of all these distracted wildly accumulating things may, by probability, be? Some upshot, and the time draws nigh. Busy are central committees, of faders at the Jacobin's church, of sections at the town hall. Reunion of Kara, Camille and company at the Golden Sun busy, like submarine deities, or call them mud gods, working there in the deep murk of waters, till the thing be ready. And how your National Assembly, like a ship waterlogged, helmless, lies tumbling, the galleries, of shrill women, of faders with sabres, bellowing down on it, not unfrightful, and waits where the waves of chance may please to strand it. Suspicious, nay on the left side, conscious, what submarine explosion is meanwhile a charging. Petition for King's forfeiture rises often there, petition from Paris section, from provincial patriot towns. From Alonson, Brian Kahn, and the traders at the fair of Beaucaire. Or what of these? On the 3rd of August, Mayor Peschen and the municipality come petitioning for forfeiture, they openly, in their tricolor municipal scarfs. Forfeiture is what all patriots now want and expect. All Brissetans want forfeiture, with the little prince royal for king, and us for protector over him. Emphatic Faders asks the legislature, can you save us, or not? Forty-seven sections have agreed to forfeiture, only that of the Fia St. Thomas pretending to disagree. Nay section Mockenseal declares forfeiture to be, properly speaking, come. Mockenseal for one, does from this day, the last of July, cease allegiance to Lewis, and take minute of the same before all men. A thing blamed aloud, but which will be praised aloud. And the name Mockenseal, of ill counsel, be thenceforth changed to Bonkenseal, of good counsel. President Danton, in the Cordeliers section, does another thing, invites all passive citizens to take place among the active in section business, one peril threatening all. Thus he, though an official person, cloudy atlas of the whole. Likewise he manages to have that black-browed battalion of Marseillaise shifted to new barracks, in his own region of the remote southeast. Sleek Chaumet, cruel Bill Laud, Deputy Chabot the disfrocked, who gain with the toxin in his heart, will welcome them there. Wherefore, again and again, O oh legislators, can you save us or not? Poor legislators! With their legislature waterlogged, volcanic explosion charging under it. Forfeiture shall be debated on the ninth day of August, that miserable business of Lafayette may be expected to terminate on the eighth. Or will the humane reader glance into the levy day of Sunday the fifth? The last levy. Not for a long time, never, says Bertrand Molleville, had a levy been so brilliant, at least so crowded. A sad presaging interest sat on every face. Bertrand's own eyes were filled with tears. For, indeed, outside of that tricolor ribboned on the Fuenance Terrace, legislature is debating, sections are defiling, all Paris is astir this very Sunday, demanding decheance. Here, however, within the ribboned, a grand proposal is on foot, for the hundredth time, of carrying His Majesty to Rouen and the castle of Gaillon. Swiss at Kerbevoy are in readiness, much is ready, Majesty himself seems almost ready. Nevertheless, for the hundredth time, Majesty, when near the point of action, draws back, writes, after one has waited, palpitating, an endless summer day, that, he has reason to believe the insurrection is not so ripe as you suppose. Whereat Bertrand Molleville breaks forth, into extremity at one of spleen and despair, de humor et de desespoir. Chapter 2.6. VI. The Steeples at Midnight. For, in truth, the insurrection is just about ripe. 
Thursday is the 9th of the month August, if forfeiture be not pronounced by the legislature that day, we must pronounce it ourselves. Legislature A poor waterlogged legislature can pronounce nothing. On Wednesday the 8th, after endless oratory once again, they cannot even pronounce accusation again Lafayette, but absolve him, hear it, patriotism, by a majority of two to one. Patriotism hears it. Patriotism, hounded on by Prussian terror, by preternatural suspicion, roars tumultuous round the Salle de Manege, all day, insults many leading deputies, of the absolvent right side. Ney chases them, collars them with loud menace, Deputy Vaublanc, and others of the like, are glad to take refuge in guardhouses, and escape by the back window. And so, next day, there is infinite complaint, letter after letter from insulted deputy. Mere complaint, debate and self-canceling jargon, the son of Thursday sets like the others, and no forfeiture pronounced. Wherefore in fine, to your tents, O Israel. The mother society ceases speaking. Groups cease haranguing, patriots, with closed lips now, take one another's arm, walk off, in rows, two and two, at a brisk business pace, and vanish afar in the obscure places of the East. Santerre is ready, or we will make him ready. Forty-seven of the forty-eight sections are ready, Nafia St. Thomas itself turns up the Jacobin side of it, turns down the fuel inside of it, and is ready too. Let the unlimited patriot look to his weapon, be it pike, be it firelock. And the breast brethren, above all, the black-browed Marseillese prepare themselves for the extreme hour. Syndic Roterer knows, and laments or not as the issue may turn, that five thousand ball cartridges, within these few days, have been distributed to faders, at the Hotel de Ville. And ye likewise, gallant gentlemen, defenders of royalty, crowd ye on your side to the tilleries. Not to a levy, no, to a couchy, where much will be put to bed. Your tickets of entry are needful, needful your blunderbusses. They come and crowd, like gallant men who also know how to die, old male the camp marshal has come, his eyes gleaming once again, though dimmed by the room of almost fourscore years. Courage, brothers. We have a thousand red Swiss. Men stanch of heart, steadfast as the granite of their Alps. National grenadiers are at least friends of order, commandant man that breathes loyal ardor, will answer for it on his head. Man that will, and his staff. For the staff, though there stands a doom and decree to that effect, is happily never yet dissolved. Commandant man that has corresponded with Mayor Peshin, carries a written order from him these three days, to repel force by force. A squadron on the Pont Neuf with cannon shall turn back these Marseillaise coming across the river, a squadron at the town hall shall cut Saint Antoine in two, as it issues from the arcade Saint John. Drive one half back to the obscure east, drive the other half forward through the wickets of the Louvre. Squadrons not a few, and mounted squadrons, squadrons in the Palais Royal, in the Place Vaudome, all these shall charge, at the right moment. Sweep this street, and then sweep that. Some new 20th of June we shall have, only still more ineffectual. Or probably the insurrection will not dare to rise at all. Mandat squadrons, horse gendarmerie and blue guards march, clattering, tramping, Mandat's cannoneers rumble. Under cloud of night, to the sound of his general, which begins drumming when men should go to bed. It is the ninth night of August, 1792. On the other hand, the forty-eight sections correspond by swift messengers, are choosing each their three delegates with full powers. Syndic Roterer, Mayor Peshin are sent for to the Tilleries, courageous legislators, when the drum beats danger, should repair to their cell. Demoiselle Theroin has on her grenadier bonnet, short-skirted riding habit. Two pistols garnish her small waist, and sabre hangs in baldric by her side. Such a game is playing in this Paris pandemonium, or city of all the devils, and yet the night, as Mayor Peshin walks here in the Tillery's garden, is beautiful and calm. Orion and the Pleiades glitter down quite serene. Peshin has come forth, the heat inside was so oppressive. Indeed, His Majesty's reception of him was of the roughest, as it well might be. And now there is no outgate. 
Mandat's blue squadrons turn you back at every grade, nay the Fia St. Thomas grenadiers give themselves liberties of tongue, how a virtuous mayor shall pay for it, if there be mischief, and the like, though others again are full of civility. Surely if any man in France is in straits this night, it is Mayor Pession, bound, under pain of death, one may say, to smile dexterously with the one side of his face, and weep with the other, death if he do it not dexterously enough. Not till four in the morning does a national assembly, hearing of his plight, summon him over, to give account of Paris, of which he knows nothing, whereby however he shall get home to bed, and only his gilt coach be left. Scarcely less delicate is Syndic Roderer's task, who must wait whether he will lament or not, till he see the issue. Janus Bifrons, or Mr. Facing Both Ways, as Vernacular Bunyan has it. They walk there, in the meanwhile, these two Januses, with others of the like double conformation, and talk of indifferent matters. Roderer, from time to time, steps in, to listen, to speak. To send for the department directory itself, he there procures syndic not seeing how to act. The apartments are all crowded, some seven hundred gentlemen in black elbowing, bustling, red Swiss standing like rocks. Ghost, or partial ghost of a ministry, with roterer and advisers, hovering round their majesties, old Marshal male kneeling at the king's feet, to say, he and these gallant gentlemen are come to die for him. List. Through the placid midnight. Clang of the distant storm bell. So, in very sooth, steeple after steeple takes up the wondrous tale. Black courtiers listen at the windows, opened for air, discriminate the steeple bells, this is the tocsin of Saint Rock. That again, is it not Saint Jacques, named de la Boucherie? Yes, Messrs. Or even Saint Germain el Auxerrois, hear ye it not? The same metal that rang storm, two hundred and twenty years ago, but by a majesty's order then. On Saint Bartholomew's Eve, so go the steeple bells, which courtiers can discriminate. Nay, meseems, there is the town hall itself, we know it by its sound. Yes, friends, that is the town hall, discoursing so, to the night. Miraculously. By miraculous metal tongue and man's arm, Marat himself, if you knew it, is pulling at the rope there. Marat is pulling, Robespierre lies deep, invisible for the next forty hours. And some men have heart, and some have as good as none, and not even frenzy will give them any. What struggling confusion, as the issue slowly draws on. And the doubtful hour, with pain and blind struggle, brings forth its certainty, never to be abolished, the full power delegates, three from each section, a hundred and forty-four in all, got gathered at the town hall, about midnight. Mandat squadron, stationed there, did not hinder their entering, are they not the central committee of the sections, who sit here usually, though in greater number tonight. They are there, presided by confusion, irresolution, and the clack of tongues. Swift scouts fly, rumor buzzes, of black courtiers, red Swiss, of Mandat and his squadrons that shall charge. Better put off the insurrection. Yes, put it off. Ha, hark! Saint Antoine booming out eloquent toxin, of its own accord, friends, no, ye cannot put off the insurrection. But must put it on, and live with it, or die with it. Swift now, therefore, let these actual old municipals, on sight of the full powers, and mandate of the sovereign elected people, lay down their functions, and this new hundred and forty-four take them up. Will ye nil ye, worthy old municipals, go ye must. Nay is it not a happiness for many a municipal that he can wash his hands of such a business, and sit there paralyzed, unaccountable, till the hour do bring forth. Or even go home to his night's rest. Two only of the old, or at most three, we retain Mayor Pession, for the present walking in the Tilleries, procure Manuel, procure substitute Danton, invisible Atlas of the whole. And so, with our hundred and forty-four, among whom are a Toxin Huguenin, a Bill Laud, a Chaumet, an Editor Talians, and Fabre d'Eglantines, Surgents, Panaces. And in brief, either emergent, or else emerged and full blown, the entire flower of unlimited patriotism, have we not, as by magic, made a new municipality, ready to act in the unlimited manner. 
and declare itself roundly, in a state of insurrection. First of all, then, be commandant man that sent for, with that mayor's order of his, also let the new municipals visit those squadrons that were to charge. And let the storm bell ring its loudest, and, on the whole, forward, ye 144, retreat is now none for you. Reader, fancy not, in thy languid way, that insurrection is easy. Insurrection is difficult, each individual uncertain even of his next neighbor, totally uncertain of his distant neighbors, what strength is with him, what strength is against him. Certain only that, in case of failure, his individual portion is the gallows. Eight hundred thousand heads, and in each of them a separate estimate of these uncertainties, a separate theorem of action conformable to that, out of so many uncertainties, does the certainty, an inevitable net result never to be abolished, go on. At all moments, bodying itself forth. Leading thee also towards civic crowns or an ignominious noose. Could the reader taken as Modius's flight, and waving open all roofs and privacies, look down from the tower of Notre Dame, what a Paris were it. Of treble voice whimperings or vehemence, of bass voice growlings, dubitations, courage screwing itself to desperate defiance, cowardice trembling silent within barred doors, and all round, dullness calmly snoring. For much dullness, flung on its mattresses, always sleeps. Oh, between the clangor of these high-storming toxins and that snore of dullness, what a gamut, of trepidation, excitation, desperation, and above it mere doubt, danger, atropus and knocks. Fighters of this section draw out, hear that the next section does not, and thereupon draw in. Saint Antoine, on this side the river, is uncertain of Saint Marceau on that. Steady only is the snore of dullness, are the six hundred Marcellese that know how to die. Mandat, twice summoned to the town hall, has not come. Scouts fly incessant, in distracted haste, and the many whispering voices of rumor. Theroin and unofficial patriots flit, dim visible, exploratory, far and wide, like night birds on the wing. Of nationals some three thousand have followed Mandat and his general. The rest follow each his own theorem of the uncertainties, theorem, that one should march rather with Saint Antoine, innumerable theorems, that in such a case the wholesomest were sleep. And so the drums beat, in made fits, and the storm bells peal. Saint Antoine itself does but draw out and draw in, Commandant Santerre, over there, cannot believe that the Marseillaise and Saint Marceau will march. Thou laggard sonorous beer vat, with the loud voice and timber head, is it time now to palter? Alsatian Westerman clutches him by the throat with drawn sabre, whereupon the timber-headed believes. In this manner wanes the slow night, amid fret, uncertainty, and toxin, all men's humor rising to the hysterical pitch, and nothing done. However, Mandat, on the third summons does come, come, unguarded, astonished to find the municipality new. They question him straightly on that mayor's order to resist force by force. On that strategic scheme of cutting Saint Antoine in two halves, he answers what he can, they think it were right to send this strategic national commandant to the Abbey prison, and let a court of law decide on him. Alas, a court of law, not book law but primeval club law, crowds and jostles out of doors, all fretted to the hysterical pitch, cruel as fear, blind as the night, such court of law, and no other, clutches poor Mandat from his constables. Beats him down, massacres him, on the steps of the town hall. Look to it, ye new municipals, ye people, in a state of insurrection. Blood is shed, blood must be answered for. Alas, in such hysterical humor, more blood will flow, for it is as with the tiger in that, he has only to begin. Seventeen individuals have been seized in the champs Elysees by exploratory patriotism. They flitting dim visible, by it flitting dim visible. Ye have pistols, rapiers, ye seventeen. One of those accursed, false patrols, that go marauding, with anti-national intent, seeking what they can spy, what they can spill. The seventeen are carried to the nearest guardhouse, eleven of them escape by back passages. How is this? Demoiselle Theroin appears at the front entrance, with sabre, pistols, and a train, denounces treasonous connivance. 
demands, seizes, the remaining six, that the justice of the people be not trifled with. Of which six two more escape in the whirl and debate of the club law court, the last unhappy for are massacred, as man that was, two ex-bodyguards. One dissipated abbe, one royalist pamphleteer, Sullo, known to us by name, able editor, and wit of all work. Poor Sullo, his Acts of the Apostles, and brisk placard journals, for he was an able man, come to finest, in this manner. And questionable jesting issues suddenly in horrid earnest. Such doings usher in the dawn of the 10th of August, 1792. Or think what a night the poor National Assembly has had, sitting there, in great paucity, attempting to debate. Quivering and shivering, pointing towards all the thirty-two azimuths at once, as the magnet needle does when thunderstorm is in the air. If the insurrection come? If it come, and fail? Alas, in that case, may not black courtiers, with blunderbusses, red Swiss with bayonets rush over, flushed with victory, and ask us, thou undefinable, waterlogged, self-distractive, self-destructive legislative, what dost thou here unsunk? Or figure the poor National Guards, bivouacking, in temporary tents, there, or standing ranked, shifting from leg to leg, all through the weary night, new tricolor municipals ordering one thing, old man dat captains ordering another. Procure Manuel has ordered the cannons to be withdrawn from the Pont Neuf, none ventured to disobey him. It seemed certain, then, the old staff so long doomed has finally been dissolved, in these hours. And man that is not our commandant now, but Santerre. Yes, friends, Santerre henceforth, surely man that no more. The squadrons that were to charge see nothing certain, except that they are cold, hungry, worn down with watching. That it were sad to slay French brothers, sadder to be slain by them. Without the Tillery's circuit, and within it, sour uncertain humor sways these men, only the Red Swiss stand steadfast. Then their officers refresh now with a slight wetting of brandy, wherein the nationals, too far gone for brandy, refused to participate. King Louis meanwhile had laid him down for a little sleep, his wig when he reappeared had lost the powder on one side. Old Marshal Mail and the gentleman in black rise always in spirits, as the insurrection does not rise, there goes a witty saying now, le toxin any rend pa. The toxin, like a dry milk cow, does not yield. For the rest, could one not proclaim martial law? Not easily, for now, it seems, Mayor Peshin is gone. On the other hand, our interim commandant, poor man that being off, to the Hotel de Ville, complains that so many courtiers in black encumber the service, are an eye sorrow to the National Guards. To which Her Majesty answers with emphasis, that they will obey all, will suffer all, that they are sure men these. And so the yellow lamplight dies out in the grey of morning, in the king's palace, over such a scene. Scene of jostling, elbowing, of confusion, and indeed conclusion, for the thing is about to end. Roterer and spectral ministers jostle in the press, consult, inside cabinets, with one or with both majesties. Sister Elizabeth takes the queen to the window, sister, see what a beautiful sunrise, right over the Jacobin's church and that quarter. How happy if the toxin did not yield! But Mandat returns not. Peshin is gone, much hangs wavering in the invisible balance. About five o'clock, there rises from the garden a kind of sound, as of a shout to which had become a howl, and instead of Vive le Roy were ending in Vive la Nation. Mon Dieu! ejaculates a spectral minister, what is he doing down there? For it is His Majesty, gone down with old Marshal Mail to review the troops, and the nearest companies of them answer so. Her Majesty bursts into a stream of tears. Yet on stepping from the cabinet her eyes are dry and calm, her look is even cheerful. The Austrian lip, and the aquiline nose, fuller than usual, gave to her countenance, says Peltier, something of majesty, which they that did not see her in these moments cannot well have an idea of. O oh, thou Teresa's daughter! King Louis enters, much blown with the fatigue, but for the rest with his old air of indifference. Of all hopes now surely the joyfulest were, that the toxin did not yield. Chapter 2.6.7 
The Swiss. Unhappy friends, the toxin does yield, has yielded. Lo ye, how with the first sunrays its ocean tide, of pikes and fusils, flows glittering from the far east, immeasurable, born of the night. They march there, the grim host. Saint Antoine on this side of the river, Saint Marceau on that, the black browed Marcellese in the van. With hum, and grim murmur, far heard. Like the ocean tide, as we say, drawn up, as if by Luna and influences, from the great deep of waters, they roll gleaming on, no king, Canute or Lewis, can bid them roll back. Why deadying side currents, of onlookers, roll hither and thither, unarmed, not voiceless, they, the steel host, roll on. New Commandant Santerre, indeed, has taken seat at the town hall, rests there, in his halfway house. Alsatian Westerman, with flashing sabre, does not rest, nor the sections, nor the Marseillaise, nor Demoiselle Theroin, but roll continually on. And now, where are Mandat squadrons that were to charge? Not a squadron of them stirs, or they stir in the wrong direction, out of the way, their officers glad that they will even do that. It is to this hour uncertain whether the squadron on the Pont Neuf made the shadow of resistance, or did not make the shadow, enough, the black-browed Marseillaise, and Saint Marceau following them, do cross without let. Do cross, in sure hope now of Saint Antoine and the rest, do billow on, towards the Tilleries, where their errand is. The Tilleries, at sound of them, rustles responsive, the Red Swiss look to their priming. Courtiers in black draw their blunderbusses, rapiers, poniards, some have even fire shovels, every man his weapon of war. Judge if, in these circumstances, Syndic Roterer felt easy. Will the kind heavens open no middle course of refuge for a poor Syndic who halts between two? If indeed His Majesty would consent to go over to the assembly. His Majesty, above all Her Majesty, cannot agree to that. Did Her Majesty answer the proposal with a fi donk, did she say even, she would be nailed to the walls sooner? Apparently not. It is written also that she offered the king a pistol, saying, now or else never was the time to shew himself. Close eyewitnesses did not see it, nor do we. That saw only that she was queenlike, quiet, that she argued not, upbraided not, with the inexorable, but, like Caesar in the capital, wrapped her mantle, as it beseems queens and sons of Adam to do. But thou, O Louis! Of what stuff art thou at all? Is there no stroke in thee, then, for life and crown? The silliest hunted deer dies not so. Art thou the languidest of all mortals, or the mildest minded? Thou art the worst starred. The tide advances, syndic roterers and all men straits grow straighter and straighter. Formescent clangor comes from the armed nationals in the court, far and wide is the infinite hubbub of tongues. What counsel? And the tide is now nigh. Messengers, forerunners speak hastily through the outer grates, hold parley sitting astride the walls. Syndic Roterer goes out and comes in. Canoniers ask him, Are we to fire against the people? King's ministers ask him, Shall the king's house be forced? Syndic Roderer has a hard game to play. He speaks to the cannoneers with eloquence, with fervor, such fervor as a man can, who has to blow hot and cold in one breath. Hot and cold, O Roderer. We, for our part, cannot live and die. The cannoneers, by way of answer, fling down their linstocks. Think of this answer, O King Louis, and King's ministers, and take a poor syndic's safe middle course, towards the Salle de Manege. King Louis sits, his hands lent on knees, body bent forward, gazes for a space fixedly on Syndic Roderer. Then answers, looking over his shoulder to the Queen, Marchands. They march, King Louis, Queen, Sister Elizabeth, the two royal children and governess, these, with Syndic Roderer, and officials of the department. Amid a double rank of National Guards. The men with blunderbusses, the steady red Swiss gaze mournfully, reproachfully, but hear only these words from Syndic Roderer, the king is going to the assembly, make way. It has struck eight, on all clocks, some minutes ago, the king has left the Tilleries, forever. 
O oh, ye stanch Swiss, ye gallant gentlemen in black, for what a cause are ye to spend and be spent? Look out from the western windows, ye may see King Louis placidly hold on his way, the poor little prince royal, sportfully kicking the fallen leaves. Fremescent multitude on the terrace of the Fuenance whirls parallel to him. One man in it, very noisy, with a long pole, will they not obstruct the outer staircase, and back entrance of the sow, when it comes to that? King's guards can go no further than the bottom step there. Lo, deputation of legislators come out. He of the long pole is stilled by oratory, assembly's guards join themselves to king's guards, and all may mount in this case of necessity, the outer staircase is free or passable. See, royalty ascends. A blue grenadier lifts the poor little prince royal from the press, royalty has entered in. Royalty has vanished forever from your eyes. And ye left standing there, amid the yawning abysses, an earthquake of insurrection, without course. Without command, if ye perish it must be as more than martyrs, as martyrs who are now without a cause. The black courtiers disappear mostly, through such issues as they can. The poor Swiss know not how to act, one duty only is clear to them, that of standing by their post, and they will perform that. But the glittering steel tide has arrived, it beats now against the chateau barriers, and eastern courts. Irresistible, loud surging far and wide, breaks in, fills the court of the carousel, black-browed Marseillaise in the van. King Louis gone, say you, over to the assembly. Well and good, but till the assembly pronounce forfeiture of him, what boots it? Our post is in that chateau or stronghold of his, there till then must we continue. Think, ye stanch Swiss, whether it were good that grim murder began, and brothers blasted one another in pieces for a stone edifice, poor Swiss. They know not how to act, from the southern windows, some fling cartridges, in sign of brotherhood. On the eastern outer staircase, and within through long stairs and corridors, they stand firm-ranked, peaceable and yet refusing to stir. Westerman speaks to them in Alsatian German, Marcellese plead, in hot Provençal speech and pantomime. Stunning hubbub pleads and threatens, infinite, around. The Swiss stand fast, peaceable and yet immovable, red granite pier in that waste-flashing sea of steel. Who can help the inevitable issue, Marcellese and all France, on this side? Granite Swiss on that. The pantomime grows hotter and hotter, Marseillaise sabres flourishing by way of action, the Swiss brow also clouding itself, the Swiss thumb bringing its firelock to the cock. And hark! High thundering above all the din, three Marseillaise cannon from the carousel, pointed by a gunner of bad aim, come rattling over the roofs. Ye Swiss, therefore, fire! The Swiss fire! By volley, by platoon, in rolling fire, Marseillaise men not a few, and, a tall man that was louder than any, lie silent, smashed, upon the pavement, not a few Marseillaise, after the long dusty march, have made halt here. The carousel is void. The black tide recoiling, fugitives rushing as far as Saint Antoine before they stop. The cannoneers without Linstock have squatted invisible, and left their cannon, which the Swiss sees. Think what a volley, reverberating doomful to the four corners of Paris, and through all hearts, like the clang of Bologna's thongs. The black-browed Marseillaise, rallying on the instant, have become black demons that know how to die. Nor is Brest behindhand, nor Alsatian Westerman, Demoiselle Theroen is Sybil Theroen, Vengeance Victoire, O you la mort. From all patriot artillery, great and small. From Fuenant's Terrace, and all terraces and places of the widespread insurrectionary sea, there roars responsive a red whirlwind. Blue nationals, ranked in the garden, cannot help their muskets going off, against foreign murderers. For there is a sympathy in muskets, in heaped masses of men, nay, are not mankind, in whole, like tuned strings, and a cunning infinite concordance and unity. You smite one string, and all strings will begin sounding, in soft sphere melody, in deafening screech of madness. Mounted gendarmerie gallop distracted, are fired on merely as a thing running. Galloping over the Pont Royal, or one knows not whither. 
The brain of Paris, brain fevered in the center of it here, has gone mad, what you call, taken fire. Behold, the fire slackens not, nor does the Swiss rolling fire slacken from within. Nay they clutched cannon, as we saw, and now, from the other side, they clutch three pieces more, alas, cannon without linstock, nor will the steel and flint answer, though they try it. Had a chance to answer. Patriot onlookers have their misgivings, one strangest patriot onlooker thinks that the Swiss, had they a commander, would beat. He is a man not unqualified to judge, the name of him is Napoleon Bonaparte. And onlookers, and women, stand gazing, and the witty Dr. Moore of Glasgow among them, on the other side of the river, cannon rush rumbling past them, pause on the Pont Royal, belch out their iron entrails there, against the tilleries. And at every new belch, the women and onlookers shout and clap hands. City of all the devils. In remote streets, men are drinking breakfast coffee, following their affairs, with a start now and then, as some dull echo reverberates a note louder. And here. Marcellese fall wounded, but Barbarous has surgeons, Barbarous is close by, managing, though underhand, and under cover. Marcellese fall deathstruck, bequeath their firelock, specify in which pocket are the cartridges. And die, murmuring, revenge me, revenge thy country. Breast Fadir officers, galloping in red coats, are shot as Swiss. Lo you, the carousel has burst into flame, Paris pandemonium. Nay the poor city, as we said, is in fever fit and convulsion. Such crisis has lasted for the space of some half hour. But what is this that, with legislative insignia, ventures through the hubbub and death hail, from the back entrance of the Manege? Towards the Tilleries and Swiss, written order from His Majesty to cease firing. O oh, ye hapless Swiss, why was there no order not to begin it? Gladly would the Swiss cease firing, but who will bid mad insurrection cease firing? To insurrection you cannot speak, neither can it, hydra headed, here. The dead and dying, by the hundred, lie all around, are borne bleeding through the streets, towards help, the sight of them, like a torch of the furies, kindling madness. Patriot Paris roars, as the bear bereaved of her whelps. On, ye patriots, vengeance. Victory or death. There are men seen, who rush on, armed only with walking sticks. Terror and fury rule the hour. The Swiss, pressed on from without, paralyzed from within, have ceased to shoot, but not to be shot. What shall they do? Desperate is the moment. Shelter or instant death, yet how? Where? One party flies out by the Rue de l'Echelle. Is destroyed utterly, en entier. A second, by the other side, throws itself into the garden, hurrying across a keen fusillade rushes suppliant into the National Assembly, finds pity and refuge in the back benches there. The third, and largest, darts out in column, three hundred strong, towards the champs Elysees. ah, could we but reach Kerbevoy, where other Swiss are. Wah! See, in such fusillade the column soon breaks itself by diversity of opinion, into distracted segments, this way and that, to escape in holes, to die fighting from street to street. The firing and murdering will not cease, not yet for long. The red porters of hotels are shot at, be they Swiss by nature, or Swiss only in name. The very firemen, who pump and labor on that smoking carousel, are shot at, why should the carousel not burn? Some Swiss take refuge in private houses. Find that mercy too does still dwell in the heart of man. The brave Marcellese are merciful, late so wroth, and labor to save. Journalist Gorses pleads hard with infuriated groups. Clements, the wine merchant, stumbles forward to the bar of the assembly, a rescued Swiss in his hand, tells passionately how he rescued him with pain and peril, how he will henceforth support him, being childless himself. And falls a swoon round the poor Swiss's neck, amid plaudits. But the most are butchered, and even mangled. Fifty, some say fourscore, were marched as prisoners, by national guards, to the Hotel de Ville, the ferocious people bursts through on them, in the place to grieve, massacres them to the last man. 
O Puppel, envy of the universe. Puppel, in mad Gaelic effervescence. Surely few things in the history of carnage are painfuler. What ineffaceable red streak, flickering so sad in the memory, is that, of this poor column of red Swiss, breaking itself in the confusion of opinions. Dispersing, into blackness and death. Honor to you, brave men, honorable pity, through long times. Not martyrs were ye, and yet almost more. He was no king of yours, this Lewis, and he forsook you like a king of shreds and patches. Ye were but sold to him for some poor sixpence a day, yet would ye work for your wages, keep your plighted word. The work now was to die, and ye did it. Honor to you, O kinsman. And may the old Deutsch Biederkeit and Tapferkeit, and valor which is worth and truth be they Swiss, be they Saxon, fail in no age. Not bastards, true-born were these men. Sons of the men of Sempak, of Merton, who knelt, but not to thee, O Burgundy, let the traveller, as he passes through Lucerne, turn aside to look a little at their monumental lion, not for Torvalson's sake alone. Hewn out of living rock, the figure rests there, by the still lake waters, in lullaby of distant tinkling Ranstavaches, the granite mountains dumbly keeping watch all round, and, though inanimate, speaks. Chapter 2.6.8 Constitution burst in pieces. Thus is the 10th of August won and lost. Patriotism reckons it slain by thousand on thousand, so deadly was the Swiss fire from these windows, but will finally reduce them to some twelve hundred. No child's play was it, nor is it. Till two in the afternoon the massacring, the breaking and the burning has not ended, nor the loose bedlam shut itself again. How deluges of frantic sansculottism roared through all passages of this Tilleries, ruthless in vengeance, how the valets were butchered, hewn down. And Dame Campan saw the Marseille's saber flash over her head, but the black browed said, V.A.T.N., get thee gone, and flung her from him unstruck, how in the cellars wine bottles were broken, wine butts were staved in and drunk. And, upwards to the very garrets, all windows tumbled out their precious royal furnitures. And, with gold mirrors, velvet curtains, down of ripped feather beds, and dead bodies of men, the Tilleries was like no garden of the earth, all this let him who has a taste for it see amply in Mercier, in acrid Montgaillard. Or Beaulieu of the Du Amos. A hundred and eighty bodies of Swiss lie piled there, naked, unremoved till the second day. Patriotism has torn their red coats into snips. And marches with them at the pike's point, the ghastly bare corpses lie there, under the sun and under the stars, the curious of both sexes crowding to look. Which let not us do. Above a hundred carts heaped with dead fare towards the cemetery of St. Madeline, bewailed, bewept, for all had kindred, all had mothers, if not here, then there. It is one of those carnage fields, such as you read of by the name, Glorious Victory, brought home in this case to one's own door. But the black-browed Marseillese have struck down the tyrant of the chateau. He is struck down. Lo, and hardly to rise. What a moment for an August legislative was that when the hereditary representative entered, under such circumstances, and the grenadier, carrying the little prince royal out of the press, set him down on the assembly table. A moment which one had to smooth off with oratory, waiting what the next would bring. Lewis said few words, he was come hither to prevent a great crime, he believed himself safer nowhere than here. President Vergniad answered briefly, in vague oratory as we say, about defense of constituted authorities, about dying at our post. And so King Lewis sat him down, first here, then there. For a difficulty arose. The constitution not permitting us to debate while the king is present, finally he settles himself with his family in the loge of the logograph in the reporter's box of a journalist, which is beyond the enchanted constitutional circuit. Separated from it by a rail. To such lodge of the logograph, measuring some ten feet square, with a small closet at the entrance of it behind, is the king of broad France now limited, here can he and his sit pent, under the eyes of the world. Or retire into their closet at intervals. For the space of sixteen hours. Such quiet peculiar moment has the legislative lived to see. 
But also what a moment was that other, few minutes later, when the three Marseillese cannon went off, and the Swiss rolling fire and universal thunder, like the crack of doom, began to rattle. Honorable members start to their feet. Stray bullets singing epicedium even here, shivering in with window glass and jingle. No, this is our post, let us die here. They sit therefore, like stone legislators. But may not the lodge of the logograph be forced from behind? Tear down the railing that divides it from the enchanted constitutional circuit. Usher's tear and tug, his majesty himself aiding from within, the railing gives way, majesty and legislative are united in place, unknown destiny hovering over both. Rattle, and again rattle, went the thunder, one breathless wide-eyed messenger rushing in after another, king's orders to the Swiss went out. It was a fearful thunder, but, as we know, it ended. Breathless messengers, fugitive Swiss, denunciatory patriots, trepidation, finally trepudiation, before four o'clock much has come and gone. The new municipals have come and gone, with three flags, Liberté, Egalité, Pattery, and the clang of vivats. Vergniad, he who as president few hours ago talked of dying for constituted authorities, has moved, as committee reporter, that the hereditary representative be suspended, that a national convention do forthwith assemble to say what further. An able report, which the president must have had ready in his pocket. A president, in such cases, must have much ready, and yet not ready, and Janus-like look before and after. King Louis listens to all. Retires about midnight to three little rooms on the upper floor, till the Luxembourg be prepared for him, and the safeguard of the nation. Safer if Brunswick were once here. Or, alas, not so safe. Ye hapless discrowned heads. Crowds came, next morning, to catch a glimpse of them, in their three upper rooms. Montgaillard says the August captives wore an air of cheerfulness, even of gaiety. That the Queen and Princess Lambal, who had joined her overnight, looked out of the open window, shook powder from their hair on the people below, and laughed. He is an acrid distorted man. For the rest, one may guess that the legislative, above all that the new municipality continues busy. Messengers, municipal or legislative, and swift dispatches rush off to all corners of France. Full of triumph, blended with indignant wail, for twelve hundred have fallen. France sends up its blended shout responsive, the tenth of August shall be as the fourteenth of July, only bloodier and greater. The court has conspired. Poor court, the court has been vanquished, and will have both the scath to bear and the scorn. How the statues of kings do now all fall. Bronze Henri himself, though he wore a cockade once, jingles down from the Pont Neuf, where Pattery floats in danger. Much more does Louis XIV, from the place Vaudome, jingle down, and even breaks in falling. The curious can remark, written on his horse's shoe, 12-8-1692, a century and a day. The 10th of August was Friday. The week is not done, when our old patriot ministry is recalled, what of it can be got, strict Roland, Genevese Clavier. Add heavy Monge the mathematician, once a stone hewer, and, for minister of justice, Danton, led hither, as himself says, in one of his gigantic figures, through the breach of patriot cannon. These, under legislative committees, must rule the wreck as they can, confusedly enough, with an old legislative waterlogged, with a new municipality so brisk. But national convention will get itself together, and then. Without delay, however, let a new jury court and criminal tribunal be set up in Paris, to try the crimes and conspiracies of the Tenth. High Court of Orleans is distant, slow, the blood of the twelve hundred patriots, whatever become of other blood, shall be inquired after. Tremble, ye criminals and conspirators, the Minister of Justice is Danton. Robespierre too, after the victory, sits in the new municipality, insurrectionary, improvised municipality, which calls itself Council General of the Commune. For three days now, Lewis and his family have heard the legislative debates in the lodge of the logograph, and retired nightly to their small upper rooms. The Luxembourg and safeguard of the nation could not be got ready, nay, 
it seems the Luxembourg has too many cellars and issues, no municipality can undertake to watch it. The compact prison of the temple, not so elegant indeed, were much safer. To the temple, therefore. On Monday, 13th day of August 1792, in Mayor Pesson's carriage, Louis and his sad suspended household, fare thither, all Paris out to look at them. As they pass through the place Vadom Louis XIV's statue lies broken on the ground. Pesson is afraid the Queen's looks may be thought scornful, and produce provocation, she casts down her eyes, and does not look at all. The press is prodigious, but quiet, here and there, it shouts vive la nation, but for most part gazes in silence. French royalty vanishes within the gates of the temple, these old peak towers, like peaked extinguisher or bonsoir, do cover it up. From which same towers, poor Jacques Molay and his Templars were burnt out, by French royalty, five centuries since. Such are the turns of fate below. Foreign ambassadors, English Lord Gower have all demanded passports. Are driving indignantly towards their respective homes. So, then, the constitution is over. Forever and a day. Gone is that wonder of the universe, first biennial parliament, waterlogged, waits only till the convention come. And will then sink to endless depths. One can guess the silent rage of old constituents, constitution builders, extinct fuinants, men who thought the constitution would march. Lafayette rises to the altitude of the situation. At the head of his army. Legislative commissioners are posting towards him and it, on the northern frontier, to congratulate and perorate, he orders the municipality of Sedan to arrest these commissioners, and keep them strictly in ward as rebels, till he say further. The Sedan municipals obey. The Sedan municipals obey, but the soldiers of the Lafayette army? The soldiers of the Lafayette army have, as all soldiers have, a kind of dim feeling that they themselves are sansculottes in buff belts. That the victory of the 10th of August is also a victory for them. They will not rise and follow Lafayette to Paris, they will rise and send him thither. On the 18th, which is but next Saturday, Lafayette, with some two or three indignant staff officers, one of whom is old constituent Alexander de Lameth, having first put his lines in what order he could, rides swiftly over the marches. Towards Holland. Rides, alas, swiftly into the claws of Austrians. He, long wavering, trembling on the verge of the horizon, has set, in Almut's dungeons, this history knows him no more. Adieu, thou hero of two worlds, thinnest, but compact honor-worthy man. Through long rough night of captivity, through other tumults, triumphs and changes, thou wilt swing well, fast anchored to the Washington formula, and be the hero and perfect character, were it only of one idea. The sedan municipals repent and protest, the soldiers shout vive la nation. Dumouriez Palamides, from his camp at Mauld, sees himself made commander-in-chief. And, O oh Brunswick! What sort of military execution will Paris merit now? Forward, ye well-drilled exterminatory men, with your artillery wagons, and camp kettles jingling. Forward, tall chivalrous king of Prussia. Fanfarinating emigrants and war god Broy, for some consolation to mankind, which verily is not without need of some. End of the second volume. Volume 3. The Guillotine. Allah Freiheit's Apostle, S.I.E. Wherein Mir Immer Zuweiter. Wilker sucked Dockner Jeter M. Endi for Sitch. Whilst du Vili Befrain, so wag E.S. Vilen zu dienen. We gefarlich das say, whilst du E.S. Wissen. Versuches. Goethe. Book 3.I. September. Chapter 3.1.I. The Improvised Commune. Ye have roused her, then, ye emigrants and despots of the world, France is roused. Long have ye been lecturing and tutoring this poor nation, like cruel uncalled for pedagogues, shaking over her your ferulas of fire and steel, it is long that ye have pricked and filliped and affrighted her. There as she sat helpless in her dead sermons of a constitution, you gathering in on her from all lands, with your armaments and plots, your invadings and truculent bullyings. And lo now, ye have pricked her to the quick, and she is up, 
and her blood is up. The dead searments are rent into cobwebs, and she fronts you in that terrible strength of nature, which no man has measured, which goes down to madness and tophet, see now how ye will deal with her. This month of September, 1792, which has become one of the memorable months of history, presents itself under two most diverse aspects, all of black on the one side, all of bright on the other. Whatsoever is cruel in the panic frenzy of twenty-five million men, whatsoever is great in the simultaneous death defiance of twenty-five million men, stand here in abrupt contrast, near by one another. As indeed is usual when a man, how much more when a nation of men, is hurled suddenly beyond the limits. For nature, as green as she looks, rests everywhere on dread foundations, were we farther down. And Pan, to whose music the nymphs dance, has a cry in him that can drive all men distracted. Very frightful it is when a nation, rending asunder its constitutions and regulations which were grown dead sermons for it, becomes transcendental. And must now seek its wild way through the new, chaotic, where force is not yet distinguished into bidden and forbidden, but crime and virtue welter unseparated, in that domain of what is called the passions. Of what we call the miracles and the portents. It is thus that, for some three years to come, we are to contemplate France, in this final third volume of our history. Sansculottism reigning in all its grandeur and in all its hideousness, the gospel, God's message, of man's rights, man's mights or strengths, once more preached irrefragably abroad. Along with this, and still louder for the time, and fearfulest devil's message of man's weaknesses and sins, and all on such a scale, and under such aspect cloudy death-birth of a world. Huge smoke-cloud, streaked with rays as of heaven on one side, girt on the other as with hell-fire. History tells us many things, but for the last thousand years and more, what thing has she told us of a sort like this? Which therefore let us too, O reader, dwell on willingly, for a little, and from its endless significance endeavor to extract what may, in present circumstances, be adapted for us. It is unfortunate, though very natural, that the history of this period has so generally been written in hysterics. Exaggeration abounds, execration, wailing, and, on the whole, darkness. But thus too, when foul old Rome had to be swept from the earth, and those Northmen, and other horrid sons of nature, came in, swallowing formulas, as the French now do, foul old Rome screamed execratively her loudest. So that, the true shape of many things is lost for us. Attila's Huns had arms of such length that they could lift a stone without stooping. Into the body of the poor totter's execrative Roman history intercalated an alphabetic letter. And so they continue Tartars, of fell Tartarian nature, to this day. Here, in like manner, search as we will in these multiform innumerable French records, darkness too frequently covers, or sheer distraction bewilders. One finds it difficult to imagine that the sun shone in this September month, as he does in others. Nevertheless it is an indisputable fact that the sun did shine, and there was weather and work, nay, as to that, very bad weather for harvest work. An unlucky editor may do his utmost, and after all, require allowances. He had been a wise Frenchman, who, looking, close at hand, on this waste aspect of a France all stirring and whirling, in ways new, untried, had been able to discern where the cardinal movement lay. Which tendency it was that had the rule and primary direction of it then. But at forty-four years' distance, it is different. To all men now, two cardinal movements or grand tendencies, in the September world, have become discernible enough, that stormful effluence towards the frontiers. That frantic crowding towards townhouses and council halls in the interior. Wild France dashes, in desperate death defiance, towards the frontiers, to defend itself from foreign despots, crowds towards town halls and election committee rooms, to defend itself from domestic aristocrats. Let the reader conceive well these two cardinal movements, and what side currents and endless vortexes might depend on these. He shall judge too, whether, in such sudden wreckage of all old authorities, such a pair of cardinal movements, half frantic in themselves, could be of soft nature. As in dry Sahara, when the winds waken, and lift and winnow the immensity of sand. The air itself, 
travelers say, is a dim sand air, and dim looming through it, the wonderfulest uncertain colonnades of sand pillars rush whirling from this side and from that, like so many mad spinning dervishes, of a hundred feet in stature. And dance their huge desert waltz there. Nevertheless in all human movements, were they but a day old, there is order, or the beginning of order. Consider two things in this Sahara waltz of the French twenty-five millions. Or rather one thing, and one hope of a thing, the commune, municipality, of Paris, which is already here, the national convention, which shall in few weeks be here. The insurrectionary commune, which improvising itself on the eve of the 10th of August, worked this ever-memorable deliverance by explosion, must needs rule over it, till the convention meet. This commune, which they may well call a spontaneous or improvised commune, is, for the present, sovereign of France. The legislative, deriving its authority from the old, how can it now have authority when the old is exploded by insurrection? As a floating piece of wreck, certain things, persons and interests may still cleave to it, volunteer defenders, riflemen or pikemen in green uniform or red nightcap, of bonnet rouge, defile before it daily, just on the wing towards Brunswick. With the brandishing of arms, always with some touch of Leonidas eloquence, often with a fire of daring that threatens to out Herod Herod, the galleries, especially the ladies, never done with applauding. Addresses of this or the like sort can be received and answered, in the hearing of all France, the Salle de Manege is still useful as a place of proclamation. For which use, indeed, it now chiefly serves. Vergniaud delivers spirit-stirring orations. But always with a prophetic sense only, looking towards the coming convention. Let our memory perish, cries Vergniaud, but let France be free. Whereupon they all start to their feet, shouting responsive, Yes, yes, Paris notre memoire, pour vous que la France soit libre. This frock Chabot abjures heaven that at least we may have done with kings. And fast as powder under spark, we all blaze up once more, and with waved hats shout and swear, Yes, nous le jurons, plus de roi. All which, as a method of proclamation, is very convenient. For the rest, that are busy brissets, rigorous Rollins, men who once had authority and now have less and less. Men who love law, and will have even an explosion explode itself, as far as possible, according to rule, do find this state of matters most unofficial unsatisfactory, is not to be denied. Complaints are made, attempts are made, but without effect. The attempts even recoil, and must be desisted from, for fear of worse, the scepter is departed from this legislative once and always. A poor legislative, so hard was fate, had let itself be hand-jived, nailed to the rock like an Andromeda, and could only wail there to the earth and heavens. Miraculously a winged Perseus, or improvised commune, has dawned out of the void blue, and cut her loose, but whether now is it she, with her softness and musical speech, or is it he, with his hardness and sharp falchion and aegis? That shall have casting vote. Melodious agreement of vote, this were the rule. But if otherwise, and votes diverge, then surely Andromeda's part is to weep, if possible, tears of gratitude alone. Be content, O France, with this improvised commune, such as it is. It has the implements, and has the hands, the time is not long. On Sunday the 26th of August, our primary assemblies shall meet, begin electing of electors, on Sunday the 2nd of September, may the day prove lucky. The electors shall begin electing deputies, and so an all-healing national convention will come together. No Marc d'Argent, or distinction of active and passive, now insults the French patriot, but there is universal suffrage, unlimited liberty to choose. Old constituents, present legislators, all France is eligible. Nay, it may be said, the flower of all the universe, the L universe, is eligible, for in these very days we, by act of assembly, naturalize, the chief foreign friends of humanity, priestly, burnt out for us in Birmingham. Klopstock, a genius of all countries, Jeremy Bentham, useful jurisconsult, distinguished Payne, the rebellious needleman, some of whom may be chosen. As is most fit, for a convention of this kind. In a word, 745 unshackled sovereigns, 
admired of the universe, shall replace this hapless impotency of a legislative, out of which, it is likely, the best members, and the mountain in mass, may be re-elected. Roland is getting ready the solace de Saint Suisses, as preliminary rendezvous for them, in that void palace of the Tilleries, now void and national, and not a palace, but a caravanzera. As for the spontaneous commune, one may say that there never was on earth a stranger town council. Administration, not of a great city, but of a great kingdom in a state of revolt and frenzy, this is the task that has fallen to it. Enrolling, provisioning, judging, devising, deciding, doing, endeavoring to do, one wonders the human brain did not give way under all this, and real. But happily human brains have such a talent of taking up simply what they can carry, and ignoring all the rest, leaving all the rest, as if it were not there. Whereby somewhat is verily shifted for, and much shifts for itself. This improvised commune walks along, nothing doubting, promptly making front, without fear or flurry, at what moment soever, to the wants of the moment. Were the world on fire, one improvised tricolor municipal has but one life to lose. They are the elixir and chosen men of sansculotic patriotism, promoted to the forlorn hope, unspeakable victory or a high gallows, this is their mead. They sit there, in the town hall, these astonishing tricolor municipals, in council general. In committee of watchfulness, the surveillance, which will even become the salad public, of public salvation, or what other committees and subcommittees are needful, managing infinite correspondence. Passing infinite decrees, one hears of a decree being, the 98th of the day. Ready. Is the word. They carry loaded pistols in their pocket, also some improvised luncheon by way of meal. Or indeed, by and by, Treader's contract for the supply of repasts, to be eaten on the spot, too lavishly, as it was afterwards grumbled. Thus they, girt in their tricolor sashes, municipal notepaper in the one hand, firearms in other. They have their agents out all over France, speaking in townhouses, marketplaces, highways and byways, agitating, urging to arm, all hearts tingling to hear. Great is the fire of anti-aristocrat eloquence, nay some, as Biblia Pollock Mamoro, seem to hint afar off at something which smells of agrarian law, and a surgery of the overswollen dropsical strongbox itself. Whereat indeed the bold bookseller runs risk of being hanged, an ex-constituent Buzet has to smuggle him off. Governing persons, were they never so insignificant intrinsically, have for most part plenty of memoir writers. And the curious, in aftertimes, can learn minutely their goings out and comings in, which, as men always love to know their fellow men in singular situations, is a comfort, of its kind. Not so, with these governing persons, now in the town hall. And yet what most original fellow man, of the governing sort, High Chancellor, King, Kaiser, Secretary of the Home or the Foreign Department, ever shewed such a faces as Clerk Taulin, Procure Manuel, Future Procure Chaumet. Here in this sand waltz of the twenty-five millions, now do. O brother mortals, thou advocate Panis, friend of Danton, kinsman of Santerre, engraver surgeant, since called agate surgeant, thou Huguenin, with the toxin in thy heart. But, as Horace says, they wanted the sacred memoir writer, Sacrovate. And we know them not. Men bragged of August and its doings, publishing them in high places, but of this September none now or afterwards would brag. The September world remains dark, fuliginous, as Lapland witch midnight. From which, indeed, very strange shapes will evolve themselves. Understand this, however, that incorruptible Robespierre is not wanting, now when the brunt of battle is past. In a stealthy way the sea-green man sits there, his feline eyes excellent in the twilight. Also understand this other, a single fact worth many, that Murad is not only there, but has a seat of honor assigned him, a tribune particular. How changed from Marat, lifted from his dark cellar into this luminous, peculiar tribune. All dogs have their day, even rabid dogs. Sorrowful, incurable Philoctetes Marat, without whom Troy cannot be taken. Hither, as a main element of the governing power, has Marat been raised. Royalist types, for we have, suppressed, 
innumerable durasois, royas, and even clapped them in prison, royalist types replaced the worn types often snatched from a people's friend in old ill days. In our peculiar tribune, we write and redact placards of du monitory terror, Amos du Puppel, now under the name of Journal de la Republic, and sit a bait of men. Marat, says one, is the conscience of the Hotel de Ville. Keeper, as some call it, of the sovereign's conscience, which surely, in such hands, will not lie hid in a napkin. Two great movements, as we said, agitate this distracted national mind, a rushing against domestic traitors, a rushing against foreign despots. Mad movements both, restrainable by no known rule. Strongest passions of human nature driving them on, love, hatred, vengeful sorrow, braggart nationality also vengeful, and pale panic over all. Twelve hundred slain patriots, do they not, from their dark catacombs there, in death's dumb shoe, plead, O ye legislators, for vengeance. Such was the destructive rage of these aristocrats on the ever-memorable tenth. Nay, apart from vengeance, and with an eye to public salvation only, are there not still, in this Paris, in round numbers, thirty thousand aristocrats, of the most malignant humor, driven now to their last trump card? Be patient, ye patriots, our new high court, tribunal of the seventeenth, sits, each section has sent for jurymen. And Danton, extinguishing improper judges, improper practices wheresoever found, is, the same man you have known at the Cordeliers. With such a minister of justice shall not justice be done, let it be swift then, answers universal patriotism. Swift and sure. One would hope, this tribunal of the seventeenth is swifter than most. Already on the twenty-first, while our court is but four days old, Colonat d'Angremont, the royal enlister, crimp, embaucher, dies by torchlight. For, lo, the great guillotine, wondrous to behold, now stands there, the doctor's idea has become oak and iron, the huge cyclopean axe falls in its grooves like the ram of the pile engine, swiftly snuffing out the light of men. Mais vous, Gualches, what have you invented? This, poor old Laporte, intendant of the civil list, follows next, quietly, the mild old man. Then Durasoy, royalist placarder, cashier of all the anti-revolutionists of the interior, he went rejoicing, said that a royalist like him ought to die, of all days on this day, the twenty-fifth or St. Louis's day. All these have been tried, cast, the galleries shouting approval, and handed over to the realized idea, within a week. Besides those whom we have acquitted, the galleries murmuring, and have dismissed. Or even have personally guarded back to prison, as the galleries took to howling, and even to menacing and elbowing. Languid this tribunal is not. Nor does the other movement slacken, the rushing against foreign despots. Strong forces shall meet in death grip, drilled Europe against mad undrilled France, and singular conclusions will be tried. Conceive therefore, in some faint degree, the tumult that whirls in this France, in this Paris. Placards from section, from commune, from legislative, from the individual patriot, flame monitory on all walls. Flags of danger to fatherland wave at the Hotel de Ville, on the Pont Neuf, over the prostrate statues of kings. There is universal enlisting, urging to enlist, there is tearful boastful leave-taking, irregular marching on the great northeastern road. Marseillese sing their wild to arms, in chorus. Which now all men, all women and children have learnt, and sing chorally, in theatres, boulevards, streets, and the heart burns in every bosom, aux arms. Marchands, or think how your aristocrats are skulking into covert. How Bertrand Molleville lies hidden in some garret, in Aubrey Le Boucher Street, with a poor surgeon who had known me, Dame de Stahl has secreted her Narbonne, not knowing what in the world to make of him. The barriers are sometimes open, oftenest shut, no passports to be had, town hall emissaries, with the eyes and claws of falcons, flitting watchful on all points of your horizon. In two words, tribunal of the seventeenth, busy under howling galleries, Prussian Brunswick, over a space of forty miles, with his war tumbrils, and sleeping thunders, and Briarian, sixty-six thousand, right hands, coming, coming. O oh heavens, in these latter days of August, he is come. 
Durasoy was not yet guillotined when news had come that the Prussians were harrying and ravaging about Metz. In some four days more, one hears that Longley, our first strong place on the borders, is fallen, in fifteen hours. Quick, therefore, O ye improvised municipals, quick, and ever quicker, the improvised municipals make front to this also. Enrollment urges itself, and clothing, and arming. Our very officers have now, wool epaulets, for it is the reign of equality, and also of necessity. Neither do men now monsieur and sir one another, citoyen, citizen, were suitabler. We even say thou, as, the free peoples of antiquity did, so have journals and the improvised commune suggested, which shall be well. Infinitely better, meantime, could we suggest, where arms are to be found. For the present, our citoyens chant chorally to arms, and have no arms. Arms are searched for, passionately, there is joy over any musket. Moreover, entrenchments shall be made round Paris, on the slopes of Montmartre men dig and shovel. Though even the simple suspect this to be desperate. They dig, tricolor sashes speak encouragement and well speed ye. Nay finally, twelve members of the legislative go daily, not to encourage only, but to bear a hand, and delve, it was decreed with acclamation. Arms shall either be provided, or else the ingenuity of man crack itself, and become fatuity. Lean Beaumarchais, thinking to serve the fatherland, and do a stroke of trade, in the old way, has commissioned sixty thousand stand of good arms out of Holland, would to heaven, for fatherland's sake and his, they were come. Meanwhile railings are torn up, hammered into pikes, chains themselves shall be welded together, into pikes. The very coffins of the dead are raised, for melting into balls. All church bells must down into the furnace to make cannon. All church plate into the mint to make money. Also behold the fair swan bevies of citoyens that have alighted in churches, and sit there with swan neck, sewing tents and regimentals. Nor are patriotic gifts wanting, from those that have aught left, nor stingily given, the fair villains, mother and daughter, milliners in the Ruesti. Martin, give, a silver thimble, and a coin of fifteen sous, seven pence halfpenny, with other similar effects, and offer, at least the mother does, to mount guard. Men who have not even a thimble, give a thimbleful, were it but of invention. One citoyen has wrought out the scheme of a wooden cannon, which France shall exclusively profit by, in the first instance. It is to be made of staves, by the coopers, of almost boundless caliber, but uncertain as to strength. Thus they, hammering, scheming, stitching, founding, with all their heart and with all their soul. Two bells only are to remain in each parish, for toxin and other purposes. But mark also, precisely while the Prussian batteries were playing their briskest at Longwy in the northeast, and our dastardly Laverne saw nothing for it but surrender, southwestward, in remote, patriarchal Lavade. That sour ferment about non-juring priests, after long working, is ripe, and explodes, at the wrong moment for us. And so we have eight thousand peasants at Chatillon sur Sevre, who will not be balloted for soldiers, will not have their curates molested. To whom Bon Champs, La Roche Jacklins, and seigneurs enough, of a royalist turn, will join themselves. With stofflets and charrettes, with heroes and chuan smugglers, and the loyal warmth of a simple people, blown into flame and fury by theological and seigneurial bellows. So that there shall be fighting from behind ditches, death volleys bursting out of thickets and ravines of rivers, huts burning, feet of the pitiful women hurrying to refuge with their children on their back. Seed fields fallow, whitened with human bones. Eighty thousand, of all ages, ranks, sexes, flying at once across the lawyer, with whale borne far on the winds, and, in brief, for years coming, such a suite of scenes as glorious war has not offered in these late ages. Not since our Albigenses and Crusadings were over, save indeed some chance palatinate, or so, we might have to, burn, by way of exception. The, eight thousand at Chatillon, will be got dispelled for the moment, the fire scattered, not extinguished. To the dints and bruises of outward battle there is to be added henceforth a deadlier internal gangrene. This rising in Lavade reports itself at Paris on Wednesday the 29th of August, 
just as we had got our electors elected, and, in spite of Brunswick's and Longley's teeth, were hoping still to have a national convention, if it pleased heaven. But indeed, otherwise, this Wednesday is to be regarded as one of the notablest Paris had yet seen, gloomy tidings come successively, like Job's messengers, are met by gloomy answers. Of Sardinia rising to invade the southeast, and Spain threatening the south, we do not speak. But are not the Prussians masters of Longley, treacherously yielded, one would say, and preparing to besiege Verdun? Clare Fate and his Austrians are encompassing Thionville, darkening the north. Not Metz land now, but the Clermontais is getting harried, flying Hullens and Hazars have been seen on the Chalens Road, almost as far as St. Menehauld. Heart, ye patriots, if ye lose heart, ye lose all. It is not without a dramatic emotion that one reads in the parliamentary debates of this Wednesday evening, past seven o'clock, the scene with the military fugitives from Longley. Wayworn, dusty, disheartened, these poor men enter the legislative, about sunset or after. Give the most pathetic detail of the frightful past they were in, Prussians billowing round by the myriad, volcanically spouting fire for fifteen hours, we, scattered sparse on the ramparts, hardly a cannoneer to two guns. Our dastard Commandant Laverne nowhere shooing face, the priming would not catch, there was no powder in the bombs, what could we do? Murir. Die, answer prompt voices, and the dusty fugitives must shrink elsewhither for comfort. Yes, Murir, that is now the word. Be long we a proverb and a hissing among French strong places, let it, says the legislative, be obliterated rather, from the shamed face of the earth. And so there has gone forth decree, that long we shall, were the Prussians once out of it, be raised, and exist only as ploughed ground. Nor are the Jacobins milder, as how could they, the flower of patriotism. Poor Dame Laverne, wife of the poor commandant, took her parasol one evening, and escorted by her father came over to the hall of the mighty mother, and reads a memoir tending to justify the commandant of Longley. Lafarge, president, makes answer, Citoyen, the nation will judge Laverne, the Jacobins are bound to tell him the truth. He would have ended his course there, termin sa carrière, if he had loved the honor of his country. Chapter 3.1.2 Danton But better than raising of Longley, or rebuking poor dusty soldiers or soldiers' wives, Danton had come over, last night, and demanded a decree to search for arms, since they were not yielded voluntarily. Let domiciliary visits, with rigor of authority, be made to this end. To search for arms, for horses, aristocratism rolls in its carriage, while patriotism cannot trail its cannon. To search generally for munitions of war, in the houses of persons suspect, and even, if it seem proper, to seize and imprison the suspect persons themselves. In the prisons, their plots will be harmless. In the prisons, they will be as hostages for us, and not without use. This decree the energetic Minister of Justice demanded, last night, and got, and this same night it is to be executed. It is being executed, at the moment when these dusty soldiers get saluted with Murir. Two thousand stand of arms, as they count, are foraged in this way, and some four hundred head of new prisoners. And, on the whole, such a terror and damp is struck through the aristocrat heart, as all but patriotism, and even patriotism were it out of this agony, might pity. Yes, Messrs. If Brunswick blast Paris to ashes, he probably will blast the prisons of Paris too, pale terror, if we have got it, we will also give it, and the depth of horrors that lie in it, the same leaky bottom, in these wild waters, bears us all. One can judge what stir there was now among the thirty thousand royalists how the plotters, or the accused of plotting, shrank each closer into his lurking place, like Bertrand Mulville, looking eager towards Longley. Hoping the weather would keep fair. Or how they dressed themselves in valet's clothes, like Narbonne, and got to England as Dr. Ballman's famulus, how Dame de Stahl bestirred herself, pleading with Manuel as a sister in literature, pleading even with Clerk Tauline. A prey to nameless chagrins. Royalist Peltier, the pamphleteer, gives a touching narrative, not deficient in height of coloring, of the terrors of that night. From five in the afternoon, a great city is struck suddenly silent. 
except for the beating of drums, for the tramp of marching feet, and ever and anon the dread thunder of the knocker at some door, a tricolor commissioner with his blue guards, black guards, arriving. All streets are vacant, says Peltier. Beset by guards at each end, all citizens are ordered to be within doors. On the river float sentinel barges, lest we escape by water, the barriers hermetically closed. Frightful. The sun shines. Serenely westering, in smokeless mackerel sky, Paris is as if sleeping, as if dead, Paris is holding its breath, to see what stroke will fall on it. Poor Peltier. Acts of apostles, and all jocundity of leading articles, are gone out, and it is become bitter earnest instead, polished satire changed now into coarse pike points, hammered out of railing. All logic reduced to this one primitive thesis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, Peltier, dolefully aware of it, ducks low, escapes unscathed to England, to urge there the inky war anew. To have trial by jury, in due season, and deliverance by young Whig eloquence, world celebrated for a day. Of thirty thousand, naturally, great multitudes were left unmolested, but, as we said, some four hundred, designated as, persons suspect, were seized, and an unspeakable terror fell on all. What to him who is guilty of plotting, of antecivism, royalism, fuelantism, who, guilty or not guilty, has an enemy in his section to call him guilty? Poor old M. the Kazat is seized, his young loved daughter with him, refusing to quit him. Why, O oh Kazat, wouldst thou quit romancing, and diable Amuru, for such reality as this? Poor old M. De Sombruel, he of the invalids, is seized, a man seen askance, by patriotism ever since the Bastille days, whom also a fond daughter will not quit. With young tears hardly suppressed, and old wavering weakness rousing itself once more, O oh my brothers, O oh my sisters! The famed and named go, the nameless, if they have an accuser. Necklace Lamotte's husband is in these prisons, she long since squelched on the London pavements, but gets delivered. Gros de Morande, of the Courier de l'Europe, hobbles distractedly to and fro there, but they let him hobble out. On right nimble crutches, his hour not being yet come. Advocate Maiden de la Varenne, very weak in health, is snatched off from mother and kin. Tricolor Rossignol, journeyman goldsmith and scoundrel lately, a risen man now, remembers an old pleading of Maiden's. Jurniac de saint mirde goes. The brisk Frank soldier, he was in the mutiny of Nancy, in that effervescent regiment du Roy, on the wrong side. Saddest of all, Abbe Sicard goes. A priest who could not take the oath, but who could teach the deaf and dumb, in his section one man, he says, had a grudge at him, one man, at the fit hour, launches an arrest against him, which hits. In the arsenal quarter, there are dumb hearts making wail, with signs, with wild gestures, he their miraculous healer and speech-bringer is rapt away. What with the arrestments on this night of the twenty-ninth, what with those that have gone on more or less, day and night, ever since the tenth, one may fancy what the prisons now were. Crowding in confusion, jostle, hurry, vehemence and terror. Of the poor queen's friends, who had followed her to the temple and been committed elsewhither to prison, some, as governess de Terzel, are to be let go, one, the poor princess de Lamballe, is not let go. But waits in the strong rooms of La Force there, what will betide further? Among so many hundreds whom the launched arrest hits, who are rolled off to town hall or section hall, to preliminary houses of detention, and hurled in thither, as into cattle pens, we must mention one other, Karen de Beaumarchais, author of Figaro. Vanquisher of Mopia parliaments and Gozman hell dogs, once numbered among the demigods, and now. We left him in his culminant state, what dreadful decline is this, when we again catch a glimpse of him. At midnight, it was but the twelfth of August yet, the servant, in his shirt, with wide staring eyes, enters your room, monsieur, rise, all the people are come to seek you, they are knocking, like to break in the door. And they were in fact knocking in a terrible manner, dune fake and terrible. I fling on my coat, forgetting even the waistcoat, nothing on my feet but slippers, and say to him, and he, alas, answers mere negatory incoherences, panic interjections. 
and through the shutters and crevices, in front or rearward, the dull street lamps disclose only streetfuls of haggard countenances, clamorous, bristling with pikes, and you rush distracted for an outlet, finding none. And have to take refuge in the crockery press, downstairs, and stand there, palpitating in that imperfect costume, lights dancing past your keyhole, tramp of feet overhead, and the tumult of Satan, for four hours and more. And old ladies, of the quarter, started up, as we hear next morning, rang for their bonds and cordial drops, with shrill interjections, and old gentlemen, in their shirts, leapt garden walls, flying, while none pursued. One of whom unfortunately broke his leg. Those sixty thousand stand of Dutch arms, which never arrive, and the bold stroke of trade, have turned out so ill. Beaumarchais escaped for this time, but not for the next time, ten days after. On the evening of the twenty-ninth he is still in that chaos of the prisons, in saddest, wrestling condition, unable to get justice, even to get audience, Panis scratching his head when you speak to him, and making off. Nevertheless let the lover of Figaro know that Procure Manuel, a brother in literature, found him, and delivered him once more. But how the lean demigod, now shorn of his splendor, had to lurk in barns, to roam over harrowed fields, panting for life and to wait under eavesdrops, and sit in darkness, on the boulevard amid paving stones and boulders, longing for one word of any minister, or minister's clerk, about those accursed Dutch muskets, and getting none, with heart fuming in spleen. And terror, and suppressed canine madness, alas, how the swift sharp hound, once fit to be Diana's, breaks his old teeth now, gnawing mere windstones. And must, fly to England, and, returning from England, must creep into the corner, and lie quiet, toothless, moneyless, all this let the lover of Figaro fancy, and weep for. We here, without weeping, not without sadness, wave the withered tough fellow mortal our farewell. His Figaro has returned to the French stage, nay is, at this day, sometimes named the best piece there. And indeed, so long as man's life can ground itself only on artificiality and aridity. Each new revolt and change of dynasty turning up only a new stratum of dry rubbish, and no soil yet coming to view, may it not be good to protest against such a life, in many ways, and even in the Figaro way. Chapter 3.1.3 De Mouye Such are the last days of August, 1792, days gloomy, disastrous, and of evil omen. What will become of this poor France? Du Maurier rode from the camp of Mauld, eastward to Sedan, on Tuesday last, the 28th of the month. Reviewed that so-called army left forlorn there by Lafayette, the forlorn soldiers gloomed on him, were heard growling on him, this is one of them, C.E.B., E. La, that made war be declared. Unpromising army. Recruits flow in, filtering through depot after depot, but recruits merely, in one of all, happy if they have so much as arms. And Longwy has fallen basely, and Brunswick, and the Prussian king, with his sixty thousand, will beleaguer Verdun. And Clare fate and Austrians press deeper in, over the northern marches, a hundred and fifty thousand, as fear counts, eighty thousand, as the return shoe, do hem us in, Cimmerian Europe behind them. There is Castries and Broy chivalry. Royalist foot, in red facing and nankeen trousers, breathing death and the gallows. And lo, finally. At Verdun on Sunday the 2d of September 1792, Brunswick is here. With his king and sixty thousand, glittering over the heights, from beyond the winding Meuse River, he looks down on us, on our, high citadel, and all our confectionery ovens, for we are celebrated for confectionery, has sent courteous summons. In order to spare the effusion of blood. Resist him to the death. Every day of retardation precious. How, O oh General Beaurepaire, asks the amazed municipality, shall we resist him? We, the Verdun municipals, see no resistance possible. Has he not sixty thousand, and artillery without end? Retardation, patriotism is good, but so likewise is peaceable baking of pastry, and sleeping in whole skin. Hapless Beaurepaire stretches out his hands, and pleads passionately, in the name of country, honor, of heaven and of earth, to no purpose. The municipals have, by law, 
the power of ordering it, with an army officered by royalism or crypto-royalism, such a law seemed needful, and they order it, as pacific pastry cooks, not as heroic patriots would, to surrender. Borapir strides home, with long steps, his valet, entering the room, sees him, writing eagerly, and withdraws. His valet hears then, in a few minutes, the report of a pistol, Borapir is lying dead. His eager writing had been a brief suicidal farewell. In this manner died Borapir, wept of France, buried in the Pantheon, with honorable pension to his widow, and for epitaph these words, he chose death rather than yield to despots. The Prussians, descending from the heights, are peaceable masters of Verdun. And so Brunswick advances, from stage to stage, who shall now stay him, covering forty miles of country. Foragers fly far, the villages of the northeast are harried. Your Hessian forager has only three sous a day, the very emigrants, it is said, will take silver plate, by way of revenge. Clermont, St. Menehauld, Varennes especially, ye towns of the Knight of Spurs, tremble ye. Procure sauce and the magistracy of Varennes have fled, brave Boniface Le Blanc of the Bras d'Or is to the woods, Mrs. Le Blanc, a young woman fair to look upon, with her young infant, has to live in Greenwood, like a beautiful Bessie Belle of Song, her bower thatched with rushes, catching premature rheumatism. Clermont may ring the toxin now, and illuminate itself. Clermont lies at the foot of its cow, or vash, so they name that mountain, a prey to the Hessian spoiler, its fair women, fairer than most, are robbed, not of life, or what is dearer, yet of all that is cheaper and portable. For necessity, on three halfpence a day, has no law. At St. Menehauld, the enemy has been expected more than once, our nationals all turning out in arms, but was not yet seen. Postmaster Druet, he is not in the woods, but minding his election. And will sit in the convention, notable king-taker, and bold old dragoon as he is. Thus on the northeast all roams and runs. And on a set day, the date of which is irrecoverable by history, Brunswick has engaged to dine in Paris, the powers willing. And at Paris, in the centre, it is as we saw, and in Lavade, southwest, it is as we saw. And Sardinia is in the southeast, and Spain is in the south, and Clare fate with Austria and sieged Thionville is in the north, and all France leaps distracted, like the winnowed Sahara waltzing in sand colonnades. More desperate posture no country ever stood in. A country, one would say, which the majesty of Prussia, if it so pleased him, might partition, and clip in pieces, like a Poland. Flinging the remainder to poor brother Louis, with directions to keep it quiet, or else we will keep it for him. Or perhaps the upper powers, minded that a new chapter in universal history shall begin here and not further on, may have ordered it all otherwise? In that case, Brunswick will not dine in Paris on the set day, nor, indeed, one knows not when. Verily, amid this wreckage, where poor France seems grinding itself down to dust and bottomless ruin, who knows what miraculous salient point of deliverance and new life may have already come into existence there. And be already working there, though as yet human I discern it not. On the night of that same 28th of August, the unpromising review day in Sedan, Du Maurier assembles a council of war at his lodgings there. He spreads out the map of this forlorn war district, Prussians here, Austrians there, triumphant both, with broad highway, and little hindrance, all the way to Paris, we, scattered helpless, here and here, what to advise. The generals, strangers to de Maurier, look blank enough, know not well what to advise, if it be not retreating, and retreating till our recruits accumulate, till perhaps the chapter of chances turn up some leaf for us. Or Paris, at all events, be sacked at the latest day possible. The many counseled, who has not closed an eye for three nights, listens with little speech to these long cheerless speeches, merely watching the speaker that he may know him. Then wishes them all good night, but beckons a certain young Thuvenot, the fire of whose looks had pleased him, to wait a moment. Thuvenot waits, voila, says Polymedes, pointing to the map. That is the forest of Argonne, that long stripe of rocky mountain and wild wood, forty miles long. With but five, or say even three practicable passes through it, 
this, for they have forgotten it, might one not still seize, though Claire fate sits so nigh. Once seized. The champagne called the hungry, or worse, champagne pouilleuse, on their side of it, the fat three bishoprics, and willing France, on ours, and the equinox reigns not far, this Argonne might be the Thermopylae of France. O brisk de Mourier Palamides with thy teeming head, may the gods grant it, Palamides, at any rate, folds his map together, and flings himself on bed, resolved to try, on the morrow morning. With astucity, with swiftness, with audacity. One had need to be a lion fox, and have luck on one side. Chapter 3.1.4 September in Paris At Paris, by lying rumor which proved prophetic and veridical, the fall of Verdun was known some hours before it happened. It is Sunday the 2nd of September, handiwork hinders not the speculations of the mind. Verdun gone, though some still deny it, the Prussians in full march, with gallows ropes, with fire and faggot. Thirty thousand aristocrats within our own walls, and but the merest quarter tithe of them yet put in prison. Nay there goes a word that even these will revolt. Sieur Jean Julien, Wagoner of Vaugerard, being set in the pillory last Friday, took all at once to crying, that he would be well revenged ere long, that the king's friends in prison would burst out, force the temple, set the king on horseback. And, joined by the unimprisoned, ride rushod over us all. This the unfortunate wagoner of Vaugerard did bawl, at the top of his lungs, when snatched off to the town hall, he persisted in it, still bawling. Yesternight, when they guillotined him, he died with the froth of it on his lips. For a man's mind, padlocked to the pillory, may go mad, and all men's minds may go mad, and, believe him, as the frenetic will do, because it is impossible. So that apparently the knot of the crisis, and last agony of France is come. Make front to this, thou improvised commune, strong Danton, whatsoever man is strong. Readers can judge whether the flag of country in danger flapped soothing or distractively on the souls of men, that day. But the improvised commune, but strong Danton is not wanting, each after his kind. Huge placards are getting plastered to the walls, at two o'clock the storm bell shall be sounded, the alarm cannon fired, all Paris shall rush to the Champ de Mars, and have itself enrolled. Unarmed, truly, and undrilled. But desperate, in the strength of frenzy. Haste, ye men. Ye very women, offer to mount guard and shoulder the brown musket, weak clucking hens, in a state of desperation, will fly at the muzzle of the mastiff, and even conquer him, by vehemence of character. Terror itself, when once grown transcendental, becomes a kind of courage, as frost sufficiently intense, according to poet Milton, will burn. Danton, the other night, in the Legislative Committee of General Defense, when the other ministers and legislators had all opined, said, it would not do to quit Paris, and fly to Saumur, that they must abide by Paris. And take such attitude as would put their enemies in fear, fair pair, a word of his which has been often repeated, and reprinted, in italics. At two of the clock, Borapair, as we saw, has shot himself at Verdun. And over Europe, mortals are going in for afternoon sermon. But at Paris, all steeples are clangoring not for sermon, the alarm gun booming from minute to minute. Champ de Mars and Fatherland's altar boiling with desperate terror courage, what a miserere going up to heaven from this once capital of the most Christian king. The legislative sits in alternate awe and effervescence. Vergniaud proposing that twelve shall go and dig personally on Montmartre, which is decreed by acclaim. But better than digging personally with acclaim, see Danton enter, the black brows clouded, the colossus figure tramping heavy. Grim energy looking from all features of the rugged man. Strong is that grim son of France, and son of earth, a reality and not a formula he too, and surely now if ever, being hurled low enough, it is on the earth and on realities that he rests. Legislators, so speaks the stentor voice, as the newspapers yet preserve it for us, it is not the alarm cannon that you hear, it is the pot charge against our enemies. To conquer them, to hurl them back, what do we require? Il news faux de l'audis, et encore de l'audis, et toujours de l'audis, to dare, and again to dare, 
and without end to dare. Right so, thou brawny titan, there is nothing left for thee but that. Old men, who heard it, will still tell you how the reverberating voice made all hearts swell, in that moment, and braced them to the sticking place, and thrilled abroad over France, like electric virtue, as a word spoken in season. But the commune, enrolling in the Champ de Mars? But the Committee of Watchfulness, become now Committee of Public Salvation, whose conscience is Marat. The commune enrolling enrolls many. Provides tents for them in that Mars field, that they may march with dawn on the morrow, praise to this part of the commune. To Marat and the Committee of Watchfulness not praise. Not even blame, such as could be meted out in these insufficient dialects of ours, expressive silence rather. Lone Marat, the man forbid, meditating long in his cellars of refuge, on his stylite's pillar, could see salvation in one thing only, in the fall of 260,000 aristocrat heads. With so many score of Naples bravos, each a dirk in his right hand, a muff on his left, he would traverse France, and do it. But the world laughed, mocking the severe benevolence of a people's friend. And his idea could not become an action, but only a fixed idea. Lo, now, however, he has come down from his stylite's pillar, to a tribune particular. Here now, without the dirks, without the muffs at least, were it not grown possible, now in the knot of the crisis, when salvation or destruction hangs in the hour. The ice tower of Avignon was noised of sufficiently, and lives in all memories. But the authors were not punished, nay we saw Jordan Cooktet, born on men's shoulders, like a copper portent, traversing the cities of the south. What phantasms, squalid horrid, shaking their dirk and muff, may dance through the brain of a marat, in this dizzy peeling of toxin miserere, and universal frenzy, seek not to guess, O reader. Nor what the cruel Bill Laud, in his short brown coat was thinking, nor surgeant, not yet agate surgeant, nor Panis the confidant of Danton. Nor, in a word, how gloomy Orcus does breed in her gloomy womb, and fashion her monsters, and prodigies of events, which thou sayest her visibly bear. Terror is on these streets of Paris. Terror and rage, tears and frenzy, toxin miserere peeling through the air, fierce desperation rushing to battle, mothers, with streaming eyes and wild hearts, sending forth their sons to die. Carriage horses are seized by the bridle, that they may draw a cannon, the traces cut, the carriages left standing. In such toxin miserere, and murky bewilderment of frenzy, are not murder, eight, and all furies near at hand. On slight hint, who knows on how slight, may not murder come, and, with her snaky sparkling hand, illuminate this murk. How it was and went, what part might be premeditated, what was improvised and accidental, man will never know, till the great day of judgment make it known. But with a marat for keeper of the sovereign's conscience, and we know what the ultima ratio of sovereigns, when they are driven to it, is. In this Paris there are as many wicked men, say a hundred or more, as exist in all the earth, to be hired, and set on, to set on, of their own accord, unhired. And yet we will remark that premeditation itself is not performance, is not surety of performance, that it is perhaps, at most, surety of letting whosoever wills perform. From the purpose of crime to the act of crime there is an abyss. Wonderful to think of. The finger lies on the pistol, but the man is not yet a murderer, nay, his whole nature staggering at such consummation, is there not a confused pause rather, one last instant of possibility for him? Not yet a murderer. It is at the mercy of light trifles whether the most fixed idea may not yet become unfixed. One slight twitch of a muscle, the death flash bursts, and he is it, and will for eternity be it, and earth has become a penal Tartarus for him. His horizon girdled now not with golden hope, but with red flames of remorse, voices from the depths of nature sounding, woe, woe on him. Of such stuff are we all made, on such powder mines of bottomless guilt and criminality, if God restrain not. As is well said, does the purest of us walk. There are depths in man that go the length of lowest hell, as there are heights that reach highest heaven. For are not both heaven and hell made out of him, made by him, everlasting miracle and mystery as he is, but looking on this champ de Mars, with its tent buildings, and frantic enrollments. 
On this murky simmering Paris, with its crammed prisons, supposed about to burst, with its toxin miserere, its mother's tears, and soldiers' farewell shoutings, the pious soul might have prayed, that day, that God's grace would restrain. And greatly restrain. Lest on slight hest or hint, madness, horror and murder rose, and this Sabbath day of September became a day black in the annals of men. The toxin is pealing its loudest, the clocks inaudibly striking three, when poor Abbe Sicard, with some thirty other nonjurant priests, in six carriages, fare along the streets, from their preliminary house of detention at the town hall. Westward towards the prison of the Abbe. Carriages enough stand deserted on the streets, these six move on, through angry multitudes, cursing as they move. A cursed aristocrat Tartuffs, this is the pass ye have brought us to. And now ye will break the prisons, and set Cape at Vito on horseback to ride over us? Out upon you, priests of Beelzebub and Moloch, of Tartuffery, Mammon, and the Prussian gallows, which ye name Mother Church and God. Such reproaches have the poor nonjurants to endure, and worse, spoken in on them by frantic patriots, who mount even on the carriage steps, the very guards hardly refraining. Pull up your carriage blinds, no. Answers patriotism, clapping its horny paw on the carriage blind, and crushing it down again. Patience and oppression has limits, we are close on the abbe, it has lasted long, a poor nonjurant, of quicker temper, smites the horny paw with his cane. Nay, finding solacement in it, smites the unkempt head, sharply and again more sharply, twice over, seen clearly of us and of the world. It is the last that we see clearly. Alas, next moment, the carriages are locked and blocked in endless raging tumults, in yells deaf to the cry for mercy, which answer the cry for mercy with saber thrusts through the heart. The thirty priests are torn out, are massacred about the prison gate, one after one, only the poor Abbe Sicard, whom one Motana watchmaker, knowing him, heroically tried to save, and secrete in the prison, escapes to tell. And it is night and Orcus, and murder's snaky sparkling head has risen in the murk. From Sunday afternoon, exclusive of intervals, and pauses not final, till Thursday evening, there follow consecutively a hundred hours. Which hundred hours are to be reckoned with the hours of the Bartholomew butchery, of the Armagnac massacres, Sicilian vespers, or whatsoever is savagest in the annals of this world? Horrible the hour when man's soul, in its paroxysm, spurns asunder the barriers and rules, and shews what dens and depths are in it. For night and Orcus, as we say, as was long prophesied, have burst forth, here in this Paris, from their subterranean imprisonment, hideous, dim, confused, which it is painful to look on. And yet which cannot, and indeed which should not, be forgotten. The reader, who looks earnestly through this dim phantasmagory of the pit, will discern few fixed certain objects, and yet still a few. He will observe, in this abbey prison, the sudden massacre of the priests being once over, a strange court of justice, or call it court of revenge and wild justice, swiftly fashion itself, and take seat round a table. With the prison registers spread before it. Stanislas Maillard, Bastille hero, famed leader of the Menads, presiding. O Stanislas, one hope to meet thee elsewhere than here, thou shifty riding usher, with an inkling of law. This work also thou hadst to do. And then, to depart for ever from our eyes. At La Force, at the Chatelet, the Conciergerie, the like court forms itself, with the like accompaniments, the thing that one man does other men can do. There are some seven prisons in Paris, full of aristocrats with conspiracies, nay not even by Cedar and Salpetrier shall escape, with their forgers of assignats, and there are seventy times seven hundred patriot hearts in a state of frenzy. Scoundrel hearts also there are, as perfect, say, as the earth holds, if such are needed. To whom, in this mood, law is as no law, and killing, by what name soever called, is but work to be done. So sit these sudden courts of wild justice, with the prison registers before them, unwanted wild tumult howling all round, the prisoners in dread expectancy within. Swift, a name is called, bolts jingle, a prisoner is there. A few questions are put. Swiftly this sudden jury decides, royalist plotter or not. 
Clearly not, in that case, let the prisoner be enlarged with vive la nation. Probably yeah, then still, let the prisoner be enlarged, but without vive la nation. Or else it may run, let the prisoner be conducted to la force. At la force again their formula is, let the prisoner be conducted to the abbaye. to la force then. Volunteer bailiffs seize the doomed man, he is at the outer gate. Enlarged, or, conducted, not into la force, but into a howling sea, forth, under an arch of wild sabres, axes and pikes, and sinks, hewn asunder. And another sinks, and another. And there forms itself a piled heap of corpses, and the kennels begin to run red. Fancy the yells of these men, their faces of sweat and blood, the crueler shrieks of these women, for there are women too. And a fellow mortal hurled naked into it all. Jurniac de saint Mird has seen battle, has seen an effervescent regiment do roy in mutiny, but the bravest heart may quail at this. The Swiss prisoners, remnants of the 10th of August, clasped each other spasmodically, and hung back, grey veterans crying, Mercy Messers, ah, mercy. But there was no mercy. Suddenly, however, one of these men steps forward. He had a blue frock coat, he seemed to be about thirty, his stature was above common, his look noble and martial. I go first, said he, since it must be so, adieu. Then dashing his hat sharply behind him, which way? Cried he to the brigands, shoo at me, then. They open the folding gate, he is announced to the multitude. He stands a moment motionless, then plunges forth among the pikes, and dies of a thousand wounds. Man after man is cut down. The sabres need sharpening, the killers refresh themselves from wine jugs. Onward and onward goes the butchery, the loud yells wearying down into bass growls. A somber-faced, shifting multitude looks on, in dull approval, or dull disapproval. In dull recognition that it is necessity. An anglais in drab greatcoat was seen, or seemed to be seen, serving liquor from his own dram bottle, for what purpose, if not set on by Pitt, Satan and himself no best. Witty Dr. Moore grew sick on approaching, and turned into another street that, quick enough goes this jury court, and rigorous. The brave are not spared, nor the beautiful, nor the weak. Old M. De Montmorin, the minister's brother, was acquitted by the tribunal of the 17th, and conducted back, elbowed by howling galleries, but is not acquitted here. Princess de Lamballe has lain down on bed, Madam, you are to be removed to the abbey. I do not wish to remove, I am well enough here. There is a need be for removing. She will arrange her dress a little, then. Rude voices answer, you have not far to go. She too is led to the Hellgate, a manifest queen's friend. She shivers back, at the sight of bloody sabres, but there is no return, onwards. That fair hindhead is cleft with the axe. The neck is severed. That fair body is cut in fragments, with indignities, and obscene horrors of Mustachio Grand's levers, which human nature would fain find incredible, which shall be read in the original language only. She was beautiful, she was good, she had known no happiness. Young hearts, generation after generation, will think with themselves, O oh, worthy of worship, thou king descended, God descended, and poor sister woman. Why was not I there? And some sword bamung, or Thor's hammer in my hand. Her head is fixed on a pike, paraded under the windows of the temple, that a still more hated, a Marie Antoinette, may see. One municipal, in the temple with the royal prisoners at the moment, said, Look out. Another eagerly whispered, Do not look. The circuit of the temple is guarded, in these hours, by a long stretch tricolor ribboned, terror enters, and the clangor of infinite tumult, hitherto not regicide, though that too may come. But it is more edifying to note what thrillings of affection, what fragments of wild virtues turn up, in this shaking asunder of man's existence, for of these two there is a proportion. Note old Marquis Cazat, he is doomed to die. But his young daughter clasps him in her arms, with an inspiration of eloquence, with a love which is stronger than very death, the heart of the killers themselves is touched by it, the old man is spared. Yet he was guilty, 
if plotting for his king is guilt, in ten days more, a court of law condemned him, and he had to die elsewhere, bequeathing his daughter a lock of his old grey hair. Or note old M. de Sombreuil, who also had a daughter, my father is not an aristocrat, O oh good gentleman, I will swear it, and testify it, and in all ways prove it, we are not, we hate aristocrats. Wilt thou drink aristocrats' blood? The man lifts blood, if universal rumour can be credited, the poor maiden does drink. This Sombreuil is innocent then. Yes indeed, and now note, most of all, how the bloody pikes, at this news, do rattle to the ground. And the tiger yells become bursts of jubilee over a brother saved, and the old man and his daughter are clasped to bloody bosoms, with hot tears, and borne home in triumph of vive la nation, the killers refusing even money. Does it seem strange, this temper of theirs? It seems very certain, well proved by royalist testimony in other instances, and very significant. Chapter 3.1.V A Trilogy As all delineation, in these ages, were it never so epic, speaking itself and not singing itself, must either found on belief and provable fact, or have no foundation at all, nor accept as floating cobweb any existence at all. The reader will perhaps prefer to take a glance with the very eyes of eyewitnesses. And see, in that way, for himself, how it was. Brave Jurniac, innocent Abbe Sicard, judicious advocate maiden, these, greatly compressing themselves, shall speak, each an instant. Jurniac's agony of thirty-eight hours went through, above a hundred editions, though intrinsically a poor work. Some portion of it may here go through above the hundred and first, for want of a better. Towards seven o'clock, Sunday night, at the Abbey, for Jurniac goes by dates, we saw two men enter, their hands bloody and armed with sabres, a turnkey, with a torch, lighted them, he pointed to the bed of the unfortunate Swiss, Redding. Redding spoke with a dying voice. One of them paused, but the other cried Alan's donk, lifted the unfortunate man, carried him out on his back to the street. He was massacred there. We all looked at one another in silence, we clasped each other's hands. Motionless, with fixed eyes, we gazed on the pavement of our prison, on which lay the moonlight, checkered with the triple stanchions of our windows. Three in the morning, they were breaking in one of the prison doors. We at first thought they were coming to kill us in our room, but heard, by voices on the staircase, that it was a room where some prisoners had barricaded themselves. They were all butchered there, as we shortly gathered. Ten o'clock, the Abbe Lenfant and the Abbe de Chaptrastignac appeared in the pulpit of the chapel, which was our prison, they had entered by a door from the stairs. They said to us that our end was at hand, that we must compose ourselves, and receive their last blessing. An electric movement, not to be defined, threw us all on our knees, and we received it. These two white-haired old men, blessing us from their place above, death hovering over our heads, on all hands environing us, the moment is never to be forgotten. Half an hour after, they were both massacred, and we heard their cries. Thus Jurniac in his agony in the abbey. But now let the good maiden speak, what he, over in La Force, in the same hours, is suffering and witnessing. This resurrection by him is greatly the best, the least theatrical of these pamphlets. And stands testing by documents. Toward seven o'clock, on Sunday night, prisoners were called frequently, and they did not reappear. Each of us reasoned in his own way, on this singularity, but our ideas became calm, as we persuaded ourselves that the memorial I had drawn up for the National Assembly was producing effect. At one in the morning, the grate which led to our quarter opened anew. For men in uniform, each with a drawn sabre and blazing torch, came up to our corridor, preceded by a turnkey and entered an apartment close to ours, to investigate a box there, which we heard them break up. This done, they stepped into the gallery, and questioned the man Quissa, to know where Lamotte, Necklace's widower, was. Lamotte, they said, had some months ago, under pretext of a treasure he knew of, swindled a sum of three hundred livres from one of them, inviting him to dinner for that purpose. The wretched Quissa, now in their hands, who indeed lost his life this night, answered trembling, that he remembered the fact well, but could not tell what was become of Lamotte. 
Determined to find Lamotte and confront him with Quissa, they rummaged, along with this ladder, through various other apartments, but without effect, for we heard them say, Come search among the corpses then, for, nom de Dieu. We must find where he is. At this time, I heard Louis Barty, the Abbe Barty's name called, he was brought out, and directly massacred, as I learnt. He had been accused, along with his concubine, five or six years before, of having murdered and cut in pieces his own brother, auditor of the Chamber de Comps of Montpellier. But had by his subtlety, his dexterity, nay his eloquence, outwitted the judges, and escaped. One may fancy what terror these words, come search among the corpses then, had thrown me into. I saw nothing for it now but resigning myself to die. I wrote my last will, concluding it by a petition and adjuration, that the paper should be sent to its address. Scarcely had I quitted the pen, when there came two other men in uniform. One of them, whose arm and sleeve up to the very shoulder, as well as the saber, were covered with blood, said, he was as weary as a hodman that had been beating plaster. Baudin de la Chennai was called, sixty years of virtues could not save him. They said, I'll obey, he passed the fatal outer gate, gave a cry of terror, at sight of the heaped corpses, covered his eyes with his hands, and died of innumerable wounds. At every new opening of the grate, I thought I should hear my own name called, and see Rossignol enter. I flung off my nightgown and cap, I put on a coarse unwashed shirt, a worn frock without waistcoat, an old round hat. These things I had sent for, some days ago, in the fear of what might happen. The rooms of this corridor had been all emptied but ours. We were four together. Whom they seemed to have forgotten, we addressed our prayers in common to the Eternal to be delivered from this peril. Baptiste the turnkey came up by himself, to see us. I took him by the hands, I conjured him to save us. Promised him a hundred louis, if he would conduct me home. A noise coming from the grates made him hastily withdraw. It was the noise of some dozen or fifteen men, armed to the teeth. As we, lying flat to escape being seen, could see from our windows, upstairs, said they, let not one remain. I took out my penknife. I considered where I should strike myself, but reflected that the blade was too short, and also, on religion. Finally, however, between seven and eight o'clock in the morning, enter four men with bludgeons and sabres. To one of whom Gerard my comrade whispered, earnestly, apart. During their colloquy I searched everywhere for shoes, that I might lay off the advocate pumps, pantoufles de palais, I had on, but could find none. Constant, called Le Savage, Gerard, and a third whose name escapes me, they let clear off, as for me, for sabres were crossed over my breast, and they led me down. I was brought to their bar. To the personage with the scarf, who sat as judge there. He was a lame man, of tall lank stature. He recognized me on the streets, and spoke to me seven months after. I have been assured that he was son of a retired attorney, and named Cheapy. Crossing the court called Des Nourices, I saw Manuel haranguing in tricolor scarf. The trial, as we see, ends in acquittal and resurrection. Poor Sicard, from the violin of the Abbey, shall say but a few words, true-looking, though tremulous. Towards three in the morning, the killers bethink them of this little violin, and knock from the court. I tap gently, trembling lest the murderers might hear, on the opposite door, where the section committee was sitting, they answered gruffly that they had no key. There were three of us in this violin. My companions thought they perceived a kind of loft overhead. But it was very high, only one of us could reach it, by mounting on the shoulders of both the others. One of them said to me, that my life was usefuler than theirs, I resisted, they insisted, no denial. I fling myself on the neck of these two deliverers, never was seen more touching. I mount on the shoulders of the first, then on those of the second, finally on the loft, and address to my two comrades the expression of a soul overwhelmed with natural emotions. The two generous companions, we rejoice to find, did not perish. But it is time that Jurniac de saint Myrd should speak his last words, and end this singular trilogy. The night had become day, 
and the day has again become night. Jernyak, worn down with uttermost agitation, has fallen asleep, and had a cheering dream, he has also contrived to make acquaintance with one of the volunteer bailiffs, and spoken in native Pravasal with him. On Tuesday, about one in the morning, his agony is reaching its crisis. By the glare of two torches, I now describe the terrible tribunal, where lay my life or my death. The president, in grey coats, with a sabre at his side, stood leaning with his hands against a table, on which were papers, an inkstand, tobacco pipes and bottles. Some ten persons were around, seated or standing. Two of whom had jackets and aprons, others were sleeping stretched on benches. Two men, in bloody shirts, guarded the door of the place, an old turnkey had his hand on the lock. In front of the president, three men held a prisoner, who might be about sixty inch, or seventy, he was old Marshal Mail, of the Tilleries and August 10th. They stationed me in a corner, my guards crossed their sabres on my breast. I looked on all sides for my Pravaso, two national guards, one of them drunk, presented some appeal from the section of Croix Rouge in favour of the prisoner, the man in grey answered, they are useless, these appeals for traitors. Then the prisoner exclaimed, it is frightful, your judgment is a murder. The president answered, my hands are washed of it, take em, mail away. They drove him into the street, where, through the opening of the door, I saw him massacred. The president sat down to write, registering, I suppose, the name of this one whom they had finished, then I heard him say, another, ah un autre. Behold me then hailed before this swift and bloody judgment bar, where the best protection was to have no protection, and all resources of ingenuity became null if they were not founded on truth. Two of my guards held me each by a hand, the third by the collar of my coat. Your name, your profession, said the president. The smallest lie ruins you, added one of the judges, my name is Jernyak St. Meard. I have served, as an officer, twenty years, and I appear at your tribunal with the assurance of an innocent man, who therefore will not lie. We shall see that, said the president, do you know why you are arrested? Yes, Monsieur le President. I am accused of editing the journal de la Cour et de la Ville. But I hope to prove the falsity. But no, Jernyak's proof of the falsity, and defense generally, though of excellent result as a defense, is not interesting to read. It is long-winded, there is a loose theatricality in the reporting of it, which does not amount to unveracity, yet which tends that way. We shall suppose him successful, beyond hope, in proving and disproving. And skip largely, to the catastrophe, almost at two steps. But after all, said one of the judges, there is no smoke without kindling, tell us why they accuse you of that. I was about to do so, Jernyak does so, with more and more success. Nay, continued I, they accuse me even of recruiting for the emigrants. At these words there arose a general murmur. Oh Messrs, Messrs, I exclaimed, raising my voice, it is my turn to speak, I beg M. Le President to have the kindness to maintain it for me, I never needed it more. True enough, true enough, said almost all the judges with a laugh, silence. While they were examining the testimonials I had produced, a new prisoner was brought in, and placed before the President. It was one priest more, they said, whom they had ferreted out of the chapelle. After very few questions, a la force. He flung his breviary on the table, was hurled forth, and massacred. I reappeared before the tribunal. You tell us always, cried one of the judges, with a tone of impatience, that you are not this, that you are not that, what are you then? I was an open royalist. There arose a general murmur, which was miraculously appeased by another of the men, who had seemed to take an interest in me, we are not here to judge opinions, said he, but to judge the results of them. Could Rousseau and Voltaire both in one, pleading for me, have said better, yes, Messrs, cried I, always till the 10th of August, I was an open royalist. Ever since the 10th of August that cause has been finished. I am a Frenchman, true to my country. I was always a man of honor. My soldiers never distrusted me. Nay, two days before that business of Nancy, when their suspicion of their officers was at its height, 
they chose me for commander, to lead them to Lunaville, to get back the prisoners of the regiment Mestreda camp, and seize General Malsenia. Which fact there is, most luckily, an individual present who by a certain token can confirm. The president, this cross-questioning being over, took off his hat and said, I see nothing to suspect in this man, I am for granting him his liberty. Is that your vote? To which all the judges answered, We, we, it is just. And there arose vivats within doors and without, escort of three, amid shoutings and embracings, thus Jurniak escaped from jury trial and the jaws of death. Maiden and Sicard did, either by trial, and no bill found, Lank President Cheapy finding absolutely nothing, or else by evasion, and new favor of Motan the brave watchmaker, likewise escape, and were embraced, and wept over. Weeping in return, as they well might. Thus they three, in wondrous trilogy, or triple soliloquy, uttering simultaneously, through the dread night watches, their night thoughts, grown audible to us. They three are become audible, but the other thousand and eighty-nine, of whom two hundred and two were priests, who also had night thoughts, remain inaudible, choked for ever in black death. Heard only of President Cheapy and the Man in Grey. Chapter 3.1.VI The Circular But the constituted authorities, all this while. The Legislative Assembly, the Six Ministers, the Town Hall, Santerre with the National Guard, it is very curious to think what a city is. Theatres, to the number of some twenty-three, were open every night during these prodigies, while right arms here grew weary with slaying, right arms there are twiddle deeing on melodious catgut. At the very instant when Abbe Sicard was clambering up his second pair of shoulders, three men high, five hundred thousand human individuals were lying horizontal, as if nothing were amiss. As for the poor legislative, the scepter had departed from it. The legislative did send deputation to the prisons, to the street courts, and poor M. de Saux did harangue there. But produced no conviction whatsoever, nay, at last, as he continued haranguing, the street court interposed, not without threats, and he had to cease, and withdraw. This is the same poor worthy old M. de Saux who told, or indeed almost sang, though with cracked voice, the taking of the Bastille, to our satisfaction long since. He was wont to announce himself, on such and on all occasions, as the translator of Juvenal. Good citizens, you see before you a man who loves his country, who is the translator of Juvenal, said he once. Juvenal, interrupts Sansculatism, who the devil is Juvenal? One of your sacred aristocrats. To the lantern. From an orator of this kind, conviction was not to be expected. The legislative had much ado to save one of its own members, or ex-members, Deputy Journeau, who chanced to be lying in arrest for mere parliamentary delinquencies, in these prisons. As for poor old de Saux and company, they returned to the Salle de Manege, saying, it was dark, and they could not see well what was going on. Roland writes indignant messages, in the name of order, humanity, and the law. But there is no force at his disposal. Santerre's national force seems lazy to rise, though he made requisitions, he says, which always dispersed again. Nay did not we, with advocate maiden's eyes, see men in uniform, too, with their sleeves bloody to the shoulder? Hessian goes in tricolor scarf, speaks the austere language of the law the killers give up, while he is there. When his back is turned, recommence. Manuel too in scarf we, with maiden's eyes, transiently saw haranguing, in the court called of nurses, cour de nurses. On the other hand, cruel Bill Laud, likewise in scarf, with that small puce coat and black wig we are used to on him, audibly delivers, standing among corpses, at the abbey, a short but ever memorable harangue, reported in various phraseology. But always to this purpose, brave citizens, you are extirpating the enemies of liberty. You are at your duty. A grateful commune, and country, would wish to recompense you adequately, but cannot, for you know its want of funds. Whoever shall have worked, travail, in a prison shall receive a draft of one Louis, payable by our cashier. Continue your work. The constituted authorities are of yesterday, all pulling different ways, there is properly not constituted authority, 
but every man is his own king. And all are kinglets, belligerent, allied, or armed neutral, without king over them. O everlasting infamy, exclaims Montgaillard, that Paris stood looking on in stupor for four days, and did not interfere. Very desirable indeed that Paris had interfered, yet not unnatural that it stood even so, looking on in stupor. Paris is in death panic, the enemy and gibbets at its door, whosoever in Paris has the heart to front death finds it more pressing to do it fighting the Prussians, than fighting the killers of aristocrats. Indignant abhorrence, as in Roland, may be here, gloomy sanction, premeditation or not, as in Marat and Committee of Salvation, may be there, dull disapproval, dull approval, and acquiescence in necessity and destiny, is the general temper. The sons of darkness, two hundred or so, risen from their lurking places, have scope to do their work. Urged on by fever frenzy of patriotism, and the madness of terror, urged on by lucre, and the gold Lewis of wages? Nay, not lucre, for the gold watches, rings, money of the massacred, are punctually brought to the town hall, by killers sans indispensables, who higgle afterwards for their twenty shillings of wages. And Sergeant sticking an uncommonly fine agate on his finger, fully meaning to account for it, becomes agate sergeant. But the temper, as we say, is dull acquiescence. Not till the patriotic or frenetic part of the work is finished for want of material. And sons of darkness, bent clearly on lucre alone, begin wrenching watches and purses, brooches from ladies' necks, to equip volunteers, in daylight, on the streets, does the temper from dull grow vehement. Does the constable raise his truncheon, and striking heartily, like a cattle driver in earnest, beat the course of things back into its old regulated drove roads. The guard mobile itself was surreptitiously plundered, on the seventeenth of the month, to Roland's new horror, who anew bestirs himself, and is, as Sighs says, the veto of scoundrels, Roland Vito de Cokins. This is the September Massacre, otherwise called, Severe Justice of the People. These are the Septemberers, Septemberers, a name of some note and lucency, but lucency of the nether fire sort. Very different from that of our Bastille heroes, who shone, disputable by no friend of freedom, as in heavenly light radiance, to such faces of the business have we advanced since then. The numbers massacred are, in historical fantasy, between two and three thousand, or indeed they are, upwards of six thousand, for Peltier, in vision, saw them massacring the very patients of the Bicedar madhouse, with grape shot. Nay finally they are, twelve thousand, and odd hundreds, not more than that. In arithmetical ciphers, and lists drawn up by accurate advocate maiden, the number, including two hundred and two priests, three, persons unknown, and, one thief killed at the Bernardines, is, as above hinted, a thousand and eighty-nine. No less than that. A thousand and eighty-nine lie dead, two hundred and sixty heaped carcasses on the Ponto change, itself among which, Robespierre pleading afterwards will nearly weep to reflect that there was said to be one slain innocent. 1. Not two, O thou sea green incorruptible. If so, Themis sans culotte must be lucky, for she was brief. In the dim registers of the town hall, which are preserved to this day, men read, with a certain sickness of heart, items and entries not usual in town books to workers employed in preserving the salubrity of the air in the prisons. And persons, who presided over these dangerous operations, so much, in various items, nearly seven hundred pounds sterling. To carters employed to, the burying grounds of Clamart, Montrouge, and Vaugerard, at so much a journey, per cart, this also is an entry. Then so many francs and odd sous, for the necessary quantity of quick lime. Carts go along the streets. Full of stripped human corpses, thrown pell-mell, limbs sticking up, sayest thou that cold hand sticking up, through the heaped embrace of brother corpses, in its yellow paleness, in its cold rigor. The palm open towards heaven, as if in dumb prayer, in expostulation to profundus, take pity on the sons of men, Mercier saw it, as he walked down, the Rue Saint-Jacques from Montrouge, on the morrow of the massacres, but not a hand. It was a foot, which he reckoned still more significant, one understands not well why. Or was it as the foot of one spurning heaven? Rushing, like a wild diver, in disgust and despair, 
towards the depths of annihilation. Even there shall his hand find thee, and his right hand hold thee, surely for right not for wrong, for good not evil. I saw that foot, says Mercier. I shall know it again at the great day of judgment, when the Eternal, throned on his thunders, shall judge both kings and Septemberers. That a shriek of inarticulate horror rose over this thing, not only from French aristocrats and moderates, but from all Europe, and has prolonged itself to the present day, was most natural and right. The thing lay done, irrevocable. A thing to be counted beside some other things, which lie very black in our earth's annals, yet which will not erase therefrom. For man, as was remarked, has transcendentalisms in him. Standing, as he does, poor creature, every way, in the confluence of infinitudes, a mystery to himself and others, in the center of two eternities, of three immensities, in the intersection of primeval light with the everlasting dark. Thus have there been, especially by vehement tempers reduced to a state of desperation, very miserable things done. Sicilian Vespers, and eight thousand slaughtered in two hours, are a known thing. Kings themselves, not in desperation, but only in difficulty, have sat hatching, for year and day, Nada thou says, for seven years, their Bartholomew business. And then, at the right moment, also on an autumn Sunday, this very bell, they say it is the identical metal, of Saint Germain el was set a peeling, with effect. Nay the same black boulder stones of these Paris prisons have seen prison massacres before now. Men massacring countrymen, Burgundies massacring Armagnacs, whom they had suddenly imprisoned, till as now there are piled heaps of carcasses, and the streets ran red. The mayor passion of the time speaking the austere language of the law, and answered by the killers, in old French, it is some four hundred years old Maugerbu, sire, sir, God's molly son on your justice, your pity, your right reason. Cursed be of God whoso shall have pity on these false traitorous Armagnacs, English, dogs they are, they have destroyed us, wasted this realm of France, and sold it to the English. And so they slay, and fling aside the slain, to the extent of 1518, among whom are found four bishops of false and damnable counsel, and two presidents of parliament. For though it is not Satan's world this that we live in, Satan always has his place in it, underground properly, and from time to time bursts up. Well may mankind shriek, inarticulately anathematizing as they can. There are actions of such emphasis that no shrieking can be too emphatic for them. Shriek ye, acted have they. Shriek who might in this France, in this Paris legislative or Paris town hall, there are ten men who do not shriek. A circular goes out from the Committee of Salat Public, dated 3rd of September, 1792, directed to all town halls, a state paper too remarkable to be overlooked. A part of the ferocious conspirators detained in the prisons, it says, have been put to death by the people. And it, the circular, cannot doubt but the whole nation, driven to the edge of ruin by such endless series of treasons, will make haste to adopt this means of public salvation. And all Frenchmen will cry as the men of Paris, we go to fight the enemy, but we will not leave robbers behind us, to butcher our wives and children. To which are legibly appended these signatures, Panis, Sergeant, Marat, friend of the people. With seven others, carried down thereby, in a strange way, to the late remembrance of antiquarians. We remark, however, that their circular rather recoiled on themselves. The town halls made no use of it, even the distracted sansculottes made little. They only howled and bellowed, but did not bite. At Reims, about eight persons, were killed, and two afterwards were hanged for doing it. At Lyons, and a few other places, some attempt was made, but with hardly any effect, being quickly put down. Less fortunate were the prisoners of Orleans, was the good Duke de la Rochefoucauld. He journeying, by quick stages, with his mother and wife, towards the waters of forges, or some quieter country, was arrested at geysers. Conducted along the streets, amid effervescing multitudes, and killed dead by the stroke of a paving stone hurled through the coach window. Killed as a once liberal now aristocrat. Protector of priests, suspender of virtuous passions, and his unfortunate hot-grown cold, detestable to patriotism. He dies lamented of Europe, 
his blood spattering the cheeks of his old mother, ninety-three years old. As for the Orleans prisoners, they are state criminals, royalist ministers, Delisarts, Montmorens, who have been accumulating on the High Court of Orleans, ever since that tribunal was set up. Whom now it seems good that we should get transferred to our new Paris Court of the 17th, which proceeds far quicker. Accordingly hot Fournier from Martinique, Fournier el Americain, is off, missioned by constituted authority. With stanch National Guards, with Lazuski the Pole, sparingly provided with road money. These, through bad quarters, through difficulties, perils, for authorities cross each other in this time, do triumphantly bring off the fifty or fifty-three Orleans prisoners, towards Paris. Where a swifter court of the seventeenth will do justice on them. But lo, at Paris, in the interim, a still swifter and swiftest court of the second, and of September, has instituted itself, enter not Paris, or that will judge you. What shall Hot Fournier do? It was his duty, as volunteer constable, had he been a perfect character, to guard those men's lives never so aristocratic, at the expense of his own valuable life never so sansculotic, till some constituted court had disposed of them. But he was an imperfect character and constable, perhaps one of the more imperfect. Hot Fournier, ordered to turn thither by one authority, to turn thither by another authority, is in a perplexing multiplicity of orders. But finally he strikes off for Versailles. His prisoners fare in tumbrils, or open carts, himself and guards riding and marching around, and at the last village, the worthy mayor of Versailles comes to meet him, anxious that the arrival and locking up were well over. It is Sunday, the ninth day of the month. Lo, on entering the avenue of Versailles, what multitudes, stirring, swarming in the September sun, under the dull green September foliage. The four-road avenue all humming and swarming, as if the town had emptied itself. Our tumbrils roll heavily through the living sea, the guards and Fournier making way with ever more difficulty, the mayor speaking and gesturing his persuasivest. Amid the inarticulate growling hum, which growls ever the deeper even by hearing itself growl, not without sharp yelpings here and there, would to God we were out of this straight place, and wind and separation had cooled the heat which seems about igniting here. And yet if the wide avenue is too straight, what will the street de surintendance be, at leaving of the same? At the corner of surintendence street, the compressed yelpings became a continuous yell, savage figures spring on the tumble shafts. First spray of an endless coming tide. The mayor pleads, pushes, half desperate, is pushed, carried off in men's arms, the savage tide has entrance, has mastery. Amid horrid noise, and tumult as of fierce wolves, the prisoners sink massacred, all but some eleven, who escaped into houses, and found mercy. The prisons, and what other prisoners they held, were with difficulty saved. The stripped clothes are burnt in bonfire, the corpses lie heaped in the ditch on the morrow morning. All France, except it be the ten men of the circular and their people, moans and rages, inarticulately shrieking, all Europe rings. But neither did Danton shriek, though, as Minister of Justice, it was more his part to do so. Brawny Danton is in the breach, as of stormed cities and nations. Amid the sweep of 10th of August cannon, the rustle of Prussian gallows ropes, the smiting of September sabres, destruction all round him, and the rushing down of worlds, Minister of Justice is his name. But Titan of the Forlorn Hope, and Enfant Perdue of the Revolution, is his quality and the man acts according to that. We must put our enemies in fear. Deep fear, is it not, as of its own accord, falling on our enemies? The titan of the forlorn hope, he is not the man that would swiftest of all prevent its so falling. Forward, thou lost titan of an infant Purdue, thou must dare, and again dare, and without end dare, there is nothing left for thee but that. K mon nom soit fletri, let my name be blighted, what am I? The cause alone is great, and shall live, and not perish. Dot, so, on the whole, here too is a swallower of formulas. Of still wider gulp than Mirabeau, this Danton, Mirabeau of the Sansculottes. In the September days, this minister was not heard of as cooperating with strict Roland, his business might lie elsewhere, with Brunswick and the Hotel de Ville. 
When applied to by an official person about the Orleans prisoners and the risks they ran, he answered gloomily, twice over, are not these men guilty? When pressed, he answered in a terrible voice and turned his back. Two thousand slain in the prisons, horrible if you will, but Brunswick is within a day's journey of U.S., and there are five and twenty millions yet, to slay or to save. Some men have tasks, frightfuler than ours. It seems strange, but is not strange, that this minister of Moloch justice, when any suppliant for a friend's life got access to him, was found to have human compassion, and yielded and granted always. Neither did one personal enemy of Danton perish in these days. To shriek, we say, when certain things are acted, is proper and unavoidable. Nevertheless, articulate speech, not shrieking, is the faculty of man, when speech is not yet possible, let there be, with the shortest delay, at least, silence. Silence, accordingly, in this forty-fourth year of the business, and eighteen hundred and thirty-sixth of an era called Christian as Lucas a non, is the thing we recommend in practice. Nay, instead of shrieking more, it were perhaps edifying to remark, on the other side, what a singular thing customs, in Latin, mores, are. And how fitly the virtue, virtus, manhood or worth, that is in a man, is called his morality, or customariness. Fell slaughter, one the most authentic products of the pit you would say, once give it customs, becomes war, with laws of war. And is customary and moral enough, and red individuals carry the tools of it girt round their haunches, not without an air of pride, which do thou nowise blame. While, see, so long as it is but dressed in hodden or russet. And revolution, less frequent than war, has not yet got its laws of revolution, but the hodden or russet individuals are uncustomary, O oh shrieking beloved brother blockheads of mankind, let us close those wide mouths of ours. Let us cease shrieking, and begin considering. Chapter 3.1.7 September in Argonne Plain, at any rate, is one thing, that the fear, whatever of fear those aristocrat enemies might need, has been brought about. The matter is getting serious then. Sansculottism too has become a fact, and seems minded to assert itself as such. This huge mooncalf of Sansculottism, staggering about, as young calves do, is not mockable only, and soft like another calf. But terrible too, if you prick it, and, through its hideous nostrils, blows fire, aristocrats, with pale panic in their hearts, fly towards covert, and a light rises to them over several things. Or rather a confused transition towards light, whereby for the moment darkness is only darker than ever. But, what will become of this France? Here is a question. France is dancing its desert waltz, as Sahara does when the winds waken. In world blasts twenty-five millions in number, waltzing towards town halls, aristocrat prisons, and election committee rooms, towards Brunswick and the frontiers, towards a new chapter of universal history. If indeed it be not the finest, and winding up of that. In election committee rooms there is now no dubiety, but the work goes bravely along. The convention is getting chosen, really in a decisive spirit. In the town hall we already date first year of the republic. Some two hundred of our best legislators may be re-elected, the mountain bodily, Robespierre, with Mayor Pechon, Buzet, Curic Grégoire, Rabot, some three-score old constituents. Though we once had only thirty voices. All these, and along with them, friends long known to revolutionary fame, Camille de Moulin, though he stutters in speech, Manuel, Taulin and company, journalists courses, Cara, Mercier, Louvet of Fablas. Clut speaker of mankind, Callot de Herbois, tearing a passion to rags, Fabre d'Eglantine, speculative pamphleteer, Legendre the solid butcher. Nay Marat, though rural France can hardly believe it, or even believe that there is a Marat except in print. Of Minister Danton, who will lay down his ministry for a membership, we need not speak. Paris is fervent. Nor is the country wanting to itself. Barbarous, Rebecqui, and fervid patriots are coming from Marseilles. 745 men, or indeed 49, for Avignon now sends four, are gathering, so many are to meet. 
not so many are to part. Attorney Carrier from Aurillac, ex-priest Levin from Eris, these shall both gain a name. Mountainous Auvergne re-elects her Ram, hardy tiller of the soil, once mathematical professor. Who, unconscious, carries in pedo remarkable new calendar, with messeters, pluvioses, and such like, and having given it well forth, shall depart by the death they call Roman. Size old constituent comes. To make new constitutions as many as wanted, for the rest, peering out of his clear cautious eyes, he will cower low in many an emergency, and find silence safest. Young Saint Just is coming, deputed by Ain in the north. More like a student than a senator, not four and twenty yet, who has written books, a youth of slight stature, with mild mellow voice, enthusiast olive complexion, and long dark hair. Farad, from the far valley door in the folds of the Pyrenees, is coming, an ardent republican, doomed to fame, at least in death. All manner of patriot men are coming, teachers, husbandmen, priests and ex-priests, traders, doctors. Above all, talkers, or the attorney species. Man midwives, as Levasseur of the Sart, are not wanting. Nor artists, gross David, with the swollen cheek, has long painted, with genius in a state of convulsion, and will now legislate. The swollen cheek, choking his words in the birth, totally disqualifies him as orator, but his pencil, his head, his gross hot heart, with genius in a state of convulsion, will be there. A man bodily and mentally swollen cheeked, disproportionate. Flabby large, instead of great, weak withal as in a state of convulsion, not strong in a state of composure, so let him play his part. Nor are naturalized benefactors of the species forgotten, priestly, elected by the Orne department, but declining, pain the rebellious needleman, by the pas de Calais, who accepts. Few nobles come, and yet not none. Paul Francois Barris, noble as the Barrises, old as the rocks of Provence, he is one. The reckless, shipwrecked man, flung ashore on the coast of the Maldives long ago, while sailing and soldiering as Indian fighter. Flung ashore since then, as hungry Parisian pleasure hunter and half pay, on many a Circe island, with temporary enchantment, temporary conversion into beasthood and hoghood, the remote VAR department has now sent him hither. A man of heat and haste, defective in utterance, defective indeed in anything to utter, yet not without a certain rapidity of glance, a certain swift transient courage, who, in these times, fortune favoring, may go far. He is tall, handsome to the eye, only the complexion a little yellow, but, with a robe of purple with a scarlet cloak and plume of tricolor, on occasions of solemnity, the man will look well. La Pelletier Saint Fargeau, old constituent, is a kind of noble, and of enormous wealth, he too has come hither, to have the pain of death abolished. Hapless ex parlementeer Nay, among our sixty old constituents, see Philippe d'Orleans a prince of the blood. Not now d'Orleans, for, feudalism being swept from the world, he demands of his worthy friends the electors of Paris, to have a new name of their choosing. Whereupon procure Manuel, like an antithetic literary man, recommends equality, égalité. A Philippe égalité therefore will sit, seen of the earth and heaven. Such a convention is gathering itself together. Mere angry poultry in molting season. Whom Brunswick's grenadiers and cannoneers will give short account of. Would the weather only mend a little. In vain, O oh Bertrand. The weather will not mend a whit, nay even if it did. Dumouriez Palamides, though Bertrand knows it not, started from brief slumber at Sedan, on that morning of the 29th of August, with stealthiness, with promptitude, audacity. Some three mornings after that, Brunswick, opening wide eyes, perceives the passes of the Argonne all seized, blocked with felled trees, fortified with camps, and that it is a most shifty swift Dumouriez this, who has outwitted him. The maneuver may cost Brunswick a loss of three weeks, very fatal in these circumstances. A mountain wall of forty miles lying between him and Paris, which he should have preoccupied, which how now to get possession of. Also the rain it raineth every day, and we are in a hungry champagne pouilleuse, a land flowing only with ditch water. How to cross this mountain wall of the Argonne, or what in the world to do with it? 
There are marchings and wet splashings by steep paths, with sacraments and guttural interjections, forcings of argon passes, which unhappily will not force. Through the woods, volleying war reverberates, like huge gong music, or Moloch's kettle drum, borne by the echoes, swollen torrents boil angrily round the foot of rocks, floating pale carcasses of men. In vain. Ilatez village, with its church steeple, rises intact in the mountain pass, between the embosoming heights, your forced marchings and climbings have become forced slidings and tumblings back. From the hilltops thou sayest nothing but dumb crags, and endless wet moaning woods, the Claremont Vash, huge cow that she is, disclosing herself at intervals. Flinging off her cloud blanket, and soon taking it on again, drowned in the pouring heaven. The Argonne passes will not force, you must skirt the Argonne, go round by the end of it. But fancy whether the emigrant seigneurs have not got their brilliancy dulled a little, whether that foot regiment in red facings with nankeen trousers could be in field day order. In place of gasconading, a sort of desperation, and hydrophobia from excess of water, is threatening to supervene. Young Prince de Ligne, son of that brave literary de Ligne, the thunder god of dandies, fell backwards. Shot dead in Grand Prix, the northmost of the passes, Brunswick is skirting and rounding, laboriously, by the extremity of the south. For days, days of a rain as of Noah, without fire, without food. For fire you cut down green trees, and produce smoke, for food you eat green grapes, and produce colic, pestilential dysentery, lambda kappa omicron nu tau omicron delta lambda alpha omicron. And the peasants assassinate us, they do not join us. Shrill women cry shame on us, threaten to draw their very scissors on us. O oh, ye hapless dulled bright seigneurs, and hydrophobic splashed nankeens! But oh, ten times more, ye poor sacramenting ghastly visaged Hessians and Hullans, fallen on your backs, who had no call to die there, except compulsion in three halfpence a day. Nor has Mrs. Leblanc of the Golden Arm a good time of it, in her bower of dripping rushes. Assassinating peasants are hanged, old constituent honorable members, though of venerable age, ride in carts with their hands tied, these are the woes of war. Thus they, sprawling and wriggling, far and wide, on the slopes and passes of the Argonne, a loss to Brunswick of five and twenty disastrous days. There is wriggling and struggling, facing, backing, and right about facing. As the positions shift, and the Argonne gets partly rounded, partly forced, but still de Mourier, force him, round him as you will, sticks like a rooted fixture on the ground, fixture with many hinges, wheeling now this way, now that. Shewing always new front, in the most unexpected manner, nowise consenting to take himself away. Recruits stream up on him, full of heart, yet rather difficult to deal with. Behind Grand Prix, for example, Grand Prix which is on the wrong side of the Argonne, for we are now forced and rounded, the full heart, in one of those wheelings and shewings of new front, did as it were overset itself. As full hearts are liable to do. And there rose a shriek of sov kaput, and a death panic which had nigh ruined all. So that the general had to come galloping, and, with thunder words, with gesture, stroke of drawn sword even, check and rally, and bring back the sense of shame. Nay to seize the first shriekers and ringleaders, shave their heads and eyebrows, and pack them forth into the world as a sign. Thus too, for really the rations are short, and wet camping with hungry stomach brings bad humor, there is like to be mutiny. Whereupon again de Mourier arrives at the head of their line, with his staff, and an escort of a hundred hussars. He had placed some squadrons behind them, the artillery in front, he said to them, As for you, for I will neither call you citizens, nor soldiers, nor my men, and I am ES and fans, you see before you this artillery, behind you this cavalry. You have dishonored yourselves by crimes. If you amend, and grow to behave like this brave army which you have the honor of belonging to, you will find in me a good father. But plunderers and assassins I do not suffer here. At the smallest mutiny I will have you shivered in pieces, hacker and pieces. Seek out the scoundrels that are among you, and dismiss them yourselves, I hold you responsible for them. Patience, O de Mourier. 
this uncertain heap of shriekers, mutineers, where they once drilled and inured, will become a phalanxed mass of fighters, and wheel and whirl, to order, swiftly like the wind or the whirlwind, tanned mustacho figures. Often barefoot, even barebacked, with sinews of iron, who require only bread and gunpowder, very sons of fire, the adroitest, hastiest, hottest ever seen perhaps since Attila's time. They may conquer and overrun amazingly, much as that same Attila did, whose Attila's camp and battlefield thou now sayest, on this very ground. Who, after sweeping bare the world, was, with difficulty, and days of tough fighting, checked here by Roman Aetius and fortune, and his dust cloud made to vanish in the east again. Strangely enough, in this shrieking confusion of a soldiery, which we saw long since fallen all suicidally out of square in suicidal collision, at Nancy, or on the streets of Metz, where brave bull stood with drawn sword. And which has collided and ground itself to pieces worse and worse ever since, down now to such a state, in this shrieking confusion, and not elsewhere, lies the first germ of returning order for France. Round which, we say, poor France nearly all ground down suicidally likewise into rubbish and chaos, will be glad to rally. To begin growing, and new shaping her inorganic dust, very slowly, through centuries, through Napoleon's, Louis Philippe's and other the like media and phases, into a new, infinitely preferable France, we can hope. These wheelings and movements in the region of the Argonne, which are all faithfully described by Dumouriez himself, and more interesting to us than Hoyle's or Philidor's best game of chess, let us, nevertheless, O reader, entirely omit. And hasten to remark two things, the first a minute private, the second a large public thing. Our minute private thing is, the presence, in the Prussian host, in that war game of the Argonne, of a certain man, belonging to the sort called immortal. Who, in days since then, is becoming visible more and more, in that character, as the transitory more and more vanishes, for from of old it was remarked that when the gods appear among men, it is seldom in recognizable shape. Thus Admetus Neatherds give Apollo a draught of their goatskin way bottle, well if they do not give him strokes with their ox rungs, not dreaming that he is the sun god. This man's name is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He is Herzog Weimar's minister, come with the small contingent of Weimar, to do insignificant unmilitary duty here, very irrecognizable to nearly all. He stands at present, with drawn bridle, on the height near St. Menehauld, making an experiment on the cannon fever. Having ridden thither against persuasion, into the dance and firing of the cannonballs, with a scientific desire to understand what that same cannon fever may be, the sound of them, says he, is curious enough. As if it were compounded of the humming of tops, the gurgling of water and the whistle of birds. By degrees you get a very uncommon sensation, which can only be described by similitude. It seems as if you were in some place extremely hot, and at the same time were completely penetrated by the heat of it, so that you feel as if you and this element you are in were perfectly on a par. The eyesight loses nothing of its strength or distinctness, and yet it is as if all things had got a kind of brown-red color, which makes the situation and the object still more impressive on you. This is the canon fever, as a world poet feels it dot, a man entirely irrecognizable in whose irrecognizable head, meanwhile, there verily is the spiritual counterpart, and call it complement, of this same huge death-birth of the world. Which now effectuates itself, outwardly in the Argonne, in such canon thunder, inwardly, in the irrecognizable head, quite otherwise than by thunder. Mark that man, O reader, as the memorablest of all the memorable in this Argonne campaign. What we say of him is not dream, nor flourish of rhetoric, but scientific historic fact, as many men, now at this distance, see or begin to see. But the large public thing we had to remark is this, that the 20th of September, 1792, was a raw morning covered with mist. That from three in the morning St. Menehauld, and those villages and homesteads we know of old were stirred by the rumble of artillery wagons, by the clatter of hoofs, and many-footed tramp of men, all manner of military, patriot and Prussian taking up positions, on the heights of La Lune and other heights. Shifting and shoving, seemingly in some dread chess game, which may the heavens turn to good. 
The miller of Valmy has fled dusty underground, his mill, were it never so windy, will have rest today. At seven in the morning the mist clears off, see Kellerman, Du Maurier, second in command, with eighteen pieces of cannon, and deep serried ranks, drawn up round that same silent windmill, on his knoll of strength. Brunswick, also, with serried ranks and cannon, glooming over to him from the height of La Lune, only the little brook and its little dell are now parting them. So that the much longed for has come at last. Instead of hunger and dysentery, we shall have sharp shot, and then, Du Maurier, with force and firm front, looks on from a neighboring height, can help only with his wishes, in silence. Lo, the eighteen pieces do bluster and bark, responsive to the bluster of La Lune, and thunderclouds mount into the air, and echoes roar through all dells, far into the depths of our gone wood, deserted now. And limbs and lives of men fly dissipated, this way and that. Can Brunswick make an impression on them? The dull bright seigneurs stand biting their thumbs, these sansculottes seem not to fly like poultry. Towards noontide a cannon shot blows Kellerman's horse from under him, there bursts a powder cart high into the air, with Nell heard over all, some swagging and swaying observable, Brunswick will try. Camarada, cries Kellerman, vive la patterie. Allons vainqueur pour l, let us conquer. Live the fatherland, rings responsive, to the welkin, like rolling fire from side to side, our ranks are as firm as rocks. And Brunswick may recross the dell, ineffectual, regain his old position on La Lune, not unbattered by the way. And so, for the length of a September day, with bluster and bark, with bellow far echoing. The cannonade lasts till sunset. And no impression made. Till an hour after sunset, the few remaining clocks of the district striking seven, at this late time of day Brunswick tries again. With not a whit better fortune. He is met by rock ranks, by shouts of vive la patterie. And driven back, not unbattered. Whereupon he ceases, retires, to the tavern of La Lune, and sets to raising a redoute lest he be attacked. Verily so, ye dulled bright seigneurs, make of it what ye may. Ah, and France does not rise round us in mass, and the peasants do not join us, but assassinate us, neither hanging nor any persuasion will induce them. They have lost their old distinguishing love of king, and king's cloak, I fear, altogether. And will even fight to be rid of it, that seems now their humor. Nor does Austria prosper, nor the siege of Thionville. The Thionvillers, carrying their insolence to the epigrammatic pitch, have put a wooden horse on their walls, with a bundle of hay hung from him, and this inscription, When I finish my hay, you will take Thionville. To such height has the frenzy of mankind risen. The trenches of Thionville may shut, and what though those of Leal open. The earth smiles not on us, nor the heaven, but weeps and blears itself, in sour rain, and worse. Our very friends insult us. We are wounded in the house of our friends, His Majesty of Prussia had a greatcoat, when the rain came, and, contrary to all known laws, he put it on, though our two French princes, the hope of their country, had none. To which indeed, as Goethe admits, what answer could be made, cold and hunger and affront, colic and dysentery in death. And we here, cowering redoubt, most unredoubtable, amid the tattered corn shocks and deformed stubble, on the splashy height of La Lune, round the mean tavern de La Lune. This is the cannonade of Valmy. Wherein the world poet experimented on the cannon fever, wherein the French sansculottes did not fly like poultry. Precious to France. Every soldier did his duty, an Alsatian Kellerman, how preferable to old Luckner the dismissed. Began to become greater. An Egalité fills, Equality Junior, a light gallant field officer, distinguished himself by intrepidity, it is the same intrepid individual who now, as Louis Philippe, without the equality, struggles, under sad circumstances. To be called King of the French for a season. Chapter 3.1.8 Exeunt. But this twentieth of September is otherwise a great day. For, observe, while Kellerman's horse was flying blown from under him at the mill of Valmy, our new national deputies, that shall be a national convention, are hovering and gathering about the hall of the hundred Swiss. 
with intent to constitute themselves. On the morrow, about noontide, Camus the archivist is busy verifying their powers, several hundreds of them already here. Whereupon the old legislative comes solemnly over, to merge its old ashes phoenix-like in the body of the new. And so forthwith, returning all solemnly back to the Salle de Manege, there sits a national convention, 749 complete, or complete enough, presided by Pechon, which proceeds directly to do business. Read that reported afternoon's debate, O oh reader, there are few debates like it, dull reporting monitor itself becomes more dramatic than a very Shakespeare. For epigrammatic Manuel rises, speaks strange things. How the president shall have a guard of honor, and lodge in the tilleries, rejected. And Danton rises and speaks, and Callot de Herbois rises, and Curate Gregoire, and Lame Cuthin of the Mountain rises. And in rapid Melibian stanzas, only a few lines each, they propose motions not a few, that the cornerstone of our new constitution is sovereignty of the people, that our constitution shall be accepted by the people or be null. Further that the people ought to be avenged, and have right judges, that the imposts must continue till new order, that landed and other property be sacred forever. Finally that royalty from this day is abolished in France, decreed all, before four o'clock strike, with acclamation of the world. The tree was all so ripe, only shake it and there fall such yellow cartloads. And so over in the Valmy region, as soon as the news come, what stir is this, audible, visible from our muddy heights of La Lune? Universal shouting of the French on their opposite hillside, caps raised on bayonets, and a sound as of Republic. Vive la Republic born dubious on the winds, on the moral morning, so to speak, Brunswick slings his knapsacks before day, lights any fires he has, and marches without tap of drum. Dumouriez finds ghastly symptoms in that camp. Latrines full of blood. The chivalrous king of Prussia, for he as we saw is here in person, may long rue the day, may look colder than ever on these dulled bright seigneurs, and French princes their country's hope. And, on the whole, put on his great coat without ceremony, happy that he has won. They retire, all retire with convenient dispatch, through a champagne trodden into a quagmire, the wild weather pouring on them. Dumouriez through his Kellermans and Dillons pricking them a little in the hinder parts. A little, not much, now pricking, now negotiating, for Brunswick has his eyes opened, and the majesty of Prussia is a repentant majesty. Nor has Austria prospered, nor the wooden horse of Thionville bitten his hay, nor Lille city surrendered itself. The Lille trenches opened, on the 29th of the month, with balls and shells, and red-hot balls. As if not trenches but Vesuvius and the pit had opened. It was frightful, say all eyewitnesses, but it is ineffectual. The Lillers have risen to such temper, especially after these news from Argonne and the East. Not a sans indispensables in Lille that would surrender for a king's ransom. Red-hot balls rain, day and night, six thousand, or so, and bombs, filled internally with oil of turpentine which splashes up in flame. Mainly on the dwellings of the sansculottes and poor, the streets of the rich being spared. But the sansculottes get water pails, form quenching regulations, the ball is in Peter's house. The ball is in John's. They divide their lodging and substance with each other, shout vive la republic, and faint not in heart. A ball thunders through the main chamber of the Hotel de Ville, while the commune is there assembled, we are in permanence, says one, coldly, proceeding with his business. And the ball remains permanent too, sticking in the wall, probably to this day. The Austrian Archduchess, Queen's sister, will herself see red artillery fired. In their overhaste to satisfy an Archduchess, two mortars explode and kill thirty persons. It is in vain, Lille, often burning, is always quenched again, Lille will not yield. The very boys deftly wrench the matches out of fallen bombs, a man clutches a rolling ball with his hat, which takes fire, when cool, they crown it with a bonnet rouge. Memorable also be that nimble barber, who when the bomb burst beside him, snatched up a shred of it, introduced soap and lather into it, crying, voila mon plat à barbe, my new shaving dish, and shaved, fourteen people, on the spot. Bravo, 
Thou nimble shaver, worthy to shave old spectral red cloak, and find treasures, on the eighth day of this desperate siege, the sixth day of October, Austria finding it fruitless, draws off, with no pleasurable consciousness. Rapidly, Dumouriez tending thitherward, and Lille too, black with ashes and smolder, but jubilant sky high, flings its gates open. The plat a barb became fashionable. No patriot of an elegant turn, says Mercier several years afterwards, but shaves himself out of the splinter of a Lille bomb. Quid multa, why many words? The invaders are in flight. Brunswick's host, the third part of it gone to death, staggers disastrous along the deep highways of Champagne, spreading out also into the fields of a tough spongy red-colored clay, like Pharaoh through a red sea of mud, says Goethe. For he also lay broken chariots, and riders and foot seemed sinking around. On the eleventh morning of October, the world poet, struggling northwards out of Verdun, which he had entered southwards, some five weeks ago, in quite other order, discerned the following phenomenon and formed part of it. Towards three in the morning, without having had any sleep, we were about mounting our carriage, drawn up at the door. When an insuperable obstacle disclosed itself, for there rolled on already, between the pavement stones which were crushed up into a ridge on each side, an uninterrupted column of sick wagons through the town, and all was trodden as into a morass. While we stood waiting what could be made of it, our landlord the Knight of St. Louis pressed past us, without salutation. He had been a Calones notable in 1787, an emigrant since, had returned to his home, jubilant, with the Prussians but must now forth again into the wide world, followed by a servant carrying a little bundle on his stick. The activity of our alert Lisieux shone eminent, and, on this occasion too, brought us on, for he struck into a small gap of the wagon row, and held the advancing team back till we, with our six and our four horses, got intercalated, after which, in my light little coachlet, I could breathe freer. We were now under way, at a funeral pace, but still under way. The day broke. We found ourselves at the outlet of the town, in a tumult and turmoil without measure. All sorts of vehicles, few horsemen, innumerable foot people, were crossing each other on the great esplanade before the gate. We turned to the right, with our column, towards Estain, on a limited highway, with ditches at each side. Self preservation, in so monstrous a press, knew now no pity, no respect of aught. Not far before us there fell down a horse of an ammunition wagon, they cut the traces, and let it lie. And now as the three others could not bring their load along, they cut them also loose, tumbled the heavy packed vehicle into the ditch. And, with the smallest retardation, we had to drive on, right over the horse, which was just about to rise, and I saw too clearly how its legs, under the wheels, went crashing and quivering. Horse and foot endeavored to escape from the narrow laborious highway into the meadows, but these two were reined to ruin, overflowed by full ditches, the connection of the footpaths everywhere interrupted. For gentlemanlike, handsome, well-dressed French soldiers waited for a time beside our carriage. Wonderfully clean and neat, and had such art of picking their steps, that their footgear testified no higher than the ankle to the muddy pilgrimage these good people found themselves engaged in. That under such circumstances one saw, in ditches, in meadows, in fields and crofts, dead horses enough, was natural to the case, by and by, however, you found them also flayed, the fleshy parts even cut away, sad token of the universal distress. Thus we fared on, every moment in danger, at the smallest stoppage on our own part, of being ourselves tumbled overboard, under which circumstances, truly, the careful dexterity of our Lisieux could not be sufficiently praised. The same talent shoot itself at a stain, where we arrived towards noon, and descried, over the beautiful well-built little town, through streets and on squares, around and beside us, one sense confusing tumult, the mass rolled this way and that. And, all struggling forward, each hindered the other. Unexpectedly our carriage drew up before a stately house in the marketplace, Master and mistress of the mansion saluted us in reverent distance. Dexterous Lisieux, though we knew it not, had said we were the king of Prussia's brother. But now, from the ground floor windows, looking over the whole marketplace, we had the endless tumult lying, 
as it were, palpable. All sorts of walkers, soldiers in uniform, marauders, stout but sorrowing citizens and peasants, women and children, crushed and jostled each other, amid vehicles of all forms, ammunition wagons, baggage wagons. Carriages, single, double, and multiplex, such hundredfold miscellany of teams, requisitioned or lawfully owned, making way, hitting together, hindering each other, rolled here to right and to left. Horned cattle too were struggling on. Probably herds that had been put in requisition. Riders you saw few, but the elegant carriages of the emigrants, many colored, lacquered, gilt and silvered, evidently by the best builders, caught your eye. The crisis of the strait however arose further on a little, where the crowded marketplace had to introduce itself into a street, straight indeed and good, but proportionably far too narrow. I have, in my life, seen nothing like it, the aspect of it might perhaps be compared to that of a swollen river which has been raging over meadows and fields, and is now again obliged to press itself through a narrow bridge. And flow on in its bounded channel. Down the long street, all visible from our windows, there swelled continually the strangest tide, a high double-seated traveling coach towered visible over the flood of things. We thought of the fair French women we had seen in the morning. It was not they, however, it was Count Hogwitz, him you could look at, with a kind of sardonic malice, rocking onwards, step by step, there. In such untriumphant procession has the Brunswick Manifesto issued. Nay and worse, in negotiation with these miscreants, the first news of which produced such a revulsion in the emigrant nature, as put our scientific world poet in fear for the wits of several. There is no help, they must fare on, these poor emigrants, angry with all persons and things, and making all persons angry, in the hapless course they struck into. Landlord and landlady testify to you, at tables d'hôte, how insupportable these Frenchmen are, how, in spite of such humiliation, of poverty and probable beggary, there is ever the same struggle for precedence, the same forwardness. And want of discretion. High in honor, at the head of the table, you with your own eyes observe not a seigneur but the automaton of a seigneur, fallen into dotage, still worshipped, reverently waited on, and fed. In miscellaneous seats, is a miscellany of soldiers, commissaries, adventurers, consuming silently their barbarian vittles. On all brows is to be read a hard destiny. All are silent, for each has his own sufferings to bear, and looks forth into misery without bounds. One hasty wanderer, coming in, and eating without ungraciousness what is set before him, the landlord lets off almost scot-free. He is, whispered the landlord to me, the first of these cursed people I have seen condescend to taste our German black bread. And de Mourier is in Paris, lauded and feasted. Paraded in glittering saloons, floods of beautifulest blonde dresses and broadcloth coats flowing past him, endless, in admiring joy. One night, nevertheless, in the splendor of one such scene, he sees himself suddenly apostrophized by a squalid unjoyful figure, who has come in uninvited, nay despite of all lackeys, an unjoyful figure. The figure is come in express mission from the Jacobins, to inquire sharply, better then than later, touching certain things, shaven eyebrows of volunteer patriots, for instance. Also, your threats of shivering in pieces. Also, why you have not chased Brunswick hotly enough. Thus, with sharp croak, inquires the figure. Say vous coup on appel Marat, you are he they call Marat, answers the general, and turns coldly on his heel. Marat. The blonde gowns quiver like aspens, the dress coats gather round, actor Talma, for it is his house, and almost the very chandelier lights, are blue, till this obscene spectrum, or visual appearance, vanish back into native night. General de Mourier, in few brief days, is gone again, towards the Netherlands, will attack the Netherlands, winter though it be. And General Montesquieu, on the southeast, has driven in the Sardinian majesty. Nay, almost without a shot fired, has taken Savoy from him, which longs to become a piece of the Republic. And General Custine, on the northeast, has dashed forth on Spires and its arsenal. And then on electoral mens, not uninvited, wherein are German Democrats and no shadow of an elector now, so that in the last days of October, Frau Forster, 
a daughter of Haines, somewhat democratic. Walking out of the gate of Mentz with her husband, finds French soldiers playing at bowls with cannonballs there. Forster trips cheerfully over one iron bomb, with, Live the Republic. A black-bearded National Guard answers, El vivre bien sans vous, it will probably live independently of you. Book 3.2 Regicide Chapter 3.2.I The Deliberative France therefore has done two things very completely, she has hurled back her Sumerian invaders far over the marches. 